Brown Book of the Hitler Terror and Burning of the Reichstag by Lord Marley It is always difficult to secure authentic information as to what is happening under a well-organized terror. Even experienced journalists find it difficult, in spite of their training, to get anything like the truth. Special credit is due to a few of the foreign press correspondents in Germany who, at the risk of losing their posts, have contrived to get so much of the truth across the frontier. Many authentic documents have been placed at the disposal of the World Committee for the Victims of German Fascism, some by journalists, others by doctors and members of the legal profession, to whom special means of discovering the truth were available, but who did not dare, and indeed were unable, to publish their information in Germany. Other documents have been sent by the tortured and martyred victims themselves. For the greater part of the material, the committee has to thank its own reporters, who have been working in Germany at the risk of their lives. We have not used the most sensational of these documents. Every statement made in this book has been carefully verified, and is typical of a number of similar cases. We would have been able to publish even worse individual cases, but we have not done this, just because they were individual cases. Not a single one of the cases published in this book is an exceptional case. Each case cited is typical of many others which are in our possession or in the hands of the national committees. These manifestations of fascism are appalling. But the memory of the public is short, and public opinion is unfortunately only too ready to reconcile itself to a fait accompli, as in the case of Italy. This book aims at keeping alive the memory of the criminal acts of the Nazi government. It is a contribution to the fight against Hitler fascism. This fight is not directed against Germany. It is a fight on behalf of the real Germany. Mali, Chairman of the World Committee for the Victims of German Fascism. House of Lords, London. End of forward. Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley. Chapter 1. The Path to Power. The German Labour Party was founded in Munich in January 1919. In July of that year, Adolf Hitler, at that time education officer in the Reichswehr, joined this party. He was the seventh member of what later developed into the National Socialist German Labour Party. Who were the founders and first members of this party? From what sections of the population did they come, and what interests did they represent? In the first place, they consisted of soldiers and officers who had come back from the war completely disillusioned. For four years, they had honestly believed in the chauvinistic slogans with which they had been fed. They had staked their lives in the struggle for a greater Germany. They believed in the legend that pacifist and social democratic traitors had stabbed the German army in the back and brought about its defeat. These men who came back were deeply embittered by what they thought was the weakness of the ruling class, the treachery and flight of the Kaiser, and of the deposed princes, and the failure of the generals of the Great War to strike down the November criminals. These deeply disillusioned soldiers and officers could no longer find a place for themselves in civil life. To a great extent, the professions which they had once practiced now no longer existed. This was true particularly of the professional soldiers, military cadets, and a number of categories of officials. They were joined by members of the uprooted nobility, students who had been torn from their studies by the war, and declassed and radicalized members of the middle classes, who now began to feel the ground giving way under their feet. All of these elements, who at that time also flocked into the many other military bodies which arose at that time, the Einwohnerwehr, the Stahlhelm, and the Erhardt Brigade, formed the first basis of the Young National Socialist German Labor Association, as the party first called itself officially. For two years after its formation, the National Socialists were quite an insignificant group. The November Revolution of 1918 had been beaten down, and the capitalist system had got a new lease of life. The Social Democrat, Friedrich Ebert, became the first president of the Weimar Republic. 
the old forces of finance capitalism consolidated their rule again the trade union leaders had concluded an agreement with the employers based on negotiations in november nineteen eighteen between ugo stinnes and the president of the general committee of the trade unions the social democrat karl leguin what at that time could hitler do for the leading groups of german capitalists at that period they were not yet in need of the national socialists hitler's association therefore remained without any significance he himself continued in the service of the reichswehr until april nineteen twenty giving political lectures to the soldiers on instructions from the reichswehr he also observed political organizations and meetings bringing in reports and information this was how hitler first came into contact with the german labor party not long afterwards the political importance of the party began to grow the political situation in germany began to change rapidly under the effect of the dictated peace of versailles and the losses of the war milliards of marks were demanded in reparations and had to be paid important industrial areas were lopped off alsace lorraine upper silesia the czar territory posen and west prussia the so-called polish corridor danzig and eugen malmedy the german market was still further restricted by the loss of a considerable portion of its european and oversea connections in addition to the german colonies the cost of demobilization and of putting the war industries on to a peace basis was a terrific burden on the smaller taxpayers as the dominant circles of german monopoly capital were continuously devising new methods of transferring the reparations payments and all other losses on to the shoulders of the workers and the middle class this development reached its highest point in the inflation which had begun during the war but was only widely felt among the population in the course of nineteen twenty one and nineteen twenty two in the autumn of nineteen twenty three it reached the point of catastrophe it had brought about still further impoverishment of the workers and had transformed a considerable section of the middle classes into proletarians millions of the poorer sections of the middle class were literally robbed of everything they had by the inflation the state paid the banks and heavy industry concerns six hundred million gold marks as compensation for the occupation of the ruhr by the french and these concerns also made enormous profits the economic chaos produced far-reaching political disturbances erzberger and rathenau fell victims to the bullets of nationalist murderers among the working class a process of radicalization was taking place the spartacus struggles in berlin in january nineteen nineteen were followed by the rising of the workers in the ruhr during the cot putsch of march nineteen twenty and the workers revolt in march nineteen twenty one the workers began to leave the social democratic organizations making their way first to the independent social democrats then after the autumn of nineteen twenty to the communist party great demonstrations culminated in the hamburg rising of october nineteen twenty three the twenty five points of the nazi program in nineteen twenty the national socialist german labor party first began to develop importance in february of that year hitler himself at a meeting in munich put forward the program of the party the so-called twenty-five points these are a hash of theses and demands which in parts are self-contradictory the political practice of the nazi party has at no time followed the principles laid down in the twenty-five points nor did it matter to hitler and his vassals that at the end of the program the following passage occurs the leaders of the party undertake if necessary at the risk of their own lives to work unceasingly for the carrying through of the points enumerated above this was not the only promise which the nazi leaders gave and failed to keep in a general meeting of the party in may nineteen twenty six 
a resolution was once again adopted stressing the unalterable character of the party's programme gottfried feda the joint author of the twenty-five points and theoretician of the party in his commentary on the programme laid stress on the fact that there must be no tampering with the basis and fundamental conceptions of this programme there must be no twisting and turning on any opportunistic grounds there must be no hide-and-seek with the present state economic and social order of things and there must be no weakening of our principles those who in the jewish question in our fight against high finance against the dawes pact and the policy of impoverishing germany or in any other questions on our programme cannot see eye to eye with the irrevocable aims and methods which we have laid down those who believe that the freedom of the german nation can be bought through the league of nations or locarno by compromise and cowardice such people need have nothing to do with us let them remain outside of our party but all these magnificent words cannot hide the fact that the national socialist leaders have repeatedly repudiated and betrayed their own half-hearted and compromising programme their treachery to their programme begins with the first two points point one the union of all germans on the basis of the right of self-determination of peoples to form a greater germany point two the equal right of the german nation with all other nations and the cancellation of the peace treaties of versailles and st germain neither of these two points in his programme prevented hitler both before and after his seizure of power from concluding compromises with the signatories of the versailles treaty and sending envoys to negotiate with the league of nations france poland england and italy nor did either of these points make him hesitate to betray the south tyrol to mussolini in the first edition of fader's commentary on the programme the following passage occurs we shall not give up a single german in south germany in alsace lorraine in the south tyrol in poland in austria the colony of the league of nations and the succession states of what was formerly austria in the second and all later editions the words in the south tyrol were omitted it may be noted in passing that in his foreword to the fifth edition feder remarks the only alterations which have been made are in the case of a few stylistic expressions and passages which might have led to misunderstanding it is the same with other points of the programme particularly the demands of an economic and social character such as the abolition of income derived without labour and effort abolition of the dominion of interest point eleven the complete confiscation of all war profits point twelve the taking over by the state of all concerns which have already been trustified point thirteen participation in the profits of large concerns point fourteen a considerable extension of provision for old age point fifteen the creation and maintenance of a healthy middle class the immediate municipalization of the large stores and the leasing of them at low prices to small tradespeople close control of all small tradespeople in their sales to the reich to the constituent states of the reich or to the local authorities point sixteen land reform suited to our national needs the establishment of legislation to provide for expropriation of land without compensation where required for public purposes abolition of the land tax and measures to prevent speculation in land point seventeen it is not necessary to examine each of these points in the program in detail some of them will be dealt with in later chapters as for example the points relating to the jewish question points four through eight and twenty three at this stage we are concerned only with indicating the general basis of the national socialist program and with showing how the leaders of the national socialist party have unscrupulously betrayed their own program the demands themselves are in part reactionary lower middle class demands as for example the creation and maintenance of a healthy middle class here too we have half-heartedness and contradiction such as is characteristic of the program throughout for how is the middle class to be maintained if the capitalist economic system which necessarily destroys the middle class and brings them into the ranks of the working class 
is also to be maintained. This is also true of the point dealing with agrarian policy. How can Hitler save the peasantry if he maintains private property intact, if he repudiates any expropriation of the big landlords in favor of the landless peasant? In April 1928, Hitler expressly stated that the National Socialist Party was determined to protect the private ownership of the means of production with all the strength it could command. In an explanation of the phrase expropriation without compensation in point 17 of his program, he stated that this only referred to legislation authorizing the expropriation where necessary of land which was not being properly used from the standpoint of the welfare of the people, and that this passage was in the first place directed against Jewish land speculation companies. On the other hand, the National Socialist program also contained demands which had previously been the stock and trade of liberal parties, and also demands embodied in the Weimar Constitution. Point 13, the taking over of the trusts by the state, is stolen straight out of the program of the German Democratic Party of 1919. Other points are unfulfilled promises made in the Weimar Constitution. Examples of this are point 15, extension of provision for old age, point 20, full opportunities for ability. Compare with the Constitution and the Welfare Act of 1924, point 21, improvement of the health of the people and protection for mother and child, and point 24, public service before private interest compare paragraph 156 of the Constitution. The Growth of the Nazi Movement Hitler appeared in the first great meetings organized by the Nationalist Socialist Party to put forward this program. At that period, the agitation against the Versailles Treaty was put in the forefront of the Nazi agitation. The more the middle class was affected by the continuous inflation, the more popular the Nazi demonstrations became. It cannot, however, be disputed that in the middle class it was not only the material losses they suffered through reparations, inflation, and the occupation of the Ruhr which affected their outlook, but also the blow to national sentiment which was inflicted by the dictated peace of Versailles and the entry of French troops into German territory. In February 1921, soon after the reparations negotiations, a great National Socialist demonstration was held in Munich with the slogan, Germany's Future or Extinction. For the first time, motors carrying swastika flags passed through the streets of Munich advertising the demonstration. Posters were put up everywhere with a demagogic text. If sixty million Germans, young and old, declare their united determination, we will not pay then the will of these millions will at least secure the respect which is not given to those who kiss the lash which whips them. We are men, not dogs. The sixty million Germans must tell the government clearly that whoever negotiates will be overthrown. This demonstration was a great success for Hitler. The national parties and associations, which had been using old pre-war methods of propaganda, ridiculed the young man when he came to them proposing the organization of giant demonstrations against the government's policy of fulfillment, and still more when on their refusal he himself undertook the task with his own tiny party. But the program of the nationalist parties, which was that of the Junkers and big capitalists, was not suitable for the middle classes, who, however, were carried away by the twenty-five points and Hitler's unscrupulous agitation. The failure of the Kopp Putsch had shown the weakness of the Junkers. The Putsch was based on the support of the big landlords and parts of the Reichswehr and the higher grades of the civil service, besides a few military groups. But it was completely out of touch with the discontent in the middle class. It was therefore beaten by the working class within twenty-four hours. The Stahlhelm, too, could never win more than a very limited influence, chiefly among peasant and urban youth and the most backward sections of the workers, members of the yellow unions and agricultural laborers. But the National Socialists were different. 
they put forward their imaginary fight against international Jewish banking and speculative capital in their slogan of the National Union, in which all sections of the population would live at peace with each other under a strong state, and with this program they were able to penetrate widely different groups, including large numbers of the middle class. In 1921, the membership of the National Socialist Party grew from 3,000 to 6,000, but its sphere of influence at that time was almost exclusively limited to Bavaria. In North Germany, the movements under Grefe, Wulle, Henning, and Count Reventlow were very much stronger. In 1920, the first Congress of the National Socialist Party was held in Salzburg, this Congress was attended by members of the Austrian National Socialist Party, which dated from before the war. It had been formed in 1904 as a German Labour Party, and in May 1918 this joined with other groups to form the National Socialist Party of Austria. National Socialism dates, therefore, from the early years of the century. It developed first in Bohemia, where the national question played a particularly important role. Hitler, an Austrian by birth, had taken a great deal from their program, but he was unable to reach an agreement at Salzburg with Jung, the leader of the Bohemian Party. The next Congress was held at Reichenhall in 1921. This Congress was held jointly with Russian and Ukrainian White Guard Associations, Hetman Skoropadsky was among the speakers, in conjunction with the National Socialist Alfred Rosenberg, whose family came from the Baltic provinces and who later became editor of the Völkischer Beobachter and Nazi expert in foreign politics. The White Guard emigrants developed their plans of intervention against the Soviet state, which had just driven out the last of the troops of intervention. Already at that period, Rosenberg had developed connections with Dededing and the German industrial employer Rechtberg, both of them violently hostile to the Soviet Union. It is interesting to note that in the Völkischer Beobachter, Rosenberg writes his first anti-Bolshevik articles, which were pro-Polish. In a manifesto issued in connection with the Congress of the Party in Munich in January 1922, Hitler, who had still to win his position as sole dictator of the Nazi Party, stated that it was necessary to purge the movement, as it had become a breeding ground for well-meaning fools who were all the more dangerous because of their good intentions. This was evidently directed against the other founders of the party, including Anton Drexler and Körner, who were not prepared to follow Hitler in his new and unscrupulous methods. High and influential officers in the Reichswehr at Munich had for a considerable time given support to the movement. Among them were some of Hitler's former colleagues of 1919 and 1920. With their help, he set up, alongside of the party organization proper and the press and propaganda department, a third organization, which in the following years and later on served as his main fighting weapon, the Storm Troops. In the summer of 1920, the National Socialist Party, under the pretext of protecting their meetings against attacks by the Reds, had set up what they called a corps for maintaining order. But this was too small and weak for Hitler, who in August 1921 set up his own protective organization, the Storm Troops. These formed the terrorist section of the National Socialist Party and were brought directly under the political leadership of the party. Who financed Hitler? Not long after this period, a number of capitalists, particularly in South Germany, began to take an interest in Hitler and the National Socialist Party, with a view to drawing them in to support their own reactionary politics. They realized the value of the National Socialist Movement as a weapon against the militant sections of the working class, and they were therefore prepared to support the Nazis, particularly with finance. 
in the hitler ludendorff trial of 1924 it was proved that hitler had received considerable sums of money for his party from oust the director of the bavarian employers association beckstein the piano manufacturer maffei an industrial employer in munich and hornschuh of kulmbach and grandl of augsburg two manufacturers hitler also gave lectures on his aims in the select clubs of bankers landlords and big employers of labor in return he received contributions in support of the national socialist press and for similar purposes hitler also received subsidies from borsig a large industrial employer of berlin who was chairman of the union of german employers associations an agent of hitler's in switzerland dr gausser is also said to have secured for hitler finance from henry ford and also from french capitalist groups who were speculating on the bavarian separatist movement it is probable that the full sources of hitler's finance will only become known when the archives come into the hands of the german workers but political proof of the source of his finance is already clear the whole policy of the national socialist party and the declarations of sympathy for it made by important capitalist groups such as thyssen and schacht are proof of the great interest necessarily taken in the hitler movement by the ruling class hitler's debts and the immense expenditure on propaganda and for the maintenance of the storm troops were factors which played a certain role in bringing him into action in nineteen twenty three the putsch of november ninth nineteen twenty three the munich putsch of november ninth nineteen twenty three was the highest point and also the end of the first upward movement of the national socialist party all through nineteen twenty three hitler had been urging his allies in the bavarian government and the reichswehr to take action early in november he mobilized the fighting associations and in a great demonstration of patriotic associations in munich announced the formation of the national republic he announced the deposition of ebert appointed himself chancellor Kahr, his vice-consul for bavaria Pürner, the chief of the munich police prime minister and ludendorff minister of the reichswehr the bavarian ministers were arrested but released by ludendorff a few hours later on parole at first Kahr supported hitler's proposals but in the evening went with general van losso and general seisser to the barracks of the nineteenth infantry regiment from which they declared in a broadcast that they repudiated the hitler putsch Carr stated that his consent had been obtained from him by the threat of force he also announced the compulsory liquidation of the national socialist german labor party as well as the fighting associations oberland and reichsflagge this report and the order for the dissolution of these organizations was published in the munich papers on november ninth hitler and ludendorff made a despairing effort to take power although hitler had given his word of honor a few months earlier to the bavarian minister of the interior that he would not make any attempt at a putsch they marched with their fighting organizations through the streets the reichswehr maintained an attitude of neutrality it would not fire on the marching troops bavarian police awaited hitler's approach in one of the public buildings the police fired one volley fifteen of the hitlerites fell dead hitler himself fled and was arrested in the villa of a princess before he was able to cross the austrian frontier goering fled to italy and later to sweden ludendorff was not arrested the trial of the putschists of november ninth took place in the spring of nineteen twenty four the judges were merciful and sympathetic for the accused were nationally minded people who had acted with the best intentions the accused were hitler field marshal von ludendorff frick a police official who was to become minister of the interior in nineteen thirty three captain Röhm, lieutenant pernet ludendorff's stepson and a few others 
Nazi historians record that the accused were in cheerful mood and were smiling and cracking jokes. Hitler was sentenced to five years' detention in a fortress, subject to being released on parole when he had served a portion of the sentence. A few months later, in December 1924, he was released from the Landsberg fortress. Röhm, Frick, and Bruckner got away with only three months' detention. Ludendorff was released without punishment on the ground that he had been carried away in the excitement of the moment. Hitler, then still an Austrian citizen, was not expelled, but was allowed to continue to reside in Germany. The Nazis disappear from the scene. The failure of the 1923 putsch formed the close of the insurrectionary period of the Hitler movement. The time of plans for armed uprisings against the Jewish government in Berlin had now passed. The German economic situation had reached a certain stability and the position of the middle class was improving. Hence, for some years, the National Socialist Party virtually disappeared from the scene. The United Peoples and National Socialist Parties, which in the Reichstag elections of May 1924 had obtained 1,900,000 votes and 32 seats, in December of that year secured only 840,000 votes and 14 seats. They sank down among the splinter parties, while the German Nationals secured over 100 and the Social Democrats 120 seats. The following years were marked by internal struggles within the Nationalist and National Socialist parties. In the summer of 1925, the German People's Freedom Party split, and a large section of its former supporters went over to Hitler. In the meanwhile, the employers continued to take back from the workers the concessions they had won in 1918. In January 1925, a government was formed of the reactionary parties under the leadership of the German nationalists. Three months later, Field Marshal von Hindenburg was elected by the combined forces of the right to succeed Ebert as president of the Reich. The National Socialists, who in the first ballot had supported the hopeless candidature of Ludendorff, in the second ballot voted for Hindenburg. This was the beginning of the transformation of the National Socialist Movement. The Nazis Support the Princes In 1926, in connection with the referendum for the expropriation of the princes, the National Socialists joined the chorus of all the reactionary parties from the German Nationalists to the Center and the Democrats in shouting, The expropriation of the princes is robbery of well-earned wealth. Moreover, the Nazis have never changed their line in connection with this question. The leader of the Nazi fraction in the Reichstag declared in connection with a communist motion for the expropriation of the princes and the discontinuance of payments to the Kaiser and the nobility, a sense of justice makes us reject the communist motion for the expropriation of the princes, German socialism must also recognize the rights of the Hohenzollerns. The German princes and former nobility have rewarded the Nazis for this attitude by putting millions of their compensation money at the disposal of the Nazis. We refer particularly to Prince August Wilhelm, son of the ex-Kaiser, Duke Karl Eduard of saxe coburn gotha Prince Wilhelm von Hessen, whom Göring appointed president of Hessen-Nassau in 1933, Prince Christian of schamburg lippe and recently the former crown prince has joined the motor corps of the Nazis. The National Socialists have not been in a position to deny that the ex-Kaiser Wilhelm II has also helped in the financing of the storm troops. Hitler then tried the policy of drawing closer to the reactionary parties in order to win back the confidence of the capitalists, which he had lost through the Munich Putsch. He attempted to win legal positions because he realized that this was the only way to win the favor and support of the ruling class. Once again he began lecturing in the employers' clubs in order to persuade the big capitalists that his ideas were not at all dangerous, and to explain to them 
how much better they could work with the national socialists than with the unpatriotic social democrats but now the leader did not restrict his activities to south germany he went to the western areas to find the industrial barons in their citadels in nineteen twenty six he spoke twice to specially invited audiences in essen and Königswinter, and again in nineteen twenty seven at the krupp hall in essen the organ of heavy industry the rheinisch westfalische zeitung records the applause with which hitler's remarks were greeted strasser and goebbels speak of socialism in the same period and this is typical of the double-faced unscrupulous propaganda of the national socialists gregor strasser one of hitler's lieutenants toured through north and east germany with socialist slogans of the german revolution at that time also josef goebbels comes on the stage he was a young catholic writer from the rhineland in october nineteen twenty five strasser started the national socialist correspondence which became as it were the theoretical organ of the left national socialists goebbels at first editor of this journal then went in nineteen twenty six to berlin as district leader up to then the movement had made little headway there from july nineteen twenty seven he published a weekly called de angriff with the pseudo-socialist mottoes for the oppressed against the exploiters gregor strasser with his brother otto formerly a social democrat started a small press in berlin the kampfverlag it produced three daily papers the nationaler sozialist and s in berlin the merkische beobachter for the brandenburg province and the sechziger beobachter at that time these were the only nazi daily newspapers in central and northern germany the kampfverlag also published three weekly papers and a number of books and pamphlets there is no doubt that at that period gregor strasser attempted to rival hitler in north germany he had certain differences with hitler and only made these up later but he continued to carry out an independent policy and eventually at the end of nineteen thirty two hitler relieved him of his functions when he had become too closely associated with general schleicher in all the publications of the kampfverlag a very radical tone was used which was intended to make the reader believe that he was being spoken to by a friend of the workers and even a class fighter national or international socialism a pamphlet published by the kampfverlag asserted that the national socialist party is the class party of creative labor the author of this pamphlet was jung first president of the austrian nazis gregor strasser's motto was freedom and bread and his trademark is a hammer and sword goebbels uses the same tactics in his pamphlet the nazi zozi questions and answers for nationalists there can surely be nothing more hypocritical than a fat well-fed capitalist who protests against the proletarian idea of class struggle who gave you the right to throw out your chest swollen with national responsibility in indignation against the class struggle of the proletariat has not the capitalist state for some sixty years been an organized class state which brought with it as an inevitable historical necessity the proletarian idea of class struggle are you not ashamed you well-fed central european to fight the class fight against underfed hollow-eyed hungry workless proletarians yes we call ourselves the worker state this is the first step the first step away from the capitalist state we call ourselves a labor party because we want to set labor free because to us creative labor is the progressive element in history because labor means more to us than property education rank and bourgeois origin this is why we call ourselves a labor party we call ourselves socialist as a protest against the lie of capitalist social compassion we want no compassion we want no social outlook 
we despise the rubbish which you call social legislation it is too little to live with and too much to die with we demand a full share of what heaven gave us and what we create with our hands and our brains that is socialism we protest against the idea of the class struggle our whole movement is one great protest against the class struggle but at the same time we call things by their right names if on one side seventeen million proletarians see their only salvation in the class struggle this is because from the right side they have been taught this in practice for sixty years how can we find any moral justification in fighting against the class struggle unless the capitalist class state is first absolutely torn in shreds and abolished through a new socialist organization of the german people these words were written not so very long ago by the man who later became reich minister for enlightenment and propaganda it is quite a different tone from that used in the twenty-five points in which the word socialism does not occur compare goebbels demand for the tearing in shreds of the capitalist class state with the official organ of the nazi party which in point twenty five says for the carrying through of the above the whole program we demand the creation of a strong central power in the reich the absolute authority of the central political parliament over the whole reich and all its organizations the formation of chambers of trades and professions for the carrying through in the separate states of the reich of the general measures laid down by the reich by the side of the policy as put forward by goebbels the hitler program of nineteen twenty seems colourless conventional philistine and liberal Goebbels' manifesto against the fat, well-fed capitalist provides a fascist program which is much more suitable for industrial areas than the 25 points of Hitler. New defeats in 1928. Nevertheless, neither Hitler with his lectures to the well-fed capitalists of the Rhineland and the Ruhr, nor Strasse and Goebbels with their demagogy, could succeed in extending the mass influence of the National Socialist Party it is true that a certain internal consolidation of the party took place during this period the membership rose from seventeen thousand in nineteen twenty six to forty thousand in nineteen twenty seven two congresses were held weimar in nineteen twenty six and nuremberg in nineteen twenty seven the storm detachments were re-established the party got rid of well-meaning but for that reason all the more dangerous fools the racial specialist dinter in thuringia was among those expelled moreover in order to make the party presentable in drawing-rooms the infamous murderer heines was expelled although his bloody record did not prevent hitler from taking him back again later and appointing him police president of breslau and head of the storm detachments of the whole of north and east germany in may nineteen twenty eight the national socialist party again suffered a heavy defeat at the polls securing only twelve seats in the reichstag the objective situation for the growth of the fascist movement had not yet developed the years nineteen twenty four to nineteen twenty seven had brought a certain restoration of germany's economic life and this had resulted in easier conditions for the middle class generally and also for some sections of the working class the economic crisis in germany the illusory economic prosperity however reached its zenith germany was the first european country to be affected by the developing world crisis production fell and unemployment rose in the winter of nineteen thirty there were already over three million unemployed in germany the employers began a general attack on wages according to estimates made by the berlin finanzpolitische correspondenz the average weekly wages of industrial workers fell as follows in the summer of nineteen twenty nine they were forty four point six zero reichmarks in march nineteen thirty thirty nine point oh five reichmarks the average weekly wage throughout the year which in nineteen twenty eight and nineteen twenty nine was forty two and forty five marks fell to thirty seven marks in nineteen thirty and thirty marks in nineteen thirty one under the Papenschleicher government, 
the average weekly wage was reduced to fifty per cent of what it had been in nineteen twenty eight and nineteen twenty nine it fell to twenty point eight zero marks in august nineteen thirty two and since then it has fallen still further the finance politische correspondence estimates the total wage reductions of workers and employees in germany from july nineteen twenty nine to july nineteen thirty two at approximately thirty eight billion marks at par about one billion nine hundred million pounds together with the wage and salary reductions there was also a tremendous rise in unemployment according to the official figures of the reich ministry of labor unemployment rose to over six million the official trade research institute however showed that these official figures were not comprehensive as they covered only those workers who were reporting at the labor exchanges that in addition to the visible unemployed there were also many invisible on the basis of the health insurance statistics which cover all employed persons the invisible unemployment amounted to approximately two millions while therefore the ministry of labor figures showed close on six million unemployed in the winter of nineteen thirty one to thirty two and five million in the summer of nineteen thirty two the institute estimated the figures at eight million in the winter of nineteen thirty one and thirty two and over seven million in the third quarter of nineteen thirty two the best season but even these figures did not accurately reflect the position they did not include the hundreds of thousands of persons who had been unemployed for several years and were walking the streets of the towns as beggars or wandering through germany as tramps nor did they include the destitute children and the young unemployed who could find no work when they left school they did not include the hundreds of thousands of small merchants and tradespeople of people who had formerly been independent and professional people who were living on the verge of starvation and were in fact unemployed the real number of unemployed at the end of nineteen thirty two must be put at somewhere round about nine million the position of the middle class was increasingly getting worse the specific weight of this section of the population in germany is considerable according to a statistical inquiry made by theodor geiger die soziale schichtung des deutschen volkes stuttgart nineteen thirty two the percentage proportion of the various classes in the total number of occupied persons is capitalists point eight four per cent old middle class small proprietors eighteen point three three per cent new middle class officials employees etc sixteen point oh four per cent proletaroids workers on own account small traders etc thirteen point seven six per cent proletariat fifty one point oh three per cent the proportion of the proletariat may be put too high but the general distribution is probably correct the crisis brought wide sections of the middle class down into the proletariat the number of bankruptcies rose compulsory sales became more and more frequent the small tradespeople of the towns and the small peasants were particularly severely hit and the crisis hit sections of people who had hitherto not been affected and whose position had improved during the preceding period of relative stabilization unemployment began to creep into the most privileged sections of intellectual workers the standard of living of teachers engineers doctors lawyers writers artists fell lower and lower a quarter of the university lecturers could find no posts of eight thousand graduates from the technical colleges and universities in nineteen thirty one to thirty two only one thousand found employment in their professions fifteen hundred continued their studies provisionally suffering great privation fifteen hundred found temporary work as street hawkers waiters etc but four thousand remained totally unemployed an investigation undertaken by the hartmann bund the officially recognized doctors association showed that in nineteen thirty two seventy per cent of the german medical profession were earning less than a hundred and seventy marks a month at par eight pounds ten shillings zero pence the german legal association found that its members were in much the same position according to a statement issued by the prussian minister of education 
of twenty two thousand teachers who completed their training in the previous year only nine hundred and ninety found posts and even these were only temporary and auxiliary teaching posts and these figures cover prussia only the number of unemployed engineers and chemists increased five times between april nineteen thirty and april nineteen thirty two while unemployment among technical staffs doubled and among all employees rose by one and a half times during the same period the position of those university lecturers who were still employed got worse from year to year hours were lengthened salaries were rigorously cut in addition there was an increase in short time working many industries worked only three to five days a week the immense burden of reparations sharpened the crisis the promises and hopes of the dawes plans and the locarno treaty were not fulfilled the young plan of nineteen twenty nine made a new regulation of debts which brought fresh opportunities for the german capitalists to transfer the burden to the workers a new wave of radicalization passed through the workers after the electoral success of the social democrats in may nineteen twenty eight the working class began again to turn toward the communist party sections of the middle class which had hitherto been indifferent to politics now began to become active the peasants were roused in north germany in nineteen twenty nine they were in a state of revolt resisting by force the bailiffs sent to rob them of their last cow there were conflicts with the police then came one bomb attack after another in schleswig-holstein attempts were made to blow up government offices in nineteen twenty eight a great coalition government was formed reaching from the german people's party the party of heavy industry to the social democrats hermann muller president of the social democratic party became chancellor in addition to him there were three social democrats in the government severing minister of the interior hilferding minister of finance and winnell minister of labor stresemann leader of the german people's party became foreign minister his friend dr curtius minister of economics and the democrat gessler now a fascist minister of the reichswehr it was under muller's government that the young plan was put through the chief delegate at the paris young plan conference was schacht president of the reichsbank who was removed from his post in nineteen thirty and restored to it again in nineteen thirty three as a follower of hitler the brunning period in december nineteen twenty nine hilferding was removed from the government and his place as finance minister was taken by professor moldenhauer a member of the board of control of the great german chemical trust the i g farben industrie a few months later in march nineteen thirty the muller cabinet was replaced by the brunning cabinet the social democratic party was manoeuvred out of the government nevertheless the brunning grune stegerwald government which did not have a majority in the reichstag was willingly supported and tolerated by the social democrats at the same time this government was already thinking of bringing in the national socialists in the guerica trial in june nineteen thirty three the former minister treveranus explicitly stated that at that time brunning had the intention of bringing in the nazis the social democrats represented to the workers that the brunning government was a lesser evil than a government which was purely fascist and capitalist the social democratic prussian government of braun and zebering firmly supported the brunning government of the reich the period of democracy came to an end amid the difficulties which the economic crisis brought to germany's financial industrial and agrarian capitalists brunning ruled germany with article forty eight of the weimar constitution which in fact suspends the constitution but it was not the first time that the rulers of the german republic had had to correct a political development which was beginning to get dangerous by the introduction of the state of siege and the suspension of democratic rights during the years nineteen nineteen to nineteen twenty three when the social democrat ebert was president of the reich article forty eight made it possible to prohibit strikes in so-called vital industries 
to organize strike-breaking corps for technical assistance in emergencies, to send the Reichswehr to Saxony and Thuringia in 1923, to restore constitutional conditions, and to appoint General von Zecht as military dictator for the prohibition of the German Communist Party. Zürgibel, the Social Democratic Police President of Berlin and a former trade union leader, prohibited the working-class demonstrations of May 1, 1929, and when the workers broke through this prohibition and demonstrated, he sent police against them, killing 33 Berlin workers. A few days later, Zevering prohibited the Red Front organization, which was the anti-fascist defense organization of the revolutionary workers, while in Prussia, the Nazis were allowed to continue legally building up their fighting organizations. The Reichstag was sidetracked by Brüning. The Social Democrats gave their consent to this, and Brüning ruled with emergency decrees on the basis of Article 48 of the Constitution. He decreed the reduction of unemployment payments, the lowering of the miserable pensions of the victims of the war, of the sick, of old people, widows, and orphans. He decreed new taxes on the masses, the poll tax, the crisis tax, the bachelor's tax. He decreed increases in import duties and thereby increases in the price of food. He put an end to the rent protection legislation. Banks and industrial concerns received millions in subsidies. The great landlords were able to put themselves right at the expense of their workers. They received millions out of the so-called aid for the East. And the police presidents, of whom more than half were members of the Social Democratic Party, put down with intense severity the defensive movements of the workers, prohibited the communist press, and forbade working-class demonstrations. Through this policy, the Social Democrats not only actually helped forward the development of the reactionary and fascist forces in Germany, but also gave the National Socialists the pretext for their demagogic campaign against the failure of the Marxist system. The Social Democrats tolerated the Brüning government, which increased the burdens of the workers until they became intolerable, and ruled by dictatorial methods preparing the way for the summoning of the National Socialists to government power. During this period, the second revival of the National Socialist Party began. Together with Ugenberg, the spokesman of the reactionary wing of German heavy industry and of the landlords, with the support of the Stahlhelm and other nationalist organizations, the National Socialists demanded a referendum against the Young Plan. It was conveniently forgotten that in 1925, Ugenberg's German National People's Party had set aside one half of their fraction in the Reichstag to help to secure the acceptance of the Dawes Plan. The gigantic propaganda apparatus of the Ugenberg concern, with its hundreds of newspapers and its telegraph agency, the Telegraphen Union, TU, was now at the service of the National Socialists. The referendum came to nothing, but the National Socialists could record definite successes in the elections for the Diets of Saxony and Thuringia and in the Prussian local elections. In 1930, Frick became Minister of the Interior and of Education in Thuringia, the first National Socialist minister in Germany. In Thuringia, they joined a coalition with all the parties of the right, including the German People's Party, which at that time was in the Reich coalition with the Social Democrats. Only a year earlier, Goebbels, in his small ABC of National Socialism, had called the German People's Party a representative of the interests of big capital. Hitler shows his true colors. One section of the Socialists in the Nazi Party, under the leadership of Otto Stasser, considered that they could no longer follow the legal tactics then used, and in May 1930 left the party under the slogan, The Socialists Leave the National Socialist Party. Before this, Strasser had a long discussion with Hitler, who told him, The great mass of the workers wants nothing more than bread and circuses. It has no comprehension of any ideals, and we shall never be able to count on ideals to win the workers in large numbers. We want a selection from the new master class, 
who are not guided as you are by a morality of sympathy. Strasser asked Hitler, if you took power tomorrow, what would you do the day after, for example, with the Krupp concern? Will everything remain just as it is now for the shareholders and the workers in regard to ownership, profits, and management? Hitler replied, but of course. Do you imagine I am so crazy as to destroy trade? The state would only step in when people were not acting in the interests of the nation, but for this no expropriation is necessary, nor any joint share in control, but the power of the strong state which alone is in the position to let itself be governed entirely by wide viewpoints without consideration of individuals. The expression socialism is in itself bad, but above all it does not mean that these concerns must be socialized but only that they can be socialized if they conflict with the interests of the nation. So long as they do not do this, it would be simply a crime to interfere with trade. In this connection, we have a precedent which we can adopt without further question, namely Italian fascism. Just as the fascists have already put this into effect, in our national socialist state, also employers and workers will stand alongside each other with equal rights, while the decision in disputes is left to the state, which takes care that economic struggles do not endanger the life of the nation. With this guarantee to the capitalist economic system, Hitler once again recommended himself to the ruling groups of German finance capital. He showed them that, as in the case of the Italian fascist program, so the nationalist economic program only aimed at guaranteeing the reconsolidation of capitalism. He has kept the promises which he then gave. The Reichstag elections of September 1930 gave the National Socialists their first great electoral success. They secured 6,400,000 votes and 107 seats, becoming the second strongest party after the Social Democrats. The Communists won 600,000 votes. The German Nationalist Party lost half their seats. The German People's Party won third. The National Socialists owed their success to propaganda aimed at winning the radicalized middle-class elements. This propaganda offered unlimited promises to all sections, and it was conducted with gigantic resources supplied by capitalist donors. The Nazis promised the workers higher wages, the employers higher profits, the tenants lower rents, the house owners higher rents, the peasants higher prices, the middle class cheaper food. But they did not succeed in effecting any real penetration of the working class. They merely attracted large sections of former voters for the capitalist parties. Should Hitler be Chancellor of the Reich? Brüning continued in office and issued new emergency decrees, the Social Democrats supported him in carrying through this policy, and with the growth of the National Socialist Party, the question of openly calling it to power became more and more frequently raised. In April of 1932, Hindenburg was elected a second time as President of the Reich, with the votes of the Social Democrats, who issued the slogan, A vote for Hindenburg is a blow at Hitler. In May 1932, at the instigation of the East Prussian Junkers, Chancellor Brüning was overthrown, and a Papenschleicher government took his place. The new government started to bring in even more severe dictatorial measures. On July 20th, 1932, Papen was appointed Reich Commissioner for Prussia. A captain with three soldiers of the Reichswehr sufficed to break the resistance of the Social Democratic Ministers of Prussia. For a short time, Martial law was in force in the Berlin-Brandenburg area. The Social Democratic leaders offered no resistance, although they still had under their control the whole of the police in Prussia and in several of the other states of the Reich, and although the Social Democrat police officers were urging armed resistance. On the contrary, the Social Democrat leaders denounced the Communists, who were calling on the workers for a general strike as provocateurs. They weakened the working class forces and abandoned their positions in order to be able, as they thought, to save at least something from the wreck, and so the Prussian home of democracy fell into the hands of the reactionaries without a struggle. In August 1932, 
after a second electoral success for the nazis thirteen and a half million votes and two hundred and twenty five seats in the reichstag the appointment of hitler as chancellor began to be discussed hindenburg still hesitated but the demand for hitler's appointment grew more insistent the deutsche Führerbriefe, a private bulletin of the union of german industry published an article which disclosed the plans of the dominant capitalist groups under the title the social reconsolidation of capitalism it contained the following passages the problem of consolidating the capitalist regime in post-war germany is governed by the fact that the leading section that is the capitalist controlling industry has become too small to maintain its rule alone unless recourse is to be had to the extremely dangerous weapon of purely military force it is necessary for it to link itself with sections which do not belong to it from a social standpoint but which can render it the essential service of anchoring its rule among the people and thereby becoming its especial or last defender this last or outermost defender of bourgeois rule in the first period after the war was social democracy national socialism has to succeed social democracy in providing a mass support for capitalist rule in germany social democracy had a special qualification for this task which up to the present national socialism lacks thanks to its character as the original party of the workers social democracy in addition to its purely political force also had the much more valuable and permanent advantage of control over organized labor and by paralyzing its revolutionary energies chained it firmly to the capitalist state in the first period of reconsolidation of the capitalist regime after the war the working class was divided by the wages victories and social political measures through which the social democrats canalized the revolutionary movement the deflection of the revolution into social political measures corresponded with the transference of the struggle from the factories and the streets into parliament and cabinets that is with the transformation of the struggle from below into concessions from above from then onwards therefore the social democratic and trade union bureaucracy and with them also the section of the workers whom they led were closely tied to the capitalist state and participation in its administration at least so long as there was anything left of their post-war victories to defend by these means and so long as the workers followed their leadership this analysis leads to four important conclusions one the policy of the lesser evil is not merely tactical it is the political essence of social democracy two the cords which bind the trade union bureaucracy to the state method from above are more compelling than those which bind them to marxism and therefore to social democracy and this holds in relation to the bourgeois state which wants to draw in this bureaucracy three the links between the trade union bureaucracy and social democracy stand or fall from a political standpoint with parliamentarianism four the possibility of a liberal social policy for monopoly capitalism is conditioned by the existence of an automatic mechanism for the creation of divisions in the working class a capitalist regime which adopts a liberal social policy must not only be entirely parliamentary it must also be based on social democracy and must allow social democracy to have sufficient gains to record a capitalist regime which puts an end to these gains must also sacrifice parliamentarism and social democracy must create a substitute for social democracy and pass over to a social policy of constraint the process of this transition in which we are at the moment for the reason that the economic crisis has perforce blotted out the gains referred to has to pass through the acutely dangerous stage when with the wiping out of these gains the mechanism for the creation of divisions in the working class which depended on them also ceases to function the working class moves in the direction of communism and the capitalist rule approaches the emergency stage of military dictatorship 
the only safeguard from this acute stage is if the division and holding back of the working class which the former mechanism can no longer adequately maintain is carried out by other and more direct methods in this lies the positive opportunities and tasks of national socialism if national socialism succeeds in bringing the trade unions into a social policy of constraint as social democracy formerly succeeded in bringing them into a liberal policy then national socialism would become the bearer of one of the functions essential to the future of capitalist rule and must necessarily find its place in the state and social system the danger of a state capitalist or even socialist development which is often urged against such as incorporation of the trade unions under national socialist leadership will in effect be avoided precisely by these means there is no third course between a reconsolidation of capitalist rule and the communist revolution these paragraphs give the key to an understanding of the political situation the poppenschleicher period the poppenschleicher government was a further stage on the road to a hitler dictatorship its emergency decrees were models for hitler to follow the death penalty for high treason the death penalty for political acts of violence the establishment of emergency courts which imposed long sentences of imprisonment for minor offences but this government of big capitalists junkers and generals had no mass following the stahlhelm and the german national people's party were entirely inadequate poppin's much advertised economic program of september nineteen thirty two laid new burdens on the workers and gave new millions to the rich powerful anti-fascist demonstrations under the leadership of the communist party which was carrying on the only serious extra-parliamentary fight against fascism were broken up these reached their highest point in the berlin traffic strike of november nineteen thirty two which demonstrated the helplessness of the government in face of the determination of the workers at this period too national socialism was passing through a serious crisis in the november elections it lost almost two million votes the total vote for the communist party reached six millions at the end of november poppin fell and schleicher succeeded him early in december behind the scenes negotiations were carried on in one direction with the trade unions and also with a view to the drawing in of hitler no government can sit on bayonets schleicher hesitated did nothing and merely modified some of poppin's emergency decrees on january twenty second the national socialists staged a provocative demonstration in front of the communist party headquarters the karl liebknecht house general schleicher sent the whole police force to protect the nazis from the workers counter demonstrations the situation grew more and more acute general schleicher was considering the immediate proclamation of a military dictatorship poppen worked against schleicher's plan by negotiating with hitler and hugenberg at last the ruling groups of germany as the deutsche allgemeine zeitung put it tried a leap in the dark on january thirtieth nineteen thirty three hindenburg the candidate for the presidency who had been supported by the social democrats appointed hitler chancellor of the german reich end of chapter one brown book of the hitler terror by lord marley chapter two the reichstag is in flames months of intrigue in president hindenburg's palace had preceded the fall of general schleicher poppin's cranking up of industry had come to nothing the economic difficulties were increasing at every step schleicher stumbled up against obstacles which were created for him through the influence wielded by his predecessor poppen over president hindenburg from the moment of his own resignation poppen was working systematically for the overthrow of his opponent schleicher round hindenburg there was a number of more or less definite groups fighting each other but they were not fighting over personal antipathies or sympathies but over partial interests of sections of the ruling class the separate interests of politically influential groups 
general kurt von schleicher had risen from the reichswehr to the position of chancellor of the german reich the man who announced in his wireless broadcast following his appointment as chancellor that he was a social general had for fourteen years had his hand in the political pie whenever it was necessary to push the political development of the weimar republic one step further in the direction of reaction schleicher first appeared in november nineteen eighteen as the connecting link between the general staff of the army and the social democratic people's delegates in the beating down of the revolution the name of the young captain attached to the general staff appeared in those days linked with the names of hindenburg gruner and ebert he had considerable influence in the newly created reichswehr in october nineteen twenty three he put through the state of emergency when ebert handed over all executive power to the reichswehr general von seicht in order to meet the revolutionary menace which resulted from the misery of inflation since his youth schleicher had been in close communication with hindenburg and his son colonel oskar von hindenburg through his service in the third guards regiment and on the general staff schleicher succeeded in becoming a personal informant of hindenburg he had the strings in his hands when in march nineteen thirty hindenburg through the social democratic chancellor hermann and with him social democracy out of the government schleicher arranged brunings fall when the controlling groups of german capitalism were tending more and more towards the summoning of the national socialists to power schleicher himself took gruner's place as minister of the reichswehr even when papen was chancellor schleicher had already begun to fill the most important posts in the government apparatus with his own reliable men it was schleicher who turned the scale when papen's government was rocking and induced the majority of ministers to deliver the ultimatum that papen must go schleicher had to come more and more into the open but it was easier to manoeuvre on the smooth parquet floors of the government offices than to carry out a policy on the precipitous ground of the deepening economic crisis his short term of office ran out without a programme without a policy with nothing but vague hints at all kinds of plans his government was only to serve the most powerful capitalist groups of germany as a bridge to the fascist attack on the growing revolutionary movement among the workers in the group closely associated with hindenburg there was in the first place his son and personal adjutant colonel oskar von hindenburg his secretary of state was dr meissner who had filled the same position under ebert von papen too after his term as chancellor was in hindenburg's confidential circle papen had special support in the herrenklub a very influential association of politicians bankers big employers and big landowners high civil servants and officers papen had connections with the national socialists with hitler and goering with the stahlhelm and with the german nationalist party under hugenberg a few weeks after his fall from office papen met hitler in cologne at the house of schroeder the banker hitler who on november seventh had issued a manifesto calling for a fight to the last breath against papen in the banker's drawing-room agreed to the confidential proposals put forward by papen from cologne papen went to dortmund to conduct secret negotiations with springorum and other representatives of rhenish westphalian heavy industry on the question of the government schleicher too had close relations with the national socialists especially with their socialist wing led by gregor strasser schleicher attempted to exploit for his purposes the crisis in the national socialist party which was marked by the loss of two million voters in the elections of november sixth he had links with the social democratic leipart president of the german trade union general council with the christian trade unions and with the german nationalist commercial employees association he tried to create some kind of trade union mass basis for himself through these cross threads from the trade unions under social democratic leadership to the socialist wing of the national socialists at the same time schleicher presented the junkers with millions and millions for relief confidential agents carried on negotiations between these groups 
every day new coalitions were being formed and dissolved every day the situation changed newspapers changed their owners and their editors changed their political views a struggle raged for the control of the liberal papers of the ulstein and rudolf masse concerns the tägliche rundschau once stresemann's organ became schleicher's mouthpiece there was talk of money which had found its way to the paper from the well-filled chests of the reichswehr a new editor was appointed hans zehrer leader of the so-called action group and editor of its journal action which carried on a special sort of fascist propaganda with pseudo-revolutionary slogans papen tried to secure control of the berliner tageblatt the export industries the big shipping companies and the reich railways siemens had as their organ the deutsche allgemeine zeitung which they had been subsidizing for a considerable time during those weeks schleicher also had the backing of herr krupp von bohlen and halbach and privy councillor duisberg of the ig farben industrie the chemical combine these were the leading figures in the reich union of german industry Poppen had close connections with Springorum and Thyssen, Hugenberg, and the big agrarian interests. All groups were agreed that the National Socialists would have to be drawn in as the political prop for a government of capitalist dictatorship. But there were differences of opinion as to the form and extent of their participation in the government. The intrigues in Hindenburg's palace reflected these differences the east prussian relief scandal towards the end of january nineteen thirty three schleicher felt that his government was being more and more undermined by the intrigues of papen and the big agrarian interests associated with him he felt too that he was being pushed out of the circle of hindenburg's confidential advisers he therefore decided to have recourse to a defensive maneuver which he had been contemplating for some time and an immense mass of material appeared in the papers exposing the osthilfe corruption of the big agrarian junkers a commission of inquiry was set up by the reichstag the working masses were roused to fury the scandal threatened to involve even hindenburg himself as far back as the time when hermann muller was chancellor the junkers had received millions through the so-called osthilfe to put their bankrupt estates on to a paying basis the small peasants had got practically nothing out of it the big landowners pocketed the lion's share in the reichstag committee of inquiry it was now revealed at the end of january nineteen thirty three that in addition the rich landowners had received many hundreds of thousands of marks to which they were not entitled an immensely rich owner of six manorial estates and a personal friend and neighbor of hindenburg's had secured six hundred and twenty one thousand marks by giving false particulars two counts took seven hundred thousand marks in this way a certain landowner who had ruined his property on gambling wine and women secured two hundred and eighty one thousand marks two controllers of offices through which the osthilfe was distributed paid off their own debts and pocketed tens of thousands in addition a certain lord of the manor transferred his livestock to his wife in order to secure a hundred and fifty four thousand marks of the osthilfe day by day new names appeared in the list of those who were involved in the osthilfe scandal including neighbors of hindenburg's estate people who had the run of his house there was a great uneasiness in the hindenburg family for some of the junkers involved in the scandal were among those who had organized the presentation of the neudeck estate to hindenburg on his eightieth birthday no gift tax had been paid on this gift and the estate had been registered not in hindenburg's name but in that of his son so that the state was also robbed of the future succession duty the junkers and industrial magnates had twice collected funds for repairs and equipment for the neudeck property and a third time for the purpose of putting it on a paying basis the mud of the osthilfe scandal spattered the walls of the president's palace the junkers decided schleicher must go 
as they had decided before that Brüning must go. Hitler becomes Chancellor. On the morning of January 28th, the Schleicher government resigned, when Hindenburg refused to give authority for the dissolution of the Reichstag. Papen was instructed by Hindenburg to negotiate with Hitler for the formation of a government of national concentration. Two days of unparalleled tension followed. The Communist Party broadcast leaflets calling for a general strike against the imminent Hitler dictatorship. Schleicher negotiated with Leipart. The struggle behind the scenes grew more acute. On the night of January 29th to 30th, Schleicher was toying with the idea of the immediate proclamation of a military dictatorship and the march of the Potsdam garrison on Berlin. It seemed that a critical situation might develop at any moment. Then Hindenburg decided to appoint Hitler Chancellor on conditions, and so it came about that the hitler papen hugenberg government was formed on the morning of January 30th, 1933. In June 1932, the papen schleicher government had depended on National Socialist toleration. Goebbels later charged the representatives of the Herrenklub with having adroitly clambered to power over the broad backs of the Nazis. In November 1932, the leader of the National Socialist fraction in the Prussian Diet, Wilhelm Kuba, declared that the National Socialists would never march with the battle cry of with Hugenberg for the stock exchange and capital. But during the following months, Papen had been preparing the National Socialists to throw overboard their thundering declamations as superfluous ballast when Hindenburg gave them the call. The chancellorship fell into Hitler's lap, but not as the fruit of some heroic struggle. January 30th was not the culmination of a national revolution which had conquered power by a bold attack. Adolf Hitler was given the post of chancellor when the leading sections of the ruling class wanted not only to strengthen their power against the working class, but also to smother the smell of the Osthilfe scandal. On the evening of January 30th, the stormtroopers and the Stahlhelm marched with flaming torches along the Wilhelmstrasse, cheering Hindenburg and Hitler. The stormtroop men and the Stahlhelmers knew nothing of what had been going on behind the scenes, and when they acclaimed the Day of National Awakening, they did not know that corruption and the lust for profit were its godparents. The Wave of Resistance Rises on january thirtieth nineteen thirty three the communist party made an official proposal to the executive of the social democratic party and to the general council of the trade unions under social democratic leadership and also the christian trade unions that they should jointly organize a general strike for the overthrow of the hitler government social democracy and the trade unions answered hitler has come to power legally it was necessary to wait they said until he violated legality no fight should be put up now the general attitude of the social democratic press was that hitler would soon be finished with considerable sections of the german workers accepted these statements the communist party was unable as yet to bring the majority of the working class into action the hastily formed Hitler government would have been unable to cope with the united assault of the working class in those first days of February. The Nazi stormtroops had just been passing through a severe crisis, and in some places had lost half their membership. The police apparatus could not yet be relied upon by the new government. It would also have had difficulties with Schleicher's Reichswehr. But the refusal of the general strike gave the Hitler government the time it needed. Nevertheless, the resistance of the workers was growing in Berlin, in Hamburg, in the Ruhr, in the Lower Rhine area, in central Germany, and in all parts of the Reich. The Hitler dictatorship was opposed by a working class whose fighting strength was as yet unbroken. On January 22nd, they had refused to allow themselves to be provoked. 
now a wide movement was developing for united action against the raging fascist terror social democratic christian and communist workers united to defend newspaper and trade union buildings hitler could prohibit papers refuse to allow demonstrations and send his storm troops into the working-class quarters but the working-class answer was the rise of a wide anti-fascist movement in which all sections were united the need for a provocative act hitler had held power for some weeks but the situation was far from favorable the new cabinet had dissolved the reichstag and ordered new elections papen's terrorist decrees were again brought into force in sharpened form and the osthilfe scandal was buried in a secret commission hitler proclaimed on the wireless his non-existent four years plan but the millions of his voters who were looking forward to german socialism could not be put off merely with a couple of emergency decrees and vague promises at the end of january hitler had been compelled to enter the government on the restricting conditions imposed by hindenburg there were many reasons why he was ready to compromise the discontent among his members and supporters crisis and numerous resignations from the national socialist party besides the enormous debts of the party in bourgeois circles a number of former nazi voters had already begun to show a tendency towards the german nationalists on november sixth nineteen thirty two the communists had won eleven seats in the reichstag while hitler had lost thirty-five in the new government there were three national socialist ministers opposed by eight representatives of the german nationalists and of the stahlhelm there could be no change in the cabinet without hindenburg's consent in view of the growing anti-fascist feeling among the workers hitler's election prospects were not good hugenberg and the german nationalists held all the economic posts of vantage in the cabinet and masses of the people were beginning to realize that hitler was carrying out the policy of the worst firebrands among the capitalists the disillusionment of the masses would show itself in an increased communist vote on march fifth it had become an imperative necessity for the national socialist leaders to change the situation by an act of provocation planned on a grandiose scale then the elections could be carried out while the pogrom feeling against the communists and social democrats was at its height at the same time the position of the national socialists within the cabinet could be strengthened goebbels provided the plans for the most outrageous of all the acts of provocation which a ruling class has ever used against the insurgent working class goering president of the reichstag and commander of the prussian police was responsible for the exact fulfillment of the plan the original plans of the national socialist leaders to bring all storm troopers to berlin for the night of march fifth to sixth had been shattered by the threat of their allies to bring out the reichswehr against them but the new plan of provocation provided the means to satisfy the national socialist demand for complete governmental power and also to prepare the way for an unrestrained nazi terror the national socialist leaders moved into action the german nationalist police president of berlin dr melker was transferred to magdeburg and his place in berlin was filled by the national socialist retired admiral von levetzow on february twenty fourth the karl liebknecht house the headquarters of the german communist party was once again searched by the police although the karl liebknecht house had already been in the possession of the police for some weeks and was only left by the police after a thorough search which produced no results now suddenly seriously incriminating material was found the day before the reichstag fire gigantic headlines in the whole bourgeois press told readers of the secrets of karl liebknecht house of subterranean passages treasonable material and plans for a bolshevistic revolution 
the press also reported an alleged communist bomb outrage on the railway in east prussia this outrage was never mentioned again on january twenty fifth there was a small fire in the berliner schloss which was announced sensationally as a communist act in this way public opinion was carefully prepared from paper to paper from day to day for the great coup the communist party received reliable reports that the government had planned an act of provocation the deputy wilhelm pieck spoke of it in the sportpalast in berlin he mentioned a nazi plan for a faked attempt to assassinate hitler or some other act of provocation which was to take place some days before the election and lead to the prohibition of the communist party the communist fraction in the reichstag made a similar statement at a conference of foreign press representatives the hitler press following instructions raised the campaign against the revolutionary workers to boiling point everyone who was following the political situation realized that a crisis was imminent everyone felt that there was something in the air then on the night of february twenty seventh to twenty eighth all german wireless stations broadcast the message the reichstag is in flames end of chapter two brown book of the hitler terror by lord marley chapter three van der lubbe the tool marinus van der lubbe was born in leiden on january thirteenth nineteen hundred and nine his father owned a small shop and also traded his wares through the neighboring villages at the age of sixteen after a short period as assistant in a shop marinus van der lubbe became a worker in the building trade which he had to leave after an accident which permanently injured his eyesight shortly before this he joined the leiden branch of the young communist league he was always ambitious and seeking prominence and in january nineteen twenty nine he resigned from the young communist league because he was not appointed leader of the pioneers organization he rejoined but in december nineteen twenty nine again resigned owing to a conflict with the young communist league in connection with leaflets which he wrote and distributed over his own signature he joined the league again in nineteen thirty but was distrusted and did not take any active part in april nineteen thirty one the question of his expulsion was raised and van der lubbe immediately resigned from that date he had no connection whatever with the young communist league or communist party but attacked the communists whenever he had the opportunity van der lubbe's life marinus van der lubbe was five months in the leiden hospital after his accident he could not go back to his trade and tried to earn his living in various ways in the winter of nineteen twenty seven to twenty eight he worked as a temporary waiter in the station restaurant in leiden and in the summer of nineteen twenty eight he was a porter in the van holland hotel at nordweg after that he did a little trading in potatoes on his own account and then worked on a ferry transporting building materials between nordweg and sassenheim in the summer of nineteen thirty he went to calais and on his return stated that he had worked as an excavator and had also made some attempts to swim the channel we have made detailed inquiries in calais but can find no evidence that he ever made such an attempt but the fact that he boasted of this on his return to leiden is characteristic of his outlook enquiries into his life in leiden have definitely established the fact that he was homosexual this is of great importance for his later history his tour through europe together with a friend of his holverda he planned a workers sports and study tour through europe and had cards printed with his and holverda's photographs and the statement in four languages that they were undertaking a tour through europe and the soviet union before they left there was a quarrel and holverda remained in leiden actually the postcards say that the tour was to begin on april fourteenth nineteen thirty one we have in our possession one of these cards dated from potsdam april fourteenth nineteen thirty one 
not long after van der lubbe was back in leyden he makes dr bell's acquaintance when van der lubbe returned from his first short visit to germany he told his friends of a gentleman who had taken him on a long tour in his car we do not know whether lubbe's story was true or whether he invented the gentleman from leipzig but we do know that on that first visit to germany van der lubbe made the acquaintance of a man who played a decisive part in lubbe's future life in april or may nineteen thirty one lubbe met dr bell we know this from a friend of dr bell's he writes if i remember rightly it was in may nineteen thirty one that bell told me he had made the acquaintance of a young dutch worker who had made a very good impression on him he must have met him when he was out in his car near berlin or potsdam they met a hiker on the way and gave him a lift in the car he was a young dutch workman this young dutchman later visited bell in munich bell called him renus or renus he had frequent meetings with him marinus van der lubbe visits munich in september nineteen thirty one van der lubbe again started out for germany he still had the postcards which he had had printed for his tour through europe and sold them on his way at the frontier village of gronau in westphalia in september nineteen thirty one he was arrested for selling cards in the street without a license the court in munster imposed a small fine at bacharach on the rhine van der lubbe got into conversation with a motorcyclist he was also a dutchman plucht a railway engine driver whose home was in the hague blumfontein strat twenty four plucht gave lubbe a lift in his side-car and they put up overnight in rotenburg plucht at the hotel and lubbe at a youth hostel plucht told our investigator of the conversation he had had with van der lubbe who in reply to the question what he was doing in germany said that he was looking for work plucht then asked van der lubbe whether he would not be much more likely to find work in holland than in germany to which lubbe replied with great assurance that he would get work in germany plucht recalls that he was surprised at van der lubbe's tone of assurance from rotenburg the two went on to munich parting on the outskirts of the town we know that van der lubbe visited dr bell in munich we do not know exactly how long he stayed there but it must have been some days as on his return to leyden he gave his friends a detailed and accurate description of the town he talked not only of the town but also of the grand time he had had there and of the many gentlemen whose acquaintance he had made there the most important acquaintance made by van der lubbe in munich was captain Ruhm at that time dr bell was still adviser in foreign politics to hitler's chief of staff Rühm. he was a close friend of Rühm's, so close in fact that Rühm gave him the confidential task of establishing connections with the reichsbanner commander major meyer Rühm then felt that he was being persecuted by the national socialist murder gang and he tried to get protection from meyer through the intermediary dr bell all these facts were established in court in october nineteen thirty two when captain Rühm brought an action against the social democratic journal munchener post bell was not only adviser in foreign politics to Rühm; he was also his confidant in personal matters the munchener post and other papers in nineteen thirty two published letters from Rühm to young men from which it is clear that Rühm was homosexual dr bell knew many of room's relations with young men for the reason that he himself procured many of them for room bell who had intimate knowledge of the situation within the national socialist party kept a list of these young men intending to use it as a weapon against room if any conflict developed with him van der lubbe's name was on this list a voyage of adventure after leaving munich van der lubbe did actually carry out part of his tour through europe we are in possession of a postcard written by him from krakow 
our investigator in holland saw a letter which he had written from budapest and a card from belgrade when van der lubbe returned to leyden in january or february nineteen thirty two he had a great deal to tell his friends about his tour one of these tales deserves to be told van der lubbe said that he had been in poland and had reached the frontier of the soviet union a mighty river he said divides poland from the soviet union he had tried to swim this river but was driven back by shots from the polish frontier guards he was then arrested and kept a few days in a prison from which he could see the soviet frontier across the river then he was sent about his business van der lubbe's friends were greatly astonished when our investigator informed them that there was no mighty river between poland and the soviet union this tale again is characteristic of van der lubbe's boastfulness and desire for notoriety the cards and letters which van der lubbe had written to his friends in leyden are proof that at the end of nineteen thirty one and the beginning of nineteen thirty two he was in several towns in hungary poland and yugoslavia it is probable that he was not alone but in the company of some rich man on his return to leyden he said that a gentleman in budapest had given him new shoes that the dutch consul in yugoslavia had given him his fare back and other improbable things which suggest that he actually travelled with some rich friend dr bell introduced luba not only to captain room but to other national socialists as well from then on he was in regular communication with national socialist circles his friends in leyden are unanimous in their statements that luba received many letters from germany and that he always tried to conceal these letters from his friends a guest of the nazis van der lubbe's return to leyden in january or february nineteen thirty two was unexpectedly prompt he sent a postcard from berlin and arrived at leyden at the same time as the card he must therefore have travelled by train or by car the question of where the money came from remains open after an interval of about two months van der lubbe went on a third visit to germany but before that he achieved a little notoriety in leyden smashing some windows at the office of the relief organization which had refused to increase his allowance he was sentenced to three months imprisonment for this before going to prison however he managed to pay another visit to germany we know that he went to berlin and saxony on june first and second he stayed the night at zernowitz where he was seen in company with the local councillor sommer and also schumann who owned a vegetable garden both are national socialists after the reichstag fire councillor sommer reported van der lubbe's visit in june nineteen thirty two to the mayor of brockwitz this fact was recorded in a protocol which was forwarded to the saxon ministry of the interior which notified frick reich minister of the interior of these facts the facts became public as a result of an interpolation in the saxon diet by a social democratic deputy they have not been denied by anyone the papers which reported this interpolation also reported that councillor sommer had disappeared a short time after he had made the report concerning van der lubbe's stay at zernowitz this statement too has not been contradicted after his stay in zernowitz van der lubbe must have remained in germany a few days longer on his return to holland he was arrested in utrecht on june twenty first nineteen thirty two he was nine days in prison in utrecht and was then moved to the prison at scravenhaga hague to carry out his three months sentence van der lubbe attacks the communist party van der lubbe was released from prison on october second nineteen thirty two he came from the hague to leyden and did not go out of the country again before the end of the year he paid a visit to his father at dordrecht and then went on to amsterdam and the hague in these towns he spoke at a number of meetings his speeches vigorously attacking the communist party 
we have definite evidence of this one document in our possession shows that van der lubbe spoke at a fascist meeting for the fascists a second document describes van der lubbe's attitude at a meeting of taxi drivers who were on strike at the hague at this meeting van der lubbe not only attacked the communists but tried to incite the taxi drivers to terrorist acts van der lubbe followed a consistent line since he finally left the communist party from nineteen twenty nine to nineteen thirty one he had been trying to find scope for his anarchist tendencies within the communist movement and when his connections with it were finally broken in april nineteen thirty one he turned to attacking the movement this attack became more and more vigorous at every meeting he addressed the arguments which he was using during the last quarter of nineteen thirty two were clearly influenced by national socialist propaganda lower middle class in origin and only temporarily in the ranks of the workers he had returned to the fold his last journey to germany in january nineteen thirty three van der lubbe was making preparations for another visit to germany before he left he had to have treatment for his eyes again at the leyden hospital and he was four weeks in hospital shortly before his departure for germany he visited frau van zeip in whose house he had lodged she told our investigator of her last talk with van der lubbe who told her that his passport had very nearly run out she asked him whether it was really necessary for him to go to germany and whether he would not do better to stay in leyden van der lubbe replied that she need not worry he had something important to do in germany he would only need his passport for this occasion and then it would not matter if it ran out in the middle of february marinus van der lubbe left leyden before his departure he had a new suit and new shoes the Vossische zeitung of march second reported that he spent the night at glindau near werder on february seventeenth and that he went on to berlin on february eighteenth in berlin he met the nazi friends whose acquaintance he had made through dr bell van der lubbe the tool on february twenty seventh van der lubbe was arrested in the burning reichstag the flames were the background of the hoax in which van der lubbe for a few hours played the leading role then he passed from the stage the searchlights of truth have pierced the fog of deception and mercilessly shone up goering and goebbels who made use of van der lubbe as their tool why did the murderer highness and his associates who had been entrusted by goering and goebbels with the technical carrying out of the incendiary act choose van der lubbe as the tool van der lubbe had been in the communist movement in holland up to april nineteen thirty one the men who were carrying out the orders issued by goering and goebbels believed that this was enough to make it possible to put the guilt for the incendiary act in the reichstag on to the shoulders of the communists van der lubbe's homosexual connections with national socialist leaders and his material dependence on them made him obedient and willing to carry out the incendiary's part van der lubbe's dutch nationality was a further advantage it enabled goering and goebbels to represent the burning of the reichstag as an international plot for all these reasons van der lubbe was chosen as the tool to carry out the incendiary act the leading figures in the plot were dr goebbels concocted the plot for setting fire to the reichstag also the fanatical lies and provocation captain goering a drug fiend directed operations edmund heines a murderer was entrusted with the leadership of the incendiary group marinus van der lubbe the tool when the chicago police in eighteen eighty six staged a bomb explosion carried out by paid provocators an explosion which killed a large number of the police it was seven years before the act of provocation was established the tools had been well chosen after the burning of the reichstag 
it took only three days to make the whole world certain that the national socialists had set fire to the reichstag the tool of van der lubbe was too ill chosen End of chapter three brown book of hitler terror by lord marley chapter four the real incendiaries the german reichstag the foundation stone of the german reichstag was laid by wilhelm i on june 9, 1884 the building was completed in december 1894 the german reichstag building is in the konigsplatz opposite the bismarck memorial the east front faces the friedrich eberstrasse the south front overlooks the Teegarten, across the Simonstrasse, while the north front overlooks the Spree. The building consists of cellars, a ground floor, a main floor, an intermediate floor, and two upper floors. The front of the building is 137 meters long. It is crowned by a large dome, round which are four smaller cupolas. The central feature of the main floor is the session hall, in which the Reichstag met. The walls of the chamber are paneled in wood, except for the side behind the president's chair, which is stone. The dais, the tribunes, and the deputy seats are of wood. The seats are arranged in the form of an amphitheater in seven sections, divided by narrow, thickly carpeted gangways. There is a corridor running round the hall, which leads into the lobby. The corridors and the hall are furnished with carpets, upholstered seats, and heavy curtains. In the main floor there are also numerous rooms and halls, with windows looking out over the streets. The reading room, the archives, and the library are partly on the main floor and partly in the intermediate floor. The heating and ventilating apparatus is in the cellars. A small flight of stairs leads from the cellar to a subterranean passage which leads out under the portico of the reichstag and under the friedrich eberstrasse a door shuts off this subterranean passage from the stairs and also from the other rooms containing the ventilation apparatus hot pipes run along the walls of the passage the main entrance of the reichstag opens on the konigsplatz but this entrance is only used on special occasions how does a visitor get access to the reichstag in all its reports on the burning of the Reichstag, the Hitler government gave no indication of how the incendiaries got into the Reichstag. They replied on the fact that practically no German or foreigner knows the formalities which have to be gone through in order to enter the Reichstag. The following shows what a visitor to the Reichstag has to do to get in. 1. Non-members and visitors can only enter the Reichstag through door 2 or door 5. Door 2 opens on to the Simonstrasse, door 5 on to the Reichstagschufer. 2. Anyone entering the Reichstag through door 5 comes into a lobby, across which there is a rope barrier. The officials stand behind this barrier. 3. Each visitor has to apply to one of the officials. It is impossible to get into the Reichstag without giving particulars to an official. Each visitor has to fill in a printed card with the name of the visitor, the name of the member whom he wishes to see, and the reason for the visit. 4. This card is then taken by a messenger to the member concerned. The member is asked whether he is willing to see the visitor. 5. While the messenger is looking for the member, the visitor has to wait in the waiting room. He is all the time under observation by the officials on duty. 6. If the member agrees to see the visitor, the latter is then brought to him by a messenger. The messenger conducts the visitor personally to the member and only leaves when the visitor is with the member. 7. All visitors are listed in a special register, which is made up from the cards already mentioned. The Fire in the Reichstag between 9 and 9.15 in the evening of February 27, 1933, fire broke out in the Reichstag building. The first public announcement of the burning of the Reichstag was made that evening by wireless. The Berlin Broadcasting Station also announced that the incendiary was a Dutch communist named van der Lubbe. 
He was said to have made a full confession, and to have been caught in the building, dressed only in a pair of trousers, when the police officials came to the Reichstag. It was stated that he had a Dutch passport on him, and also a membership book of the Dutch Communist Party. Early the following morning, the official Presidienste circulated the following account of the fire. On Monday evening, fire broke out in the German Reichstag. The Reich Commissioner for the Prussian Ministry of the Interior, Minister Goering, immediately on his arrival took over the direction of all operations. As soon as the fire became known, Chancellor Adolf Hitler and Vice-Chancellor von Palpen also came to the Reichstag. This is undoubtedly the most serious act of incendiarism as yet experienced in Germany. The police investigation has shown that the fire was started at a number of points all over the Reichstag building, from the cellar to the dome. Tar and torches were used, these being put in leather chairs and among the documents of the Reichstag. Also, near doors, curtains, wood paneling, and at other easily inflammable spots. A police official saw persons with burning torches in the dark building. He fired at once. One of the criminals was caught. This is the 24-year-old bricklayer van der Lubbe of Leiden in Holland, who had on him a Dutch passport, which was in order, and stated that he was a member of the Dutch Communist Party. The central portion of the Reichstag has been completely burnt out. The sessions chamber with the tribunes and corridors have been destroyed. The damage runs into millions. This act of incendiarism is the most monstrous act of terrorism so far carried out by Bolshevism in Germany. Among the hundred centners of material which the police discovered in the search of the Karl Leibnacht house, there were instructions for the carrying through of the communist terror on the Bolshevist model. According to these instructions, government buildings, museums, mansions, and essential plant were to be burnt down. The directions also state that in disturbances and conflicts with the police, women and children should be sent in front of the terrorist groups, where possible the wives of the children of police officials. The systematic carrying through of the Bolshevist revolution has been checked by the discovery of this material. In spite of this, the burning of the Reichstag was to be the signal for a bloody insurrection and civil war. Plans had been prepared for looting on a large scale in Berlin at 4 a.m. on Tuesday. It has been ascertained that today was to have seen throughout Germany terrorist acts against individual persons, against private property, and against the life and limb of the peaceful population, and also the beginning of general civil war. The Reich Commissioner of the Prussian Ministry of the Interior, Minister Goering, has taken the strongest measures to meet this terrible danger. He will maintain the authority of the state in all circumstances, and with all the means at his disposal. It can be stated that the first attack of the criminal forces has been beaten back for the moment. Already on Monday evening, all public buildings and vital industries were placed under police protection to ensure public security. Special police cars are passing continuously through the parts of town, which are chiefly threatened. The whole of the police and criminal police in Prussia has immediately been put in a state of readiness. The auxiliary police have been called up. Orders have been issued for the arrest of two leading communist members of the Reichstag on a charge of grave suspicion. The other Communist Party members of the Reichstag and officials have been put under protective arrest. Communist papers, periodicals, leaflets and posters have been prohibited throughout Prussia for four weeks. All social democratic newspapers have been prohibited for 14 days, as the Reichstag incendiary in his confession admitted that he had connections with the Social Democratic Party. Through this confession, the United Communist Social Democratic Front has become a palpable fact. This situation demands of the authorities responsible for the security in Prussia decisive action to fulfill their duty of maintaining the authority of the state in this moment of danger. The latest events have fully established the necessity of the special measures which had already been introduced. Auxiliary police, authority to the police to shoot, etc., these measures equip the state power to nip in the bud any further attack on the peace of Germany, and thereby on the peace of Europe.
Minister Goering appeals for the strictest discipline from the German nation in this grave hour. He expects the unwavering support of the population, for whose security and safety he answers with his own person. The First Press Announcements On the morning of February 28th, millions of people read the accounts of the burning of the Reichstag in their papers. The front pages shouted in great letters, The German Reichstag in flames. This event overshadowed all other news. In London, Paris, New York, Amsterdam, Prague, and Vienna, the reader was furnished with long accounts of the burning of the Reichstag building. The reporters unanimously stated that the hall had been completely burnt out, including the dome above it, the glass roof being shattered, and the struts bent. The corridors round the Reichstag chamber and the lobby were also destroyed. The press of the world, however, contained a number of divergent statements with regard to the further details. The Prager Tagblatt of February 28th stated that the fire was noticed at about 10 o'clock in the evening. The Temps of March 1st stated that the fire had been discovered at 9.15 p.m. The London Times of February 28th reported that the fire had broken out at 9 p.m. The reports in the papers also gave different accounts of how the fire had been discovered. The Hugenberg News Agency, Telegraphen Union, stated in an announcement which was printed by a section of the press in the morning edition of February 28th. It has been established beyond question that the fire was developed into a conflagration with the aid of torches placed at various points. A police official noticed through one of the windows a man carrying torches moving stealthily and immediately fired at him. The Temps of March 1st states, on the other hand, that the first warning of the fire was given by an employee of the Engineering Institute opposite the Reichstag. The number of points at which the fire started is estimated differently by the various papers. The Prager Tageblatt of February 28th speaks of 20 points, well, the Berlin correspondent of The Times states in the issue of February 28th that the police officers on duty told him that the fire had started in four or five places. The Chicago Tribune reports ten points. The rapidity with which the fire spread shows conclusively that it was started at a number of points. The pogrom against the left begins. The fire in the Reichstag was still burning when police cars and motorcyclists and the Nazi storm detachments were already on their way. The first arrest was made immediately after midnight. By the morning, police headquarters were filled with hundreds of arrested persons who sat on long benches in the corridors. Communists, socialists, pacifists, writers, doctors, and lawyers had been torn from their beds in the night and taken to police headquarters. Many of them were already asleep when the wireless announcement of the fire was circulated. The noon papers gave the first names of the arrested persons. Among them were writers Ludwig Wren, Egon Irwin Kisch, Eric Baron, Karl von Ozeitsky, and Otto Lehmann Rusbilt, the doctors Bonheim, Schminke, and Hoden, the lawyers Appel, Litten, Barbach, and Felix Hall the communist members of the Reichstag Walter Stecker, Ernest Schneider, Fritz Emmerich, Ottoman Getschke, and Willy Kaspar. The Reichstag member Torgler, who was accused of being jointly responsible for the burning of the Reichstag, on the morning of February 28th, went to police headquarters to make a protest against the charge. He was arrested. The communist and social democratic press did not appear on the morning of February 28th. The printing works of the Vorwarts and of the papers Berlin M. Morgan and Welt M. Abend were occupied during the night of the 27th, and the copies of the morning edition, which had already been run off, were confiscated. The printing works of the Rote Fawn, which are in the Karl Leibnacht house, had been occupied by the police some days previously and the Rote Fawn had already been prohibited before the burning of the Reichstag. Emergency Decrees The fire in the Reichstag was put out during the night. 
Within a few hours, the president of the Reichstag signed a decree entitled Emergency Decree for the Protection of the Nation and the State. It contained the following clauses. In virtue of Article 48 of the Constitution of the Reich, and as it measures of defense against communist acts of violence which endanger the state, it is decreed. 1. Articles 114, 115, 117, 118, 123, 124, and 153 of the Constitution of the German Reich are suspended until further notice. Consequently, restrictions on personal freedom and on the right of free expression of opinion, including the freedom of the press and of the right of association and assembly, are permissible beyond the limit laid down in these articles of the Constitution. In addition, the privacy of correspondence of the post, telegraph, and telephone is suspended, and house searchings and the confiscation or restriction on the rights of property are permissible. 4. Any person who opposes any orders issued by the state authorities or officials authorized by them for the enforcement of this decree, or orders issued by the Reich government in accordance with Section 2, or who supports or incites to such opposition, is liable to imprisonment for not less than one month, or to a fine from 150 to 15,000 Reichsmarks, unless a heavier penalty is imposed under existing legislation. Any person whose opposition endangers life is liable to not less than six months hard labor in extenuating circumstances, and if the opposition has fatal results to the death penalty, or in extenuating circumstances to not less than two years penal servitude. Any person who incites to opposition to the public danger is liable to hard labor, or in extenuating circumstances to imprisonment, for not less than three months. 5. The death penalty is substituted for penal servitude for life, where this is laid down under the criminal code, namely under sections 81, high treason, 229, poisoning, 307, arson. 311, causing explosions, 312, causing floods, 315, damage to railways, 324, attempts to poison groups of persons. The following crimes are punishable with death or unless heavier penalties are imposed by previous legislation, with penal servitude for life or up to 15 years. 1. Any attempt to murder the President or Ministers or Commissioners, whether of the Reich or of the States of the Reich, or instigation to such murder, or agreement or conspiracy with others aiming at such murder. In cases under Section 115 of the Criminal Code, Serious Rioting, or Sections 125, Serious Breaches of the Peace, any act involving the use of arms or conscious and deliberate cooperation with armed persons. 3. Any act to deprive any person of his or her liberty, with a view of using him or her as a hostage in political conflicts. The Campaign Special editions of the papers, ministerial speeches, wireless announcements and posters everywhere announced. The Communists have set fire to the Reichstag insurrection and civil war were to follow. The communists intended to violate your wives and murder your children. The communists intended to poison the water in the wells and the food in the restaurants and canteens. Every hour crimes of the communists were hammered into the readers of the German papers and those who listened to the wireless. The campaign was developed on a systematic plan. The press was crammed with atrocity stories of what the communists had intended. The Vosich Zeitung of March 1st gave information which it had from government sources. The government is of the opinion that the situation is such that a danger to the state and to the nation existed and still exists. The material from the Karl Leibnacht House is now being examined by the government's legal advisers. 
Official reports state that this material contains proof that terrorist acts had been systematically prepared by the Communists on a scale that would place the nation and the state in the greatest danger. Among the confiscated Communist material, definite plans have been found for the seizure of hostages, especially the wives and children of particular individuals, plans for incendiary acts on public buildings, directions for terrorist groups who were to be placed at certain points in the uniform of the police. Storm Detachments and Stolhelm There is, it is declared, well-founded suspicion that the Communist activities are to be continued and that the central leadership of their operations will, if necessary, be removed from Berlin. There is also good cause to believe that, as in Karl Leibnacht House, there are subterranean cellars and passages at other points, through which the Communists escape at the moment of danger. In this connection, it is emphasized that the necessary steps have been taken at the German frontiers to make the flight of suspected persons into foreign countries impossible. In connection with the act of incendiarism in the Reichstag, it is stated that irrefutable proof exists that the chairman of the communist section in the Reichstag, Deputy Torgler, had been for some hours in the Reichstag building with the incendiary, and that he had also been with others who had been concerned in the crime. It is added that the other criminals may have been able to escape through the subterranean passages, which, in connection with the heating arrangement of the Reichstag, link the Reichstag building itself with the building occupied by the president of the Reichstag. In this connection, reference is made to the arrest of two persons who telephoned from the Reichstag building, asserting that the president of the Reichstag, Goering, was the instigator of the incendiary act, and stress is laid on the fact that the people concerned were connected with the Social Democratic Party and press. The authorities state that the fight against communism will now be conducted with extreme severity. Anyone who works with the communists, or regarding whom there are sufficient grounds to suspect that he is working with them, will be rigorously dealt with as the communists themselves. The government statements also make it clear that the elections will be held under all circumstances. Quote, it is to be noted that the decrees for the protection of the nation and the state, and the decree which punishes high treason more severely than hitherto, are supplementary to each other. The authorities state that the clauses of the decree for the protection of the nation and the state, which are particularly directed against communism, were necessary because of the documents found in Karl Leibnacht House. Thus, for example, the increased severity of the punishments laid down in the criminal code for the administering of poison and poisoning to the common danger has been due to the fact that the communists intended to carry out acts of poisoning on a large scale, including the poisoning of food and restaurants frequented by politicians who were their enemies. Minister Goering spoke on the wireless on March 1st, and this was relayed from all German stations. According to the unanimous reports published in the press, Goering made the following statements in his speech. The communists are using leaflets and handbills to rally workers capable of using arms for red mass self-defense. This pretext was to enable the masses of the revolutionary communists to be mobilized and to bring them into battle against the nation and the state. I should like to state openly that we are not carrying on a defensive fight, but that we have passed to the offensive along the whole front. It will be my principal task to extirpate communism from our people. For that reason, we have also mobilized those forces of national Germany, whose main task it must be to overcome communism. On February 15th, it was ascertained that the Communist Party, was engaged in organizing terrorist troops in units up to 200 men. These groups were to dress in storm detachment uniforms and then to carry out attacks on motor cars, stores, shops, etc. Similar attacks were to be carried out on Allied associations, such as the Stahlhelm and the National Parties. By these means, it was hoped to break the unity of the national movement. Terrorist troops in the uniform of the Stahlhelm were also to carry out similar activities. In cases of arrest, 
false particulars were to be given. In addition, numerous forged orders of the Storm Detachment and Stahlhelm leaders were found in which the Storm Detachment were directed secretly to hold themselves in readiness for the night of March 6th in order to occupy Berlin, and they were to be prepared to use their arms and beat down all resistance, etc. These forged orders were then to be circulated to the authorities and among the citizens in order to create the fear of a national socialist push and to throw the workers into the necessary state of confusion. There were also forged police orders instructing the police to hand over armored cars. At a meeting of the Communist Party executive on February 18th, there was discussion of what was expressly called a pact of attack of the united proletariat against the bourgeoisie and against the fascist state on the same day the leader of a group which was intended to blow up bridges who had fallen under suspicion owing to a considerable quantity of explosives being missing was arrested a short time afterwards an organization of the communist party was discovered which was to work with poison a poison plan was discovered in Cologne, which made it clear that the poison was to be used in the food of the storm detachments and of the Stahlhelms. A further document proves that not only the wives and children of leading individuals were to be taken as hostages, but also the wives and children of police officials who were to be put in front of demonstrations as a living wall of defense. The leadership of this murder organization was in the hands of the communist leader, Munzenberg. On February 22nd, the Central Committee issued the slogan of the arming of the working class. The instructions state, in the application of the terror, every means and every weapon must be employed. Mass strikes were organized. Solidarity strikes were to be prepared. All persons able to use arms were to report and all members were to prepare themselves for illegality. Goering then spoke of an organization plan for the armed insurrection, entitled The Art of Armed Insurrection. He stated that this armed insurrection was the first phase of civil war. Instructions were said to be given in it for the use of small terrorist groups and for the starting of fires in the thousands and thousands of places. The aim of these activities was said to be to entice the police and the Reichswehr into the country, and then to start the insurrection in the unprotected towns. In making use of hostages, no humanitarian motives should be allowed to intervene. Goering's concluding words were, Let me tell the communists, my nerves have never given way up to now, and I feel strong enough to repay their criminal activities in kind. Who were the incendiaries? From the moment when the news was spread of the burning of the Reichstag, the question was raised throughout the press of the world. Who were the incendiaries? Most of the German papers adopted the statement of the Hitler government that the communists had set fire to the Reichstag. The whole of the foreign press, however, received the official information with considerable skepticism which soon developed into open ridicule of the official count of the temps of march first containing the following statement the official communique is obviously intended to rouse the population to fury against the left opposition there is no way of testing the police statements it can only be said that the burning of the reichstag comes very opportunely for the government election propaganda it serves as prelude to action not only against the communists, but also against the social democrats, and also serves the purpose of enabling the Nazi storm detachments and the Stahlhelm to come out as an armed force. In the same edition of the Temps, it is said that the democratic circles and circles of the left in Berlin are skeptical regarding the origin of the Reichstag fire. In the issue of the following day, the Temps further states, the arrest of van der Lubbe and his accomplices is not sufficient to lift the veil which covers the Reichstag fire. The London News Chronicle of March 1st declared, The suggestion that the German communists had any official connection with the affair is just nonsense. The London Evening Standard of March 1st, 1933 stated, It cannot be disputed that there are millions of people in Germany today 
who simply cannot and will not believe the extraordinary stories circulated officially about the Red Revolution, which has only just been averted. Nor is the official version of the setting alight of the Reichstag by a Dutch communist, implicitly believed by many people. These few examples of the many press reports suffice to show that no credence was given outside Germany to the official declarations of the Hitler government. The whole world outside Germany was and is convinced that the National Socialists set fire to the Reichstag. We will give one more quotation, which brings out the view of the outside world with particular clarity. The leading article in the Daily Telegraph of March 2nd contains the following. Van der Lubbe's examination will perhaps explain how he smuggled in his supplies of benzene, and whether he worked alone or as one of the ten, who are reported by the Nazis to have had a hand in the job. As to this, it may well be asked, first, where are the nine others? And secondly, where were the lynx-eyed Reichstag watchmen? Within three days of the Reichstag fire, the Hitler government was confronted with the fact that no one abroad gave any credence to its reports. Who benefited from the Reichstag fire? Every criminal investigator first puts the question, who derived any advantage from the crime? And this question must be put in connection with the Reichstag fire. The Hitler government asserted in its official report of February 28th that the Reichstag fire had been organized by communists, and that it was to have been the signal for a bloody insurrection and civil war. But is there, apart from the government's assertion, a single shred of evidence that on the night of February 27th the Communist Party intended to resort to bloody insurrection? The Communist Party's tactics are definitely at variance with such a suggestion. On March 25, 1933, the German Communist Party issued a statement on the burning of the Reichstag, which contains the following. Anyone who has even the slightest knowledge of communism, of the teaching of Marx and Lenin, of the decisions of the Communist International, and of the German Communist Party, knows that the methods of individual terror, arson, acts of sabotage, and so forth, do not belong to the tactical methods of the communist movement. The Communist Party has always stated that its aim was carrying through of the proletarian revolution. In order to achieve this aim, the party uses the tactics of revolutionary mass struggle, the winning of the masses for the communist movement, through agitation and propaganda, and above all, through the organizations of the daily struggle for the immediate interest of the workers. These are the tactics through which the communist movement, on the basis of Marxist and Leninist principles, realizes its aim in every country. It is obvious that the Reichstag fire could have no imaginable sense or purpose for the communist movement. Could setting fire to the Reichstag bring any advantages to the communists? The German Communist Party had been increasing its influence steadily during the preceding years. In the presidential elections of March 1932, it secured 4,960,000 votes for its candidate, Ernst Thalmann. In the Reichstag elections of July 31, 1932, it secured, in round figures, 5,300,000 votes. In the elections of November 6, 1932, it reached 6 million votes. The Communist Party entered the campaign for the election of March 5, 1933, with exceedingly good prospects. The whole foreign press prophesied a great increase in the Communist vote. The dissatisfaction in the social democratic ranks was growing. Repeated acts of provocation by the Nazis the ejection of the social democratic ministers in prussia by an officer and three men the passivity of the trade union and party leaders all contributed to driving wide sections of former social democratic voters into supporting the communists there was equal dissatisfaction in the ranks of the national socialists in the november election of 1932 hitler had lost over two million votes the process of disintegration was developing. When Hitler came to power, 
many of his adherents expected a decisive change for the better. It did not come. There was a danger of still further secession into the ranks of the communists. The Hitler government included among the evidence of what the communists had had in mind the pamphlet, The Art of Insurrection. The Bayerisch Courier, the organ of the Catholic Bavarian People's Party, in its issue of March 3, 1933, referred to the fact that this pamphlet dated from 1923, and the pamphlet contains the following quotations from Lenin. One must make sure, first, that all the class forces hostile to us have fallen into complete enough confusion and are sufficiently at loggerheads with each other, have sufficiently weakened themselves in a struggle beyond their capacities to give us a chance of victory. Secondly, one must ensure that all the vacillating, wavering, unstable intermediate elements the petty bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeois democracy, in contradistinction to the bourgeoisie, have sufficiently exposed themselves in the eyes of the people, and have disgraced themselves through their material bankruptcy. Thirdly, one must have the feeling of the masses in favor of supporting the most determined, unselfishly resolute, revolutionary action against the bourgeoisie. Then, indeed, revolution is ripe. Then, indeed, if we have correctly gauged all the conditions briefly outlined above, and if we have chosen the moment rightly, our victory is assured. With the vanguard alone, victory is impossible. It would not only be foolish but criminal to throw the vanguard into the final struggle, so long as the whole class, the general mass, has not taken up a position either of direct support of the vanguard or at least of benevolent neutrality towards it. Had Goering even glanced at the pamphlet, he would not have made the mistake of citing it as evidence against the Communist Party. Hitler as Hugenberg's Prisoner On January 30, 1933, the so-called government of national concentration was formed with Hitler as Chancellor. The terms on which the Hindenburg appointed Hitler were extremely hard for the National Socialists. German Nationalist ministers had the absolute majority in the cabinet. The Vice-Chancellor, von Papen, was appointed Commissioner for Prussia, although in previous governments this post had been filled by the Reich Chancellor himself. The Ministry of the Reichswehr, which the National Socialists had claimed in the last stage of the struggle for power, was entrusted to General von Blomberg, a loyal supporter of Hindenburg. When the new cabinet took the oath on January 30th, Hitler had to give an express undertaking, in the presence of all the members of the cabinet, that he would not alter the composition of the government, whatever the result of the election might be. The three National Socialist ministers, Hitler, Frick, and Goering, took their places in a government of German nationalists who controlled all the economic ministries besides the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of the Reichswehr. According to the plans of the German nationalists, Hitler was to be their prisoner. He was received by Hindenburg only in the presence of von Papen. There was no precedent for such treatment to a chancellor. No change could be made in this situation by legal methods, the German nationalists were very pleased with themselves. The second leader in command of the Stahlhelm, Lieutenant Colonel Dusterberg, in an election meeting on February 12th, made known to the public the fact of Hitler's undertaking not to make any change in the cabinet. The men round Hitler, especially Goebbels and Goering, did all they could to free Hitler from the embrace of the German nationalists. Only a changed distribution of power within the government could damp down the growing dissatisfaction of many National Socialist electors. An attempt at a putsch was too dangerous. The Reichswehr and the Stahlhelm were with Hindenburg. If it came to fighting, it was likely that the Reichsbanner would side with the Reichswehr and the Stahlhelm against the Nazis. Dr. Oberfroren's Memorandum it was in this situation that the National Socialists entered the election campaign. Dr. Goebbels, the most ingenious of the National Socialist leaders, saw how things threatened to develop. 
It was he who first thought of a grand coup which would at one blow change the political position of the National Socialists. Evidence of the origin and carrying through of this coup exists. On April 26th and 27th, 1933, the Manchester Guardian published articles on the Reichstag fire, in which reference was made to a memorandum originating in German nationalist circles. This memorandum was produced by the former chairman of the German nationalist fraction in the Reichstag, Dr. Oberfahren. When it became known that Dr. Oberfahren was the author of the memorandum referred to in articles published in the Manchester Guardian, the attack on him began, and on May 7th he was found dead in his flat. The report issued by the Hitler government stated that he had committed suicide. In reality, he had been murdered by the Nazis. After the March 5th elections, Dr. Oberfahren had attempted to organize the fight of the German nationalists and the Stahlhelm against the Nazis. As a confidant of Hugenberg's, he was fully informed of all that went on in the cabinet. He set down in a memorandum what he knew of the preparations for the burning of the Reichstag and sent this memorandum to his friends. We quote from this memorandum only the most important passages which indicate what was taking place behind the scenes during February. After stating that the repeated searches of Karl Leibnacht House had produced no results, Dr. Oberfahren gives an account of how the plan for the burning of the Reichstag was developed by the National Socialists. Dr. Goebbels' Plan Herr Dr. Goebbels, untroubled by any scruples, had soon prepared a plan which, if carried out, would not only overcome the opposition of the German nationalists to the Nazi demands for the suppression of social democratic and communist agitation, but in certain circumstances, if completely successful, would also secure the prohibition of the Communist Party. Goebbels considered it necessary that material should be found in Karl Leibnacht House, which would prove the criminal intentions of the Communists, and establish that a Communist insurrection was imminent, and that therefore there was immediate danger in delay. As Melcher's police, Melcher was the police president of Berlin, had still found nothing in Karl Leibnacht House, a new police president for Berlin must be appointed from the National Socialist ranks. It was only with great reluctance that Herr von Papen allowed his nominee, Melcher, to be displaced. The National Socialist nomination of Count Eldorf, head of the Berlin storm troops, was not accepted. Finally, agreement was reached on Admiral von Leibitzau, who, although he belonged to the National Socialist Party, also still had connections with the German nationalists. It was a simple matter to smuggle material into the Karl Leibnacht house, which was then empty. The police had the plans of the office section and the cellars. The necessary documents could therefore be easily put there. From the first, Goebbels was clear as to the necessity of underlining the seriousness and the credibility of the forged documents on their discovery by some incident, even if this was only hinted at. Provision was, in fact, made for this. On February 24th, the police forced their way into the Karl Leibnacht house, which had been standing empty for some weeks, searched it thoroughly, and sealed it up. That same day, the official announcement was made that a quantity of extremely treasonable material had been found. On February 26, the Conti Bureau, the government's news bureau, issued a very detailed account of what the result of the search had been. It is not worthwhile to repeat this statement, the penny-dreadful style of which struck even the most unprejudiced reader. A detailed account was given of secret passages, secret springs, secret tunnels, catacombs, subterranean vaults, and other contrivances of similar character. The whole content of the report produced a ridiculous effect, as, for example, the descriptions of the cellars of an office building in the fantastic terms subterranean vaults and catacombs. It was remarkable that in what were described as well-concealed rooms in the cellar, the police should find several hundredweight of precise directions 
for the carrying through of an imminent revolution the statement that what had been found in these secret vaults was proof that the communist party and its auxiliary organizations lived a second illegal existence below the surface was particularly nonsensical admiral von levitzow police president of berlin on the afternoon of sunday february twenty sixth made a report to the minister of the interior herr goring on what had been found in the karl leibnacht house the discoveries in the karl leibnacht house gave rise to considerable dissension within the coalition government Papen, Hugenberg, and Selte vigorously reproached Herr Goring for making use of such a swindle. They pointed out that the documents alleged to have been discovered were such clumsy forgeries that they could in no circumstances be produced in public. They pointed out that it should have been managed more skillfully, along lines similar to those used by the English conservatives, sometime previously in connection with the forged Zinevaev letter. The crudeness of the description of the Karl Leibnacht house given by the Conti Bureau was emphasized. German nationalists and Stahlhelmers pointed out that no one would believe that the communists would have deliberately established their illegal headquarters in Karl Leibnacht house. The forgeries should have been carried out less clumsily, and the illegal rooms should have been discovered in some other quarter of Berlin. Nevertheless, as the whole affair had already been made public, the German nationalists could do nothing but agree to further strengthening of the decrees against the communists, on the basis of the material that had been discovered. Of course, they were in no way concerned to protect the communists, but merely objected to the crudeness of the methods used. At the same time, they also wanted to allow the communists, in any event, to take part in the elections, as they wanted to prevent the National Socialists from securing the absolute majority in the Reichstag through the elimination of the Communist Party. Goebbels' plan is carried out. Dr. Oberfahren shows in his memorandum that Goebbels thought it necessary to heighten the effect of the material alleged to have been discovered in Karl Leibnacht House by an incident of some kind. He thought that he would achieve the greatest success, we continue to give Dr. Oberfahren's account, by a series of acts of arson which were to culminate in a fire in the German Reichstag on February 27th. It was agreed that the most important Nazi leaders, Hitler, Goering, and Goebbels, were not to make any engagements to speak at election meetings on that date, but were to be in Berlin. We give below an announcement published in the Volkischer Beobachter of the election speeches which would have been made by Hitler. It is especially noticeable that Hitler kept free from the dates from the 25th to the 27th of February. February 23rd, Frankfurt, en Main. February 24th, Munich. February 28th, Leipzig. March 1st, Breslau. March 2nd, Berlin. March 3rd, Hamburg. March 4th, Konigsberg. The Volkischer Beobachter adds, it is possible that election meetings will also be arranged for February 25th and 26th. The time of the meetings will be between 8 and 9 p.m. So in order to be prepared for emergencies, Hitler had kept free the dates from February 25th to 27th. But in any event, it was announced beforehand that Hitler could in no circumstances speak in any election meetings on February 27th. Contradictions in the Official Reports The first official report stated that a police officer noticed people carrying lighted torches in the dark building, and that he succeeded in capturing the criminal. It further stated that the criminal was found in one of the cellars, and allowed himself to be arrested without showing any resistance. On March 4th, however, a further statement describes the arrest of van der Lubbe as follows. Police on the Brandenburg Tor side of the Reichstag noticed the fire in the building. One of the police saw torches quite clearly and immediately fired. At first there was some doubt about this incident. Since then, however, the marks of the bullets have actually been found. The police then rushed into the Reichstag. They found in the lobby, not as was originally reported, in the cellars, 
the man Marinus van der Lubbe, who was there overpowered by one of the officers, after considerable resistance. This is the first contradiction in the official reports. Charges against Torgler and Conan. On the evening of March 1st, the official Prussische Presidentst issued the following statement. The official investigation of the grave act of incendiarism in the building of the German Reichstag has up to the present shown that at least seven persons must have been required for the bringing in of the inflammable material alone, while the placing of it and simultaneous setting fire to the various points in the huge building must have required at least ten persons. No doubt whatever that the incendiaries were so completely familiar with all the details of the vast building that only unrestricted access over a number of years could have given this definite knowledge of all the rooms. Grave suspicion therefore rests on the Communist Party deputies, who particularly in recent weeks have been noticeably often meeting in the Reichstag building under the most diverse pretexts. This familiarity with the Reichstag building and with the duty arrangements of the officials also explains the fact that for the time being only the Dutch communist who was caught in the act was arrested, as after he had carried out his criminal deed, he was unable to escape owing to his ignorance of the building. The arrested man, who is also known in Holland as extremely radical, has been continuously present at the meetings of the Communist Action Committee and was drawn in to carry out the act of incendiarism. The investigation has further established that three witnesses, some hours before the outbreak of the fire, saw the arrested Dutch criminal in the company of the Communist deputies Torgler and Konen in the corridors of the Reichstag at about eight o'clock in the evening. A mistake on the part of these witnesses is out of the question in view of the criminal's appearance as moreover the deputy's entrance to the reichstag is closed at eight p m and the communist deputies torgler and conan at about eight thirty p m asked for their coats and hats to be brought to their rooms and only left the building through another door at about ten p m extremely grave suspicion rests on these two communists for it was between these times that the fire was arranged the rumor that Deputy Torgler voluntarily presented himself at police headquarters is not correct. It is true that through his legal adviser he asked for a safe conduct when he realized that escape was impossible. But this was refused, and the deputy was arrested. On March 4th, the chief of the political police issued a report stating that, insofar as the investigation has up to now produced results giving rise to well-founded suspicion, of the complicity of third persons in the interests of the pending prosecution and of the security of the state no statement can be made so that on march first grave suspicion rests on torgler and conan and the security of the state does not prevent the announcement of the grounds for this suspicion on march fourth any information bearing on the grounds for suspicion would endanger the security of the state this is the second contradiction in the Presidian's message of March 1st, which has already been quoted, it is stated that Torgler and Conan left the Reichstag building at about 10 p.m. According to the messages issued by the Wolf Bureau and the Telegraphen Union and the foreign correspondents, the fire was discovered in the time between 9 and 9.15 p.m. At 9.15, the fire brigade started operations. At about the same time, the police surrounded the Reichstag and prevented any access to it. A few minutes after the fire had been discovered, Goering arrived on the spot, and shortly after his arrival, Hitler, Goebbels, Papen, and Prince August Wilhelm also arrived. But in spite of this, the deputies Torgler and Konen quietly left the burning Reichstag, which was cordoned off by the police and surrounded by a crowd of thousands of people and it did not occur to anyone to ask them a single question. This is the third contradiction. A complete alibi. Two waiters in the Aschinger restaurant, near the Friedrichstrasse station, have deposed on oath that the Reichstag deputy Torgler took his evening meal in the restaurant not later than 8.30. Torgler must therefore have left the Reichstag at the very latest, soon after 8 o'clock, and not at 10 o'clock, as the official statement asserts. 
A sworn deposition made by the Reichstag deputy Wilhelm Konen is printed below. This shows that Torgler and Konen left the Reichstag that evening between 8.10 and 8.15 p.m. We give the deposition in full because Konen arrived at the Reichstag at about 6.30 p.m. on February 27th and was with Torgler until 1.30 a.m. the following morning. These two deputies have a complete alibi, which shows that there is not a word of truth in the charge against them made by the Hitler government. Conan's deposition is as follows. In the afternoon of February 27th, I went, as I had done almost every day of the previous week, to the police headquarters in the Alexander Platz to see Detective Commissioner Dr. Broschwitz, in order to discuss with him further the question of releasing election material from Karl Leibnacht House. Shortly after 3 p.m., we went round to Karl Leibnacht House with some detective officers, and there a few small lots of posters, streamers, and other election material were released by the police and packed and sent out. When this had been completed at 5.40 p.m., I took leave of the detective commissioner, arranged to meet some of our helpers next day in a neighboring restaurant to organize the dispatch of further material and then telephone to our fraction secretariat in the Reichstag, as I had to discuss some points in connection with the distribution of speakers for the last week of the election campaign. Following on this telephone conversation, I went direct to the Reichstag for the purpose stated, reaching there shortly before half-past six. There I met my colleague Ernst Torgler, who as chairman of the official election committee of our party was concerned in the allocation of party members of the Reichstag to the meetings which had been arranged. At about 7.15 p.m. I had settled the business I had come for, and Torgler asked me to visit a few minutes for him, as he was only waiting for a telephone call which would soon be through. Then we could go and have a meal together. I then told him of the constant difficulties which were being made over the release of election material from Karl Leibnacht House. We agreed that Torgler, as head of the party's Central Election Committee, should telephone to Dr. Diles, head of the political section of the Berlin police, to lodge a further protest against the withholding of election posters and other election material. This conversation with Dr. Diles took place at about 7.30 p.m. Following on this, I got myself put through to the assessor, who, as Dr. Diles' right-hand man, was responsible for handing over the material and put my point of view as to the difficulties which were being created, also discussing what had to be done the following day, in connection with which I had already made a further appointment to meet the detective commissioner at Karl Leibnacht House. After this telephone conversation with police headquarters, Torgler had another telephone conversation, at about quarter to eight, with the lawyer, Dr. Rosenfeld. Then, as the call from a party friend, which he had been expecting since seven o'clock, still did not come through, he telephoned down to the porter at door five, and asked him, in the event of a call coming through to him after eight, when the exchange in the Reichstag is closed, to call him down on the internal telephone from the fraction secretariat room. Meanwhile, the cloakroom attendant at the south door telephoned to ask whether Herr Torgler was now leaving or whether his hat and coat should be brought up as usual to the secretariat room. Torgler asked for his things to be brought up to him, and this was done at about eight o'clock. At eight o'clock the cloakroom and door two are closed. Then at last, at a couple minutes past eight, the call which we had been waiting for came through, and had to be dealt with by the porter at door five, the only door still open. Torgler was called down on the house telephone, and naturally, having to come down from the third floor and not wanting to keep his friend waiting unnecessarily, he lost no time over getting down. A few minutes later, Torgler returned from the porter's office, direct to the fraction room, and soon after that we put on our things, and together with the woman secretary of the fraction, left the Reichstag through door five at perhaps quarter past eight. So far from leaving the building in flight, as is alleged, it so happened that we left the Reichstag building that evening at a much slower pace than we had ever done before. The secretary of the fraction, who went out with us that night, 
was suffering from an inflamed vein which made it difficult for her to walk, so that we went at a snail's pace. It was at this very slow pace that we walked to the Friedrichstrasse station, where the secretary left us, and went down to the underground. We went straight, that is, therefore, at about half-past eight, to the Aschinger restaurant at the Friedrichstrasse station, where we had supper. There we met three other party friends, and stayed for some time talking to them. Two of these friends left us after they had had a meal, somewhere between half-past nine and quarter to ten. At ten o'clock there was a change of shifts for the waiters, so we paid our bills shortly before ten. It was already past ten o'clock when the new waiter came to our table and, addressing me by name, said, Herr Conan, have you heard? The Reichstag is on fire. I was astounded, and replied, Man, are you mad? It's quite impossible. He answered excitedly, No, it's true. All the taxi drivers say so. You can ask them at the counter by the door. Thousands of people are already collected there. Thus it was that we came to learn of one of the most monstrous crimes in the history of the world. Signed, William Conan. This affidavit exposes the fourth contradiction in the official reports. The message issued by the Preussische Präsident of March 1, 1933, states that Torgler did not present himself at police headquarters, but that he was arrested. The deposition printed below, which was given on oath by the barrister Dr. Kurt Rosenfeld, who accompanied Torgler to police headquarters, shows that this statement is untrue. On the morning after the burning of the Reichstag, Herr Ernst Torgler rang me up on the telephone and asked me whether I was willing to go with him to police headquarters, where he intended to go in order to rebut the charges which had been made against him in connection with the Reichstag fire. I expressed my willingness to go with him, and at once telephoned to police headquarters to inform them that I should be coming at once with Torgler. If I remember rightly, I spoke to an official of the name of Heller, then drove to police headquarters in a car with Torgler, and asked to see Herr Heller, to whom I said, This is Herr Torgler, and I must ask you to question him in connection with the charge that he is supposed to have had some sort of connection with the Reichstag fire. The news that Torgler had presented himself voluntarily to be interrogated brought several police officers into the room where I was, asking, Is it true that Torgler has come of his own accord? Herr Heller then went with Herr Torgler into another room, while I waited in the anteroom. After a long time, Herr Torgler came out of the room again, and we waited together until Herr Heller called us both into another room and in my presence declared that Torgler was under arrest. Signed, Kurt Rosenfeld. This is the fifth contradiction. The Prosich president of March 1st reported that Deputy Torgler had been several hours in company with the incendiary in the Reichstag building, and that he had also been in the company of other persons implicated in the fire. If Torgler had really been an accomplice, the most elementary common sense would have prevented him from showing himself in public with van der Lubbe. This is the sixth contradiction. The statement issued by the official Preussik Presidienst on March 1st asserts that the communist deputies of the Reichstag were familiar with the Reichstag building and with the duty arrangements of the staff. In fact, the communist deputies of the Reichstag were not familiar with the duty arrangements of the staff, as they had no seat on the presidium of the Reichstag, and were moreover excluded from all committees which dealt with the administration of the Reichstag building. And moreover, as we shall show, on the day of the burning of the Reichstag, the duty arrangements of the staff had been altered by the National Socialist House Inspector, so that although Goering, president of the Reichstag, was in a position to know about this alteration. The communist deputies could not have known of it. This is the seventh contradiction. Van der Lubbe, not a communist. The official president's messages of February 28th state that Van der Lubbe stated that he was a member of the Dutch Communist Party. The version broadcast on the wireless that Van der Lubbe had had on him a membership card of the Dutch Communist Party was dropped even on the night of the Reichstag fire, because it was too incredible. 
The first journalist who interviewed van der Lubbe after the burning of the Reichstag was the reporter of the Amsterdam paper De Telegraaf, whose message was published in his paper on March 2nd. Marinus tells me that for some years now he's not been a member of any party. He is not a convinced communist. In fact, Marinus van der Lubbe resigned from the Young Communist League of Leiden in April 1931 in order to forestall his expulsion. This is the eighth contradiction. The Wolf Telegraph Bureau reported from Amsterdam on March 2nd. The attempt made by the Dutch communists to repudiate van der Lubbe cannot succeed, for police headquarters in The Hague have information that Lubbe was not expelled but merely removed from the front line and given the cold shoulder because his radical ideas did not suit the cautious party leadership in Holland. The German authorities wanted to create the impression that a communist who had been given the cold shoulder by the Dutch Communist Party, in reality, van der Lubbe had not been a member of the Young Communist League since April 1931, was used by the Germanist Communist Party for terrorist acts. Was it not the National Socialists who had been for years asserting that the closest links existed between the Communist parties, which are all only sections of the Communist International? How then can it be imagined that a Dutch Communist who had been given the cold shoulder would be received by the German Communist leaders with open arms and entrusted with the most confidential work? That is the ninth contradiction. The same report by the Wolf Telegraph Bureau goes on to say, as recently as December 22, 1932, Lube took part in a meeting of taxi drivers in The Hague who were on strike and made a long communist speech. This information given by the Dutch police is indeed extremely important in its bearing on the Reichstag fire. In the meeting of taxi drivers, van der Lube did not make a communist speech but as he had frequently done before, attacked the Dutch Communist Party. We have definite evidence of this in a signed statement made by A. Taro, a member of the staff of the Tribune, and countersigned by a number of other persons present at the meeting. This is the tenth contradiction. The statement made by the chief of the political police on March 4th asserted that van der Lubbe knew German, Statements by everyone who knew him, and also the statements made by the journalist who visited him in prison and spoke to him, are all unanimous that van der Lubbe only speaks broken German. The local Anzeiger of February 28th states that van der Lubbe was interrogated with the aid of an interpreter. This is the eleventh contradiction. The same statement made by the chief of the political police says, van der Lubbe is also known to the police as a communist agitator. On April 28, 1931, he was arrested by the police in Kronauer in Westphalia for selling postcards of communist tendency. In actual fact, van der Lubbe did sell postcards at Kronauer in Westphalia. They were postcards of himself and his friend Hovelde. The postcards bear the following text in four languages. Worker, sports, and study tour of Marinus van der Lubbe and H. Hovelde through Europe and the Soviet Union. Start of the tour from Leiden, April 14, 1931. There is not another word on the card, not the slightest indication of communist agitation. Van der Lubbe was arrested merely because he had no license to sell the cards on the street. This is the twelfth contradiction. The chief of the Berlin political police further stated, he, van der Lubbe, in his examination, only admitted the true facts of the case insofar as he was confronted with witnesses. A few lines lower down the same report says, he, van der Lubbe, confessed every detail. No names of eyewitnesses of the act of incendiarism have been given by the Hitler government. Even the official Prusich Presidente did not assert that van der Lubbe had been seen setting fire to the Reichstag by the police or anyone else. And if this is so, then, according to the statement issued by the chief of the political police, he did not make any confession. On the other hand, the same police official states that van der Lubbe confessed every detail. This is the thirteenth contradiction. 
The so-called national press, which is inspired by the police, announced the day after the Reichstag fire that van der Lubbe had been in Moscow and had been trained there. In reality, van der Lubbe had never been in the Soviet Union. He went direct from Leiden to Germany. This is the 14th contradiction. Van der Lubbe left Leiden between the 13th and the 15th of February. According to a statement published in the Vosich Zeitung of March 2, 1933, he spent the night of the 17th through the 18th of February in a hostel at Glindau near Werden. On February 18th, he went on foot to Berlin. In an interview which the criminal commissioner Heise gave to the Dutch press on March 13th, he stated that van der Lubbe had made the acquaintance of communists at labor exchanges and through them was brought into the Communist Action Committee. Van der Lubbe did not arrive in Berlin until the evening of Saturday, February 18th at the earliest. On the Sunday following, February 19th, the labor exchanges were closed. If the statement made by the police is correct, therefore, he could not have made the acquaintance of communists at a labor exchange before Monday, February 20th, at the earliest. The reader must imagine for himself. A Dutchman, speaking broken German, without any transfer papers from the Dutch Communist Party, on February 20th makes the acquaintance of communists at a labor exchange in Berlin, is brought by them into contact with the leaders of the party, and commissioned by them to set fire to the Reichstag on February 27th. This is the 15th contradiction. A statement issued by the official Prusich Presidente of March 1st says, The arrested man has been continuously present at the meetings of the Communist Action Committee and was drawn in to carry out this act of incendiarism. On March 3rd, the Central Committee of the German Communist Party made the following statement in reply. Of course, no meetings of any Communist Action Committee have been held in the Reichstag or elsewhere at which the man arrested in the Reichstag, van der Lubbe, was present. In the first place, no Communist Action Committee exists, but only the Central Committee of the German Communist Party and its political bureau. In the second place, no individuals take part in meetings of the Communist Party or of any of its units who are not members of either the German Communist Party or of some other section of the Comintern. This reply to Goering's assertions reveals the 16th contradiction. Catacombs in Karl Leibnacht House A statement issued by the official Prusich Presidente on February 28, 1933, says, among the hundred sentinels of material which the police discovered in their search of the Karl Leipnack House were instructions for the carrying out of the communist terror on the Bolshevik model. According to these instructions, government buildings, museums, mansions, and essential plant were to be burnt down. The further direction is given that in riots and conflicts, women and children are to be put in front of the terrorist troops. If possible, the wives and children of police officials. The discovery of this material has checked the systematic carrying through of the Bolshevik Revolution. The Reichstag deputy Wilhelm Konin, who was constantly working in the Karl Leipnacht House during the last few days of February, as a leading official of the Communist Party, describes the searches in Karl Leipnacht House as follows. In the forenoon of February 17th, a gigantic crowd of detective officers, accompanied by several companies of ordinary police, rushed into the building and occupied every room. Every corner, every cupboard was thoroughly searched. They had taken the precaution of bringing skilled workers with them to take to pieces the desks uh, for which there were no keys. All the cellars, too, were carefully searched. In the cellars, as usual, there was only the material which had been left over from various campaigns, or had been returned to the office in the course of years. In the basement rooms there were also supplies of paper and bookshop stocks. On that occasion the police inspector still considered it necessary, at my request, to show me any papers confiscated as suspicious, and to state that they were confiscated or to give me a receipt for them. Among the papers seized in the course of this exhaustive search, which lasted many hours, there was neither the book The Art of Armed Insurrection, 
nor any other so-called seditious publication. Nor was there any mention of these in the police reports issued immediately after the raid. It was only a week later, on February 24th, although I had been almost every day with police inspectors in the Karl Leibnacht house, in connection with getting out election material, that police headquarters suddenly asserted that in the course of a new search in the so-called catacombs, seditious material had been found, including the book The Art of Armed Insurrection. This alleged new search, if it took place at all, must have been carried out without any civilian witnesses, and without any representative of the people concerned being present. This is all the more significant, as I had been practically every day in the Karl Leibnacht house negotiating with police inspectors to recover election material, paper, books, and so forth, and getting them dispatched. Although I was therefore available every day, I was neither summoned nor even informed when the alleged discovery was made. It would have been particularly easy to inform me of it, as I was there on the 24th, on Saturday the 25th, and again on Monday the 27th, and was talking to detectives and inspectors in connection with the delivery of the material recovered from the police. On February 25th, after the report of the passages, vaults and catacombs had already appeared in heavy type in the great press, when I had finished with the inspector in charge in connection with the release of election material, I asked him where the catacombs were. A number of comrades who were helping with the dispatch of the election material were also present. He then, to our surprise, pointed to a trap door about a yard wide in a room on the ground floor, which was used as a porter's office. The trap door was raised so that we could see a ladder leading down into the basement. A comrade who had worked in the building for many years and knew it well said, Man, that's the trap door to our old beer cellar. We all laughed and asked the same question. Is that supposed to be the catacombs? The inspector answered only with a rather embarrassed nod. That part of the building used to be an inn. The explanation of the passages through which people were supposed to be able to get away to other streets is equally simple. Karl Leipnick House is a corner house, which, as an office building for commercial undertakings, had storerooms and working rooms in the basement, and these were described by Goering's police as vaults, passages, and catacombs. These two statements expose the seventeenth contradiction in the official reports. Signal for Civil War, the Preussische Presidente announced on February 28th. The burning of the Reichstag was to be the signal for a bloody insurrection and civil war. Looting on a large scale had been organized for Tuesday in Berlin. It has been ascertained that today was to have seen throughout Germany terrorist acts against individual persons, against private property, and against the life and limb of the peaceful population, and also the beginning of general civil war. The Voice of Zeitung of March 4th, 1933, reported, The work of the police has up to the present prevented the material being put into the hands of every communist. It has only got into the hands of a few functionaries in secret communications. The last search of Karl Leibnacht House took place on February 24th. It was on this occasion that the terrorist material is alleged to have been found. The political police state that the instructions for the terror did not reach all communists, but were only known to a few functionaries, so that the German Communist Party would have had to circulate through every area in Germany in the three days between February 24th and 27th, the materials stored in the Karl Leibnacht House. Secondly, within the same three days, it would have had to get together the special groups who were to carry out the terrorist acts. Thirdly, it would have had to instruct and train these groups to carry out the terrorist acts. And fourthly, it would have had to prepare and organize the rest of the members for the civil war, which was to be unleashed through these terrorist acts. In February 1933, the German Communist Party had over 300,000 members, distributed all over Germany. The party would have had to work miracles to organize within three days, for the carrying through of all the plans attributed to it by the official statements. This is the 18th 
contradiction. The incriminating material has not been produced. During the evening of March 1st, the official Prusich Presidente issued the following announcement. The Prussian Ministry of the Interior states, in connection with the decree issued by the Reich government against the communist danger, dated February 28th, that particularly heavy penalties have been imposed for a number of crimes, because of the grave and acute danger which has been fully established, and of the inhuman and carefully prepared system of unrestricted communist terror. Germany was to have been thrown into the chaos of Bolshevism, the assassination of individual leaders of the nation and of the state, outrages against essential services and public persons, the seizure as hostages of the wives and children of prominent men, were to produce fear and dismay among the nation, and cripple any attempt at resistance on the part of the citizens. The Reich Commissioner for the Prussian Ministry of the Interior, Minister Goering, will in the very near future make public the documents which prove the necessity of all the measures which have been taken. The enormous amount of material is being sifted once again, and a final examination of it is being made with a view to ensuring that the security of the state cannot be further endangered by its publication. Up to the present time, the documents have not been published. This is the 19th contradiction. Goering denies his own statement. On March 2, 1933, the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung and the Taglish Rundschau published the following messages from the official Prussisch Präsident. In certain foreign newspapers, the slanderous assertion, emanating from German Marxist circles, is being circulated that the fire in the Reichstag building was organized not by communists, but from the National Socialist side. The originators of this slander have already been arrested, and will be brought to due punishment as soon as the investigation has been completed. Among other things, it is asserted that the Dutch communist who was arrested is in reality an agent provocateur, and was induced to carry out the act of incendiarism by leading national socialists. This is supposed to be proved by the fact that the criminal had used his coat and shirt as inflammable material but had not even removed the communist documents and his passports which were found on him. Significance is further attached to the fact that the police authorities have not published the photograph of the incendiary and the documents found on him, and have also offered no reward for persons who could give further information about the criminal and establish his connections with communist and social democratic politicians. This unusual procedure in an important criminal case is supposed to be evidence that the authorities are hindering the elucidation of the crime in order to be able to use a National Socialist Act of provocation as a pretext for anti-Marxist measures. In reply to this, it is stated from official sources that these slanderous arguments are, of course, devoid of any basis. The photographs of the criminal and of the documents found on him have not yet been published purely in the interest of the investigation. Publication will take place in the course of today. Moreover, the Berlin correspondence of foreign newspapers can obtain the photographic reproductions in the course of today from the IA department at police headquarters. The photograph of the criminal will also be handed today to the Dutch police in order to confirm the criminal's identity. This will remove the possibility of further slanders. A specific warning is issued against the dissemination of such slanders. But before the other German papers could publish this announcement, its publication was forbidden. Goering instructed the Wolf Bureau to circulate a statement that the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung and the Taglish Rundschau had been taken in by a communist forgery. Apparently, Goering wanted to make people believe that anyone can simply ring up a newspaper and say, Preussisch Präsident speaking, and then secure publicity for any kind of story. In reality, telephone messages from press agencies to newspapers are very strictly controlled. Before accepting any message, the editorial stenographer first asks for confirmation from the control. Goering's dementi cannot cause any doubt as to the fact that at first he intended, through the Prussisch Presidente, to bluff the world 
and then later, too late, realized the danger of the message and tried to hold it back. This is the twentieth contradiction. The Hunt for Accomplices the Conti service of the official Wolf Telegraph Bureau announced on March 4, 1933, that the Communist Reichstag deputy Schumann, at a communist election meeting at Garen, Thuringia, on February 24, foretold the burning of the Reichstag building. Schumann's actual words are reported to have been, This evening the Reichstag will be in flames, but that makes no difference. If this dance hall is burnt down, then we will get a swung floor. The Vosishi Zeitung of March 5th, 1933 states, A report was sent out from Thuringia and further broadcast by wireless to the effect that the district authorities in Arnstadt in Thuringia were in possession of a report relating to a communist election meeting held at Garen on the evening of the wicked act of arson in the building of the German Reichstag that the local police official who was present at the meeting recorded in his report a statement made by the speaker the communist reichstag deputy schumann in which the fire in the reichstag was foretold in advance investigations since made have however as the thuringer allgemeine zeitung now states shown that there is a wireless apparatus in the restaurant where the meeting was held and that the landlord on the basis of the radio announcement had sent to tell the speaker in the course of his speech that the reichstag was on fire it has been established that the police officer concerned made an error of one hour in his report and that schumann only began his speech at about ten fifteen p m it can therefore be taken for granted that he had already heard of the radio announcement that the reichstag was on fire this is the twenty-first contradiction on march seventh nineteen thirty three the vosich zeitung stated on the basis of information received from the police Duren six three in the german village of lammerdorf near the belgian frontier a russian emigrant was arrested yesterday evening on suspicion of having been concerned in the burning of the reichstag shortly before his arrest he had dispatched a telegram from a belgian post office to paris the content of which cannot as yet be disclosed on being sent back across the frontier by belgian frontier guards he was arrested on this side of the frontier he admitted during his interrogation that he came originally from russia and had been living for some time in berlin he had severe burns on his arms and legs the mysterious foreigner was today handed over to the criminal authorities he obstinately refuses to say anything more regarding his activities in the capital of the reich and up to the present has not even given his name on march eighth nineteen thirty three the vosich zeitung printed a statement received from the authorities at Aix la chapelle not an accomplice of the reichstag incendiary the authorities of Aix la chapelle state that the Russian citizen who was arrested near Freyne's house as an incendiary, as investigations have shown, cannot be implicated. The man concerned has been active as a journalist in the Communist Party. For this reason he was expelled from the country a year ago, but there is no further evidence against him. His expulsion has been carried out this is the twenty-second contradiction did van der lubbe alone start the fire early in march the hitler government sent heisig a detective commissioner to leiden to make investigations regarding van der lubbe's antecedents heisig gave an interview to representatives of the dutch press which was published in a number of papers on march fourteenth this contains the following as for the important questions whether lube had assistants or accomplices it is probable that he alone started the fire but that the preparatory measures had been carried out by accomplices this statement absolutely contradicts the official statement made on march first that the simultaneous lighting of the fire at so many points in the gigantic building must have required at least ten persons 
the judge in charge of the investigation voigt therefore hastened to deny on march fifteenth the statement made by heisig a report has been published in a number of papers that van der lubbe started the fire in the reichstag by himself this is not correct the investigation conducted by the court has given good reason to believe that van der lubbe did not commit the crime on his own initiative in the interests of the investigation details cannot at present be given this is the twenty-third contradiction lubbe's connections with the social democrats the official preussic presidentia of february twenty eighth gave the information that in his confession van der lubbe had admitted to connections with the social democratic party on february twenty eighth the executive of the social democratic party issued a statement in the following terms during the night of the twenty seventh twenty eighth february the whole social democratic press of prussia was prohibited for fourteen days the prohibition is based on the statement that an arrested man has confessed that he started the fire in the reichstag building and had previously had a certain connection with the social democratic party the suggestion that the social democratic party would have anything to do with people who set fire to the reichstag is repudiated by the party this statement issued by the executive of the social democratic party was confirmed by a statement made by the examining magistrate judge voigt which was published on march twenty second nineteen thirty three the investigation has so far shown that the dutch communist van der lubbe who was arrested as the person who set fire to the reichstag building was in communication immediately before the fire not only with german communists but also with foreign communists including some who had been condemned to death or to long terms of penal servitude in connection with the explosion in the sophia cathedral in nineteen twenty five the persons concerned are now under arrest the investigation has not produced the slightest grounds for believing that non-communist circles had any connection with the burning of the reichstag on february twenty seventh van der lubbe is said to have admitted connections with the social democrats on march twenty second there were not the slightest grounds for believing this assertion this is the twenty fourth contradiction van der lubbe and the bulgarians in the statement referred to above judge voigt declares that van der lubbe had connections with the people responsible for the sophia cathedral explosion van der lubbe had therefore not only performed the miracle of establishing within seven days connections with the leaders of the german communist party through communists whom he got to know by accident at a labor exchange he also succeeded within these seven days in getting into touch with bulgarians who are said to have been responsible for the sophia cathedral explosion this is the twenty-fifth contradiction the bulgarians who were arrested and charged with complicity in the burning of the reichstag are dimitrov popov and tanev george dimitrov was one of the theoretical leaders of the bulgarian communist party in nineteen twenty three he took part in the rising of the bulgarian workers and in nineteen twenty four he was sentenced in contumaciam to fifteen years hard labor he has not been in bulgaria since nineteen twenty three he had no part whatever in the sophia cathedral explosion bourgeois popov emigrated to yugoslavia in nineteen twenty four and only returned to bulgaria at the end of nineteen thirty he also was not concerned in the sophia cathedral explosion of nineteen twenty five the third arrested bulgarian tanev is merely a worker who was not in any way concerned in the sophia cathedral explosion the aim of the assertion that the arrested bulgarians had blown up the sophia cathedral is quite clear the hitler government hoped to produce the impression that the burning of the reichstag was an international communist plot this is the twenty-sixth contradiction the judge in charge of the investigation asserted that dimitrov had been seen with van der lubbe at three p m on february twenty sixth 
in a restaurant in the Dusseldorferstrasse. The judge also produced a witness, who swore that he had seen van der Lubbe with Dimitrov on that date. But the witness disappeared into oblivion shortly afterwards, for Dimitrov was able to prove that on February 26th he had not been in Berlin at all, but in Munich. This is the 27th contradiction. No material for a great communist trial. On March 27th, Judge Voigt stated that a criminal warrant had so far been issued only against van der Lubbe, but on April 3rd he caused a statement to be circulated that in all five warrants had been issued in connection with the burning of the Reichstag for van der Lubbe, three Bulgarian communists, and the communist Reichstag deputy, Torgler. Torgler was arrested on February 28th, the Bulgarians on March 3rd. Up to March 27th, that is to say during the period when the main inquiries were being made, no warrants had been issued for Torgler and the Bulgarians. The warrants were issued only when the announcement that the only criminal warrant issued was for van der Lubbe had created a sensation in the press of the world. This is the 28th contradiction. Judge Voigt's statement of April 3rd says that for the time being, only warrants for protective arrest have been issued in respect of a few other suspected persons. On June 2nd, it was officially announced that the preliminary investigation conducted by Judge Voigt against the accused van der Lubbe, Torgler, Dimitrov, Popov, and Tanev, on charges of setting fire to the Reichstag and high treason, was concluded on June 1st. All the documents have now been sent to the Reich Public Prosecutor at Leipzig. On April 3rd, there were still a few other suspected persons. On June 1st, they are no longer there. This is the 29th contradiction. On April 22nd, Judge Voigt authorized the following official statement with regard to the progress of the investigation. The Supreme Court proposes to combine the investigation in the many pending cases of high treason against members of the Communist Party into one single inquiry on a large scale. It is expected that the investigations will be concluded in eight to ten weeks, so that then all the cases of high treason can be dealt with, together by the Supreme Court. The cases concerned are all those arising in connection with the change of government in Germany that is to say all crimes during the course of january and february this will also include the proceedings connected with the act of incendiarism in the reichstag this case has so far not made very rapid progress owing to the fact that the accused and particularly the bulgarians refused to make any statement the grounds for suspicion of complicity against the reichstag deputy torgler have been more securely established a month later, on May 25th, there was no longer any talk of a great communist trial. The Hitler government was forced to issue, through a parliamentary news bureau, the news, that the trial in connection with the act of incendiarism in the Reichstag will be associated with other cases against communist leaders in a great communist trial, as has been suggested, is not to be expected. The trial of van der Lubbe and his accomplices will come before the Supreme Court as soon as the necessary preliminary labors have been concluded. This is the 30th contradiction. The Volkischer Beobachter, Hitler's official organ, published the following statement on March 3rd as coming from an official source. The chief of the press section of the National Socialist Fraction in the Reichstag discovered a missing pane of the glass roof over the room of the communist deputy Torgler, and after further search discovered a long ladder above it, lying against the window of a communist deputy's room in the second upper story. Detective inspectors immediately instituted a thorough search, for it was here that the incendiaries must have come down before the crime, or got up again after the crime. On March 1st, Goering had declared that the incendiaries had got away through the underground passage, which connects the Reichstag building with Goering's house. This declaration of his confirmed what many people thought, that the Reichstag incendiaries had made their way into the Reichstag through his house, 
and had escaped through his house. In order to weaken the overwhelming impression caused by Goering's declaration, the chief of the press section of the Nazi fraction in the Reichstag was sent to discover a missing pane and a ladder. The detective force, after three days' thorough search, had failed to see what the sharp eyes of the leader of the press section discovered in a moment. This is the 31st contradiction. Van der Lubbe confesses what is required. Dr. Oberforen stated in his memorandum that Goebel's plan was to start a series of incendiary acts, which were to culminate in the burning of the Reichstag. For incendiary acts, incendiaries are necessary. Van der Lubbe confesses that he set fire to the Reichstag. Van der Lubbe confesses that on February 25th, he tried to set fire to the Berliner Schloss. In connection with this, the press of February 27th reported. It has only now become known that a small fire broke out on Saturday in an office room on the fifth floor of the Berliner Schloss, which was quickly put out by a fireman stationed on the premises. The origin of the fire is not yet fully explained, but it is thought to have been an act of incendiarism. An hour before the fire started, the caretaker had started his round through the schloss and had even passed through that room. At the time, there was nothing suspicious to be seen. Soon afterwards, the room was in flames. Investigation showed that there was a burning firelighter on the window sill and another under the window and also on the steam pipes. The police investigation has not yet been concluded. Van der Lubbe confesses that on February 25th he tried to start a fire in the welfare office in Nukelon. Van der Lubbe confesses that on February 25th he made an attempt to start a fire in the Berlin Town Hall. This Van der Lubbe is a real child of the devil. To start fires on one day in three different places in Berlin. And he is a man who only speaks German brokenly. He had only arrived in Berlin on February 18, 1933. Seven days later he had sufficient knowledge of the place to start fires in the Schloss, in the town hall, and in the welfare office. He only required nine days to learn enough about the Reichstag to enable him to walk in and out as if it were his own house. Van der Lubbe had to appear as a dyed-in-the-blood communist. Such a communist, as conceived by Dr. Goebbels, must have a forged passport. Consequently, Van der Lubbe must make some alteration in his name on the passport. The passport was forged by putting two dots over the U, changing it into a U. Van der Lubbe was only too willing to take communist leaflets into the Reichstag with him. Certainly, no criminal has ever met the police so completely equipped with credentials. A talk with Torgler the day before the Reichstag fire. As chairman of the communist fraction in the Reichstag, Ernst Torgler was often called upon to answer enquiries from the press and from journalists. At a press conference on February 24th, he told the journalists present that the communists had information of an act of provocation planned by the Nazis. He stated that among other plans there was talk of staging an attempt to assassinate Hitler. The whole of the foreign press and a section of the German press published Torgler's statement. Shortly after this conference, the parliamentary correspondent of the Vosich Zeitung, Adolf Philipsborn, arranged an interview with Torgler, and an account of this interview, written by Philipsborn, was published in the Gegen Angriff of July 1st, 1933. It runs as follows. As a parliamentary journalist, I have for many years been in contact with deputies belonging to all parties in the Reichstag. It so chanced that I had arranged an interview with Torgler on February 26, 24 hours before the Reichstag fire. Torgler came with his daughter, who is 11 years of age. As the head of his party fraction, I showed him some material on the secret plans of the National Socialists. We then talked for about two hours about the whole political situation. I have never been a sympathizer with the Communist Party, and I referred to a number of weaknesses of the party. 
Torgler admitted some of the points, but energetically defended the general standpoint of his political friends. Finally, I put the following question to him. There is a rumor going about that the Communists propose to take some action against the Nazi government before the Reichstag elections, March 5th. Is this true? Torgler. That is nonsense. The government is only waiting for an opportunity to prohibit the Communist Party. Will the Communist leaders call a strike? Torgler. Of course we are calling for a political mass strike as a means of struggle against fascist acts of violence. But we know that this can only be successful if the trade unions withdraw their opposition and line up with us in a fighting front. Can this interview then be summed up by saying that the Communist Party does not intend to take any action which could give the Nazi government the occasion for an offensive against the Marxist working class? Torgler, emphatically and with conviction. Yes, that is the position. We Communists know that by ourselves we are too weak for the fight. We know that Hitler, Goering, and his colleagues are only waiting for some pretext which will give them the opportunity to prohibit the Communist Party and cancel the mandates of party deputies elected to the Reichstag. We know that we are shadowed by spies and that our telephone conversations are listened to. We are not going to run into the trap these gentlemen have prepared for us. On the evening following this conversation, the Reichstag was in flames, and a few hours later, Torgler had been arrested as the criminal. I then had the conviction, and still have it, that Torgler told me the absolute truth, and for that reason, although I am an opponent of communism, I am prepared to say it to anyone, including Herr Goering, who knows it better than I do, and to the judges at the trial. Hands off, Ernst Torgler. He is not guilty. The proof of the Nazis' guilt. The contradictions in which the Hitler government became entangled in its accounts of the Reichstag fire are by themselves enough to show who were the real incendiaries. But apart from these contradictions, there is direct evidence that the National Socialists were guilty of this act of incendiarism. We do not propose to print here all the evidence which we have at our disposal, but only the most important and striking parts of it. The fire in the German Reichstag was discovered at 9.15. The mass arrests in Berlin began soon after midnight. Almost all the warrants were accompanied with photographs of the accused, and the date of issue was inserted in ink. On February 28th, approximately 1,500 persons were arrested in Berlin alone. Is it possible to fill out 1,500 warrants, sign them, and in the majority of cases attach photographs to them, in three hours? Information which we have received from dismissed police officials provides the explanation of this promptness. The warrants were got ready during the days immediately preceding the burning of the Reichstag. Only the date was not filled in. By the morning of February 27th, all the warrants were ready. They were signed before the date was filled in. On February 22nd, the Prussian government decided to strengthen the police with auxiliary police. Only members of the so-called national associations, that is, of the National Socialist Storm Troops and of the Stahlhelm, were allowed to join the auxiliary police. While the control of the auxiliary police was left in the hands of the local authorities, the Minister of the Interior, Goering, reserved to himself the right to control them in Berlin itself. The decision was made public on February 27th, the date of the Reichstag fire. In the first official announcement of the Reichstag fire, Goering triumphantly stated that the organization of the auxiliary police for which he was responsible had proved to be justified and necessary. The National Socialist leaders and ministers were not content with setting up the auxiliary police. On February 27th, the whole of the storm troop forces in Berlin were confined to their quarters in barracks. A member of the storm troops, who left Germany at the end of March, gave the following information to the Paris intransigent. At noon on February 27th, we received the orders to remain in our quarters until further notice. We were strictly forbidden to show ourselves in groups in the streets. 
only our collectors were allowed out with their collecting boxes, and a few others were sent on special errands. We did not know what was in the wind, and we waited until suddenly at ten o'clock in the evening the order came. All at the double to the Brandenburger Tor. Leave your weapons. You are wanted for cordon duty. The Reichstag is on fire. The Berlin leader Ernst collected a few of us in the tavern at the corner of the Wilhelmstrasse and the Dorothenstrasse. He instructed us to go to various parts of town and to spread in the beer houses and at the street corners the story that the communists had set fire to the Reichstag, that definite evidence had been found. In short, the whole story as it appeared in the press the following day. At that time, it was not yet known that van der Lubbe was a Dutchman and that Deputy Torgler had been the last to leave the Reichstag. This was all told us as an absolute fact, and indeed with such definiteness that we all felt violently angry with the incendiaries. We rushed out and carried out our tasks with the greatest zeal. The more often I told the story, the more detailed it became, and soon I felt as I had been an eyewitness of the arson. Group leader Ernst has a high position in the Hitler hierarchy but it requires more than a group leader's intellectual powers to know by a few minutes after 10 p.m. that Torgler had been the last to leave the Reichstag. Group leader Ernst was privy to the plan of Goebbels and Goering. He was allocated the special task of transforming the stormtroop men into heralds to spread the story of the communist incendiaries. Hitler betrays himself. On February 27, 1933, fire broke out in the German Reichstag. On February 27, 1933, although the elections campaign was at its height, the most important National Socialist leaders were in Berlin. On February 27, Hitler did not speak at any meeting. On February 27, Goebbels did not speak at any meeting. They were in Berlin with Goering. None of the three had any meeting or any work to do that night. A few minutes after it became known that the Reichstag was on fire, Goering made his appearance on the scene, and Hitler and Goebel were there a few minutes later. Sefton Delmer, the Berlin correspondent of the Daily Express, one of the few English papers to back Hitler, was in their company, and the report he sent to the Daily Express is more damaging than any published by papers hostile to Hitler. Sefton Delmer describes the scene at the Reichstag, perhaps twenty to thirty minutes after the fire had been discovered. Hitler is reported as having turned to von Papen and said, This is a God-given signal. If this fire, as I believe, turns out to be the handiwork of communists, then there is nothing that shall stop us now crushing out this murder pest with an iron fist. Then, turning to Sefton Delmer, he said, You are witnessing the beginning of a great new epoch in German history. This fire is the beginning. The Chancellor of the Third Reich spoke these words at a time when the guilt of the communists could not have been established, when van der Lubbe was only just being interrogated with the help of an interpreter. According to unanimous press reports, the interrogation of van der Lubbe, which began immediately after his arrest, continued into the early hours of the morning. Van der Lubbe was arrested at about 9.20 p.m. At the time when Hitler spoke the words quoted above, van der Lubbe could not have made his comprehensive confession, which might have served Hitler as the ground for his accusations against the communists. Hitler's lack of self-control made him put the blame on the communists a little too early. He did not wait for his cue. An ally charges the Nazis with the act of arson. The Deutsche Allegami Zeitung, the organ of heavy industry, had been demanding since 1930 that Hitler should be entrusted with the government. Heavy industry was then trying to make the German nationalists believe that Hitler would be content to share power with them. The first weeks of the national government's existence brought out the sharp contradictions within the coalition government. Oberforen's memorandum shows these contradictions clearly. The Deutsche Allegheimer Zeitung tried to strengthen the position of the German nationalists. In the early stages, it spared no criticism of the national government, 
and soon after the Reichstag fire, when the National Socialists became preponderant in the coalition government, it even went so far as to assert that Goering's statements were untrue and to express doubts of the guilt of the communists. On March 2nd, the following appeared in the paper. From a political standpoint, there is only one quite uncomprehensible point about the Reichstag fire, that a communist could have been found who was so foolish as to commit the crime. Apart from a few speeches, newspaper articles, and proposals put forward, up to now we have seen very little of any united front between the communists and the social democrats. It is extremely improbable that such a united front could have been widened out to achieve an act of incendiarism in the German Reichstag. We fear that closer examination of the presuppositions for the well-known statement made by the Minister of the Interior will show that the charge he made cannot be maintained. If that is the case, it would have been better not to have raised it. This is not from a Marxist journal, but from the Journal of Heavy Industry. A few months after the Reichstag fire, the Deutsche Allegami Zeitung was brought into conformity. Its chief editor was removed, not before Hugenberg also sank into the background. But though the article failed to prevent the breakup of the German Nationalist Party, it is nevertheless significant that an ally of Hitler should expose Goering's lie and cast doubt on the guilt of the communists. Why did Goering leave the Reichstag unprotected? The messages issued by the official Preussische Presidienste on February 28th stated that among the material found in Karl Leipnacht House, there were instructions for setting fire to the Reichstag. The search of Karl Leipnacht House took place on February 24th. Already on February 24th and 25th, the whole of the bourgeois press was in an uproar over the alleged murderous plans of the communists. The police president of Berlin made a report to Goering on February 26th on the material alleged to have been found in the catacombs of Karl Leibnacht House. As Minister of the Interior, Goering was in control of the Prussian police. As President of the Reichstag, Goering was in control of the Reichstag building. There was no one else in such a position as he was in to protect the Reichstag against any plot. There was no one whose duty to do this was greater than his. Goering neither called on the police to protect the Reichstag, nor did he take any protective measures within the Reichstag itself. If the material alleged to have been found was real, then at the very least Herr Goering was guilty of abetting the crime. The only conclusions that can be drawn from the fact that the document alleged to have been found in the Karl Leipnacht House have not yet been published, as also from the fact that Goering took no steps to protect the Reichstag, is that the material from the Karl Leibnacht House existed only in the reports in the official Preussische Presidienste. The communists neither intended nor did they make any preparations to set fire to the Reichstag. The incendiaries were National Socialists. Goering sends home the Reichstag officials. Goering not only took no steps to protect the Reichstag building, he also saw to it that the Reichstag officials left the Reichstag before the normal time for finishing duty. On February 27th, the National Socialist Inspector of the building released the officials on duty at one o'clock in the afternoon. The staff told him that it was contrary to the terms of their employment to leave before the end of their spell of duty. The National Socialist Inspector told them to go off duty, as there was nothing to do. Early in March, the foreign press published the information that the staff of the Reichstag had been released from their duties at an early hour on February 27th. The Hitler government has not dared to deny this. Fire Brigade Director puts the blame on Goering. On March 24th, the surprising announcement was made that the Chief Fire Brigade Director of Berlin, Gemp, had been provisionally granted leave of absence, as he had tolerated communist intrigues in the service. The communist intrigues which Gemp was supposed to have tolerated consisted in the fact that in a conference with the inspectors and men of the fire brigade, he had made statements in connection with the Reichstag fire, which threw a curious light on Goering's attitude at the scene of the fire. 
Gemp's statements concern the three following essential points. In a conference with his inspectors and officers shortly before his dismissal, Herr Gemp complained that the fire brigade had been summoned too late. This was the only explanation of why a storm troop detachment, some 20 men strong, was already on the scene of the fire by the time that the fire brigade at last appeared. Herr Gamp complained further that the Minister of the Interior, Goering, had expressly forbidden him to circulate a general call and thereby to summon stronger forces to fight the fire. Finally, Herr Gamp had noticed that in the parts of the Reichstag building which were not destroyed, there were great masses of unused incendiary material lying about. In fact, in various rooms and under and in cupboards, etc., there was material which would have completely filled a lorry. The above report was published in the Sorbuckner Volkstem of April 25, 1933, and thence found its way into the press of the world. Goering did not reply to the report published by the Sorbuckner Volkstem, not even by denying that the report was true. He used it as an opportunity of accusing Gemp of disloyalty. The Deutsche Allegami Zeitung of April 29, 1933, reports how Goering reacted to the disclosure made by the Volkstein. Disciplinary Action Against Director Gemp We have received the following from Commissioner Dr. Lippert. Fire Brigade Director Gemp, Chief of the Berlin Fire Brigade, who was provisionally granted leave of absence by Dr. Lippert, State Commissioner was accused of having tolerated communist intrigues in the service under his control. Gemp then requested that disciplinary proceedings should be started against him. This request was not granted at the time, in view of the fact that Gemp was suspected of other offenses. Disciplinary proceedings have now been opened against him, as he is charged with dereliction of duty under Section 266 of the Criminal Code in connection with the purchase of a motor car through one of the functionaries at that time, the Social Democrat councillor Ahrens. It is not only in the Gemp case that the National Socialists have used the tactics of getting rid of dangerous opponents by means of criminal charges. From the charges brought by Gemp against Goering, it is clear that Goering was interested in the spreading of the fire and not in putting it out. The National Socialists intended to use the Incendiary Act to deal a deadly blow against Marxism. With this in view, it was necessary that the damage done by the fire should be as great and impressive as possible, and therefore it was not to be put out too soon. Three days after the fire, the building was opened for the public to see the effect. The same National Socialist inspector of the building who had sent the staff away early on February 27th was now the official guide through the ruined building. Tens of thousands of people crowded in to see the site. The guide explained, in an expert way, how the fire had been started by the communists, and he did not omit to amplify his description with atrocity stories of what the communists had intended to do. Goering, who had not the courage himself to deny what the Saarbrückner Volkstem reported, compelled Gemp to issue a dementi. Gemp seems to have refused to do so for some time. It was only on June 18, 1933, that a statement by him appeared in the German press, in which he declared that the report published in the Volkstem was false. There is some dementis which establish the truth of the report that is denied and Gemp's delayed dementi is one of this kind. Under the pressure of the charges made against him, and from fear of the sentence of imprisonment with which he was threatened, Gemp gave way to Goering's threats. Where are the instigators of the fire? In the second March number of the conservative weekly journal Der Ring, which is edited by Heinrich von Gleichen, we find... The fire in the Reichstag led to extremely severe countermeasures by the government of the Reich. The authorities are maintaining a state of preparedness for all eventualities. The public and the leading articles in the press are asking, how is it possible? Are we then really a nation of blind hens? 
where are the instigators of this fire whose results show how sure they were of their aims to give a single answer to all questions we must say in all seriousness and to the point we have no secret service such as the english and other nations have if we had such an institution, then we should by now know exactly where the instigators of the Reichstag fire were to be found. In fact, we should already know the actual persons. They are perhaps members of the best German international society. Heinrich von Gleichen is one of the most influential members of the Heron Club. Since Poppen was Chancellor, von Gleichen has been one of the wire-pullers of the government's policy. His connections with the President's palace are more than excellent. In the extract quoted by us from The Ring, von Gleichen openly charges the Hitler government with not having done anything to clear up the Reichstag fire. He asks, where are the instigators of this fire, whose results show how sure they were of their aims? Can anything else be meant by this than that the National Socialists organized the fire in order confidently to win one position of power after the other? After this issue, the ring was prohibited. Dr. Bell tells tales out of school. Elsewhere in this book, an exact account is given of Dr. Bell's death at the hands of the Nazis, here we deal only with his role in connection with the Reichstag fire. We do not propose to rely on the reports which state that before the Reichstag fire, between 8 and 9 on February 27th, Dr. Bell told English and American journalists that the Reichstag was on fire. This statement was deliberately circulated by the Hitler government. The Nazis wanted a favorable opportunity for a dementi and for thus discrediting what Dr. Bell had really stated. Dr. Bell knew van der Lubbe very well, and he was also kept closely informed by van der Lubbe of the connections he had formed with Nazi circles in Munich and Berlin. Although for about a year Dr. Bell had been hostile to the National Socialist Party, he still had a number of men within the party who kept him informed, he knew exactly what had taken place in connection with the Reichstag fire. In the National Club in the Friedrich Ebertstrasse on March 3rd or 4th, Bell betrayed what he knew about the Reichstag fire to a politician belonging to the People's Party. This politician wrote to some of his friends, telling them the information which Bell had given him as to who were the real incendiaries. One of these letters fell into the hands of Dalouegis, the chief of the secret police. The letter cost Bell his life. On April 3rd, he was murdered in the village of Kufstein in Austria by Nazis who went there from Munich. The Murder of Hanussen The clairvoyant Eric Hanussen gave a housewarming party on the day before the Reichstag fire at his new flat in Berlin, Leitzenbergstrasse 16, which he called the Palace of Occultism. Some of the Nazi leaders were present on this occasion, including Count Heldorf, leader of the Berlin Nazis, as well as artists, actors, and journalists. Among them, there was also a reporter of the Berliner Zwolf or Blatt. In the seance, which Hanussen staged, he said, among other things, I see a great house burning. In the first March number of his weekly paper, Hanussen's Bunte Wochenschau, Hanussen printed an article on the political situation. He wrote in this article that he had known in advance of the Reichstag fire, but that he was not able to speak openly of it. It is clear that some leading Nazi must have given Hanussen information before the Reichstag fire, which enabled Hanussen to foresee it. Hanussen must have known a great deal. This is clear from a sworn deposition given us by Dr. Franz Hollering, former editor of the Berliner Zwolf or Blatt. The undersigned Dr. Franz Hollering hereby declares on oath 
in my capacity as editor-in-chief of the berliner zof or blatt and of the montag morgan i was brought into touch between february first and march fourth nineteen thirty three with eric hanussen as the publisher of his national socialist clairvoyant journal which was set up and printed in the same printing works as the papers named above i did not get to know hanussen personally but i had a telephone conversation with him on one occasion when he was trying to get in touch with the business manager of the printing works and the editor roly nurnberg who were not there at the time that was in the night of february twenty seventh the night of the burning of the reichstag the first report of the discovery of the fire had hardly reached the office when hanussen rang up on the telephone he wanted to know from me how far the fire had spread and whether the incendiaries had been caught i replied that an unconfirmed report had reached me about a communist troop which was alleged to have set fire to the reichstag with the help of torches at the same time i pointed out that this report was incredible i said in so many words that the communists particularly in the existing political situation would never have committed such a suicidal act of folly hanussen replied in an excited voice that he was of quite the opposite opinion that he knew it was a communist plot and that i would very soon see the consequences this call came through between nine thirty and nine forty five I made inquiries of my staff, which knew of Hanussen's close connections with Count Heldorf, particularly through his frequent telephone calls to the printing works. Hanussen was generally regarded as exceptionally well informed on National Socialist plans. Signed, Dr. Franz Hollering. Thus, at a time when the first vague reports of the fire in the Reichstag had only just reached the editorial offices, of the newspapers hanussen was already saying that the fire had been started by the communists and that it would have serious consequences this statement of hanussen's shows more clearly than anything else that his informant is to be found in high nazi circles the jew hanussen did not long enjoy the rule of hitler which he had so earnestly desired on april seventh nineteen thirty three his body was found in a little wood by the side of the barut neuhof road he had died at the hands of the nazis the third man who knew the secret after bell hanussen after hanussen dr oberforen of these three persons who knew the secret of the burning of the reichstag dr oberforen was the most dangerous Bell could be got rid of as a political adventurer, Hanussen as a charlatan. Dr. Oberforen was an influential politician, leader of the German nationalist fraction in the Reichstag. In February 1933, he had declared in an election speech that the Hitler government would continue to exist in its then composition, whatever the results of the election events after february twenty seventh shook his belief that the national socialists would stand by the undertaking sworn by hitler on january thirtieth dr oberforn put forward within the german nationalist party the proposal that it should begin the fight against hitler's policy of concentrating power in his own hands in order to win his friends for this fight he recorded what he knew of the Reichstag fire and of the struggle within the cabinet in the memorandum which has already been quoted. The following description by Dr. Oberforum deals with what happened after the Reichstag fire. The German nationalists and the fire. However much the German nationalist party is in agreement with the sharpest measures against the communists, it cannot approve of the act of incendiarism carried out by its coalition friends it is true that the cabinet meeting on tuesday agreed to the sharpest measures against the communists and partly also against the social democrats however no doubt was left that the act of incendiarism would most seriously damage the reputation of the national front abroad in this meeting of the cabinet the sharpest expressions of condemnation were not spared the National Socialist ministers did not succeed in pressing through the prohibition of the Communist Party. 
As already said above, the German nationalists needed the communist deputies in order to prevent the national socialists from having an absolute majority in parliament. At this cabinet meeting, Herr Goering was strictly forbidden to produce in public his forged material from Karl Liebknecht House. It was pointed out that the publication of these crude forgeries would only make things still worse for the government. It was particularly inconvenient for the government that the communist deputy Torgler, leader of the communist fraction in the Reichstag, had put himself at the disposal of the police on Tuesday morning. His flight would have been preferable. The fact that after thousands of communist functionaries had been arrested, and in spite of the threat of a court-martial, he had presented himself to the police was extremely inconvenient for the government. Herr Goering was commissioned to deny that Torgler had given himself up voluntarily. The echo in the world press, however, which followed the Reichstag fire, was so unexpectedly unanimous in attributing the act of incendiarism to leading members of the government that the prestige of the national government was most seriously shaken. However convenient it was for Goering and Goebbels, that the communist and social democratic election propaganda had been silenced, however well they knew that the broad mass of lower middle class persons, clerks and peasants, would believe the story of the Reichstag fire and would consequently give their votes to the National Socialist Party as the leader of the fight against Bolshevism, they were seriously disturbed at the attitude of the German nationalist ministers in the cabinet. Once again, they did not get the prohibition of the Communist Party. In spite of their boundless pretensions, they felt that they were held in an iron embrace by the German nationalists, Stahlheim and the Reichswehr. It was clear to them that they must get out of this embrace as soon as possible. They discussed all kinds of proposals. Finally, the groups decided to make a bid for power by a coup in the night of March 5th to 6th. The plan was to occupy the government quarter and demand from Hindenburg a change in the composition of the cabinet. In this event, Hindenburg was to appoint Adolf Hitler to take over the functions of President of the Reich, and at the same time Hitler was to appoint Goering Chancellor. The discussions led up to the decision to carry through the plan in connection with the great propaganda march of Nazi stormtroops and protective corps through Berlin, at which Hitler would take the salute on Friday, March 3rd. This great propaganda march was then organized. Numbers of provincial stormtroop sections arrived in Berlin. The streets were cleared by the police for the triumphal march. Traffic was diverted, and thousands of people crowded to the Wilhelmstrasse to see the march past the leader, Adolf Hitler. As rumors had been gaining ground that the government quarter was to be occupied in the course of this march, at the last moment, the German nationalist ministers in the cabinet insisted that Adolf Hitler should abandon the march past in the Wilhelmstrasse. The thousands waiting at the Wilhelmstrasse were suddenly told, to their astonishment, that the Nazi march would follow another route, and would not touch the Wilhelmstrasse, but would go through Prince Albrechtstrasse and to the west of the town. However, the German nationalists were obliged to agree, for their part, to abandon a Stahlhelm march through the government quarter, which had been announced for the day of the elections as an act of homage to Hindenburg. The Stahlhelm leaders agreed to the change. The position was extremely serious for the German nationalist ministers. The election results in Lipa Detmo had shown how great the danger was, that German national electors would pass over the national socialists in a body. German nationalist propaganda could not compete with the unrestrained propaganda carried on by the National Socialists. The Herren Club, the groups connected with the Stahlhelm, and the German nationalist leaders discussed the position. After the occupation of the government quarter on March 3rd had been averted, it was necessary to prepare for the threatened coup on the night of March 5th to 6th, with more than the Reichswehr and the Stahlhelm. It was clear that the masses were now no longer behind the old field marshal, but behind their idol, Adolf Hitler. It would be futile to oppose these masses and the sentiment of the masses merely by the use of arms. It was therefore necessary to act as unscrupulously as Goering and Goebbels had done in connection with the Reichstag fire. The following plan was made. 
an official statement was to be made public dealing with the results so far arrived at in the inquiry in connection with the Reichstag incendiaries. This statement was so worded that, if necessary, it would be possible to refer to it to show that they were already then on the tracks of the National Socialist criminals. This official statement could then be used for the press on the night of March 5th through 6th as weapon against the National Socialist ministers, if these really attempted to carry out their plan of occupying the government quarter. It was hoped by these means to throw the National Socialist masses into confusion and, if possible, to win them for the National Front under the leadership of the German Nationalists and for Hindenburg, to disclose the plans for the forcible seizure of power, to accuse Goering, Hitler, and Goebbels of the act of incendiarism in the Reichstag, on the basis of the official communique already issued, and to call on the millions of National Socialists to stand united behind Field Marshal Hindenburg to save the National Front against Marxism. It was hoped by these means to make the national masses prepared to accept a military dictatorship under Hindenburg. Hindenburg himself was not to be present at the Stahlhelm demonstration, but was to spend the night of March 5th to the 6th outside of Berlin under the protection of the Reichswehr, and the Reichswehr itself was to be mobilized for action. Murderer and Incendiary Dr. Oberforn wrote in his memorandum, in the meantime, the men charged by Herr Gehring, under the leadership of Highness, Silesian stormtroop leader, and Reichstag deputy, passed along the heating passages from the palace of the president of the Reichstag and through the underground passage into the Reichstag. The point at which each of the selected stormtroop and protective corps leader was to start a fire was arranged in detail. A general rehearsal had been held the previous day. Van der Lubbe went with them as the fifth or sixth man. When the observation posts in the Reichstag sent word that the air was clear, the incendiary set to work. The starting of the fire was completed within a few minutes. Then their work accomplished, they made their way back by the same route as they had come. Van der Lubbe alone remained behind in the Reichstag building. Dr. Oberforen's statement that Heine's was in charge of the incendiary column, is confirmed from other sources, including Dr. Bell. Heinus was especially suitable for this work. He murders when he is told to, he shoots when he is told to, and he sets fire when he is told to. The incendiary's base. Even if Goering's tools had prepared the act of provocation more carefully, and had not made the whole series of contradictions, which in themselves are overwhelming evidence of the Nazis' guilt, the case against the Nazis would still be clear to all eyes to see. The Wasserische Zeitung of March 1, 1933, contains the following statement emanating from government sources. It is stated that there is irrefutable evidence that Deputy Torgler, chairman of the communist faction of the Reichstag, was in the Reichstag building for several hours with the incendiary, and that he had also been in company with other persons who participated in the incendiary act. It is added that the other criminals may have been able to escape through the underground passage used in connection with the heating equipment of the Reichstag, which connects the Reichstag building itself with the building of the president of the Reichstag. As we have already said, there is in fact an underground passage leading from the Reichstag building to the house of the president of the Reichstag. At the time of the Reichstag fire, the occupant of this house, to which the underground passage leads, was Hermann Goering. He occupies the house through which, according to his own version, the criminals escaped. Hermann Goering is not only prime minister of Prussia, Minister of Police, and President of the Reichstag, Hermann Göring is also one of the chiefs of the Stormtroop Organization. Hermann Göring has at his disposal a special Storm Detachment, Storm Detachment G. His house is constantly guarded by a staff guard consisting of at least 30 men. The official Preussische Presidienst announced that 
at least seven men must have been concerned in bringing the incendiary material into the Reichstag, and the actual operation of starting the fire must have taken ten men. If we accept this statement, at least ten men must have been concerned in the fire. It can be safely assumed that the fire was started at a number of different points in different parts of the building. Otherwise, it would be impossible to explain the rapidity with which the fire spread in the huge building. To start the fire at several points required a considerable quantity of inflammable material weighing several hundredweight. In his report to fire brigade inspectors and men, Director Gemp stated that after the fire, he observed a considerable quantity of incendiary material which had not been used and that a lorry would have been required to carry it. The statement by Director Gemp confirms the assumption that the incendiaries must have taken a large quantity of incendiary material into the Reichstag. How was the incendiary material taken into the Reichstag? We have given a description of the obstacles a visitor has to overcome in order to get into the Reichstag. Visitors are only admitted through door five. They have to pass through a series of officials. Can it be imagined that between seven and ten men carrying several hundred weight of incendiary material can have slipped into the Reichstag without being noticed by a single one of the Reichstag officials? Even the most prejudiced observer must admit that no incendiary and no group of incendiaries could have dared to bring in the material through door five. The case is just the same with the so-called deputies' entrance, door two. Only deputies are allowed to enter by this door. The idea that deputies could have brought hundredweights of incendiary material past the officials at door two is no less absurd than the idea that the material could have been brought in by door five. The incendiaries would therefore have been obliged to choose some other way, a secret way, which would allow them to bring the material into the Reichstag and distribute it at the points required. There is such a secret way into the Reichstag, namely the underground passage, which connects the house of the president of the Reichstag with the Reichstag building itself. This underground passage was the strategic route for the incendiaries. But anyone who wants to use the underground passage to the Reichstag was obliged first to pass through Goering's house, the house of the president of the Reichstag. He was therefore obliged to get past the guards, who were constantly watching Goering's house. He would also have to have run the risk of being seen by someone in Goering's house. Is it conceivable that communists could have got into Goering's house and through it and through the underground passage without being stopped and arrested by the guard of thirty men? Is it conceivable that communists could have taken hundredweights of incendiary material through Goering's house without having been stopped and arrested by the guard? Is it conceivable that communists could have escaped through Goering's house? It is out of the question. Any communist who in those days of February had tried to enter Goering's house would without a doubt have been arrested. It was impossible for communists to reach the Reichstag by way of Goering's house and the underground passage. But for whom, then, was it possible? Only leading National Socialists could have entered Goering's house without attracting attention and without arousing even the slightest suspicion. Many meetings took place in the house between Goering and the leading officials of the National Socialist Party. No stormtroop man would have thought of stopping men who held high positions in his party and whom he often saw visiting Goering's house. There was no danger for such people. They could go in and out as they liked. This is true of all the higher officials. They could have brought the incendiary material required in small quantities without any difficulty and without attracting any attention. The guards would not have noticed anything if a number of chests described as documents or even as arms had been delivered to the basement of the house. 
the transport of arms was taking place in those days wherever there was a nazi headquarters goering's house was the key position for the attack on the reichstag whoever controlled goering's house could do what he liked to the reichstag building goering's house was the bridgehead from which the incendiary column advanced to the assault Goering's house was the depot where the incendiary material was stored. Goering's house was the safe port into which the criminals could flee when they had perpetrated their crime. The Incendiary Column We said above that only leading National Socialists could have entered Goering's house without arousing suspicion. Dr. Oberforen also speaks of selected leaders of the storm troops and protective corps. It is clear that the National Socialist leadership, which devised and organized the plan of the Reichstag fire, were very much interested in seeing that the carrying out of the plan was entrusted to their most reliable praetorians. Goebbels and Goering could not put themselves into the hands of any storm troop members, they could not run the risk that some discontented stormtroop men might expose the real incendiaries. Therefore, they had to seek their accomplices in the ranks of the highest officials of the party. Men had to be found who, on the one hand, would not shrink from any crime, and on the other, were so closely linked to the National Socialist leadership and with their fate that they could not be suspected of any treachery and the ranks of the leaders of the National Socialist Party leadership are full of persons who satisfy these conditions. We know from Dr. Oberforen's memorandum that the murderer Heines was put in charge of the incendiary column. How was the incendiary act carried out? The incendiary column assembled in Goering's house. Heines, Schultz, Heldorf, and the others could get past the guards without interference, as they were known as stormtroop leaders. Van der Lubbe probably went in with Count Heldorf. The first task which had to be carried out was the transport of the incendiary material, for which purpose the incendiaries used the underground passage to the Reichstag from Goering's house. It is probable that several journeys had to be made. They began their operations at an agreed signal, which told them that the last deputy had left the Reichstag. There was no danger of discovery by the Reichstag officials on duty, for these had been sent home by the Nazi inspector before the end of their spell of duty. The distribution of the incendiary material at the various points, and pouring petrol, benzene, etc., over it, must have taken some little time at least twenty minutes. Then the fire was started at different points. The first reports issued by the police and the fire brigade spoke of seven to ten incendiaries and of the fire having started at many points. No one in Germany believed that the incendiaries had got into the Reichstag in the usual way and had left by the usual way. The question was raised, how did the incendiaries escape? Any careless talk by a policeman, any careless talk from a fire brigade, any newspaper report, might create an alarming position. Goering was in an extremely difficult situation. He resorted to an old trick. Before anyone else suggested that the incendiaries must have escaped through the underground passage, Goering wanted to say it himself. He hoped thereby to meet the imminent danger, to present something that was highly suspicious as quite harmless. Goering himself stated that the incendiaries had escaped through the underground passage. But later he bitterly regretted that he had said this. The trick had not come off. And so this underground passage to Goering's house was never again mentioned in any minister's speech or in any official report. Goering's statement was to be forgotten. We have not forgotten it. It is a fact that the incendiaries escaped through the underground passage, but they could only use this passage because they knew it led to Goering's house. 
Göring's house meant safety. The official Preussische Präsident of February 28th stated that the incendiaries had full knowledge of the building. Who other than Göring's friends were in the best position to gain full knowledge, to examine and test the underground passage? Göring was master in the Reichstag. He could give his friends information about every corner of it. He was master in the palace of the president of the Reichstag. He could receive his friends there. He could arrange a store and hiding place for the incendiary material. He was Prussian minister of the interior. He controlled the police throughout Prussia. All the possibilities of organizing the burning of the Reichstag were in the hands of Goering. Van der Lubbe in the burning Reichstag. The Preussische Presidienst tried to persuade the public that van der Lubbe had been unable to escape because he did not know the building. According to Goering and the Preussische Presidienst, all of van der Lubbe's accomplices were quite familiar with the building. It would have been easy for them to take van der Lubbe with them and to save him. But van der Lubbe could not be saved. He had to be left behind in the burning Reichstag, and was left behind because he was the evidence against the communists. Van der Lubbe played his part to the best of his ability. He let himself be arrested in the burning building. He had discarded his shirt and coat so as to present a true picture of a communist incendiary. He confessed to having set fire to the Reichstag. He confessed to any act of incendiarism required in the welfare office in Neulkolm, in the Berlin town hall, in the Berliner Schloss. And van der Luber will confess to everything which his employers ask him to confess. He will say against Torgler whatever his employers tell him to say. He will say against Dimitrov everything that is wanted. He will inculpate everyone whom his National Socialist friends wish to destroy. He will exculpate everyone whom his National Socialist friends wished to protect. Hermann Goering but all of van der Lubbe's confessions could not prevent the failure of the second task, which had been entrusted to him, by giving himself up and confessing to shelter the real incendiaries. The figure of van der Lubbe was too small for this. His role was too obvious. Everyone saw through the trick. They realized that behind van der Lubbe was Captain Hermann Göring one of the stormtroop chiefs, minister of the German Reich, premier and minister of the interior of Prussia, president of the German Reichstag. Captain Goering was born in Rosenheim, Bavaria, on January 12, 1893. His biographers tell us of his heroic deeds as an airman during the war. They forgot to add that his flights were carried out when he was under the influence of morphia. Goering's biographers tell us that in 1925 through 26 he was in Stockholm working for an airplane company. They forgot to add that Hermann Goering, according to the official reports of the Stockholm police, was put into the asylum at Langbro because a doctor had certified him to be of unsound mind. He was subsequently taken to the Konradsberg Hospital near Stockholm. But as a result of his conduct, he was taken back to Langbro and there kept shut up. He could no longer be kept in private mental homes because the staff were unwilling to look after him. And in Langbro, he had such bad attacks that he had to be put into the section for serious cases. All the attempts made by Goering to deny these facts are vain as we have a photograph of the official registration card recording Goering's admission to the Langbro Asylum. Goering's biographers like to record his marriage with Karen von Falk. She had previously been married to a Swede, Captain Kansau. After the divorce, the former couple had a lawsuit over the guardianship of their son Thomas. 
during the court proceedings on april twenty second nineteen twenty six a certificate signed by the police doctor carl a lundberg was submitted we print a photograph of this certificate which says in so many words that goering is seriously addicted to drugs goering's morphia craving has therefore been established before the courts the court decided that goering could not have the guardianship of the boy thomas national socialism has given goring the guardianship of sixty million germans on march tenth nineteen thirty three goring made a speech in essen in the course of which he said quote, my nerves have never given way up to now unquote. he hoped by this remark to silence the statements published in the foreign press regarding his nervous condition at that time he did not realize that there was in existence documentary proof of his nervous condition his insanity his craving for morphia it is no accident that this man is playing a leading part in the third empire he embodies the whole brutality of the old prussian officers corps which has been striving for power ever since nineteen eighteen he is the embodiment of the sadism which in the last few months has led to thousands of murders and tens of thousands of brutal and cruel acts of maltreatment. He is the embodiment of that officer's clique which murdered Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, which shed streams of blood in Hungary, which set up white gallows in Finland, and is now making the whole of Hitler's Germany into a brown hell. Goering represents the content of the policy of the National Socialists. National Socialism does not represent the workers, or the employees, or the middle class, but it represents the interests of the ruling class, of the noble caste. Power was put into the hands of the National Socialists in order that they should maintain the existing economic system and protect it against the menacing forces of social revolution. To protect these interests, National Socialism has taken its highest officials from the ranks of the former officers' corps of the nobility and the high state officials. This Captain Goering brutal in the extreme, lying and cowardly in the extreme, shows the true face of National Socialism. This Captain Goering was the organizer of the Reichstag fire. His party comrade Goebbels invented the plan. Goering carried it through. All the opportunities for doing so were in his hands. All the necessary power was in his hands. He held all the threads. It was the morphia fiend Goering who set fire to the Reichstag. End of chapter 4 Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley Chapter 5 Destruction of the Workers' Organizations Now the hour of reckoning has come when we draw conclusions. Let them be under no illusion that this reckoning may come to some unexpected end. The end of the revolution is the end of the November criminals, the end of that system, the end of that period. We will hunt out these men from their last hiding places, and we will not rest until the body of our nation has been rid of the last traces of that poison. Hitler on May 7, 1933, at Kiel. Hitler expropriates. Hitler has not nationalized a single trust, nor has he expropriated a single financial magnate. But in the first few months of his rule, he has carried through the expropriation of the political and trade union working class organizations of Germany. All communist and social democratic newspapers were prohibited from the night of the burning of the Reichstag. During that week, the Karl Liebknecht House in Berlin, the former headquarters of the Communist Party, was expropriated 
under the Hitler government's emergency decree of February 1933. Then all the printing establishments and buildings owned by the Communist Party throughout Germany were expropriated, and the same procedure was applied to the Berlin evening paper Welt am Abend. The Attack on Trade Union Property Even before the burning of the Reichstag, systematic attacks on trade union buildings and people's houses all over Germany has been made by storm troop detachments. On March 9th, in Chenitz, the business manager of the Social Democratic Printing Works, Landgraf, was shot by storm troopers when they occupied the works. On the same date, Workers armed with rifles and hand grenades defended the trade union house at Wurzen against a storm troop attack. In Braunschweig, Hans Seiler, the circulation manager of the social democratic paper Volksfreund, was shot by storm troopers who occupied the offices of the paper. On the same date, there was a partial strike of the Dresden workers against the looting by Nazis of the people's houses in that town. On the same date, the trade union house in Berlin was looted. The following account of the attack on the trade union headquarters and the Otto Braun house in Königsberg has been given us by an eyewitness. The health section of the trade union association was having its usual monthly meeting and social gathering, Nazi stormtroopers came into the building and suddenly the doors of the room were torn open and about 60 men, armed with revolvers, forced their way into the hall and fired a number of shots at the ceiling and the wall. Five people were wounded, one seriously, by bullets glancing off the walls. Then the bandits drove men and women out into the street without their hats and coats, which were confiscated. After that, the Nazis went through the trade union offices, destroying everything. In the case of the Otto Brown House, two uniformed police officers came to the building at 11.20 p.m. and took away the revolver which was in the possession of the night watchman. They then told him that they would hold him as a hostage, and that they would have to shoot him if any armed person was found in the house. Ten minutes later, a strong storm troop detachment made its appearance and entered the building, the caretaker of the building, with his wife and two daughters, lived there in a flat. Three Nazis went to the flat, and, threatening the caretaker with the revolvers, ordered him at once to open all the rooms in the building. Then the stormtroopers began to smash up everything. They first made for the office of the Reichsbanner organization, and chopped up every piece of furniture into tiny fragments, using axes which they had brought with them. Valuable pictures were destroyed, the cash box was broken open, and every desk smashed. The office was left simply a heap of rubbish. The district office of the Social Democratic Party was dealt with in the same way, and also the office of the Freethinkers' Organization. Then the business manager of the Königsberger Volkszeitung was fetched by three stormtroopers and forced to take them through the offices at the point of the revolver. He was then made to open the garages, which were let to private individuals and firms, and to put the motors there out of action. With the three revolvers pointing at him, he was forced to burn a black-red gold banner in the street. The Saarbrück Volkstimme of March 13th contains the following report of the occupation by Nazis of the offices of the Mine Workers Union in Bochum. The central offices for the Reich, which are also the headquarters of the Bochum Mine Workers Union, were attacked by Hitler's bandits belonging to the stormtroops and protective corps, and destroyed from top to bottom. All documents were set alight, the fire spreading to parts of the building, and the whole of the central executive, or those members who were there, including the president, Hussmann, a member of the Reichstag, were carried off by the stormtroopers and protective corpsmen. These few examples are only a small sample of what went on at the time in every part of Germany. The swastika flag was hoisted over every trade union building, every people's house, every newspaper office belonging either to the Social Democratic Party or to the Communist Party. Moral Provocation 
The burning of the Reichstag was not enough in the way of acts of provocation for the National Socialists, who also resorted to moral provocation. They called the Karl Liebknecht House Horse Vessel House and made it the headquarters of the political police. Karl Liebknecht's name is known to the workers of the whole world. In defiance of martial law, Karl Liebknecht raised his voice against the slaughter of the war. Who was the National Socialist hero, Horst Wessel? He was a student, the son of a Berlin clergyman. Even the Nazis cannot deny that this hero, who used to hunt Marxists at night with his storm troops, lived on the earnings of a prostitute. He was killed in this prostitute's flat by one of her former lovers. The legend writers of National Socialism say that Horst Wessel only wanted to save this woman's soul. The National Socialist Press asserted, and this became the official legend, that Horst Wessel had fallen at the hands of the Communists. Organizations dissolved. There has not been, and there is not now, any formal prohibition of the Communist Party in Germany. But the campaign of terror has in fact put all communist leaders and functionaries outside the law. All organizations which were believed to stand on the basis of the class struggle were outlawed. The trade union organizations of the revolutionary workers among the miners and the metal workers of Berlin and the whole of the revolutionary trade union opposition were driven underground. Revolutionary workers' organizations uniting all parties, such as the Anti-Fascist League, the Red Sports Organizations, the Revolutionary Associations of Writers and Artists and Photographers, etc., were treated in the same way as the Communist Party from the moment of the Reichstag fire. The German Red Aid, a working-class organization for the support of political prisoners and their families, which helped all workers irrespective of their political affiliation, was driven underground. Even aid for the victims of fascist barbarity has to be organized secretly. The International Workers' Relief, which organized help for strikers during industrial disputes, was also outlawed. Its property was confiscated and its officials and members were persecuted. All the social and cultural organizations of the working class were suppressed. The children's organizations, the League for the Protection of Motherhood, the Association of Social and Political Organizations. All pacifist organizations met the same fate. The League for Human Rights, the German Peace Society, and many others. The elections of works councils which took place at the end of March were overshadowed by the campaign of repression of the workers' organizations and could not give a true reflection of the feeling among the workers. A report from the Union Engineering Factory in Dortmund is typical of how these elections were carried out in almost all German factories. At the Union Works in Dortmund, the foreman, Dickmann, whose duty it was to superintend the ballot, was arrested on the day before the election. The Nazis took charge of the ballot papers and called on the workers to vote. Any workers who refused to vote was told that he would be regarded as an enemy of the national government. The table at which the ballot papers were filled was surrounded by armed Nazis. Each worker who came up to vote was listed and a note was kept of which ballot paper he placed in the envelope and handed in. At the end of the ballot, the leader of the Nazis took charge of the ballot box and, with his friends, counted up the votes. Not a single worker of any other organization was allowed to check the result. Yet, in spite of such methods, the elections did not give the Nazis a majority in most factories throughout Germany. What the Nazis could not get by intimidation and falsification was therefore secured by them through the open use of force during the month of April. The cleansing of the works councils by the removal of all elected trade union and revolutionary representatives. Even representatives of the Christian unions, who were known as anti-fascists, were removed from office. 
Stormtroopers marched into the room where the Works Council was meeting, maltreated and imprisoned some, and forced them to resign under the threat of their lives. Appointed Nazi Works Councillors were put in to correct the election results in every factory. Destruction of the Trade Unions The National Labor Day of May 1st, when hundreds of thousands of workers were driven to participate in the official demonstrations by the threat of instant dismissal, served as a preparatory step to the occupation of all trade union offices by the Nazis on May 2nd. The dissolution of the trade unions in the form in which they had hitherto existed was proclaimed in the name of a Committee for the Protection of German Labor, which no one heard of until that moment. It did not help the German General Trade Union Federation that it had called on the workers to participate in the Hitler demonstration of May 1st. The trade union offices were occupied and the trade union leaders maltreated. The German Labour Front took over the whole trade union apparatus. We give below a few documents showing the methods that were used in these attacks on the trade unions. The National Socialists take over the trade unions. The leaders arrested. Action throughout the Reich. Headlines in the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung, May 2, 1933. Yes, we have power, but we have not yet won the whole nation. We have not yet won you workers 100%. From the manifesto issued by Dr. Ley, May 2, 1932. Cleansing of the free trade unions and creation of a labor organization. Stormtroopers occupy all trade union buildings. Fifty trade union leaders arrested. The second stage of the National Socialist Revolution. Headlines in the Volkischer Beobachter, May 3rd, 1933. After Germany, in the most comprehensive meaning of the word, had acknowledged on May 1st the National Socialist conception of the idea of labor, on May 2nd the implications of this acknowledgement were applied throughout the movement. So-called free trade unions have been disloyal to their own real nature and have degenerated themselves and the trade union idea to the level of international Marxism, from Alfred Rosenberg's leading article in the Volkischer Beobachter, May 3, 1933. The National Socialist Factory Organization Journal, the Arbeitertum, which deals with the theory and practice of the National Socialist Factory Organization, becomes from today the official organ of the German General Trade Union Federation and of the AFA Federation. From the Lay Committee Manifesto, issued on May 2nd, 1933. The chapter of Marxist incitement of the workers is closed, after the action taken against the Marxist trade unions met with such tremendous response throughout the nation and particularly in the working class, the General Association of Christian Trade Unions, the Trade Union Association of German Employees, Workers and Officials Associations, Hirsch Dunker, the Federation of Employees, Trade Unions, and other smaller associations under the influence of this mighty national movement found themselves compelled to declare in writing that they put themselves unconditionally at the disposal of the leader of the National Socialist German Labour Party and would carry out without reserve the instructions of the Action Committee for the Protection of German Labour, which he has appointed. From the manifesto issued by Dr. Ley on May 4, 1933. Innumerable cases of corruption among the leaders of the Marxist trade unions. Balance sheet mysteries and dark financial transactions. Eight million organized workers brought under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. Headlines in the Volkischer Beobachter of May 1933. The first manifesto issued by Dr. Ley. The head of the Action Committee for the Protection of German Labor was written in a very friendly tone. We have never destroyed anything which had any kind of value for our nation, nor shall we in the future. This is a fundamental principle of National Socialism. This holds good particularly of the trade unions, which have been built up 
out of the pennies which the workers have earned with such bitter toil and starve themselves to give. No, workers, your institutions are sacred and inviolable to us national socialists. I myself am the son of a poor peasant, and I know poverty. I myself was for seven years in one of the largest factories in Germany. It may be remarked in passing that Dr. Ley was never a worker, but in his seven years of employment with the I.G. Farbend Industry A.G., the Chemical Trust, was a highly paid official of the company and received a large sum when he left. At the moment when they took over the trade unions by force, the National Socialist leaders used the tactics of making a solemn promise to the organized workers that their institutions would be maintained. At the same time, the National Socialist press started a great campaign on the corruption in trade union offices, and the Nazi stormtroopers stood ready with their revolvers and rubber truncheons to persuade everyone of the friendship felt by the Nazis to the working class. A few weeks later, on June 10th, Dr. Ley issued his Fundamental Ideas on Corporate Organization and the German Labor Front, which he himself described as the foundation on which generations will be able to build anew for centuries. The essential paragraph in this so completely new foundation reads as follows. Leadership in the Factory Corporate Organization will, as its first work, restore absolute leadership to the natural leader of a factory, that is, the employer, and will at the same time place full responsibility on him. Only the employer can decide. This passage, which proclaims the absolute dictatorship of the employer in the factory, contains not a trace of the sacredness and inviolability of the trade union organization. Henceforward, the trade unions are to be merely auxiliary instruments used by the state of fascist dictatorship. It is better that we should give it, Marxism, a last shot to finish it off, than that we should ever allow it to rise again. The Leiparts and the Grassmans may hypocritically declare their devotion to Hitler as much as they like, but it is better that they should be in prison, thereby we deprive the Marxist ruffians of their chief weapon, and of the last possibility of strengthening themselves afresh. The diabolical doctrine of Marxism must perish miserably on the battlefield of the National Socialist Revolution. From Dr. Ley's Manifesto of May 2nd, 1933. Corruption on Corruption one of the national socialist methods of fighting is to settle their opponents by bringing charges of corruption against them. It was this method that they used to silence Gimp, the Berlin Fire Brigade director, who knew too much about the burning of the Reichstag. And this was the method they used to settle accounts with large numbers of the officials of the Weimar Republic and many leaders of bourgeois organizations which had not yet been brought into conformity. And it was the method they used to revenge themselves on Gareca, who in 1932 had been head of the Hindenburg Election Committee and therefore one of the chief opponents of Hitler's candidature for the presidency. When, under Dr. Ley's guidance, the free trade unions had been brought into conformity, the National Socialist leaders started their great campaign of exposing the corruption in the trade unions by way of rounding off their soon-forgotten promises of raising trade union benefits and lowering contributions. Long accounts were published in the fascist press of how luxuriously the central offices of the various trade unions were furnished. Columns in the press recounted the high salaries drawn by the trade union leaders. The National Socialist leaders, who had placed the trade union apparatus under the bureaucratic political control of fascist commissioners, tried to rouse the militant members of the trade unions 
against the bureaucracy of their former leaders and against their policy of industrial peace and to exploit this to get support for the cleansing carried out by the fascists the poverty of the workers and the refusal of strike pay to them in former economic struggles was contrasted in the fascist press with the comfortable lives led by the trade union leaders the Volkische Beobachter screamed in heavy type that the president of the AFA Federation, Alf Heuser, had arranged compensation for himself when he retired, amounting to 18 months' salary at 940 marks, a total of 16,920 marks. In addition to facts which savored of corruption, the National Socialist unmaskers produced cases of corruption which they simply invented. Any use of money which did not suit the policy of the Nazis was labeled as dishonest. It was unmasked that in the presidential election campaign, 300,000 marks of trade union money had been handed over by the General Trade Union Federation to the Social Democratic Party, in aid of their campaign for Hindenburg. The Central Union of Employees had given 50,000 marks to the Reichsbanner organization in the spring of 1932, and two amounts of 15,000 marks to the Social Democratic Party funds in July and November of 1932. The revolutionary trade union opposition always opposed the use of trade union money for supporting the capitalist policy of the Social Democrats but it is merely political trickery for the National Socialist leaders who have themselves destroyed the workers' militant organizations to oppose the use of trade union money for purposes which have nothing to do with the class struggle. Confiscation of the Social Democratic Party's property The next step was the confiscation of all property belonging to the Social Democratic Party and the Reichsbanner. Berlin, May 10, 1933, an order had been issued for the confiscation of all the property of the Social Democratic Party and of its newspapers, as well as of the Reichsbanner and its press. The ground for confiscation is the great number of cases of dishonesty which have been discovered as a result of the taking over the trade unions and the labor banks by the National Socialist Factory Organization. In addition to the confiscation of the property of the Social Democratic Party, it must be stated that the property of all organizations connected with the party is also confiscated. Angriff, May 10th, 1933. On the same date, all money belonging to the Social Democratic Party in post office accounts, party publishing concerns, and in the labor bank was confiscated. The offices of the Social Democratic Organizations of the Reichsbanner and of the Party Press were closed. The official Preussische Pressendienst announced that Leipart, the trade union leader and Social Democratic member of the Reichstag, was to be prosecuted for a breach of trust and fraud on the grounds that specific contributions of trade union money had been used for purposes other than those for which they had been provided. The same steps were taken against all organizations connected with the Social Democrats, the Workers' Gymnastic and Sports Federation, the German Free Thinkers League, the Workers' Welfare Association, etc. On May 11th, the Consumers' Cooperative Society was put into safe hands. In order to safeguard the immensely valuable property of the cooperative societies, which is undoubtedly in danger, in the view of the leader, the Reich Minister for Economics and other authorities concerned, it is necessary to put the consumers' cooperative societies into safe hands with a view to their liquidation. It is desirable that the societies in the first instance should not be impeded in their operations. But it is expressly emphasized that, on the other hand, there should be no further extension of the societies. Dr. Ley leader of the German Labor Front, has entrusted the director of the Labor Bank, Karl Muller, with the carrying through of the necessary measures. Volkischer Beobachter, May 12, 1933. 
Under the slogan of the fight against corruption, the property of the trade unions was then confiscated. Following the confiscation of the property of the Social Democratic Party and of the Reichsbanner organization, the corruption department of the Prussian Ministry of Justice has now confiscated the entire property of the trade unions. Dr. Ley, the leader of the German Labor Front, has assumed responsibility for carrying this step into effect. Volkerscher Beobachter, May 13, 1933. On June 23, 1933, the Hitler government dissolved the Social Democratic Party in the form which has now become usual. The party was forbidden to undertake any political activity, and its representatives were turned out of all parliaments. Even the support given by the Social Democratic Party to Hitler's declarations on foreign policy on May 17th in the Reichstag and the efforts made by Loba, the new party leader, to secure toleration from the Hitler government by repudiating the section of the Social Democratic Party executive which had emigrated, proved to have been in vain. Expropriation of Communist Property On May 27, 1933, after every piece of property of the Communist Party and of the press and organizations associated with the party had been confiscated for some months, the following act on the confiscation of communist property was published. Section 1. Subsection 1. The supreme authorities of the federal states, or officials authorized by them, may confiscate for the benefit of the state any property and rights of the Communist Party of Germany and of its auxiliary and substitute organizations, as well as property and rights which are used or destined to be used for the furtherance of communist aims. Subsection 2. The Minister of the Interior of the Reich may requisition the supreme authorities of the federal states to take measures for the enforcement of subsection 1. Section 2. The provisions of section 1 do not apply to property, leased or put at the disposal of the Communist Party without transfer of ownership except when the leaser or supplier had in view the furtherance of communist aims section three all existing rights relating to the property which is confiscated are cancelled the confiscation of real estate does not however affect existing rights affecting the property the authorities enforcing the confiscation may declare such rights cancelled where the value given in exchange for the rights was intended for the furtherance of communist aims. Section 4. In cases of hardship, creditors having claims on the confiscated property may receive compensation from the proceeds of this property. Section 7. Provides that no compensation shall be given, and Section 8. Empowers Dr. Frick, Reich Minister of the Interior, to issue regulations for the enforcement of the act. The Welt am Abend, a militant working-class paper with a big circulation in Berlin, was confiscated among the other property of the Communist Party, or of what were alleged to be communist organizations. When it became clear that the official National Socialist newspapers were not penetrating working-class circles, the Gables Ministry of Propaganda bethought itself of a new way of deceiving the workers. At the end of May, a new National Socialist journal began to appear with the same title and the same general makeup as the Welt am Abend. Its first few issues also followed the nature of the contents of the old paper. A so-called objective report on the Soviet Union was published, and in other ways an attempt was made to appeal to working-class readers. But within a very short time, the new paper found itself obliged to defend itself publicly against the exposure of its aims, which had been made in illegal leaflets circulating among the workers of Berlin. The Corporate Aims of the National Socialists The clearer it became, 
that the national socialist government could do nothing to overcome the economic difficulties facing germany but was in fact driving germany forward to catastrophe the more brutally the nazis applied their dictatorial powers they necessarily pushed forward towards the absorption of all power towards the monopoly of all power in the hands of their own party and of its pseudo-workers organizations the catholic convention in munich at which the vice-chancellor von papen was one of the official speakers was dissolved by the police christian organizations were forbidden to undertake any activity other than religious the growing rival force of the german nationalist factory and defense organizations was forcibly destroyed by the police the few representatives of the christian trade unions in the newly formed great convention of labor which formed the central organization of all the trade unions which had been brought into conformity were thrown out of the convention under a regulation issued by dr ley on june twenty third on the grounds that they were enemies of the national government in his fundamental ideas on the corporate organization and the german labor front which were published in the volkischer beobachter of june eighth through tenth of nineteen thirty three dr ley sets forth in programmatic form the corporate aims of the national socialists after the worker organizations have been destroyed a the workers are forbidden to fight for higher wages because such a fight is only the expression of greed for money lay's actual words were we know how the greed for profit can get control of men we know how the greed for money dominates everyone one man strives to get more wages another strives for higher dividends but just because we know this we recognize with equal clarity that this beast within individual men should not be allowed to be nurtured by artificial organizations but that it must be the task of a higher state leadership to set bounds to this human weakness to restrain it if necessary to put brutal limits and barriers in its way b the leadership of the employer in the factory is to be restored without any limitation dr ley says for this reason corporate organization will as its first work restore absolute leadership to the natural leader of a factory that is the employer and will at the same time place full responsibility on him the works council of a factory is composed of workers employees and employers nevertheless it will have only a consultative voice only the employer can decide many employers have for years had to call for the master in the house now they are once again to be the master in the house c the inflexible wages agreements of the past are to be smashed to pieces wages agreements must be as living and flexible as possible d the last illusion of independence is stripped from the former labor courts their place is taken by so-called corporate courts composed of representatives of employers and selected fascists masquerading as representatives of workers and employees the program put forward by dr ley is not a private suggestion of his own but a program worked out at hitler's instructions on behalf of the party and the government its hostility to the workers and friendliness towards the employers is obvious the corporate organization which is supposed to be going to overcome the division of society into classes and the class struggle is based at all points on the sharpening of the employer's class dictatorship the appointment of twelve labor trustees with power to dictate working conditions in all areas of germany is to serve the same purpose the complete abolition of any rights possessed by the workers to a voice in determining their own conditions of life the occupation by nazis of all trade union posts and of all positions in the state and every form of organization paves the way for the establishment of a universal national socialist bureaucracy in the conditions existing under capitalism 
with the forcible abolition of all control from below, this monopoly must necessarily be the source of the worst forms of corruption. But each day that passes shows that all the mania for destruction, the arbitrary measures and murder lust of the national socialist leaders, is powerless to destroy the militant movement of the German working class. End of chapter 5. Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley Chapter 6 The Campaign Against Culture At the same time as their main attack against the German working class and its organizations, Hitler and Goebbels are also waging war against the best sections of the German intelligentsia. Nazi boots trample on the life work of the most prominent scientists and artists. In the literal sense, they trample on the brutally treated bodies of many intellectuals who are hated by the Nazis on account of their independence, their progressive and liberal outlook, although in many cases they have had no connection whatever with the militant workers. Under Hitler, even a liberal outlook is a crime which must be mercilessly avenged. Goebbels commands the Brown Inquisitors, who think that they can turn back the wheel of history to long before the French Revolution. Everything Jewish or supposedly Marxist, everything that embodies the progress and enlightenment of the last 150 years, is to be rooted out. In Hitler's Germany, there is no room for conceptions of any spiritual freedom, for any moderate goodwill felt by bourgeois professors to scientific impartiality, for even the most distant expression of the social struggle for the freedom of the masses in works of art. These are driven from professional chairs from the stage, from the desks of lecturers and conductors. They are driven from the hospitals, from the research institutes and the academies. The pyres of advanced literature in German city squares blazon far into the distance the message that the brown barbarians intend not only to extirpate physically the most courageous and self-sacrificing anti-fascists, but also to destroy everything of any vitality and worth and even anything that was at all progressive, even from a bourgeois standpoint. The last standard-bearers of intellectual liberalism are now being physically and intellectually murdered by that brown force which the ruling powers have unchained in order to postpone the collapse of the capitalist system. The most recent events in Germany have shown more clearly than ever that in our epoch the future of culture is inseparably connected with the working-class struggle for freedom persecution of scientists fascism's deadly hatred is naturally directed against those intellectuals who have sided with the working class struggle for freedom or are connected with pacifist organizations the attack on them followed immediately after the burning of the reichstag the first series of arrests which began after the incendiary act of the brown provocateurs affected particularly the german group of the league of doctors against imperialist war which had been formed at Amsterdam. Since the end of February, the leader of this group, Dr. Felix Bunheim, has been in one of Hitler's prisons. Dr. Bunheim is an extremely respected specialist for internal diseases, and his many scientific works have made him famous. He belongs to no party. The scientific importance of his works secured for him a responsible post in the Hufeland Hospital, one of the largest in Berlin. The mere fact that Dr. Felix Bunheim put himself at the head of the doctor's movement against war has been enough to expose him to the undying hate of the Hitler fascists. His work on behalf of the International Doctors' League has been arbitrarily denounced as high treason. He has not been allowed any legal aid. In spite of his imprisonment for several months, he has been refused any contact with his family. Max Hodan, known for his activities in the sphere of advice to working men and women in sexual matters, and author of a number of popular scientific works, has for some months been in the hands of Hitler's myrmidons. The well-known Marxist scientist Hermann Duncker, a name which ranks high in the workers' movement throughout the world, has been imprisoned in spite of his age and the fact that he was seriously ill. His life is in serious danger. The man who was regarded by a whole generation of social democratic workers as one of their most esteemed teachers is now being physically and mentally destroyed in Hitler's prisons. 
the writer carl august Wittfogel, author of an extremely well-informed book on china the writers ludwig wren carl von osieski kurt hiller egon irvin kisch eric musam klaus neukranz eric baron and many others and the doctors professor scheller of breslau dr asch of berlin and dr volgemuth of hamburg have been arrested the scientific institutes universities and schools are to be turned into drill halls for storm troop culture the persecution of scientists of high standing who are suspected of marxist pacifist or liberal ideas touches even the ranks of the german nationalist party the lecturing staffs of the most important german universities are being wiped out with a relentlessness worthy of the vandals denunciation and the grabbing of posts by incompetent but at least ambitious near scientists are now the order of the day the flower of german science driven out we select only a few examples from the list of dismissals persecutions and of persons granted leave of absence the best known case is that of albert einstein whose reputation as a physicist is worldwide albert einstein a swiss subject member of the prussian academy of sciences has incurred the hatred of the nazis for his left democratic political views his active interest in the jewish question and his world-renowned scientific achievements einstein's scientific works were burnt in the bonfire at the university of berlin amid the delighted howls of the nazis this act alone is enough to make hitler's germany a laughing-stock in the world of modern science no branch of modern industry can thrive without the exact sciences but hitler's regime has driven from their posts the most outstanding representatives of the exact sciences and mathematics the university of Göttingen has a long tradition behind it and in the last fifty years has trained a whole generation of brilliant research workers the most prominent professors of this university have been driven out james franck an experimental physicist with a worldwide reputation and a nobel prize winner was forced to take voluntary leave of absence because he is a jew professor born also a well-known physicist is no longer allowed to carry on his un-german researches in germany courant is a mathematician an authority on the theory of functions bernstein is one of the most important european experts in actuarial mathematics emmy noether has a reputation in the field of mathematics and higher algebra all of these were driven out the berlin faculty of mathematics was also deprived of its most outstanding teachers and the berlin technical university has also to record heavy losses among those who have been driven out is professor arthur korn a physicist who invented the first practical method of achieving television the berlin mathematicians who were sacrificed in the cleansing of the university include schur the algebraist and professors missis and bieberbach this outburst of fury directed against the representatives of the exact sciences is suicidal even from the standpoint of the modern capitalist development of industry and stands in sharp contrast with the opportunities which the soviet union has offered to all genuine scientists among the victims of the nazi cleansing there is a nobel prize winner of the name of fritz haber haber the leader of an important school of chemists was a scientific figure of the first rank even before the war he invented the first practical method of obtaining nitrogen from the air he is anything but a pacifist during the war his inventions were of the greatest service to imperial germany his name represents the highest development of modern german chemistry the times of may fourth nineteen thirty three justly remarked that it is an irony of fate that the nazis should compel this man to resign his post when the fact that germany was able to hold out for four years was in all probability due to him more than to any other man professor polanyi who was also driven out was one of haber's principal colleagues among others who had to make room for the cultural barbarism of the nazis we must also mention professor buck of berlin who has worked on the planckian quantum theory and the Königsberg mathematician hensel known for his original work on the theory of number the keel professor adolf frankel author of an important work on the theory of quantity and the berlin physicist pringsheim whose works deal with important problems of radiation 
all the scientists mentioned are well-known research workers and lecturers of high standing in scientific circles even this very incomplete list is enough to show that these expulsions amount to the virtual destruction of german science that german fascism is fighting every scientific advance with its inquisitions and incendiarism no passports for scientists the appointment of albert einstein to the institute of france and the lectures given in stockholm by professor bernhard zondek a dismissed gynecologist led to the demand being seriously put forward that the passports of expelled university professors should be taken from them that the un-german spirit of these scientists should not be allowed to benefit foreign universities in connection with einstein's appointment at the institute of france the taglicke rundschau a journal of the right on april seventeenth nineteen thirty three demanded that the government should at once deprive the sixteen dismissed university professors of their passports as otherwise there could be no guarantee that one or other of them might not shortly occupy a chair in paris oxford or london and use that post to carry on his anti-german politics that in this connection it was necessary to remember that some of these professors such as kelsen lederer and bonn had extremely good connections abroad germany's greatest doctors may not work in germany bernhard zondek has been described by euler the swedish nobel prize winner for medicine as the one outstanding genius zondek invented a method of chemical analysis of the urine which makes it possible to ascertain pregnancy in the earliest stages this method is of extreme importance for social hygiene as well as from the purely medical standpoint zondek has done brilliant work in the investigation of hormones he has been attempting to produce the sex hormones substances which are different in men and women their existence was only recently discovered he is one of the pioneers in this method of research and quite recently achieved astounding success in the artificial reproduction of sex hormones but the hitler government deprives him of his professorial chair friedman who has been carrying on research into tuberculosis has been removed from his post in berlin he is the inventor of a very valuable anti-tuberculosis serum tuberculin moritz borkart director of the surgical department in the moabit hospital in berlin was in his youth an assistant of the famous german surgeon von bergmann and subsequently doctor in charge of the firko hospital in berlin he has applied surgery in the fight against tuberculosis he has now been removed from his post by a national socialist commissioner of health the destruction of the hirschfeld sexual science institute a reliable witness who although not himself attached to the institute was able to see and hear exactly what occurred has made the following deposition as to the destruction of this scientific institute which is known throughout the world on the morning of may sixth the berliner lokalamtiger reported that the cleansing of berlin libraries of books of un-german spirit would be begun that morning and that the students of the gymnastic academy would make a start with the sexual science institute this institute was founded by dr magnus hirschfeld in nineteen eighteen in the house formerly occupied by prince hatzfeld and was shortly afterwards taken over by the prussian government as an institution of public importance its unique collection of exhibits its research work its archives and its library won for it an international reputation and international connections many foreign scientists doctors and writers came to berlin for the purpose of working at the institute on the publication of the press notice referred to an attempt was made to remove for safekeeping some of the most valuable private books and manuscripts but this proved to be impossible as the person removing the books was arrested by a guard which had evidently been placed round the institute during the night at nine thirty a m some lorries drew up in front of the institute with about one hundred students in a brass band they drew up in military formation in front of the institute and then marched into the building with their band playing as the office was not yet open there was no responsible person there there were only a few women and one man the students demanded admittance to every room and broke in the doors of those which were closed including the office of the world league for sexual reform when they found that there was not much to be had in the lower rooms they made their way up to the first floor 
where they emptied the ink bottles over manuscripts and carpets and then made for the bookcases they took away whatever they thought not completely unobjectionable working for the most part on the basis of the so-called blacklist but they went beyond this and took other books also including for example a large work on tutankhamen and a number of art journals which they found among the secretary's private books they then removed from the archives the large charts dealing with intersexual cases which had been prepared for the international medical congress held at the kensington museum in london in nineteen thirteen they threw most of these charts through the windows to their comrades who were standing outside they removed from the walls other drawings and photographs of special types and kicked them round the room leaving it strewn with torn drawings and broken glass when one of the students pointed out that this was medical material another replied that this was of no importance that they were not concerned with the confiscation of a few books and pictures but that they were there to destroy the institute a long speech was then made and a life-size model showing the internal secretion process was thrown out of the window and smashed to pieces in one of the consulting rooms they used a mop to smash a pantostat used in the treatment of patients they also took away a bronze bust of dr hirschfeld and a number of other statues on the first occasion they only seized a few hundred books out of the library of the institute the staff was kept under observation during the whole of the proceedings and the band played throughout so that a large crowd of inquisitive people gathered outside at twelve o'clock the leader made a long speech and then the gang left singing a particularly vulgar song and also the horsed vessel song the people in the institute assumed that this concluded the robbery proceedings but at three o'clock in the afternoon a number of lorries filled with storm troopers appeared and explained that they would have to continue the work of confiscation as the men who had been there in the morning had not had time to make a proper clearance this second troop then proceeded to make a careful search through every room taking down to the lorries basket after basket of valuable books and manuscripts two lorry loads in all it was clear from the oaths used that the names of the authors whose books were in the special library were well known to the students sigmund freud whose photograph they took from the staircase and carried off was called that jewish sow freud and havelock ellis was called that swine other english authors wanted by them were oscar wilde edward carpenter and norman hare and also the works of judge lindsay the american juvenile judge margaret sanger and george sylvester fierrick and of french writers the works of andre gide marcel proust pierre lotti zola etc the sight of the works of the danish author lundbach also made them break out into oaths many bound volumes of periodicals were also removed they also wanted to take away several thousand questionnaires which were among the records but desisted when they were assured that these were simply medical histories on the other hand it did not prove possible to dissuade them from removing the material belonging to the world league for sexual reform the whole edition of the journal sexus and the card index in addition a great many manuscripts including many unpublished ones fell into their hands they repeatedly inquired when dr hirschfeld would be returning they wanted as they expressed it to be given the tip as to when he would be there even before this raid on the institute storm troopers had visited it on several occasions and asked for dr hirschfeld when they were told that he was abroad owing to an attack of malaria they replied then let's hope he'll die without our aid then we shan't have to hang him or beat him to death on may seventh the berlin and foreign press reported the attack on the sexual science institute and the executive committee of the world league for sexual reform sent a telegraphic protest pointing out that a considerable portion of the material was foreign property and asking that it should at least not be burnt no attention was paid to this telegram which was addressed to the minister of education and three days later all the books and photographs together with a large number of other works were burnt on the opera square more than ten thousand volumes from the special library of the institute were destroyed the students carried dr hirschfeld's bust in their torchlight procession and threw it on the fire the nazi report described this deed of culture in the following terms energetic action against a poison shop german students fumigate the sexual science institute 
detachment x of the german student organization yesterday occupied the sexual science institute which was controlled by the jew magnus hirschfeld this institute which tried to shelter behind a scientific cloak and was always protected during the fourteen years of marxist rule by the authorities of that period was an unparalleled breeding-ground of dirt and filth as the results of the search have proved beyond question a whole lorry-load of pornographic pictures and writings as well as documents and registers have been confiscated the criminal police will have to deal with a part of the material found another part of it will be publicly burnt angriff may sixth nineteen thirty three un-german sociologists and jurists in turning out well-known sociologists and jurists the national socialists have also got rid of many good conservative elements the best known of these dismissed professors is the heidelberg sociologist alfred weber who in connection with his brother max weber now dead published many profound studies of the forms of development of the primitive economy of a number of peoples and cultures in countries outside europe weber is by no means a marxist but a bourgeois professor but he committed the mortal sin of not describing other peoples and cultures as half apish and subhuman as laid down by national socialism the berlin commercial academy loses its rector the prominent liberal economist professor bonn the professor of constitutional law anschutz was compelled to leave heidelberg university he had been for many years a professor at berlin university even in imperial germany he was an authority of the first rank in his sphere and subsequently he was an authoritative commentator on the weimar constitution many of his colleagues were also sent into the wilderness professor kelsen of cologne harms his colleague at kiel feiler former editor of the frankfurter zeitung the right social democrat emil radbruck the social democrat sinsheimer in frankfurt laterer in heidelberg and heller in frankfurt all of them jurists the greatest german authority on civil law professor martin wolf was forcibly driven out of his lecture room by swastika students the liberal lewin schuchin of kiel an authority on international law who represented germany at the hague international tribunal was driven from his post prominent psychologists too were driven from their lecture rooms william stern of hamburg who has published important works on child psychology and max wertheimer of frankfurt are no longer allowed to lecture at german universities in hamburg in addition to a half dozen of less well-known professors the philosopher ernst kassirer was dismissed he was a man of great learning and reputation of the so-called marsburg school books by weight in berlin the political police have confiscated approximately ten thousand hundred weight of books and periodicals and removed them to the stables of the former mounted police where they are being carefully examined the seizure of the books was not carried out everywhere without friction as soon as it became known that the operation was in progress many libraries put their books into hiding places to prevent their seizure by the police most of the hiding places were however discovered many of the books were found scattered in coach houses cellars sheds under floors and in private houses volkischer beobuchter may twenty first nineteen thirty three on the bonfires we are not and do not want to be the land of goethe and einstein not on any account berliner local may seventh nineteen thirty three when the caliph wanted to burn the famous library of alexandria some people begged him to preserve this valuable collection why asked the caliph if these books contain what is in the koran then they are superfluous and if anything else is in them then they are pernicious and so the library of alexandria was burnt on may tenth the square in front of the berlin opera house opposite the university was aglow with the flames of a great bonfire the whole square was cordoned off with brown and black detachments of the storm troops and protective corps lorries brought in gigantic heaps of books bands played orders rang out the minister of propaganda goebbels rushed up in a car in the year nineteen thirty three this extraordinary spectacle of the burning books took place to the sound of the horse vessel and deutschland songs 
on to the bonfire were thrown the works of karl marx frederick engels lenin and stalin rosa luxemburg karl liebknecht and august bebel deutschland deutschland über alles on to the bonfire were thrown the works of pacifist writers bourgeois poets and social reformers whose names ranked high in bourgeois germany the flames consumed the works of thomas mann and heinrich mann leonard frank magnus hirschfeld sigmund freud jacob wassermann stefan zweig bert brecht alfred doblin and theodore plivier deutschland deutschland über alles this destruction of all advanced creations of the intellect took place not far away from the pedestal of alexander and wilhelm von humboldt in the berlin university wilhelm von humboldt who founded this university and became one of the standard bearers of the spirit of the enlightenment aimed at raising junker prussia to the level of the bourgeois world of the west now german students in nazi uniform carried out this pogrom against advanced literature in front of his statue deutschland deutschland über alles the crackling flames in front of berlin university the pall of smoke over the heads of a chauvinistic mob a speech from goebbels reich minister of propaganda this made a spectacle which the berliner twelve uhr mittagsblatt a loyal hitler journal with unconscious irony described as spectral it has forgotten the fires lighted by the oppressors of every age and what came of them the flames in front of berlin university were to consume not only marxist works but the highest achievements of bourgeois culture and science of the last hundred and fifty years the mania for the destruction of all advanced literature raged through every province of germany tens of thousands of private libraries were confiscated in the course of raids on houses and often destroyed on the spot the library in the leipzig volkshaus one of the largest and most valuable libraries in germany with rare and irreplaceable publications of the working-class movement fell victim to the brown culture-bearer's hatred of marxism here are some instances of the public burning of books reported by the german national telegraphen union of may tenth berlin may tenth in munich a ceremony was carried out in the inner court of the university which was presided over by the rector the official speech was made by the bavarian minister of education who spoke of the national revolution and the tasks of the universities at the end of the proceedings there was a torchlight procession to the Königsplatz, where the burning of un-german books was carried out in dresden the poet wilhelm vesper spoke at the students demonstration here too there was a long torchlight procession to the bismarck colonnade where after an address by the senior dresden student all filthy and disgusting literature was burnt in breslau the students demonstration took place at the castle square after an official speech by professor bornhausen about forty hundredweight of filthy and shameful books were burnt in frankfurt on main professor fricke opened the proceedings which took place on the historic Römerberg. a wagon filled with the books which were to be burnt as a symbol was drawn by two oxen to the place where the bonfire had been made the burning of the books concluded with the singing of the horst vessel song a few days earlier the works of the great german poet heinrich heine had been committed to the flames in dusseldorf in his speech at berlin herr goebbels spoke of the burning of the books as a very symbolic act the burning was not symbolical the german fascist reactionaries are determined in actual fact and quite unsymbolically to burn anything printed which does not suit them just as they are determined physically to exterminate all writers and distributors of anti-fascist literature a blacklist the hugenberg organ the nachtesgabe published on april twenty sixth nineteen thirty three the following blacklist of literature which deserved to be burnt belle lettres shalom ash henri barbus bertold breck max broad except his novel tycho brahe alfred doblin except for wallenstein ilia ehrenberg albert ehrenstein arthur flesser leon fuchtwanger ivan gol yaroslav hasek walter hasenclever arthur holitscher heydrich edward jacob joseph kalinikau gina kaus egan erwin kisch heinz liebmann 
Heinrich Mann, except Flöten und Dolce, Klaus Mann, Robert Neumann, Ernst Ottwald, Kurt Pintus, Theodor Plivier, Eric Maria Remarque, Ludwig Renn, only not Krieg, Alfred Schirokauer, Arthur Schnitzler, Richard Bierhofen, Ernst Toller, Kurt Tukolsky, Arnold Zweig, Stefan Zweig, and Katerina Wirt Soldat by Adrian Thomas. Political Science Lenin, Karl Liebknecht, Karl Marx, Hugo Preuss, Walter Rathenau, Rudolf Hilferding, August Bebel, Max Adler, S. Offhauser, E. I. Gumbel, N. Bucharin, L. Bauer, and Helen Keller. All of La Salle, except for his Assizes speeches and On the Special Connection of the Present Historical Period with the Idea of the Workers as a Class. History in general all pacifist and defeatist works also all pro-bolshevik literature on russian history must be destroyed this includes the work of otto bauer karl chupik oscar blum paul hahn muller franken kurt kerstein's bismarck und seine zeit franz mehring's zur deutschen geschichte and zur prussischen geschichte and the works of glacier and upton sinclair Gutjahr, head of the Berlin-Brandenburg section of the German student organization, directed the burning of the books on the square in front of Berlin University. In addition to the works of the authors enumerated above, he also ordered to be thrown onto the flames the works of Engels, Sigmund Freud, Emil Ludwig, Alfred Kerr, Osiecki, Theodor Wolff, George Bernhard, Bertha von Suttner, Rosa Luxemburg, Theodor Heuss, Freiherr von Schoenig, and Van de Velde. The ideological weakness of the brown rulers manifests itself in this war of destruction waged against science and literature for the purpose of destroying everything that is necessary to an understanding of the history of culture and science. But Hitler's burning of all the works of progressive German thought cannot wipe out the memory of what mankind has owed in the past to German thought. The flames of the fires on the Berlin Opera Square have not destroyed Germany's ability to help forward the development of human culture. Not Hitler, Goebbels, Goering, and Rust are the representatives of the real German mind, but the millions of men and women whom the Hitler regime is now persecuting as anti-fascist workers, scientists, artists, and intellectuals. Cleansing of the Prussian Academy of Poets we are not here concerned with whether the Prussian Academy of Poets has produced any positive and really creative work during the existence of the Weimar Republic. Measured by their swastika successors, the poets who have been ejected from the Academy or forced to resign from it are indeed giants. First among the purged members of the Academy is Thomas Mann, the Nobel Prize winner and perhaps the most representative writer of bourgeois Germany. His crime was that in recent years he had been drawing closer to a social democratic standpoint and had even on several occasions raised his voice against deliberate judicial murders as in the cases of sacco and vanzetti and rahosi he once described the national socialist party as the most noxious refuse of the age and this crime will never be forgiven him his brother heinrich mann tried to maintain the position of a free and independent mind he caricatured the middle class of imperial germany der untertan and also of the republic the grosse sacke he supported the amsterdam international anti-war movement and he has therefore like his brother had his books burnt and he himself has been hunted out by hitler's culture bearers jacob wasserman is another of the writers who has incurred the nazis hatred his books have been translated into many languages his chief crime is that he is a jew and that he has expressed liberal ideas in his novels. Alfred Doblin, by profession a doctor in a working-class quarter of Berlin, also wrote a number of fantastic and, to some extent, exotic novels. Die Drei Sprünge de Wang Lun, Wallenstein, Berger, Mira und Giganten. His last novel was Berlin Alexanderplatz. In public debates, Doblin described himself as a class-conscious bourgeois, he experimented a great deal in his style and treatment, somewhat like the Irishman James Joyce in the American Dos Passos. 
franz werfel who never went outside the range of bourgeois ideas was the pioneer of expressionism twenty years ago his novel verdi won him great popularity the nazis could not leave him alone others ejected were rene schickela the german poet of alsatian origin and lenhard frank author of the anti-war book der mensch ist gut and the novels die ruberbande and die ursache although he had been moving to the right during recent years his past was enough to win for him the nazis hate dramatists turned out of the academy included georg kaiser whose talent was unique though extremely anarchist in tendency and fritz von unruh the dramatist of the weimar republic bernhard kellermann a gifted story writer of liberal tendencies the poets Mombert and rudolf panwitz and ludwig fulda a writer of comedies were all ejected one of the few german women writers of any literary ability ricarda hook resigned from the academy early in april among the politically colorless members of the academy such as oscar lurka and jacob schaffner gerhard hauptmann must also be mentioned these were allowed to remain in the academy hauptmann who wrote the story of the weavers had already been through many transformations during the war he was one of the ninety-three intellectuals who signed a manifesto supporting the warlords after the war he became the official poet of the weimar republic and now he maintained a determined silence when the brown terror was driving the best bourgeois writers and scientists out of the country and now for the men whom rust the nazi minister of education has brought into the prussian academy of poets the leading figure is hans Jost who once eagerly supported the revolution but the crime of november nineteen eighteen is now forgiven he is the only national socialist writer who has achieved a certain reputation at present his schlageter drama is being played on instructions from the hitler government in hundreds of german theatres its hero declares when i hear the word culture i get my browning ready herr rust's special attractions in the academy apart from hans Carossa, are quite insignificant writers like Emil Strauss, Will Vesper, Wilhelm Schaffer, Agnes Miegel, and Peter Dorfler. Hans Grimm wrote a novel on The Nation Without Room for Expansion, and Boris von Munchausen has written slight ballads expressing German sentiments. In their endeavor to find names of any kind of significance, the National Socialists even approached the poet Stefan George, the most snobbish and superior of all German poets hoping to be able to use his name to grace adolf hitler's cultural policy brown poetry dr joseph goebbels minister of propaganda in the third empire wrote a novel called michael a german destiny in diary form michael the yearning german soul has visions evil appears to him in the form of ivan the russian who tries to entice him into bolshevism michael's soul struggles with the tempter but i am stronger than he now i have him by the throat now i hurl him to the ground there he lies the death rattle in his throat and bloodshot eyes perish carrion i trample on his brains and now i am free that is the spirit which makes a man worthy of the hitlerized academy of poets i trample on his brains perish carrion the notorious writer hans heinz ivers who was appointed by goebbels as head of the association of german authors after it had been brought into conformity has not yet been officially admitted to the academy of poets his pornographic novels alrana and der vampire were subsequently put on the list of filthy and disgusting literature by the nazis themselves and they were the only ones which really deserved it but he is the official biographer of horst wessel the hero of national socialism on hitler's birthday a horst wessel play by avers was broadcast by the german wireless this writer's existence had been completely forgotten for many years until he was resurrected to be the official poet of the third empire in nineteen twenty two ivers wrote a foreword expressing great sympathy for the jews to israel zangwill's die stimme von jerusalem but the state of the market has altered since then and avers has become an anti-semite 
thus the prussian academy of poets has been reconstructed under the banner of the spirit which expresses itself in such an awakening lyric as the following all the little birds are already there air nun ada and all little birds one now adieu my dear fatherland at strasbourg a great lamentation begins hail to thee in thy crown of victory a summons thunders through the land rosa luxemburg is floating in the canal karl liebknecht is hanging on the tree two all little birds are already there all little birds all thrush finch and tit and the reichsbanner black red what a pity that there's no gold for ever a pity from germany awake the small nazi songbook edition b published by paul Ehren, sulzbach oberfaltz eighth edition it must not be thought that this gem of brown poetry broadcast in the eighth edition is not typical there is no difference between this and the most popular nazi songs when jewish blood spurts from under the knife things will be twice as good as before or the red brood beat them to a pulp storm troops are on the march clear the way the campaign against un-german music herr joseph goebbels reich minister of propaganda told the german theatre managers and actors on may ninth that art comes from ability and not from the will by way of illustrating this fine sentiment we give below a further list of losses to german art bruno walter otto klemperer and fritz busch were always reckoned among the best creative artists of germany for some years otto klemperer directed the kroll opera house in berlin and under him it became a centre of modern music it was he who brought forward hindemith and kurt weil klemperer was subsequently appointed to the state opera house in berlin where he continued his work along the same lines now he has been forced to give up his conductor's baton because he is of jewish origin bruno walter a conductor with a reputation throughout the world is a jew and as art comes from ability he may no longer conduct in germany his place is taken by a certain herr fusel official musician to the nazis he was commander of a large brass band in connection with whom no one can use the terms art and ability but he will now show the awakened german nation how music is made bush the musical director in dresden is fair and so his aryan origin cannot be disputed he is a conservative but as it happens not a nazi he brought a new era of fame to the dresden opera house during the national revolt a nazi denunciator appeared on the stage in the middle of a performance and demanded that bush should resign his post berlin march eighth yesterday evening sixty nazi storm troopers occupied the stage of the municipal opera house during the performance of rigoletto led by the famous conductor bush according to the account given by the vossische zeitung the leader of the nazis told the audience that in the future he himself would direct the theatre and that the conductor strieger would conduct the orchestra instead of bush as bush nevertheless attempted to continue conducting a terrific uproar arose among the nazis who were present and bush was compelled to leave while strieger took his place at the conductor's desk the best-known german pianist is arthur schnabel who in the course of thirty years work has developed into an interpreter of the great music written for the piano he conducted an advanced class for piano music at the berlin academy of music and he has been turned out because he is a jew two of his colleagues have also been turned out of the academy emil feuermann who is now the only german cellist of any standing and leonid kreutzer a good pianist and teacher the first-rate violinist karl flesch has been dismissed also the well-known conductors oscar fried fritz stiedry and gustav brecker as well as the prominent pianist bruno eisner of the creative musicians in germany marx von schillings immediately joined the nazis his compositions are not original and his conducting nowhere gets beyond the formal pattern schillings who under the republic accepted high positions became president of the academy after max lieberman's resignation he has found a friend equally loyal to the nazis in the composer hans fitzner 
and another representative composer richard strauss has joined them it is true that the latter's works viewed from the nazi standpoint would satisfy the wanton jewish sensual appetites but he is now on the way to becoming an official composer hardly a single one of the modern german composers remains with the nazis arnold schoenberg has been driven out of his post at the academy of music whatever one thinks of his music he has certainly had the most important influence on the development of modern music in politics a conservative schoenberg was a formal revolutionary in music and found a new and original musical language but nazi germany cannot use this pioneer one of the best known german composers is kurt weil whom hitler's germany has proscribed he wrote the Dreigroschen opera which achieved success throughout the world but he is a jew and so he is now homeless franz schrecker the best known of whose operas is de Fernerklang, was ejected from the association of the academy of music he is by no means particularly progressive but his origin is not above reproach the special hate of the nazis was directed against the first proletarian revolutionary composer hans eisler who has also been driven out of germany in recent years he has provided the german working class with choral pieces die masnama and popular fighting songs which were sung in meetings and on the streets and will soon become known in other countries his music was consciously and consistently made for the working class hitler's germany offered him either the drilling of the concentration camps or a martyr's death in some nazi barracks german music which for some time has been in a general state of crisis has now been deprived of its best forces as a result of this action the most famous conductor in the world arturo toscanini who works in mussolini's italy has refused to take part in the bayreuth festival in connection with the anniversary of richard wagner early in june he sent the following telegram to frau winifred wagner as events in germany which violate my feelings as an artist and as a man in spite of my hopes show no change up to the present i consider it to be my duty to break the silence which i have imposed on myself for the last two months and to inform you that for my and your and everyone's peace of mind it is better not to think any more of my coming to bayreuth with sentiments of unalterable friendship for the house of wagner arturo toscanini theater painting films the chauvinistic glorification of schlageter and the idealization of horse vessel now dominate the german stage herr goebbels has had his well-known drama der wanderer presented at a berlin theater all actors who had given proof of any artistic ability are no longer to be seen on the german stage all state municipal and private theaters have been brought into conformity the actors associations have been brought under the control of fascist commissioners fritz kortner max pallenberg Masary and bergner and the stage managers max reinhardt and jesner have been driven out of germany as un-german the artistic abilities of the opera stars lotte schoene frieda leider alexander kipnis among others no longer count under the dictatorship of rust's brown culture the proletarian singer and actor ernst busch a highly gifted artist who popularized eisler's proletarian songs and won a name for himself among the german workers was hunted out of germany jewish actors only to play in negative roles the ufa film company issued instructions that in their future films jewish actors were only to be used in negative roles such as swindlers criminals and pathological cases on june sixth the general meeting was held of the union of stage directors which has been incorporated in the national socialist league of fighters for german culture the government commissioner hinkel announced at this meeting that there would be a new cleansing campaign among professional actors on the recommendation of the prussian ministry of education to the head of the government Goering, the formation of a prussian theatre commission has been announced the work of this commission of which hinkel will be chairman will be to investigate the position of all stage managers musical directors conductors and soloists connected with all municipal theatres decrees will shortly be issued to facilitate the annulment extension or alteration of agreements 
in order to ensure that no obstacles stand in the way of the artistic work which is essential in the german theatre legal measures will be taken to provide for the dissolution of private obligations where these are in conflict with the interests of the german theatre frankfurter zeitung june eighth nineteen thirty three the nazi work of destruction is being carried on in every field of art the president of the academy of arts the painter max lieberman a conservative in politics was compelled to resign his post on the basis of the aryan clause it goes without saying that kata kolwitz the gifted artist of working-class life was banished by the nazis the number of painters and artists who have fallen victims to the german cleansing is legion the best known and most progressive film directors have been forced to leave germany to find employment all film artists associated with the working class movement and all proletarian or progressive films have been placed on the blacklist the following are some of the films which were immediately prohibited by the hitler government kula vampa niemandsland kameradschaft mutter krause die andere seite das testament des dr marbus im westen nichts neues fruenglick fruen not Holzerner Kreuzer, a French film. Soviet films banned included The Path to Life, Storm Over Asia, Mother, Menschen Arsenal, Ten Days That Shook the World, The End of St. Petersburg. Woe to those who are suspected of too close connection with working class films. An example of this is the imprisonment and maltreatment of Dr. A. Steigler by stormtroopers and auxiliary police steigler was director of a film company in berlin which in the course of its work rented russian films this was enough the offices of the company were occupied by storm troops and police and the whole staff was arrested all films were confiscated and the offices sealed up the staff was taken to the maike for barracks in berlin where in the presence of his employees dr steigler was subjected to the most terrible maltreatment and torture Stormtroopers attacked him with their fists, clubs, and belts, and kicked him when he fell to the ground covered with blood. The Schools of the Third Empire They say that in your schools boys and girls fight together naked and are thus trained as warriors and Amazons, but do they also learn anything? And are not their carnal desires excited when they see each other thus? Not at all, my friend, for we wear them out till they can no longer breathe, and when they are tired they can neither think nor feel carnal desire but how then do they acquire the sciences and arts which they must have o wise lawgiver they must not learn and they must not think for whoever can think may think evil thoughts but whoever is made perfect physically and made to toil the whole day long is capable of becoming a useful citizen from a discussion on spartan education in greece the weimar constitution made possible some though inadequate new experiments in school organization it enabled scholars at least in the large towns to pass through the public schools without religious instruction it left undisturbed the educational privileges of the rich but it did at least lead to some hesitating experiments in the admission of workers to the universities and in giving them special training for university work now the schools have once again been transformed from top to bottom into drilling grounds of the christian religion experiments such as that made by the karl marx real gymnasium in neukoln the use of modern teaching methods the subdivision of courses into a number of separate groups based on the special interests of the pupils and the systematic preparation of workers for the universities have been stopped and prohibited in my fight hitler outlined his program for the schools it was much the same as that of the spartan cynic cited above the meaning of hitler's program is that the schools of the third empire will not be expected to provide the children with knowledge and science but to make them obedient to the leader and frick says in a less open form what hitler says bluntly and without circumlocution on may ninth frick laid down his program at a meeting of the ministers of education of the various states he told them that up to now the whole system has been wrong that children have been instructed not educated a fine distinction but what is frick aiming at today 
we have more reason than ever to recall that hand in hand with our kindred germanic peoples of northern europe and their daughter states beyond the seas we have to fulfil tasks throughout the world which will give the nordic race a wide field of constructive cultural work the kindred peoples here are not clearly defined it would appear that herr frick hopes to unite them all against the sub-men in order to create a world-embracing third empire which will show the inferior peoples of latin or other races how things are managed in a real hitler empire together with the development of purely physical suppleness and ability special emphasis must be laid on the formation of will power and the power to make decisions as the essential basis for the development of a sense of pleasure in taking responsibility which lies at the root of character though expressed in involved language this corresponds closely enough with the maxims laid down by the spartan cynic the schools are to produce uneducated uninstructed but well-drilled dauntless soldiers of the third empire in order to convince the children that nothing as good as the third empire exists in the world the world must be completely distorted as it is shown to them hence history must be falsified and made national socialist the new history books must contain as little as possible considerable abridgment is indispensable it is therefore sufficient to bring out the historical forces which have always been operative the two last decades of our own age must be the main object of historical treatment to make things plainer frick added that it would be particularly necessary to deal with the beginning of the awakening of the nation in the struggle for the ruhr up to the victory of the idea of national socialist freedom and the restoration of the german nation at the festival of potsdam in addition to this type of historical science other subjects particularly insisted on for the schools are racial science and the elementary study of the basic conceptions of family research the bavarian ministry of education issued instructions containing the following passage at the beginning of the school year nineteen thirty three thirty four apart from all other subjects and lessons all classes in the state of bavaria must arrange for history lessons in the first four to six weeks covering the period nineteen eighteen to nineteen thirty three the remainder of the curriculum in this subject must be correspondingly shortened and allocated to the remaining months of the year at the conclusion of this course the last lesson must be organized as an ennobling celebration with short addresses by the teacher and one of the pupils on the national awakening the singing of patriotic songs etc this theme the national awakening which is most important for the reawakening of national sentiment among the bavarian youth in the schools is not only to be treated as a subject in the study of history health science etc but must also be dealt with fundamentally as a principle of education if examinations are to be held at the end of the year special attention must be paid to this theme the government commissioner in berlin dr meinhausen stated in a speech on the transformation of berlin school life which was published in the volkischer beobachter of may sixth nineteen thirty three that a halt must be put to all liberal sentimental dreams in the jewish question the principle must be sentimentality is high treason in accordance with this the nazi minister of education has completely reshaped all pedagogical colleges and dismissed all teachers who were suspect all secular schools are liquidated religious education is once again compulsory the reintroduction of whipping was the first achievement of brown school policy all modern tendencies in the schools have been completely rooted out the pupils in the top class at the unorganized karl marx school in neukolln have all been put back two years before they are allowed to proceed with their studies they have to be first drilled in the pure nazi spirit jewish students as well as jewish professors were driven out of the universities henceforward only one and a half percent of new entrants to the higher educational institutions may be non-aryan instructions of the prussian ministry of education may eighth nineteen thirty three all teachers are compelled to join the national socialist teachers union this is a condition of employment 
the following clauses are contained in the act against the overcrowding and excessive proportion of persons of foreign race in the universities one in all schools other than compulsory schools the number of scholars and students is to be restricted so as to guarantee adequate education and to conform with the needs of the professions two in accepting new entrants care must be taken that the number of those of german nationality who are of non-aryan origin within the meaning of the law for the restoration of a professional civil service of april seventh nineteen thirty three in relation to the total number of students in each institution and faculty does not exceed the proportion of non-aryans in the german population this proportion is fixed for germany as a whole as one point five per cent seven the act comes into force from its promulgation legal examinations simplified for nazis the reich commissioner for the prussian ministry of justice girl issued instructions on april fifth that all candidates in legal examinations who have served the fatherland for a certain period in one of the recognized national associations may at their request be allowed a shortened form of examination by way of compensation for the time lost to their studies. Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung, April 12, 1933. The Spirit of the Students Who Burn Books 1. Language and literature grow from the nation. 2. Today there is a contradiction between literature and the German nation. This is a shameful state of things. 3 purity of language and literature depends on you four our most dangerous opponent is the jew five the jew can only think jewish if he writes german he is lying the german who writes german and thinks jewish is a traitor six we mean to put an end to this lie we mean to brand this treachery seven we mean to treat the jew as a foreigner and we mean to take the nation seriously we therefore demand from the censorship the following jewish works must be published in hebrew if published in german they must be described as translations only germans have the right to write in german the un-german spirit must be eradicated from public libraries the german student organization from the twelve theses against the un-german spirit posted in berlin university on april thirteenth nineteen thirty three bringing the press into conformity on the evening of january thirtieth nineteen thirty three the day when the hitler hugenberg government was formed the new minister frick summoned the representatives of the berlin press to a conference at which he promised that the new government would be distinguished from its forerunners by its maintenance of the freedom of the press a few days after the word of a german man had been given a wave of prohibitions of the communist and social democratic press swept through germany by the middle of february practically the whole of the german communist press had been closed down prohibitions of social democratic and democratic papers descended like hail in the course of the reichstag election campaign storm troops went into the printing offices of the center newspapers in the rhineland compelled them to print the speeches of national socialist ministers and with the support of the police authorities exercised a rigid censorship over what was to appear in the course of the last few days before the burning of the reichstag frick's freedom of the press had been almost completely crushed out by the storm troops and police the destruction of working-class printing works and newspaper offices was only prevented by defensive guards when the nazis succeeded in bringing off their monstrous act of provocation in the reichstag and the brown terror began to rage the last remaining of the communist and social democratic papers were wiped out communist social democratic and bourgeois journalists of left tendencies were cast into prison or delivered over to sadistic tortures in nazi barracks the democratic bourgeois press and the center newspapers began to be brought into conformity with the new pogrom regime the democratic publishing houses of ulstein and mossa and the liberal press throughout germany began the voluntary removal of jewish pacifist or other members of their editorial staffs who were not liked by the nazis and this press too 
celebrated the fateful events of these days and declared in support of the awakening of the nation for hitler it suppressed the reports of the massacres in the working-class quarters it suppressed the acts of brutality which were taking place daily only a few minutes away from the editorial offices the jewish papers denied the persecution of the jews the foreign press which was not so accommodating in the matter of suppressing the inhuman cruelties which were taking place soon came into conflict with the hitler government on march seventh an official government communique was issued in view of the malicious reports in the foreign press as to what is taking place in germany serious measures against a number of foreign correspondents are in preparation some of the correspondents concerned have escaped the hands of the police by leaving the country as far as the other correspondents are concerned they will have to guarantee that in the future they will avoid any malicious tendencies in their reports and any ambiguous statements in consideration of this the correspondents in question have not been expelled for the time being they have been granted a probationary period of two months on april fifth the hitler government suffered a defeat at the hands of the foreign press association it had threatened the association with a boycott if it did not remove its president maurer correspondent of the chicago daily news the general meeting of the association decided by sixty votes to seven with three abstentions not to accept maurer's resignation in the course of the following weeks public opinion abroad compelled the hitler government to make further retreats in its dealings with the foreign press correspondents in germany the german press association was brought into conformity by the appointment of the nazi press chief dietrich as president similar measures were applied to the german newspaper proprietors association and the association of publishers of periodicals all district organizations of publishers and journalists were brought into conformity the german press association under its new president decided that in future no jewish or marxist journalists would be admitted to membership the germanizing of its editorial staff and its humble submission to hitlerite policy was not of much avail to the rudolf masse publishing company which owns the berliner tageblatt early in april the company was virtually expropriated and taken over by a newly formed company controlled by a nazi commissioner a new editorial staff which could furnish the necessary guarantees of loyalty to hitler was appointed another example of the many cases in which non-working class papers have been brought into conformity is that of the dortmunder general anzeiger which was voluntarily transformed into an organ of the national socialist party this paper has the largest printing works in europe and the biggest circulation of all german newspapers outside of berlin as its circulation was mainly in the thickly populated industrial areas of the rhine and westphalia its contents made some concessions to the anti-capitalists and anti-fascist feelings of the workers there on the formation of the hitler government the former editorial staff was dismissed to enable the paper to be brought voluntarily into conformity along the usual lines but this did not satisfy the brown rulers in the issue of april twentieth among various hymns of praise for the occasion of hitler's birthday there appeared a drawing of hitler which the nazi leaders declared was a caricature they therefore seized the issue and closed the offices of the paper the dortmund police president entrusted the editor of the nazi journal red earth with the management of the printing works the nazis then threatened the proprietor with the permanent prohibition of the dortmunder general anzeiger on which the proprietor declared his readiness to transform the paper into an official nazi organ and thus the nazis conquered this great printing establishment it is not possible to enumerate all the prohibitions and warnings which have been directed against bourgeois papers and periodicals the campaign of bringing into conformity led to a dictatorial transformation of the whole of the german press services readers of the newspapers which still appear in germany are hermetically sealed off from all reliable foreign news over two hundred and fifty foreign newspapers are forbidden in germany from the following countries united states nine argentina two belgium seven canada two danzig three great britain five france thirty one 
holland nine lithuania two latvia one luxembourg five austria thirty seven poland twenty four rumania one czar territory four sweden one switzerland twenty six soviet union nine spain two czechoslovakia sixty six germany was the country which had the greatest literary output the following announcement is significant of the fall in production during the first few weeks of the hitler regime according to the frankfurter zeitung of april fifteenth nineteen thirty three in the course of the national revolution production in paper mills sank in many cases to twenty five per cent the deutsche allgemeine zeitung of april twenty second reports that the publishing output in the first quarter of nineteen thirty three was thirty per cent lower than in the same quarter of nineteen thirty one the export trade continues to register a decline the german book trade has been deprived of its best customers and of a whole range of science and literature End of chapter six brown book of the hitler terror by lord marley chapter seven brutality and torture the national socialist german labor party which for years has been maintained by the german kaisers of industry and agriculture has studied history to guide it in playing its part in the period of social decline it learnt arson from nero the persecution of the jews from the middle ages the murder of socialists from Mussolini. For many years the official documents of the National Socialist Party have been proclaiming the coming of a St. Bartholomew's Night. The official description has been the Night of the Long Knife. This night began with the burning of the Reichstag, and it is not yet over. The workers and peasants have shown too much resistance, too many millions have rallied behind the banner of freedom. The National Socialist Labour Party has had to turn the St. Bartholomew's Night into a St. Bartholomew's Year, and it is the first quarter of this year which is covered in the following report. The friends of the Hitler government are always ready to repeat the government's declaration that peace and order reign in Germany. Dementis are issued to calm feeling outside of Germany, and festivals and parades are staged to distract attention from what is actually taking place. The few foreign tourists who still care to visit Germany under the present tyranny are not taken into stormtroop barracks or into concentration camps. It is only by chance that the foreign visitor may be an eyewitness of the nightly tortures shootings while trying to escape and secretly organized murders every message from foreign journalists to their newspapers every telephone conversation every visit they make is carefully noted and they are threatened with immediate expulsion and when the cries of tortured victims in the cellars of stormtroop barracks reach the ears of neighbors when the wife of some tortured prisoner speaks out when the brutality of the Nazis is actually seen by hundreds of witnesses, then the official explanation is given that this is an exceptional case. But in Essen, on March 7, 1933, Minister Goering officially proclaimed to the applauding howls of a great mass meeting that when wood is being planed, there are always shavings. In reply, it must be stated that these shavings have been organized for many years, that the methods of the Middle Ages now employed by the Nazis have been worked out and advocated for years by the National Socialist leaders. It is the National Socialist leaders who have organized the pogroms and lynchings, the burnings and the pillories, the tortures of the first, second, and third degrees. The methods of the Middle Ages have been employed publicly insofar as they were effective for propaganda. But the tortures have been carried out in private, in the darkness of the night. Even now millions of Germans are ignorant of them. The Terror by Night 
The secret terror has raged continuously since February 27, 1933. There is a general settlement of accounts. Arrests are made systematically, tortures carefully arranged. And the ministerial reply to scruples about torturing is to lay down how far these tortures can go. So long as I do not see any communists running around with their ears and noses cut off, there is no reason to get excited. Tortures up to this point are therefore authorized. There is no need to examine the victims too closely or to investigate the denunciations. The Nazis in their arrests can follow the instructions of the French cardinal who told the faithful of the original St. Bartholomew's night. Kill them all. God will be able to pick out his Christians. Every day we are being visited by new victims of these tortures by night who show us their still open wounds. We print below declarations made on oath and reports which we have investigated with the utmost care. The Torture Chambers One report makes it clear that the Nazis have established a regular tariff for beating prisoners. Simple membership of the Social Democratic Party is punished with 30 blows with a rubber truncheon on the naked body. Membership of the Communist Party is usually punished with 40 blows. The penalty is increased when the prisoner has been an official of a political party or trade union. The punishment is to be modified in accordance with the conduct of the prisoner. One prisoner, Bernstein, was given 50 lashes because he was a communist, and then a further 50 lashes because he was also a Jew. There are therefore several degrees of torture a fact which is brought out in the various declarations which are in our possession. The torture begins from the moment when the victim is fetched from his home. The person who opens the door is threatened with revolvers. The members of the family are threatened. Furniture and books are destroyed or thrown out into the street. Authors' manuscripts, the fruit of many months of work, are destroyed. In the case of workers, Whatever remains of their wages is confiscated. The family is made to witness the proceedings. The children see their father struck in his face by unknown young men. The wife sees her husband's face streaming with blood. She asks what they are going to do with him. She gets only an insult in reply. Then the prisoner is kicked out of the room and down the steps to the car which is waiting for him. One report states that after an arrest has been made, the Nazis begin to beat their prisoner on the way down the stairs. The leader of the storm troop suddenly ordered them to stop beating the prisoner, who then saw that people in the house opposite had been roused. The storm troopers are disciplined in public. But from the moment when the prisoner enters the Nazi barracks, he is as much an outlaw as the Nazi leaders have been threatening for years to make him. Any Nazi who meets the prisoner on the stairs or in the passages kicks or strikes him. Cowards have become murderers. Day after day they wait outside the doors of the rooms where the first degree of torture is applied and make the prisoners run the gauntlet of whips and boots and rubber truncheons. Then the prisoner is admitted to the presence of the stormtroop leader or higher officer and the trial begins. The court. The judge sits behind a table. Three stars on his stormtroop uniform give him judicial powers over all prisoners. Daggers and bayonets are stuck into the table, and there are flickering candles at each end. The prisoner is pushed forward to the table. Nazis press closely round him. When he answers, they hit him. If he declares his innocence, they kick him. Any attempt to defend himself is useless. There is no question of what the truth is. The trial is only a farce to provide a pretext for making another martyr. The prisoner hears the source of the denunciation which was the cause of his arrest, and thinks that he can at once disprove the charge. He begins to say something, and then blows are rained down upon him, and he is told not to speak unless he is asked a question. They ask him for addresses. 
they think that they will be able to make capital of the story that the leaders of the workers movement have betrayed each other but the prisoner refuses to say anything then the rubber truncheons are used again with furious rage it is to the eternal honor of the German working-class movement that thousands of workers have not flinched, in spite of all the brutality and torture inflicted on them. They have refused to give new victims to their torturers. THE CELLARS From the court the prisoners are taken to the cellars, where they can see in the semi-darkness the flogging benches standing ready. The air is thick, with the smell of dried blood and sweat. The prisoner is thrown on to the flogging bench, and steel rods hammer down on his back. Four of the Nazis do the beating. Each new blow cuts the raw flesh to pieces. Then they get tired and push him into the next cellar, where he is no longer alone. Fellow victims are cowering in the corners. The worst mutilated victims are writhing on straw sacks on the ground. Some have lost control and are crying out. From the next room come the cries of the next victim. The prisoners in the adjoining room can now see everything, as someone has thought it right to leave the doors open. The next victim starts up at the first blow from the steel rods. His face is pale. A new command makes him bow down again. His movement was criminal, and the punishment was made more severe. He was forced to count the blows in a loud voice, till the numbers could no longer be distinguished from his cries of pain. The half-unconscious prisoner is then pulled from the flogging bench, and the stormtroop leader walks forward and announces to the victim, Now you will be shot. The prisoner is placed with his face to the wall. There is silence broken only by the Nazis releasing the safety catches of their revolvers. Then, shots. The prisoner hears the whiz of bullets past his ears, and begins to realize that they are not hitting him. At last he sinks in a swoon, and before he loses consciousness he hears the Nazis laughing. We have many reports of similar treatment, and give the following as typical. I live in the Judenstrasse near number 50, where a stormtroop detachment was quartered. On March 19th, the arbitrary arrests I previously reported were resumed. About 9 p.m., shortly after another prisoner had been taken in, the neighbors heard a shot through the open window of the Nazi office. I was determined to see what was happening, and discovered that there was a man, presumably the prisoner, standing doubled up against the window. Then more shots rang out, but the bullets did not hit the man. Then I saw him fall to the ground, and Nazis bent down over him, laughing. One voice shouted several times, Now then, get up, go home. The prisoner seemed not to hear this shout, and he fainted with fear. Is it strange that one should hear of men being driven mad by this? Hundreds of prisoners have been through this. They have been dragged from the torture chambers and thrown into the waiting room among their comrades. At the last moment, before they sink down exhausted on their straw sacks, they are told that they are to be shot the following morning. They are in such pain that they are indifferent to the new threat. But when they come to themselves some time afterwards, they begin to think about it. They have no reason to doubt that the threat will be carried out, so they sit there among their groaning friends, waiting for their last morning to come. During the night, the guard leans against the door and sings, Dawn, dawn, you light my way to early death. A report from the Hedemannstrasse barracks in Berlin gives this detail. Sworn declarations repeatedly show that in many cases the prisoners have been left for days with this threat hanging over them. They hear the beatings beginning again in the adjoining room. The doors are kicked open so that they can see the tortures. From time to time, one of the victims is called out and tried again. The Nazis delight in filth. A new prisoner, who looks like an intellectual, is pushed into the torture chamber. The Nazis hold his head, force his teeth apart, and then pour a bottle of castor oil down his throat. 
then they ask him politely to take down his trousers he unbuttons his braces and his trousers drop the nazis do not put him on the flogging bench they make him stand doubled up the nazis wait a quarter of an hour then they pick up the steel rods and begin to beat him he screams and stands upright the nazis press him down and beat him again then suddenly his bowels empty the nazi leaders will deny these loathsome cruelties but our archives show that these statements are true and we have not only the declarations made by intellectuals and workers who have experienced this but there is also in our possession a report of a confidential meeting of nazis in berlin at which dr gables the minister for enlightenment explained how he would deal with editors who happened to have different opinions from his the protective corpsman must go to the offices of the paper concerned and give each member of the editorial staff a liter of castor oil the nazis therefore only act in accordance with instructions the red cross in nazi cellars the nazi doctors as a rule are only present at the actual torturing they are not to render any medical aid but only to determine whether the prisoner may still be beaten they are like the doctors of the inquisition the torture is stopped when there is danger of the victim dying all reports show that medical aid is only given when the victim appears to be dying injections are only made at the last minute the victims are only carried away to the hospital when the medical expert certifies that they are dying propaganda to justify the terror for years the national socialist leaders had been preparing the ground for the terror by systematic propaganda this was directed in the first place against the november criminals the revolutionaries of november 1918 who were represented as having been responsible for all the sufferings of germany since 1918 intensive propaganda was also directed against the soviet union in my fight hitler wrote it must never be forgotten that the rulers of present-day russia are blood-stained common criminals the scum of humanity and on march tenth nineteen thirty three german wireless stations broadcast a horst vessel play in which hitler's lies about the soviet union were repeated that since nineteen seventeen two million people had been murdered in russia that the soviets are the embodiment of lies and deceit looting and robbery then there was the systematic propaganda against the hereditary foe france hatred of france was carefully nurtured and the idea of revenge developed the propaganda against the jews is dealt with in another chapter one example shows its effect in the brutalities shown to jewish victims of the terror a doctor was beaten up in nazi barracks and was lying seriously injured and covered with blood on the straw someone who came into the room called attention to how serious the doctor's condition was this made the nazi guard furious with indignation and from his excited statements it was possible to gather that his section leader had told the men the following legend all doctors who are jews have for years been taking revenge on german women who come under their care in hospitals by secretly cutting out their ovaries so that only jewish women could bear children and thus the jews would rule germany the nazi guard followed up this story by kicking the severely injured man in the stomach the blood guilt of the nazi leaders the responsibility of the nazi leaders not only for the methods of their organized gangs but for the murderous feelings among their followers is made clear from statements made by the leaders both before and after their seizure of power the present minister of the interior frick declared that it is not a bad thing if a few tens of thousands of marxist functionaries come to harm Stor, the former vice president of the reichstag told a mass meeting we will make the hemp industry prosper immediately after the new cabinet of oldenburg was formed the premier rover announced 
we will put the marxists and the people of the center on the gallows to feed the ravens on march tenth nineteen thirty three minister goering spoke at a mass meeting in essen i would rather shoot a few times too short and too wide but at any rate i would shoot goering's words fell on fruitful soil at the end of april the police president of dortmund issued an instruction in the last few days many communist leaflets have been distributed i order the police to make immediate use of their weapons against any attempt to distribute communist leaflets the terror was organized one on the night of the burning of the reichstag thirty nazi barracks were prepared for carrying out tortures in berlin alone steel rods whips chains cords for tying up prisoners water pails and castor oil were bought and taken to the barracks the same night they were used doctors were allocated to each barracks two we are in possession of reports from a number of german towns showing that on the same evening the nazis were fully mobilized and guards were put round houses where working-class leaders lived as well as at railway stations and post offices three a similar selection of victims was made in all towns four the arrests were almost everywhere left to the storm troops in their special detachments the police merely accompanied them as the nazis were not at that time quite sure of their attitude five the enrollment of stormtroopers as auxiliary police began on february twenty second this is a definite indication that action on a large scale was contemplated and that it was proposed to keep the appearance of legality as long as possible six in his capacity as commissioner for prussia goering officially by an order issued on february seventeenth authorized shooting without any form of trial every man who in pursuance of this duty makes use of his weapons will be protected by me regardless of the consequence of his action on the other hand every man who from any false scruples does not use his weapons can anticipate criminal proceedings against himself every officer must at all times remember that omission to take the necessary measures is more serious than a mistake made in applying such measures seven high officials of the national socialist party have constantly been present in the torture cellars of the hedemannstrasse in berlin and in other barracks they directed the acts of brutality and conducted trials we have definite evidence for example that count heldorf leader of the nazi storm troops who was and remains in daily communication with goering and hitler held parades of the victims of the brutalities our documents we have in our archives five hundred and thirty six declarations made by persons who had been severely ill-treated the statements have been checked and found to be correct one hundred and thirty seven certificates show that the victims have received serious permanent injuries three hundred and seventy five declarations mention that the victims before being allowed to leave the torture houses were forced to sign statements that they had been well treated our material from the towns and villages of the third empire supports the conclusion that since february twenty seventh about sixty thousand people have been subjected to violence an unemployed worker on monday march sixth five p m two stormtroopers and a leader came to the door of the flat occupied by the reichstag deputy x and demanded admittance i was in the flat sorting out the washing i opened the door at first on the chain a revolver was thrust through the opening and i was ordered to open the door immediately i was asked where x was living but could give no information then they took me off with them they took me in a side car to the Bachestrasse. there they began to ill-use me i still have at the time of writing this the marks of what they did to me both eyes beaten blue 
a bite on my left temple, my hands still swollen and scratched. They called me a young murderer, and similar names, without the slightest ground. Then they made me wash off the blood, which was streaming from my forehead, mouth, and nose. I had hardly washed it off when I was taken into the front room, and again they started beating me. I covered my face with my hands, or they would certainly have broken my jaws. But that did not satisfy them. Together with two other prisoners, I was taken in a taxi to the Hedemannstrasse with two motorcyclists as escort. I was told I should be thankful that they were so humane, as they worked differently in the lower groups. I nearly had to laugh when they told me this. At the Hedemannstrasse, I stated, when they examined me, that I had been begging and had always got something at the door where X lived. Because of this, I had gone there many times, also to talk politics, and eventually Frau X gave me some housework to do, beating carpets and so on. I told the Nazis that I had been very glad to get such treatment from communists. I told them that I was a communist sympathizer and had voted for List Three. Then the man in charge said, We can always do with people who tell the truth. It is not you we want. It is your leaders we want to destroy and settle accounts with. But workers are brutally beaten. On the evening of March 5th, I was with six other workers in a public house in Berlin North. We were waiting to hear the election results. A group of uniformed stormtroop men came in, pointed their revolvers at us, and made us go with them, with their hands above our heads, to the stormtroop quarters in the Exstrasse. There we were beaten up as communist sows. Then we were put into a car and taken to the Nazi headquarters in Hedemannstrasse. We were chased up to the fourth floor, and driven along a corridor with repeated blows and lashes with riding whips. The corridor was decorated from top to bottom with conquered social democratic banners and posters. There was a figure against the wall which was supposed to represent Ernst Thälmann in the uniform of the Red Front, hanging on gallows. We were driven with blows into a general room. We were forced to go down on our knees and shout Heil Hitler, also to say the Our Father and sing the Horst Vessel song. Anyone who did not obey instantaneously was beaten till he was unconscious. Later we were placed against the wall of the room and continuous volleys were fired close above our heads. After they had left us alone for a little while, we were put through the first interrogation. Each of us was summoned alone into a room where there were about six Nazis with riding whips. We had to strip and were then told that we should be beaten until we told everything. They demanded that we should confess the most impossible things. We were asked to give the names and addresses of communist officials and to reveal imaginary hiding places of arms and duplicating machines. During the interrogation, we were beaten the whole time. Then we were given half an hour to think things over, and then the torture began again. Some anti-fascists who had formerly belonged to the Nazis had their heads shaved, except for a forelock, which was tied together. We were told that these people were to be shot next morning. When we arrived, they were lying unconscious on the floor of the general room. Besides ourselves, there were about fifty other communist and social democrat workers in the room. When we were released, a document was put in front of us stating that we had left the building without any injury to our health. We signed. I found two of those who had been with me some time after in the Amfidrishain hospital. One of them had a bullet wound in the neck. Other typical cases. J. M., a worker living in the Wiederstrasse, Berlin, was taken away by stormtroop men during the night of March 27th to 28th and severely ill-treated in the Nazi barracks in the Rotoverstrasse. His whole body is covered with open wounds. R., a worker living in Schoenberg, who was known to do political work, was found in his flat and there severely injured with steel rods, then being taken to a Nazi barracks. At the time when this report was being written, it was not yet known what had become of him. His flat was completely smashed up by the Nazis when they came to arrest him. Max F., a worker in West Brandenburg, was attacked during the night 
by about forty armed storm troop men. The door of his flat was broken in, and they started shooting wildly into the flat. He was hit in the back, but managed to jump through a window and escape. As he ran, he was hit again in the arm, and another shot grazed his body. He got away and was taken in by a hospital. It had to be kept secret that he was in the hospital. Every day his relatives were threatened. Paul Paprocki, a worker of 36 years of age, living in number 23 Malplakstrasse, was taken from his room at 3 a.m. on the night of March 26, the 27th. A strong detachment of stormtroop men took him to their headquarters in the Urtrechtstrasse. When he refused to give any addresses, they began to ill-use him. Some hours later, he was released with serious injuries from blows. The 18-year-old worker Kurt Hackenbusch, Gruntalerstrasse, 63, was arrested with three of his friends on March 26th and taken to the Nazi quarters in the Prinzenstrasse. There they were beaten with heavy leather straps. The prisoners refused to say our father. Further beating. Some hours later, the prisoners were taken to an accident station, where they were forced by threats to state that the Nazis had rescued them from an attack. In addition to cuts in his face and back, Hackenbush has a severe wound on his head. Jacob Ickler, a worker living in Castle Kettengasse 4, 20 years old, was carried off on March 20th, 1933, by Nazis who searched his father's flat. He was taken to the town hall, laid on a flogging bench, and then beaten with rubber truncheons. Some blows struck the lower half of his face and his temples. His back and upper legs were streaming with blood. A doctor's certificate testifies to the condition in which he was found. The doctor's name is not given here, as in Germany of the Third Empire it is no longer safe to give medical attention to a man who has been injured. Urine for thirst. Wilhelm Solmann, a social democratic member of the Reichstag and a former minister of the Reich, writes as under of his ill usage at the hands of stormtroop and protective corpsmen. On Thursday, March 9th, shortly after three o'clock in the afternoon, three cars filled with stormtroop and protective corpsmen pulled up at my house. As at the moment I was speaking on the telephone to a member of the town council, I was able to tell him. Nazis are forcing their way in. Give the mobile police the alarm. At that moment, a number of men armed with loaded revolvers, sticks, and knives forced their way into my study. Before I could say a word, I was struck down at my desk. The men were in a kind of frenzy of hate and joy at being able to take revenge on me. Most of the men went to the other rooms in the house and in a few minutes literally smashed everything to splinters. I was hit and thrown into an open car, my wife called out, Where are you taking my husband? One of them answered jeeringly, You will soon know that. First they drove me over the grass towards the wood, as there was a stormtroop man sitting in front of me and flourishing a revolver the whole time. I thought that they were going to shoot me in the nearest wood, but they drove on, abusing me all the time. Some of the abuse was quite insane, and then we crossed the bridge near Kalk. There they drove slowly, and all along the high street, which was full of people, I was exhibited to the crowd. This is the great Solomon. See how small he is. I was taken to the district headquarters of the National Socialists in the Mozartstrasse. I was chased up the stairs with blows and kicks and lashes, and then into the conference room. They had lowered the blinds so that the room was half in darkness. I was to be put before the tribunal. A large swastika banner was spread over the table. I saw that my colleague, Efferoth, was sitting near the window, in the same plight as myself. I had hardly taken a seat near him when the tortures began, and they went on for two hours. First, a man in stormtroop uniform, whom my colleague said was Councillor Abela, made a short speech attacking Efferoth, saying that retribution was now to come. Then protective corpsmen began attacking us with their fists. For about half an hour, Efferoth and I lay on the floor, so exhausted that we could not get up. All the time we were being hit and kicked, and now and then our hair was pulled and our heads knocked together. Eventually we were pulled up and forced into chairs. A man held our hands behind the chair, 
while another forced us to open our teeth and poured a quarter of a liter of castor oil down our throats one of our tormentors shouted for salts to increase our torture but apparently salts could not be got quickly enough then they gave us a short rest again i begged for a glass of water when it was given to me i saw its color and therefore only used it to pour over my hands which were covered with blood one of the men shouted why don't you drink the water at the same moment he threw the glass with what was left of its contents into my face then we were struck and kicked again all at once our tormentors seemed to get uneasy i thought that the police must have been notified of our being attacked and carried off about five o'clock the protective corpsman took hold of us and with a shout of into the coal cellar literally flung us down the stairs apparently the coal cellar was locked and they seemed to be in a hurry to get rid of us they therefore pushed us across the street with blows and kicks our faces were already a bloody pulp to a motor where we were made to squat on the floor the ill treatment was carried on in the closed motor one blow struck me in the right eye we pulled up at police headquarters although we were in a state of collapse we were forced to run in and up the stairs one of the nazis said that next day we would have to walk in front of the nazis torchlight procession and at the finish we would be thrown on the heap of torches the president of the police advised us to let ourselves be put under protective arrest i referred to my parliamentary immunity he agreed with what i had said but nevertheless advised that Efferoth and i should go into the prison hospital in the hospital we were sewn up and bandaged during the torturing one of the protective corpsmen had slowly and deliberately pressed a knife into Efferoth's side the doctor stated that it would have been dangerous if it had gone a centimeter deeper next day the press published a report that we had been attacked by political opponents and suffered slight injuries end of chapter seven a doctor and his wife tortured on june third at four in the morning there was a ring at the door of the flat a number of men shouted police open the door my wife replied please come in the morning i don't open the door at night then there were heavy blows against the door it was broken in and five men in stormtroop uniform without police badges forced their way into the flat holding revolvers out at us i asked what they wanted and they replied with a shower of blows with their fists and rubber truncheons hold your mouth who asked you to speak they ordered hands up some of them seized my throat and pressed me against the wall it's all up with you jews you bolshevik rabble when i tried to say something they struck me again they searched the flat smashed in the drawers of my desk filled a trunk with books manuscripts and letters and ordered me to get out of it my wife who did not want to leave me in the hands of these bandits came with me although she was told not to they kicked me down the steps when my wife protested against their treating a sick man like that she was cursed and pushed off the seat of the car you impudent sow keep quiet or you'll get it too the car pulled up at a house in front of which there was a group of storm troop and protective corpsmen as soon as we got out of the car we were driven along with rubber truncheons and dog whips and up the stairs to the fourth floor i was hardly able to climb up as i had influenza and my heart was weak so they beat me furiously until i reached the top i was pushed into a corridor and my wife and i were made to run the gauntlet through nazis who struck at us as we passed i was then taken to a separate room i stated that there must be some mistake and asked to be allowed to clear it up the prisoner who had worked at a berlin hospital for seven years and had since been chief doctor in a section of the municipal hospital in Neukölln learnt in the course of a long interrogation that the absurd charge was made against him that he was the head of the communist propaganda activities in the reich when he protested his innocence he was beaten he continues his report they threw themselves on me with bestial fury using rubber truncheons leather whips and steel rods they hit particularly at my head 
jumping up on tables and chairs and hitting mercilessly at me from above my head. My face was streaming with blood. My cries for help soon stopped. A few blows with an iron rod, and I doubled up and fell unconscious. The victim further reports that he was soon in a condition in which he might die at any moment, and the Nazis felt compelled to summon medical aid. He was able, however, to keep track of what was happening, and his account includes the following. There were young men sitting in the room. Their faces were pale, and many had bandages around their heads. They were waiting to be interrogated. Now and then Nazis would come into the room and insist on all the prisoners jumping up and greeting them with Heil Hitler. Those who did not obey the order promptly enough were lashed with whips and forced to stand up and sit down again. They had to do this ten or more times in quick succession. Stormtroop men came in and took revolvers and ammunition from the drawers of the desk. The drawers were full of revolvers, and each Nazi selected the one he liked best. Other Nazis came in looking for the list of volunteers for Austria. A man who had sworn at a stormtroop man some days before was pulled out of his bed that night and arrested. A woman who had said that a man who had gone over from the communists to the Nazis was mad, was arrested at her flat and brought to the Nazi headquarters. All at once, someone shouted, Peek and Olstein have been arrested and will be brought here. The stormtroop men raved with delight and swung their rubber truncheons round them. Let them come. Someone said that the worker Schulze had come. All the Nazis went out of the room. For a quarter of an hour I heard them raging out in the corridor. Then a short man about thirty years of age was pushed into the room. His right eye was full of blood. In the interrogation he admitted that he was a member of the Red Aid. He was accused of having been present when a stormtroop man was murdered. He denied this. He said that he had already been arrested on suspicion of this charge and then set free again. He was beaten with dog whips and ordered to answer yes to every question put to him. He was beaten until he answered yes. Are you a murderer, you scoundrel? He answered no. He was then beaten harder. His whole face was covered with blood. He wiped his face with his sleeve. You've admitted it now, he replied. It was you who compelled me to say it. They beat him again. He was asked how many children he had brought into the world, and with how many women he had slept, and whether all his children were such idiots as he was. Then he was sent into the kitchen to have his head shaved. When he came back, he was pushed in front of a fragile old man, a clergyman from Lichtefelde. The white-haired old gentleman was told to hold out his hand to him and say, Good day, comrade. The old man held out his hand and said, I shake your hand. You are a suffering human being. They all laughed. That's how you greet a murderer? The old man answered, And even if he is, he is a man who has been tortured, and you are the embodiment of force, and force is not eternal. You cannot break my convictions with rubber truncheons. You are national, and I am international. This courageous act of the white-haired old man made some of the Nazis look abashed, and when some of them rushed at him, the others held them back. After midnight, I was taken to the interrogation room where I saw my wife, who was as pale as a ghost. She whispered to me, I can't bear it any longer. I must throw myself out the window. They are going to say that you are a spy of the Cheka and shoot you. Don't do anything stupid. Pull yourself together. This exchange of words was enough to rouse the Nazi in charge to fury. He was so tired, or drunk, that he could hardly sit up. My wife was led away. My condition grew worse, and I asked for a doctor. I was taken to the room of the officer in charge, and my wife was allowed to give me something to drink. In spite of the victim's critical condition, the stormtroop detachment was determined to force the doctor to confess. The man pulled out his revolver and yelled, Three bullets, one in your forehead, one in your mouth, one in your stomach, and then it's all over and you'll be thrown on the dung heap. I lay silent and quite still. He raised his fist and struck me in the face. 
in a couple of minutes it will be all over with you i'll hang you from the window i've hanged people in kiev like that only a few minutes more when i leave the room it will be too late whether you say it or not you miserable scoundrel what is the cheka doing what is the Ogpu doing are you going to talk or not i lay still and he kicked me in the stomach as hard as he could i lost consciousness a doctor decoyed into a trap although every victim of the nazis deserves equal mention we must quote the case of another doctor on account of its special features the following report is taken from the saarbuch arbeiter stimme on march seventeenth there was a regular meeting of the berlin medical association after the lecture the chairman professor goldscheider head of the university clinic a man seventy years of age asked his colleagues to remain for a few minutes as he wanted to show them a particularly interesting case then a patient completely swathed in bandages was brought in and professor goldscheider explained gentlemen this patient is our colleague dr lust the day before yesterday he received a telephone call in the evening summoning him to a patient in lichtefeld when he reached there he was met by stormtroop men and ill-treated in this terrible way these words caused great indignation at the meeting the well-known professor sauerbruch a german nationalist jumped up and declared that he was prepared to take the victim of the nazis into his clinic as a result of this experience something like a panic had spread through berlin doctors many of whom fear that when they are called to a patient they may meet a similar terrible fate a woman forty-six years old whipped during the night of monday march twentieth tuesday march twenty-first the social democratic woman councillor maria jinkowski was attacked in her flat bergmannstrasse eighteen Köpenick, berlin a laundry van pulled up in front of the house Twenty stormtroop men broke in the house door and occupied the stairs. Six men forced their way into her flat with revolvers ready. Frau Jankowski was taken in the van with two communist officials who were already in it, to the transport headquarters of the Nazis in Köpenick. In a shed in the courtyard, she was forced to take off her clothes and lie on a wooden bench, which was covered with a black-red-gold flag. Four men held her down, one pressing her face into a bundle of old rags. For two hours this woman, forty-six years old, was beaten mercilessly with truncheons, steel rods, and whips. After this torture, Frau Jankowski was put into the street. At about five in the morning, some passers-by found her and took her home in a taxi. The doctor certified that her condition was dangerous. One kidney had been broken by blows. There was literally not a sound spot left on her body. In the Antonius Hospital in Kalhorst, Frau Jankowski made the following deposition. While I was being beaten, I was told again and again to give the names and addresses of workers. They made me count the colors of the Republic and say foul words instead of black, red, gold. They asked me questions like, Have you had any money from the Welfare Department? Have you housed and fed communists? Have you stolen shoes from unemployed workers? Have you made a list of Nazi shops to be boycotted? Every time I answered no, I was given a new shower of blows. When I cried out, the fifth of my tormentors pressed my face into the rags. After I had had at least a hundred blows, I fell off the bench. I was then pulled off the ground and given such a blow in my face that I fell in a corner, damaging my knee. Then, together with the two communist workers who were also being tortured, I was forced to sing Deutschland, Deutschland über alles. I was compelled to sign a declaration that I would leave the Social Democratic Party, that I would never take part in politics again, and that I would report every Thursday to the Nazi office. Then I was given different treatment. I was given a glass of water. My clothes were brushed and given back to me. The leader told one of the men to take the lady out. The man held me up when I was about to fall down, and shut the door after me with a polite good evening. My husband reported the facts to the police, but was told that they were powerless. 
what was it that made these young lads carry out the inhuman cruelties recorded above this hate was directed against a woman who for years had been in a responsible position giving relief where it was needed a woman old enough to be their mother there is no question of this having been a private act of revenge the lads not only made the woman strip and beat her they also demanded names and addresses of social democratic party members they were acting on instructions from nazi leaders the leaders not only hushed up this crime but when it had become known abroad started proceedings against her for spreading atrocity stories nerve specialist exiled after being beaten on tuesday march twenty first the nerve specialist dr frankel whose patients are mainly working-class people was arrested in his flat in berlin by a large detachment of stormtroop men he was taken to the nazi barracks in the general papestrasse and kept there till thursday in these two days he was interrogated several times and on each occasion beaten with steel rods and dog whips the results of this ill treatment including damage to an eye by a lash from a whip were established beyond question when he was released dr frankel was released on march twenty third after he had signed an undertaking for himself and his wife that they would immediately leave germany and never return dr frankel who was now living abroad reported as follows on some of the details of his treatment while i was there about fifteen young workers were brought into the room where i had been put i can testify that these young workers were most cruelly ill-treated as a doctor i am of the opinion that at least eight of them must have succumbed to the injuries they received after they had been tied up and lighted cigarettes had been pressed into the soles of their feet the storm troop men continued torturing them cruelly for hours a doctor philipsal of beisdorf berlin was brought in at the same time as i was he was seriously wounded i am very doubtful whether he got through alive editorial note on march twenty third dr philipsal was taken to the orbank hospital where he did in fact die reichsbanner and social democrat officials the dementis issued by the Nazi government always try to represent the excesses in the Nazi barracks as the arbitrary acts of individuals. We print here a number of reports from Castle, which make it perfectly clear how closely the brutal acts are connected with the Nazi leadership. The Nazis did not take much trouble to distinguish between trials and torturings which took place in different rooms of the same house. A deposition made by Hans Quer, a Reichsbanner leader, contains the following. On March 24, 1933, at about one o'clock, I was arrested by four stormtroop men and one civilian and taken to the town hall. They said, Herr Quer, you must come with us. And then I was taken along, two men holding my arms. I was taken down the outside steps, several nazis who were at the top calling out to the public here comes the reichsbanner general Kreh. i was taken to the public hall the stormtroop leader who took me is a commercial traveller selling gin he was formerly employed in the welfare department he stole some money and was dismissed and sentenced to four months imprisonment one of the stormtroop men then took my particulars including what party i belonged to then i was informed that i could go as I went out, two Nazis got hold of me and prevented me from going. One of them went in to the man who had taken my particulars. Soon after, he came back and waved his hand, indicating that I was to be taken down to the cellar. There, I was met by ten to fifteen stormtroop men, who ordered me to take off my hat and coat. Then I was taken into a dark cellar, where there was a bench. One of the men went in front with an electric torch. The torch went out. I was forced down onto the bench, and for ten or fifteen minutes was beaten with rubber truncheons in a most brutal and inhuman way. When I fell off the bench half unconscious and begged them not to be so inhuman, they jeered at me and started beating me harder than ever. When I was coming out of the cellar, I did not walk quickly enough for them, and I was told, You had too little. If you don't hurry up, you'll be brought back in again. Other Cases in Castle Martin Meyer, aged 30, 
A municipal official of Botnerstrasse 4 was taken out of the municipal offices where he was working at 12.30 on March 24th by stormtroop men and taken to the public hall in the Karlstrasse. There he was taken into a dark cellar, laid on a bench and beaten with rubber truncheons for half an hour with one short interval. One blow hit his nose and another his right eye. Cashel Seppel, trade union secretary, Schillstrasse 14, Castle, was taken from the trade union house, along with Gurkha, another trade union secretary, by eight stormtroop men on March 23, 1933, at 5 p.m. They were told they were to be tried at the public hall. They were put into a large hall. They heard cries coming from the rooms below. They waited an hour. They were then taken by eight men into a dark cellar, laid across a table, and beaten by six men with rubber truncheons. They are now still confined to bed and under medical treatment. Their kidneys appear to be injured. Their urine is mixed with blood. Their backs, buttocks, and legs are injured. Ball Heinrich, a shopkeeper of Ludwigstrasse II, Castle, was arrested in his shop at about 3 p.m. on March 24, 1933, by four stormtroop men and taken to the public hall. He was beaten in the street and threatened that he would be shot if he tried to escape. Maltreated in the public hall, he was made to take down his trousers and beaten for a quarter of an hour with rubber truncheons. Since then, he has been in Castle Hospital. Christian Wittrock, age 40, manager of the local health insurance department at Castle, was taken out of his office by two stormtroop men on March 24, 1933. He was taken down the outside steps, then through a crowd of people to the public hall in the Karlstrasse. There he was asked particulars about himself, and then the Nazi in charge said, Wittrock is discharged. He was then taken out as if he was going to be set free, but then taken into a dark cellar laid on a bench there, and beaten with rubber truncheons. Two blows on his head, his skin cut on his back, his buttocks and his legs, his clothes were stained with blood and partly torn, also his shoes. Then he was taken back into the hall and there beaten again. He is now under medical treatment. Even an officer maltreated. In the second week of March, a retired Lieutenant Anhalt, now District Surveyor, living at Germania Strasse 12, Tempelhof, Berlin, was arrested in his flat by three stormtroop men and one civilian. He immediately gave the alarm to the police, who arrived at his flat, but refused to interfere. The stormtroop men took Anhalt to the Hedemannstrasse. There he was first struck by the civilian for having called the police. Then he was taken into a room where there were already twelve or thirteen men lying on straw. A stormtroop man, whom they called Oberfahrer, took charge of the lieutenant. There was no mention of the fact that Anhalt was charged with anything. Oberfahrer only knew that he had a former officer in front of him. He began to deliver punishment with two accomplices, and did not stop beating Anhalt until blood was streaming from his mouth and nose. Then he lifted up the injured man and showed him to the other prisoners lying groaning on the floor, saying, See here, this swine is a lieutenant, and in such a fright that he can't stand straight. As Anhalt then stood up, the stormtroop man then kicked him behind his knees, and repeated this till Anhalt fell down. Another beating followed, which, however, did not seem to break the prisoner's spirit, to the desired extent. Anhalt endured the blows in silence, and the stormtroop man shouted in fury, You'll howl, you dog, and hit at Anhalt until he lost consciousness. Then he threw him on the straw by the other prisoners. Otto Gurke arrived at the trade union house, Castle, at 3.30. Three auxiliary police said, Number one, that's one of them. Number two, we'll come for him. Number three, that's Gurkha of the Metal Workers Union. At 4.30, four stormtroop men entered the office. Here, Gurkha? Yes. Put on your coat. You must come with us to be interrogated. 
in reply to my question whether the police president knew of this i was told yes eight stormtroop men took me into the public hall i was first taken to the guard room then up into the hall and searched for arms at about five thirty i was summoned and taken by two stormtroop men down the steps into the cellar where there were a number of bicycles in the passage they told me to leave my hat and coat there i was then taken down twelve steps into a lower cellar in this cellar i was thrown on to a table my head and arms were held down and i was beaten with rubber truncheons for fifteen to twenty minutes i was then pulled up and told to say heil hitler which i could not do a doctor was summoned immediately and he certified that i was suffering from loss of blood and nervous collapse castle march twenty eighth nineteen thirty three i certify that i have treated herr otto gurka josefstrasse castle for wounds on both arms buttocks legs and calves the wounds extend to the region of the kidneys i have had herr gurka under treatment since march twenty fourth he is unable to carry out his duties and must be confined to bed. Signed. Propaganda Film Instead of Dinner At 6.30 a.m. on Monday, April 3rd, I was arrested by two protective corpsmen. Although my interrogation showed that there was no ground for my arrest, I was taken with two other prisoners to an ice cellar, an underground room fifteen feet by six with no opening for either air or light. On Thursday at about 11.30 p.m., we were brought out of the cellar and put into a schoolroom. On Friday, we thought that we were going to be released, but they had evidently only decided to make a spectacle of us. As we were put into a car, we were surrounded by a crowd of fascists who jeered at us. To our surprise, we were taken to a cinema where we were shown a film, Bleeding Germany. It was a film of incitement against France and included the shooting of Schlageter. One of the Nazis present began a speech. He imagined that he could win us over, but the main thing in our minds was that we had no dinner that day. At midnight on Friday, I was again fetched out by two stormtroop men and taken to the police station. I was not able to answer their questions to their satisfaction, and the police inspector ordered me to be taken out again. An hour later, two protective corpsmen came for me, but they did not take me back to where I had been imprisoned. They drove the car out to a wood and pulled up there. I was pulled out and then thrown to the ground. Then they asked me, where are the arms? I said, I don't know of any. Then they started to beat me with rubber truncheons. One man holding my face pressed into the sand. After a while they paused and again demanded, where are the arms? I thought of trying to run, as I felt that nothing mattered any more. But then I noticed that they were getting tired. The man who was holding down my head let go, and then I felt a terrible blow on my head and lost consciousness. When I came to, I crept home. Tagore's Experience In the last week of April, the nephew of the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore was arrested on suspicion of having plotted to assassinate Hitler. He was afterwards released and gave the following account of his experiences. The room in which I was put was underground, dark and without any air. Twenty-two prisoners were already imprisoned there, all of them members of left parties, mostly communists. Many of them had already been there more than a month, and had not yet even been interrogated. From time to time one of them would be summoned and taken out of the cell, we would hear terrible cries, and then our companion would be pushed back into the room. He would show us the traces of what had been done to him. A communist member of the Reichstag showed me the marks of ill usage on his body, saying simply, Look, this is called national German culture. On the day I was arrested, a young man of the name of Ram was called out, and returned with cut and bleeding thighs. The stormtroop men had beaten him with steel rods because he had refused to give false evidence against his comrades. Early on Tuesday morning, a man was thrown into our cell who could hardly stand. His arm was swollen and in a sling, and his face was covered with blood. He was a trade union official of the name of Fuhler. Stormtroop men had forced their way into the trade union house, and as Fuhler could not produce the arms which they demanded he should give up, they attacked him broke his arm, 
pushed a stick into his side, ripped his cheek open nearly to his eye, knocked him down, and kicked him. It was impossible to sleep at night. All the time the place was filled with the cries of the prisoners and the singing and laughter of our tormentors. In the next cell one prisoner was crying out for his mother without cessation, Often the stormtroop men would come into the cells to carry out their brutalities. Documents which not even Gibbels can dispute. Kurt Haas, a film critic who took absolutely no part in politics, was arrested by civilians in his flat on the night of February 28th. He refused to go with the men, who produced no official document apart from stormtroop credentials. Then they threatened that they would shoot him and they beat him on his bed, tied him up and carried him, severely injured, to a car. Some police stopped the car on the way and rescued Haas. His wounds were bandaged in hospital, and then he was released. Up to this point there was nothing exceptional in this story, but Haas made a complaint to the Minister of the Interior, and what followed gives the case importance. Although the stormtroop men were quite unable to produce any proof that they were acting on behalf of the authorities, they were subsequently fully protected by the ministry. Here is the reply sent by Goering's ministry. Prussian Ministry of the Interior, Stormtroop Connections Department No. 29-33, Berlin, 13 March 1933, to Herr Kurt Haas, Berlin, Wilmersdorf. Your letter, dated 4-3-1933, addressed to the Minister of the Interior, has been passed to me as the appropriate officer to investigate and decide the matter. I have ascertained that the particulars given in your letter are inaccurate and distorted in essential points. The stormtroop was completely in the right and acted with authority to take you into protective arrest, in accordance with the information I have received, after the stormtroop men had produced their credentials, as you yourself admit, they acted as the circumstances required. After putting on your clothes at their request, you yourself are responsible for having made it necessary to break your resistance by force, inasmuch as you suddenly began to shout and bluster, and attacked the stormtroop members, biting one man's thumb so severely that the wound is not yet healed. From the facts in my possession, the degree of force used was not greater than was required to break your resistance. I see no grounds for taking any action against the stormtroop leader and men concerned, but must rather reserve to the injured stormtroop man the right to take proceedings against you. Head of the Stormtroop Connections Department in the Prussian Ministry of the Interior, signed Dr. Hale. This document should be of historical value. It can as little be disputed as the official announcement from Bielefeld. 3rd April, 1933. The Social Democratic member of the Reichstag and Town Councilor Schreck was arrested yesterday. At present he is in hospital. End of chapter 7 Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley Chapter 8 The Persecution of Jews one of the first acts of the new nationalist government of Thuringia was the dissolution of the Central Union of German Citizens of Jewish Faith within the territory of the Thuringian state. The following statement was issued by the government in explanation. Quote, One of the chief objects of the Central Union is to fight anti-Semitism. As there is no anti-Semitism in Germany, the Central Union no longer has any justification for its existence. It is therefore dissolved as from today. End of quote. We are here dealing with questions of fact. Authentic reports and depositions relating to tortures, acts of brutality, and outlawry directed against Jews living in Germany will show clearly enough where the boundary lies between atrocity stories and the appalling reality. It will become evident that although in some particular cases the so-called atrocity stories may have been inexact and exaggerated, yet they have also to some extent understated the actual facts of brutality. For example, there has been a report that a certain Herr Cohn had his hairs pulled out one by one. But it turned out that this Herr Cohn had been out of Germany for some time and had not suffered at all. But on the other hand, that a certain Herr Levy not only had his hair pulled out, 
but had one of his eyes put out and has been in a hospital for some weeks in danger of death. Mistakes in names and in places where incidents took place have come to light, but for every case reported which on investigation proved to be incorrect or exaggerated, there are a hundred cases of torture, murder, and robbery which have not come to light at all, for the reason that the people concerned have been threatened with death if they tell the truth about the crimes which are being committed every day in Hitler's Germany. The reports of actual incidents can stand by themselves without any reference to the problem of the Jewish question. Many attempts, written from various standpoints, have been made to present an analysis of the situation in Germany in regard to the Jews. Here we deal with this wider question very briefly, but it is essential to say something of the inseparable connection which exists between the Hitler movement and anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism as one of the foundations of National Socialism. It is an old practice of the ruling class to distract the attention of the people from their actual sufferings. It is not possible here to deal in a scientific way with the reasons why attacks on the Jews have for many centuries served as the basis for distracting the people in this way. Why throughout the Middle Ages the Jews were attacked as a religious community, and more recently for the most part as a race. The analysis made by Marx in The Jewish Question has been followed by many subsequent writers who have treated the question from a social standpoint. At the present time, it is impossible to approach The Jewish Question as a confused complex of race, nationality, people, and religion. It must be regarded as a social question containing racial, national, and religious elements. Antisemitism in Modern Germany Hitlerism is a characteristic form of the process of dissolution of the lower middle class in the age of industrial capitalism, and it has its parallel in the past. Anti-Semitism in modern Germany dates from the movement which developed under Adolf Stocker, a court chaplain in the last quarter of last century. The basis of that movement was economic. There was a period of unrestricted speculation in the years when German industry was being built up after the victorious war of 1870-71, to and this was followed by a severe economic crisis, which directly affected the lower middle class as well as the working class. Adolf Stocker found the new gospel of salvation in a campaign against the Jews. Ernst Ottwald, in his brilliant study, Germany Awake, writes of Stocker as follows, quote, Without any regard to fundamental economic facts, Stocker ascribed to Jewish influence everything within the German Empire which seemed to him unhealthy and harmful. In the indebtedness of the peasant population of the provinces of East Prussia, which was an inevitable consequence of the increasing world production of grain, Stocker could see only the Jew who gave credit to the peasant in order to drive him from hearth and home a short time afterwards out of diabolical wickedness. He saw in the wretched position of the German industrial workers not the greed of a type of capitalist which had been brought into being by the advance made in the means of production, but the existence of Jewish capitalists, and the Jews were responsible for everything. End of quote. Bismarck, the servant of the Jews. The anti Semite propaganda achieved a certain success. The first revolutionary upheaval of the duped lower middle class was concentrated on the weakest point that is to say, the Jewish minority. But, when Adolf Stocker began to attack the rich and powerful Jews also, the solidarity of the possessing class was roused. Bismarck himself intervened, and the court chaplain who had become an agitator fell out of favor. It is amusing to find that the anti-Semitic movement of that period also attacked Bismarck, denouncing him as the servant of the Jews. A pamphlet published in 1878 contains the following. Quote, the credit for having raised the Jews and their associates into a ruling clique in Germany must be given to Prince Bismarck. The protection of the Jews is one of the blackest pages in Bismarck's glorious empire, with its consequences in the impoverishment of the working class, the demoralization of all sections of society, and the disgusting fusion of money with the aristocracy by birth. Prince Bismarck succumbed to the influence of the Jews. The society in which he moved was composed of Jews and the associates of Jews. They were always with him and were his political advisers and the champions of civilization on whom he mainly relied. End of quote. 
This popular movement of the time inevitably found expression in excesses. The signal was given by the burning down of the synagogue in the little Pomeranian town of Neustetten. Then, too, the national indignation was roused by an act of incendiarism, and then, too, it was not the incendiaries who were brought to trial, but Jews, who were alleged to have burnt down their own temple out of vindictiveness. Pogroms followed, and, when the popular movement had already begun to flag, when the economic crisis was over, this anti-Semitism took legal shape in the form of parties, and also found people who could supply the necessary ideology. Professor Eugen During, with his work on the Jewish question as a question of racial character, opened a new era of anti-Semitism, racial anti-Semitism. Since then, a great deal of ink has flowed in order to prove that the Jews are a race, and an outlandish, inferior, and criminal race at that. Apart from Chamberlain's ingenious assertions, this science has, for the most part, been content with coarse jests. Now, in Hitler's Germany, the science celebrates its triumph, and no doubt there are a good many people who will be able to earn their bread in this shameful way in the Third Empire. Anti-Semitic Parties Germany was the country in which anti-Semitism was first organized on a party basis. These parties were the German Social Party, the Anti-Semite People's Party, and later the German Reform Party. They had no other object than anti-Semitism which was the sole aim and purpose of their existence. It was characteristic that their fortunes varied with the economic situation, but in any case, anti-Semitism remained parliamentary for nearly three decades. During this period, it was a sociological rather than a social phenomenon. With the economic catastrophe of the post-war period, however, anti-Semite parliamentarism once more developed into a popular movement. The traditional anti-Semitic parties disappeared, but there were no fewer than 260 anti-Semitic organizations in post-war Germany. These were all united by the National Socialists. The National Socialist Workers' Party of Germany is indissolubly linked with anti-Semitism. In fact, it is quite unthinkable without it. Anti-Semitism was one of the foundations and the constant companion of National Socialism from triumph to triumph up to the seizure of power. Forms of Anti-Semitic Agitation Recent German anti-Semitism, of which Hitler's victory is the fulfillment, has never worried itself over much to find scientific justification. It is one of the special characteristics of this movement that, from the very beginning, it has never proved anything, but always merely asserted. Its success depends on confusing and distracting people from the actual state of things. This anti-Semitism has always found expression in the most repulsive forms of incitement. During the Kapp Putsch early in 1920, the curious anti-Semitic symbol, the Hakenkreuz swastika, was first publicly exhibited on the steel helmets of the Erhardt Brigade. On that occasion, too, the Nazi songs were first publicly sung. Then, also, a real national man made speeches entirely composed of expressions such as Rathenau, the Jewish sow. On the streets, the children were learning anti-Semitic songs. Now, in the Third Empire, they all know the glorious battle song whose refrain runs, quote, When Jewish blood spurts from under the knife, things will be twice as good as before. End of quote. For 15 years, in tens of thousands of meetings and tens of thousands of articles in the press, the Jew has been presented by Hitler's party to the duped masses as the most utter abomination. The Jew is responsible for everything, for the war as well as the peace, for capitalism as well as the revolution, for poverty as well as wealth. The National Socialist agitation sees the Jew lurking everywhere and helping on the work of Judaism to reach its aim of world domination. And to Hitler and his followers, this is equivalent to the destruction of the world. Here we can only give some examples of the absurdity and vileness of this anti-Semitism. Hitler on the Jews. We take these examples from the most official statement of National Socialism, Hitler's book My Fight, which is now circulating in many hundreds of thousands of copies. There we find, quote, The black-haired Jewish youth lies in wait for hours, satanic joy in his face, for the unsuspecting girl, whom he defiles with his blood and thereby robs from her own race. 
They were and are Jews who brought Negroes to the Rhine always with the same aim and idea in their minds of destroying, through the bastardization that must inevitably result, the white race which they hate, of bringing it down from its high cultural and political level, and themselves getting the mastery over it. In culture, the Jew defiles art, literature, and the theater, destroys natural sentiments, undermines all ideas of beauty and dignity, of nobility and goodness, and drags humanity down under the spell of his own base mode of life. If the Jews were alone on this world, they would smother themselves in dirt and filth just the same in their attempts to get advantages over each other and destroy each other, insofar as their complete lack of any sense of self-sacrifice, which finds expression in their cowardice, did not turn the fight into a farce. When the Jew wins political power, he casts aside the few wrappings which he still has. The democratic Jew of the people becomes the Jew of blood and tyranny. He tries in a few years to root out the national carriers of intelligence, and by robbing the peoples of their natural intellectual leadership, prepares them for their lot as slaves in permanent subjection. End of quote. It must be borne in mind that these phrases occur in a book which is certainly representative and was written with the consciousness that it was representative. The extracts given in fact illustrate only the mildest and most restrained form of anti-Semitic agitation. A different and much clearer language is used in meetings and in articles in the press. For years, the typical headlines in the National Socialist papers have been at the utters of the Jewish sow, the Jewish plague in the world, and so forth. And finally, it must not be forgotten that the main battle cry of the Hitler movement is Perish Judah. In The Guide and Instructional Letter for Functionaries of the National Socialists, dated March 15, 1931, we find, quote, the natural hostility of the peasant against the Jews, and his hostility against the Freemason as a servant of the Jew, must be worked up to a frenzy. Day of Reckoning It is necessary to recall all this in order to realize the ridiculous character of the Dementius issued by the National Socialist members of the government in connection with the reports of the persecution of Jews and the grotesque nature of the statement that the Jews would suffer no harm under Adolf Hitler's protecting rule. For fifteen years, the Jews have been spoken of as a world plague, as the most brutish of sub-men, and the adherents of the National Socialist movement have been given license to calumniate and persecute the Jews. Hatred of the Jews has been systematically nurtured. For fifteen years, a day of reckoning has been promised. Is it strange that this sowing of murder should bear fruit when the so-called national revolution developed? Every young national socialist has been ceaselessly told that it is a moral act and his highest duty as a national German to extirpate the Jews. How is it possible to make these young national socialists understand that now, when they are in power, they are to protect the Jews? So they are given a free hand, and very willingly too, for of all the things which they have been promised, the only thing they can be given is the satisfaction of their lust for murder. The government cannot give all National Socialist supporters bread and work, nor can it improve the economic situation or redeem any of the promises it made. But so long as it allows the lower middle class to persecute and beat up the Jews, it can distract them from the tremendous imposture of which they too have been the victims. For this reason, the campaign against the Jews is given its head in Hitler's Germany. It would be a terrible mistake to think that the persecution of the Jews was only a transitory phenomenon of the period when Hitler took power. It is a political measure systematically carried out and necessary for the tremendous deception of the people. Minister Goebbels, in a pamphlet called the Nazi Sozi, says that, quote, the liberation of the German nation can only be carried out against the Jews. It is true that the Jew is also a man but the flea is also an animal, but not a pleasant one. Our duty to ourselves and to our conscience requires us to make him harmless. End of quote. Jews are watching you. To show that the anti-Semitic propaganda has not in any way stopped, but that it is being carried on in an organized way, making use of every available means, we quote only one of the publications which have appeared since Hitler took power. It is a book by Dr. Johann von Leers, with the title, Jews Are Watching You. It is a somewhat random collection of photographs which are presented to the German people by way of a warning. 
Among some 60 photographs of Germans and people of other nationalities, there are pictures of Karl Liebknecht, who was a descendant of Martin Luther, of the Catholic leader Erzberger, of Willy Munzenberg, in whom there is not a drop of Jewish blood, of Grzynski, of the Catholic mayor of Cologne, Adenauer, of Erwin Piscator, son of a clergyman, who are all, on the National Socialist Racial Theory, Germans of pure race. But this is characteristic. In Hitler's Germany, no one takes the trouble to check up even the most simple facts which are supposed to be the basis of statements made. It is quite enough to make assertions and calumniations. Anyone who is inconvenient to the Hitler regime is a Jew, so far as this regime is concerned. That is all there is to it. The conception of responsibility is completely alien to these National Socialist writers. If anyone asks for any proof, the National Socialist storm troops are good enough to silence any inconvenient questioner. This is the reason why no one dares to challenge even the most nonsensical statements, and as no one contradicts them, the masses believe everything. This book, which we hope will get a very wide circulation, as it is really a revelation of the spirit of the new regime, contains also photographs of Rosa Luxemburg, Professor Einstein, Georg Bernhard, Leon Fuchtwanger, Theodore Wolff, Emil Ludwig, Max Reinhardt, Charlie Chaplin, Alfred Kerr, and the American banker Otto H. Kahn. No one who is not a National Socialist will find anything repulsive in these photographs. For the most part, they are splendid heads of clever and serious people of real intellectual standing. The only repulsive things about the photographs are the titles which Dr. von Leers has provided. Under Rosa Luxemburg is printed, Executed, Levine, Executed, Erzberger, Executed at Last. The young Germans who shot him were released from persecution after the National Revolution of 1933. For Einstein, there is the laconic remark, Unhanged. This is a favorite observation of the compiler of the book. He uses it for everyone who has not yet been murdered. For Reinhardt, his second-rate and soulless art, etc., Chaplin is described as a little sprawling Jew, as boring as he is repulsive. It is said of Toller, promptly locked up after Adolf Hitler's seizure of power. But not even this is true, as by that time Ernst Toller was already out of Germany. Erwin Piscator is called a Bolshevistic artistic Jew. The bankers Max Vorborg and Dr. Karl Melchior are said to be extremely dangerous. Among these Jews... There is a young man of the name of Schlesinger, who once in desperation carried out an attack on a train which cost many lives. Later on, he was released on an amnesty. In the course of the trial, it came out that Schlesinger was not a Jew, but a German of pure race. Anti-Semitic propaganda made use of the name at the time, but subsequently had to drop its attacks when it was proved beyond question that this Schlesinger was of pure race. But Dr. von Leers writes under his photograph, Quote, moved by greed and unconcealed race hatred, he caused the terrible railway accident at Lefford, end of quote. But what does it matter? One lie, more or less, makes no difference to these people. Parish Judah Herr Hans Stengel, foreign press chief of the National Socialists, gave a semi-official interview on March 27, 1933, to the American representative of the semi-official Telegraph Union Press Service. In reply to the question... Are the reports of alleged maltreatment of Jews true or false? He said, quote, A few minutes ago, when I met the Chancellor at the Munich airport on his arrival from Berlin, he authorized me to tell you that these reports are, one and all, base lies. End of quote. Humpf Stangl's answer to detailed questions about the persecution of Jews was, quote, The Berlin embassies of Sweden and Holland have investigated and have found that not a single Jew has been killed. End of quote. 43 murdered. The list of Jews shot or beaten to death by the storm troops has been checked by us, and it shows a total of 43. These 43 are the cases in which the victims were murdered primarily because they were Jews, not because they were Marxists. These 43 authentic cases, which have been examined in every detail, represent only a small part, a fraction of the real number, which will undoubtedly come to light in the course of time when it becomes possible to get more exact information on the actual incidents which have taken place in Hitler's Germany. These 43 names are selected from many hundreds of names, 
all cases which up to now it has been impossible to check satisfactorily are left out of account we do not want to estimate or think but to prove actual facts a few detailed examples are taken from the mass of material before us Quote, on the 18th of March, 1933, a tragic doom claimed our dearly beloved and promising son, Siegbert Kinderman, baker's apprentice, who had just completed his 18th year, Moritz Kinderman, sign painter, and his wife, Franzeka Strasse V. Funeral, Sunday, March 26, 1933, 2 p.m., Weissensee. No visits of condolence by request. End of quote. The Jewish apprentice Kindermann, whose tragic doom this inconspicuous notice announces, was attacked in 1932 by National Socialists because he was a member of the completely non-political Jewish sports society Bar Kokhba. In connection with this attack, a National Socialist was charged and convicted. In order to revenge this conviction, after Hitler's seizure of power, Young Kindermann was dragged to the Nazi barracks in the Hedemannstrasse in Berlin and there literally beaten to death, his body being then thrown out into the street. A large Hockenkreuz was cut in his chest. An example from Kassel. Dr. O. M. of Kassel reports as follows, quote, On Friday, March 17, 1933, bands of Nazis went all over the town of Kassel, dragging off members of the Jewish community whom, for any reason, they did not like, in order to bring them to trial. It should be noted that the victims were not persons who have been prominent in politics of any kind. The reason for their ill-treatment was, as a rule, some petty spite on the part of the Nazi leaders. The following were particularly bad cases. Dr. Max Plout, a lawyer, was dragged out of his office by a large gang of Nazis and taken away in a closed car, which drove along the main street. As they drove along, he was forced to shout Heil Hitler by blows with rubber batons, and each time he shouted, the Nazis roared with glee. Plaut was taken to the Nazi headquarters, where a so-called court-martial was held and sentenced him, for alleged professional shortcomings, to 200 blows with rubber batons. He was then taken down to a cellar and strapped to a bench for the sentence to be carried out. He was then most terribly mishandled for almost two hours. After some time, Plaut fainted. Water was then thrown over him until he revived, and he was given some alcohol by so-called sisters. When he had come to himself, the mishandling was resumed. By the time the brutal punishment had been concluded, he had completely lost consciousness and was left, covered with blood, lying in a corner. Plout was then taken to his flat, where he died ten days later. The doctors who were called to attend him, Dr. Scholl, a nerve specialist, and Professor Tonneson, head doctor of the state hospital, found the most terrible injuries, including serious damage to the internal organs, especially kidneys and lungs. His back and legs gradually turned completely black. Plout had to be kept on his bed in a permanent state of narcosis, as when he came to consciousness he screamed so terribly that he was heard in the street. After ten days of this, he died. On another occasion, another lawyer, Herr Dahlberg, was most brutally treated in the same way as Plout, and at the same place. It should be noted that some time previously he had had a conflict in court with a lawyer who is now in an official position. This dispute was brought up against him while he was being mishandled. There can be no doubt, therefore, that the tortures inflicted on Dahlberg were due to direct instructions from this high Prussian official, who had previously been in command of the Castle National Socialists. Dahlberg was so badly injured that for some days the doctors were afraid that one leg would have to be amputated but fortunately it was found possible to save it. Dalberg is still severely affected by the results of his ill treatment. Another particularly bad case was that of a young Jewish merchant, Mosbach, against whom, so far as I know, the only accusation was that he had had relations with a Christian girl, though these had been discontinued. Nazis broke into his flat, and in the presence of his mother beat him so brutally that his head and spine were terribly injured. A doctor was called, Dr. Stefan, who is politically on the extreme right, and he stated that even during the war he had never seen such an appalling sight. For a long time, Mosbach hovered between life and death, but his life was eventually saved. On the same day, also at Nazi headquarters, two merchants, Freudenstein and Ball, were beaten and severely injured, both of them being dangerously ill for some time after. 
In both cases, the ill treatment was an act of personal revenge on the part of certain Nazis, but I have no details. There was also a case of a banker named Plaut being severely handled, but his injuries were not so severe. He was 60 years of age. The crimes of the Nazis in Hesse were certainly not restricted to Kassel. It would not be an exaggeration to say that in every village in the province of Kassel where any Jews live, there have been similar cases, some of them appalling. I know that in some villages all the male members of the Jewish community have left their homes and only returned, if they have returned at all, after a long interval. End of quote. Forced to sign a statement. Leo Krell, 25 years of age, living in the Skalitzerstrasse, Berlin, was attacked by a Nazi storm detachment and carried off to a Nazi barracks, where he was murdered. His body was then dropped in front of the Jewish cemetery. We mention this case because of what followed. His aged mother received a letter asking her to go and identify her son in the mortuary. It was difficult for her to identify the body, which was mutilated in every way. The Hocken Kreuz had been carved in his face and all over his body and burnt into the flesh. All that was left of her son was a mass of bleeding pulp. Faced with this mutilated body, the mother was compelled to sign a statement that her son had died, quote, after a long illness in hospital, end of quote. Such statements are always demanded from relatives in the case of people who have been beaten to death. If any of the relatives ever hint, even in private, at what actually happened, they can look forward to being brought before a court and sentenced to many months, if not years, of imprisonment for taking part in an atrocity campaign. As a rule, the storm detachment people concerned tell the relatives that they will suffer the same fate if they do not, quote, keep their mouths shut, end of quote. A deep silence lies over Germany. The people who are suffering dare not even call for help. That would be treason. Forty-three mutilated corpses of Jews who had been beaten to death with rubber batons, steel rods, and leather whips have been recorded up to now, people whose only crime was that they were Jews. We do not know the total number of such corpses that have been secretly buried, perhaps five hundred, perhaps a thousand, perhaps even more. The future will bring it to light. It is only after some years that it will be realized that all the reports of the brutalities carried out by Hitler's bandits, which have so far been published, fall far short of the appalling reality. 300 Proved Cases of Barbarous Cruelty 43 Mutilated Corpses, Identified and Authenticated Up to the Present And How Many Cases of People Beaten Almost to Death or Injured for Life up to now, we have records of 301 cases of severe bodily injuries inflicted on Jews, cases in which we have been in a position to verify the place and date of the crime and the identity of the person injured. The actual number of Jews who have suffered ill usage must already be considerably over 10,000. Of the 300 cases which we have been able to verify, we give the following examples. In the middle of April, a number of papers reported that Rabbi Jonas Frankel, who was over 80, had been attacked and severely ill-treated by storm detachment men at his home in Berlin, Dragonerstrasse 37. The government issued a denial of this report. The rabbi's daughter, Ella Frankel, reports the following details. Quote, How my father was to be murdered by Ella Frankel. At about 7.30 on the evening of March 7th, three storm troop auxiliary policemen forced their way into our flat at Dragonerstrasse 37. Two of them held me prisoner, with their revolvers pointed at my forehead and my breast. The third shot at my father, who was sitting at his desk. Two bullets struck his head, and my father, streaming with blood, sank unconscious to the floor. One of the Nazis shouted, That's fixed him. Then they broke open the desk and stole all the money in it my dowry of $5,000 and 2,000 marks. Before leaving, they warned me against calling for help and smashed the electricity connection so that the flat was left in darkness. We later ascertained that these auxiliary police were members of the Dragonerstrasse storm troops. I lifted my father from where he was by the desk to the window, and for half an hour was calling for help. The street was cordoned off by Nazis and several squads of police. Anyone who attempted to leave his house was driven back with blows from rubber batons. Eventually, some police officers came up, followed by officials of the Humane Society, with whom our neighbors had gotten into touch. They wanted to take my father to hospital, but I would not agree. 
Two days later, we were visited by an official from the Polish consulate. He found the flat still splashed with blood. For two weeks, my father lay helpless. We were afraid every hour that he was going to die. On April 8th, some Nazis again came to the flat and demanded to see my father. They stated that if my father was willing to certify in writing that he had not been attacked by Nazis but by Jews, he would not be interfered with again. I told them that my father was too ill to write and that they must come back again in two days' time. They drew their revolvers and forced both of us to give our words of honor that we would give them the certificate two days later. As my father was determined in no case to give such a declaration, the only course left to us was to get away as quickly as possible. Two friends wrapped him up in a rug and took him away in broad daylight to friends living in a distant part of the town. I was almost out of my mind with anxiety. We had previously taken away the two scrolls of the law. Footnote. A scroll of the law consists of two tables of stone, round which is wound a parchment on which the Pentateuch is inscribed. End of footnote. But we left everything else in the flat. I left the house in indoor clothes and without a hat, as our porter was a Nazi and he would immediately have denounced us. We took the train to Vienna. My father, whose head was covered with bandages, was represented as being very old and deaf. I said that I was traveling to Vienna and had promised to look after the old man on the way. Soon after the train left Berlin, a spy came and sat with us and put questions to me, but he left the compartment when we reached Dresden as my answers had not made him suspicious. After Dresden, the examination of passengers began. German officials went from compartment to compartment asking, Are you Jews? I took up my position at the door of the compartment, in which there were only the two scrolls of the law besides my father. The officials had, however, already been given a report by the spy, and they greeted me politely and said, Ah, you are the young lady traveling to Vienna and looking after the deaf old gentleman. We have this information already. So we succeeded in getting here and stopped at Reichenberg as my father was quite unable to travel any further then. Later we came on to Prague. My father is still lying here ill. End of quote. We have given this case in detail as it is a very typical one, and we refer the reader to the accompanying photographs. A rabbi, 80 years of age, attacked and left for dead and is flat robbed but the Dementi machine has the effrontery to announce to the press of the world that there was no such person as this rabbi. This case is typical of a thousand Dementis of a regime which lies with an unscrupulous brutality equal to that with which it murders. Attacked in the Synagogue We want to state another case, the scene of which was a synagogue. Rabbi Barish was in the synagogue in Duisburg at the Divine Service when he was attacked and brutally handled. He was dragged out through the street, and after being wrapped in the black-red gold flag, was made to run the gauntlet through a crowd of shouting men. Finally, he was arrested, and the charge made against him was being responsible for public disorder in the street. The rabbi of Gelsenkirchen was driven out of the synagogue during the Sabbath service, and with a number of other Jews was taken through the streets to the Nazi barracks. There they were all forced to turn their faces to the wall and make genuflections. When the rabbi protested against this, he was laid across a ladder and beaten with a stick. Later he was set free and succeeded in escaping across the Dutch frontier. He arrived at Amsterdam so severely injured that he was unable to stand. Before the Nazis set him free, they forced him to sign a declaration that his imprisonment had been due to a misunderstanding. Pogroms The Frankfurter Zeitung of April 24, 1933, contains the following announcement. Quote, Vice Baden, April 23rd. Two assaults with fatal results occurred here on Saturday evening. The two victims were a merchant, Salomon Rosenstrock, and a dairyman, Max Castle. The police report on the murder of Max Castle runs as follows. On Saturday at 23.30, cries for help were heard coming from a flat in number 43, Webergasse. At the same time, a number of shots rang out. A motor lorry driver who was passing along the street went and informed the police. The police ascertained that the cries for help had come from the flat of Max Castle, a dairyman, 59 years of age. On entering, the officers found Castle lying dead on the floor of one of the rooms. On examination, the body showed bullet wounds which had proved fatal. Further investigation showed that several persons, by breaking in a door panel, had forced their way into the flat and shot the man as he was running towards the window. The shots had been fired from an army revolver. 
the investigations did not produce any evidence showing that the motive of the crime was robbery, and the indications are that it was an act of revenge. End of quote. The official report of the second case states that on that Saturday at 2145, the police were called to the flat of a merchant, R., 58 years old, living in Wilhelmstrasse 20. R. was lying on the ground, only just breathing. The body showed no injuries. A doctor ordered the man to be taken to hospital, but he died on the way from heart failure. The housekeeper, who was still in the flat, stated that at 2110, two young men had rung at the door of the flat and asked for R. When he came to the door, the two men pushed their way into the flat, and one of them pointed a revolver at R. R. fled into another room and fell to the ground. The two attackers then left the flat without giving any further explanation. According to the woman's description, they were two lads of between 20 and 23 years of age. We mention these cases because they seem to us typical of the actual pogrom which is being carried out. Living Targets These are a few of the cases which authorities have themselves made public, but this does not mean that thousands of similar acts of brutality have not taken place, although nothing is said of them. One day, in the middle of a Berlin street, the son of an attendant at a synagogue was attacked by a Nazi troop in the presence of his father. The lad was held by the Nazis, and one of them fired his revolver twice through the lad's right calf and twice through his left calf. The lad has now been in hospital for three months, and it is probable that he will be lame for life. A case from the provinces. The following statement, which we have received, has been checked up by us in detail. It is typical of hundreds of similar reports which are in the possession of editors outside Germany and also in the hands of many private individuals. Quote, in the little town of Niederstetten in Württemberg State, a small Jewish community has lived for centuries. Its members are for the most part merchants who, as might be expected, in so far as they take any interest in politics, belong to the parties of the right rather than to the socialists or communists. Friendly relations existed until quite recently between the Christian and the Jewish sections of the population. A week before Easter, a Nazi detachment arrived in the town early one morning and occupied the town hall, also taking control of the police. Then the houses of the Jews were searched for communist documents, naturally without any result. In spite of this, ten Jews, all respected citizens, were taken to the town hall and there one by one taken to a room. Each of them was then gagged, thrown across a chair, and beaten with steel rods until he was practically unconscious. Then the victims, who could hardly stand, were taken to the council chamber and made to stand up against the wall, the wailing wall, as the Nazis called it. After they had been forced to give the fascist salute, they were allowed to leave the town hall. Most of them, however, were so weak after the ill treatment they had received that they had to be carried home by their relatives. All the victims were ill for some weeks, and one of them has lost his speech. It should be mentioned that the non-Jewish population of the town, most of whom had voted nationalist in the election of March 5th, were very indignant at what had taken place. An old peasant said, Hitler certainly would not have wanted this to be done. The old man apparently did not have a wireless, or else he would have known that these German men have only carried out what the leading people in Germany have broadcast as their aim in thundering speeches every evening. End of quote. The following appeal, issued by the Action Committee for Fighting Judah in Neustadt, was published in the local paper dated May 18, 1933. Quote, Our aim is to liberate Neustadt from Jews and servants of the Jews. We must lay this down once again in plain language in case the people who are affected by it have not yet understood it. If anyone still thinks that he can defend the Jews, in our eyes he is a scoundrel with whom we shall deal in the same way as we deal with the Jews. End of quote. In the Nazi Barracks K.W. of Berlin reports as follows on his experience in a Nazi barracks. Quote, a 26-year-old Jew was brought in with me. He told me later that he had been arrested on his motorcycle, although he had never paid any attention to politics and has never voted. First, his hair was cut off with nail scissors, and then the auxiliary police had a dispute as to who was to beat him. The auxiliary policeman who had brought him in said, I need not have brought the Jew in at all if I'm not going to be allowed to beat him. The other said, You're drunk. Go and sleep it off. Most of the auxiliary police smelt strongly of alcohol. After that, the Jew was beaten up like the others with cowhide whips, steel rods, and rubber batons. Then a dagger was placed against his chest and he was told, Now you're going to be stabbed to death. He was actually only scratched, 
and then he was told that he would be stabbed to death early the following morning. At a quarter to six I was brought to trial. As they could produce nothing against me, I was taken to the sleeping hall, where about forty men were lying. I myself was only given a few kicks and blows with rubber batons. There was also what they called a murder cell. The three men who were in this cell had been beaten black from head to foot. At seven o'clock in the morning, the Nazi officer in charge arrived, and we were given breakfast, coffee, and dry bread. Then we were drilled in the courtyard, after we had been forced to say, Hail to our Chancellor Adolf Hitler. While we were being drilled, we had to sing Deutschland über alles and other similar songs. Then we were asked whether we would defend the fatherland if there was a war against Poland. We replied that we would. After that, we were asked what we would do if we were set free, and whether we would join the Nazis, and to this we also replied in the affirmative. End of quote. Polish Protests We cite the following, which is one of many official announcements and protests made by foreign countries. Quote, Berlin, March 30th. The Polish ambassador in Berlin has lodged a protest with the German government against the persecution of Polish Israelites by Hitler's bands. The ambassador mentioned, among other cases, the following, which had occurred in Berlin. On March 4th, Herr Israel Weiss was taken from his flat and dragged off to a garage, where he was so brutally treated that he lost consciousness. After that, he was taken to the police station where he was kept until March 6th. While he was being assaulted, Hitler's followers took from him his passport and his ring, and he never recovered those. On March 6th, Herr A. L. Mittelmann was attacked and taken into a restaurant where he was very severely injured. As a result of his treatment, he is quite unable to work. In Chemnitz and Plauen, Hitler's followers have perpetrated terrible brutalities against the Jews. All the Polish Israelites who were arrested in Chemnitz were taken under guard through the town, being made to wash out all the inscriptions which had been written on the walls during the last election. A Polish citizen, Adalbert Daphner, was given 50 lashes with a riding whip, being forced after every blow to say thank you. Terrible cruelties were carried out against a number of Israelites in the prison at Plauen. End of quote. United States Complaints A message from Berlin dated March 9th states that the American ambassador has lodged a protest against the ill treatment of American citizens. He cites a number of cases which have occurred in Berlin alone in the course of a few days. Quote, in Berlin, many Jews, including some of American nationality, have been brutally treated. For example, an American citizen, Herr Max Schussler, who was the owner of a house and had secured the eviction from his house of a Nazi tenant, was visited by Nazis one night. In order to gain entry to his flat, they represented themselves to be police. Then they demanded that Herr Schussler should sign a declaration allowing the return of his National Socialist tenant. End of quote. Official Statement from Czechoslovakia The official press bureau announces under date of April 2nd, quote, In the hospital at Vonsdorf, four refugees from Germany, who have been brutally treated, are now lying. Last night at one o'clock they were taken from a place in Saxony, which is now a concentration camp, to another village not far from Vonsdorf, being accompanied by twelve Nazis. They were four Jews, one of whom is an Austrian citizen, two being Poles, and the fourth having no nationality. A hundred yards from the frontier near Vornsdorf, the four men were taken out of the lorry and beaten up until they were covered with blood, and when they ran towards the frontier of Czechoslovakia, shots were fired after them. All four are seriously injured. One of them, in addition to other wounds, has a serious fracture of the skull and is unconscious. It must be noted that two of them had been settled in Leipzig for 25 years, where they were in business, and the other two had been 12 years in Dresden. It is announced from Germany that the refugees had refused to leave Germany, and had conducted themselves in an offensive manner to the guards who were accompanying them. End of quote. At the Frontier. The following message comes from Prague. Quote, the Berlin-Athens Express, which every day brings several hundred people to Prague, arrived there an hour late on April 1st, and with only three passengers. The passengers made depositions, which they signed before a notary, regarding what had happened in Dresden. At the station in Dresden, a cordon of Nazis had been drawn up on both sides of the train, and another detachment came through the compartments giving the order, Jews, out of the train. All Jewish passengers, including foreigners, were forced to leave the train. After this, the passports of the other passengers on the train were examined, and they were also forced to get out. They were forced to line up on the platform, and then they were ordered to march. The column of passengers, guarded by Nazis, went off towards the exit from the station. 
After this, nothing more has been heard of them. They included many women and children. End of quote. Another report runs as follows. Quote, the National Socialists even come on to Czechoslovakian territory and promise a reward for any refugees who can be brought on to German territory under any pretext. The reward promised for an ordinary refugee is 100 crowns. For a Jewish refugee, however, the amount is 200 crowns. These facts have been certified by the Czechoslovakian authorities. End of quote. The following laconic announcement from Warsaw throws further light on the position of refugees. Quote, Warsaw, March 15th. 48 Jewish families from Germany, consisting in all of 150 persons, have crossed the frontier of East Prussia and taken refuge in Poland. There were terrible scenes at the frontier, the refugees being horribly ill-treated by the German frontier guards. They were beaten and kicked and everything they had with them was taken from them by the guards. End of quote. The chief rabbi of France issues a statement. In connection with the denials issued by the German authorities, the chief rabbi of France has issued the following statement in connection with the anti-Semitic excesses in Germany. Quote, I am unfortunately compelled to say that the statements regarding atrocities are absolutely correct. We have evidence that cannot be disputed and also photographic documents. Do not think that we believe what we are told by refugees without further examination. We have ways of checking up on their statements. We are in possession of documents which have come to us from an absolutely reliable source, which I am not able to name. I can, however, say that some of these documents have an official character and have been prepared by foreign governments. The incidents in question are not cases of simple abuse, but cruel persecutions which have created victims and martyrs. If we are compelled to publish these documents, we shall do so. The conscience of the world, the chief rabbi continues, is deeply troubled and is horrified at the revival of barbarism which the anti-Semitism of the Nazis represents. In the name of humanity and civilization, the whole world protests with us. It fears that the restoration of world peace will be endangered through these new attacks of brutal force against right. End of quote. The correspondent of the English Manchester Guardian has made an extremely detailed and objective report published April 8, 1933, which is certainly not colored either by love or by hatred of National Socialism, but only by a human horror of brutality. Quote, the samples of outrages committed by brown shirts since the elections make it more evident than ever that the terror has been much worse than was at first believed. The British, French, and American press, so far from exaggerating it, as the German press complains, has understated the truth, although this is natural enough, seeing that only a small fraction of the truth is accessible. The terror seems to have been worst of all, worse even than in Berlin, in Kassel, in Silesia, where Highness, who was imprisoned on a charge of manslaughter and released by an amnesty, is in charge of the brown shirts, in Worms and in many villages. A precise account of what has happened in the villages of Oberhessen alone during the last four weeks would make a terrible story, but it is impossible to establish more than a few cases, inquiry being made difficult by the general fear not only of reprisals but also of imprisonment. A few days ago, a man was sentenced to a year's imprisonment for spreading the false rumor that a Jew had been hanged by the brown shirts. The rumor, as a matter of fact, was true. The Jew, a certain Mr. Blank, was beaten by brown shirts and hanged by his feet so that his head was suspended off the ground. When the brown shirts had finished with him, he was dead. Any German who dare say a true word about the terror in his own country runs the risk of a fearful beating or long imprisonment, or even death, and no one can reasonably be expected to run such a risk. But as one of the victims of the terror said to your correspondent today, it is impossible to remain silent even under threats. There is no reason why opinion in England and the United States should be hoodwinked, and it is necessary to point out that letters or statements by German Jewish or Republican organizations or societies saying that the terror has been exaggerated are products of fear and intimidation, and are therefore altogether unworthy of credence. Thousands upon thousands of Germans have only one wish, to get out of the country. But the frontiers are being closed by the new passport regulations, and escape is impossible except at great risk. Thus, all Germany is being converted into a huge prison. End of quote. Einstein's Appeal We will end this section with the appeal issued by Professor Einstein after he had been driven out of Germany. Professor Einstein arrived at Havre on March 27th on the steamer Belgianland. 
He was met by a delegation of the International League Against Antisemitism and gave the following statement written by his own hand. Quote, the actual facts of brutal force and oppression against every free-minded person and against the Jews, the facts of what has taken place and is still taking place in Germany, have fortunately aroused the conscience of every country which remains true to the ideals of humanity and political freedom. All friends of our civilization, which is so seriously menaced, should concentrate all their efforts in order to rid the world of this psychological disease. End of quote. The Boycott A Defensive Movement from its early days, National Socialism has made use of the method of representing itself as attacked, persecuted, and menaced. The political terror which has been organized by Hitler has always worked hand-in-hand hand with organized lies. The boycott against Jewish business concerns and the special acts against German Jews, of which we will speak later, give the best examples of the combined use of these methods. The National Socialists might have said, it is in accord with our program and with the demands which we have been making for many years that the Jews in Germany should be completely wiped out. But what did the Nazis actually do by way of justifying their boycott of Jewish shops? They cried out, We have been attacked. The Jews are trying to destroy us. What we are doing is in self-defense. This organized boycott was therefore called a defensive movement. The boycott manifesto, which was posted up everywhere, runs as follows, quote, Men and women of the German nation, the people who are guilty of this crime, this despicable atrocity campaign, are the Jews in Germany. They have called to their fellows abroad to fight against the German people. It is they who have issued lying statements and abuse. For that reason, the leaders of the German movement of liberation have decided, by way of defense against this criminal campaign, to impose a boycott on all Jewish businesses, shops, etc., as from 10 o'clock in the morning of April 1, 1933. We call on you, German men and women, to make this boycott effective. Do not buy from Jewish businesses and shops. Do not go to Jewish lawyers. Have nothing to do with Jewish doctors. Show the Jews that they cannot go unpunished if they humiliate and dishonor Germany. Anyone who opposes this manifesto thereby proves that he is on the side of the enemies of Germany. End of quote. On March 28th, the national leaders of the National Socialist Party published a manifesto to all party organizations in which the German Jews are accused of having started the atrocity campaign against the national government of Germany. The 11 points of the program. On the same day, the famous 11 points for carrying through the boycott were published. We give them verbatim below. 1. In each local group and section of the National Socialist Party, Action committees must be formed at once for the practical and systematic carrying out of the boycott of Jewish shops, Jewish goods, Jewish doctors, and Jewish lawyers. The action committees are responsible for seeing that the boycott does not harm any innocent person, but that it hits all the harder all those who are guilty. 2. The action committees are responsible for protecting all foreigners without regard to their religion or race. The boycott is a purely defensive measure, and it is exclusively directed against German Jews. 3. The action committees must immediately popularize the boycott by propaganda and explanatory statements. The principle of the boycott is that no German should buy from any Jew or be served by any Jew or his assistants. The boycott must be general. It must be carried out by the whole people and must hit Judah in its most sensitive spot. 4. In cases of doubt, the boycott of businesses must be postponed pending a decision from the Central Committee in Munich. 5. The action committees must closely watch the newspapers from the standpoint of how far they take part in the Enlightenment campaign of the German people against the atrocity campaign of the Jews. If the newspapers do not do this, or only do it to a limited extent, steps must be taken to see that they are immediately prevented from reaching any house in which Germans live. No German man and no German business must give them advertisements. They must be given to understand that they incur only public contempt and that they are written for people of Jewish race but not for Germans. 6. The action committees must carry into the factories their propaganda of enlightenment as to the consequences to German labor of the Jewish atrocity campaign, and they must explain to the workers that the national boycott was necessary as a protective measure on behalf of German labor. 7. The action committees must carry their activities into the smallest villages in order to strike particularly at the Jewish traders in the countryside. 8. The boycott must not be introduced gradually, but at a single blow. 
All preparatory measures must therefore be taken immediately with this in view. Instructions must be given to the storm troops to post pickets to warn the population against entering Jewish shops from the moment when the boycott begins. This will be April 1st punctually at 10 o'clock in the morning. It will be carried on until instructions are received from the party leadership. 9. The action committees must immediately popularize at thousands of mass meetings, which must reach even the smallest village, the demand that Jews shall only be admitted to every profession in proportion to the number of Jews in the community. In order to make this action more effective, the demand should at first be restricted to three sections. A. Students in the intermediate schools and universities. B. The medical profession. C. The legal profession. 10. The action committees are furthermore charged to see that every German who has any connection whatever with people in other countries should make use of this, in letters, telegrams, and telephonic communications, to spread the truth that peace and order reign in Germany, that the German people has no more ardent wish than to continue its work in peace and to live in peace with the rest of the world, and that its fight against the Jewish atrocity campaign is purely defensive. 11. The action committees are responsible for seeing that the whole fight is carried out absolutely peacefully and with the strictest discipline. Henceforth, no Jew must have even a hair of his head harmed. We must finish with this atrocity campaign purely through the effectiveness of the measures outlined above. This manifesto was accompanied by a long-winded explanation, each word of which was evidence of a bad conscience. The explanation concluded with the words, National Socialists, on Saturday at 10 o'clock, the Jews will know who it is that they are fighting. The lords of the Third Empire appointed to take charge of this defensive action a man named Julius Stryker, the editor of a newspaper called Der Sturmer. The outside world will not know what sort of paper this is, although from time to time its circulation runs into hundreds of thousands. For his services in editing this, Herr Stryker has been appointed commissioner in charge of the boycott movement. Herr Stryker had hardly taken up his post when he gave an interview to the press at a conference of national journalists on March 30th. In the course of this interview, he said, quote, I shall not hesitate to prohibit by force the holding of divine service by the German Jews, or to prevent them from gaining entry to the synagogues by the use of armed storm troops. The stone has now begun to roll. Whether the atrocity propaganda ceases or not makes no difference. This foreign propaganda against Hitler has given us the opportunity which we welcome, and the action will be carried through. It would be a complete illusion to imagine that the Nazis will allow themselves to be held back. End of quote. He, Stryker, was completely satisfied with the way things had developed. His only care in the past week had been to see that the war of destruction against the Jews did not weaken. Quote, had this happened, this is my firm conviction, the national revolution would have collapsed owing to its own weakness. This danger has now finally been averted, and the German people can trust in me to carry out the whole of the necessary work in connection with the Jews. End of quote. Preparations for the boycott. Incitements to Jew baiting were systematically developed during the last few days before the boycott. An example of this was the speech given by the newly appointed chief of police in Frankfurt, reported in the Frankfurter Volksblatt of March 30th. Quote, no Nazi will have anything to do with a Jew, because he knows that the Jew is of inferior race, and I am no longer going to permit animals born on German soil to be killed by the sadistic Asiatic methods of slaughter used by the Jews. If the Jew cannot eat our meat, then let him eat potatoes and turnips as you did in the hungry winters of the war. Germany is awake. You Jews, you have no need to tremble. We shall remain legal, so legal that perhaps legality will be uncomfortable for you and then you can go to Palestine and fleece each other. End of quote. The instructions from the Nazi leaders issued in a steady stream. Action committees were set up everywhere, and they were given the task of ascertaining which shops, stores, lawyers' offices, etc. were in the hands of Jews. The Central Committee for the Boycott of Jewish Concerns laid down the following principles for action. Quote, the action committees must hand over to the storm troops the list of shops which have been ascertained to be Jewish in order that these may be picketed from 10 o'clock on the morning of Saturday, April 1st, 1933. The pickets are charged with informing the public that the shops at which they are posted are Jewish. They are forbidden to take any physical measures of restraint. They are also forbidden to close the shop. In order to make it clear which shops are Jewish, posters or placards with yellow spots on a black ground must be posted at the entrance doors. 
the Jewish shops which are boycotted must not dismiss their non-Jewish employees and workers or give them notice. The action committees, in agreement with the political leaders of the district, must organize mass demonstrations and processions in all areas on Friday evening. On the Saturday morning at 10 o'clock at latest, the posters of the boycott proclamation must be put up on all advertising spaces. At the same time, lorries or better still furniture vans must be driven through the streets with posters bearing the following words in the order given. In defense against the Jewish atrocity and boycott campaign. Boycott all Jewish shops. Don't buy from Jewish stores. Don't go to Jewish lawyers. Avoid Jewish doctors. The Jews are our bane. The committees must organize collections in the German shops to finance this movement of defense. End of quote. During the days preceding April 1st, the following announcement was posted on all advertisement spaces throughout Germany. Quote, the Jews have time to reflect until Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Then the fight begins. The Jews of the whole world are trying to destroy Germany. German people, defend yourselves. Don't buy from the Jews. End of quote. Several of the government departments also issued instructions as to the measures which were to be taken in connection with the boycott. All sections of the Nazi organization also issued detailed instructions. There was no party official who failed to take the opportunity to make himself important by issuing an instruction of some kind. Treatment of Judges An eyewitness has given us the following report. Quote, On Friday, March 31st, an extraordinary scene took place in front of the High Court in Cologne. Nazi lads forced their way into the court buildings and dragged out the Jewish lawyers and judges. Then these were put into a refuse cart and made the laughing stock of the crowd. Many of the lawyers and judges were still wearing their robes. The police looked on without interfering. The cart was then taken to the main police station, which is a considerable distance from the court. The official report, which is an absolute lie, was as follows. In Cologne, members of the Nazi storm troop, in conjunction with the police, arrested a number of Jewish judges and lawyers for their personal safety as a large crowd had collected in front of the law courts. End of quote. The boycott had a limit, namely at the point when it endangered profit. In effect, all these measures only hurt the Jewish middle class and working class, but not the big Jewish capitalists. And when it was a question of trade with foreigners, all prejudice and race hatred had to fall into the background, and the Jews were not treated as sub-men or world pests, but only as extremely welcome paying guests. Here is a report published in the Frankfurter Zeitung. Quote, Weisbaden, May 31st. Up to the present this year, the number of visitors has fallen below expectations. The number of foreign visitors during the first week of May, which is always the height of the season for Weisbaden, was 1,744, and in the festival week following, it rose only to 1,808, falling again to 1,760 in the third week. The total number of visitors up to the middle of May has only been 27,000. It is therefore in the interest of this health resort that the local magistrates, the directors of the courthouse, and the national district leaders should make it known to everyone concerned, both in the country and abroad, that the mineral springs of Weisbaden are as before available without hindrance to all visitors from all countries, and that peace and order have never been disturbed in this town. The authorities of Weisbaden should feel their responsibility both to the population and also to foreign visitors, and should guarantee to all who are either permanently in Weisbaden or make a temporary stay there, without regard to their religion or political outlook, a secure and pleasant visit. End of quote. Laws of Exception The open boycott ended on April 1st, Although the National Socialist Press, the official leaders of the party, as well as their spokesmen, had assured the whole organization that this historic Saturday must be regarded as merely a test preparatory to a whole series of other measures, which would be carried out unless the opinion of the world, which at the moment was hostile, underwent a complete change. Opinion in other countries certainly changed radically, but in a direction unfavorable to the Third Empire. The government in Germany was quick to notice this. In fact, they noted it even before the boycott, and they realized that this open demonstration against the Jews was bad business. The National Socialists have principles, but they have always been prepared to sell them. The Retreat In the course of the week before the boycott, even Herr Streicher, evidently under instructions from the government, 
stated that it would not be necessary to resume the boycott, and the Minister for Propaganda and National Enlightenment told the representatives of the foreign press on March 31st, quote, that the government had decided provisionally to restrict the boycott against the Jews to Saturday, April 1st, when it would operate from 10 o'clock in the morning till 8 in the evening. After that, no further action would be taken until Wednesday. If the international press had by then stopped its agitation against Germany, no further action would be taken. But if this were not the case, a boycott would be started at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning, and this boycott would drive the Jews of Germany into absolute ruin. The instructions that two months' wages and salaries of employees of Jewish firms must be paid in advance from April 1st is cancelled. End of quote. The last sentence of this announcement shows that under the pressure of events, the National Socialists had been forced to repeal their own decrees. It had originally been decided that all owners of Jewish shops must pay all their Christian employees two months' salary in advance. The consequence of this was a run on the banks which might have led to a catastrophe if this decree had not been withdrawn at the earliest possible moment. The Silent Boycott The public boycott was a demonstration, and as a demonstration it failed and was not resumed. On the other hand, the silent boycott was continued, a boycott which cost nothing and hit not so much the rich and powerful Jewish firms as the tens of thousands of Jewish employees, doctors, lawyers, teachers, officials, university professors, etc. Hundreds of thousands of Jews have been deprived of their living, but this has given hundreds of thousands of places for Nazi hangers-on. Jewish lawyers not allowed to practice. In Berlin, at first, out of 1,200 Jewish lawyers, only 35 were permitted to practice and the number allowed to continue their practice in Cologne was only four. All Jewish judges have been given leave of absence. The commissioner of the Prussian Ministry of Justice issued the following instructions on March 31st. Quote, the irritation of the people at the presumptuous attitude of Jewish lawyers and doctors has reached such a height that it is necessary to take into account the possibility that the people may take the law into their own hands especially during the period of the defense campaign of the German people against the Jewish atrocity propaganda. This would endanger the authority of the administration of justice. I therefore request you to suggest to all Jewish judges now in office that they should at once apply for leave of absence, and this should immediately be granted to them. Please arrange with the Lawyers Association or other local organizations of the legal profession that from 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, the number of Jewish lawyers permitted to practice is fixed in a proportion which is the same as that of the Jewish population to the rest of the population. It is unnecessary to point out that Jewish lawyers should not be employed as junior counsel, nor should they be allowed to take dock briefs or be appointed receivers in bankruptcy or trustees. All engagements of Jewish lawyers in connection with official cases must immediately be withdrawn. The executives of associations of lawyers must be induced to resign. If the provincial and local leaders of the National Socialists express the desire to supervise the maintenance of security and order within the court building by sending armed pickets to these places, their wishes should be complied with. End of quote. Similar instructions were issued against Jewish doctors. In the first place, they were excluded from health insurance practice, which, of course, covered the great majority of all cases. The teachers and lecturers in Prussian educational institutions were required by the Minister of Culture, Rust, to fill out a questionnaire as to their racial origin. The Civil Service. As for government officials, the following decree was published in the beginning of April. Quote, Anyone of non-Aryan descent, particularly if their parents or grandparents were Jewish, is to be regarded as non-Aryan. One parent or one grandparent who is non-Aryan is sufficient. This is particularly to be assumed when one parent or grandparent has been a member of the Jewish religious community. Furthermore, every official who has joined the service since August 1, 1914, must prove that he is of Aryan descent, or that he fought at the front, or that his son or father fell in the World War. Birth certificates and marriage certificates of parents, in addition to military papers, must be sent in. If the Aryan descent of an official is doubtful, a decision must be made by the Office of Experts for Racial Investigation attached to the Ministry of the Interior. 
in deciding whether the provisions of Section 4, Paragraph 1 apply, the whole political activity of the official concerned, particularly since November 9, 1918, must be taken into account. Every official is under an obligation to inform his superior authorities to what political party he has hitherto belonged and what his political activities have been. The Reichsbanner, the Republican Richterbund, and the League for the Rights of Man are to be considered political parties within the meaning of this paragraph. This decree finally and definitely puts an end to the scandal of the November system, which aims at the destruction of the honest professional government servant by the introduction of party officials and office seekers. The consequences of this criminal policy have been the innumerable scandals of corruption, in which the people concerned were always representatives of the parties which, in November 1918, by treason and cowardice had put themselves at the head of a clean and untarnished state. It is well known, and does not require to be proved here in detail, that the most prominent supporters of the November Republic had been involved in the worst of these affairs. That period is now gone forever, and the new Germany will once more be administered by really efficient officials, as the world knows it was before the war. End of quote. The special importance of this decree is that subsequently almost all categories of university-trained people doctors, lawyers, teachers in high schools, etc., and also bank officials and commercial employees were put through a sieve in accordance with the principles laid down in this decree. The Attack on Jewish Doctors The following manifesto was published in the Medical Journal of Greater Berlin, dated May 20, 1933. The writer, a certain Dr. Rupin, is not just a nobody. He is Commissioner of the Provincial Medical Association of the provinces of Brandenburg and Grenzmark. The article is headed, Away with Jewish Doctors. The text is as follows, quote, The complete removal of Jews from all academic professions is necessary. Members of the free academic professions, particularly doctors, come into personal contact with very wide circles of the population and occupy a position of confidence in relation to their patients, which gives them influence over the outlook of the people with whom they are in contact. The provincial executive of the doctors of Brandenburg therefore considers it unthinkable that in our national state a Jew should have the possibility of spreading the poison of Jewish thought in this way. Undoubtedly, the earlier ideal conception of professional duty has given way in wide circles of the profession to the Jewish commercial outlook, and this is due to the overloading of the profession with Jews. This commercial attitude must be driven out of the medical profession, and we must make its reintroduction impossible. Insofar as corruption has penetrated the profession, it must be rooted out by the most decisive measures. We, German doctors, therefore demand the exclusion of all Jews from the possibility of giving medical treatment to our German people, because the Jew is the incarnation of lies and deceit. Furthermore, we demand legislation to punish with imprisonment and immediate removal from the profession, the offenses and crimes which are associated with the positions of confidence filled by the profession. We doctors ask all national professional organizations in Germany to support our demand. End of quote. By way of supplement to the above, we give the following decree of Commissioner Dr. Wagner, who is in control of the German medical associations. Quote, in pursuance of the boycott against the Jews, the Berlin Health Department, by agreement with the mayor, instructed its sections not to meet any claims from its members, where Jewish doctors have been called in to treat cases on or after April 1st. Where a Jewish doctor had previously been called in, it is suggested that members should consider whether to continue to make use of him. The Health Insurance Institute hopes that a sense of national duty will prevent the members from making use of Jewish chemists, dispensaries, opticians, or dentists. End of quote. Dismissal of Jewish teachers. We can give only a few examples of the many similar instructions which have been issued in connection with the various professions. The future position of Jewish teachers in Germany is indicated by a letter issued by one of the most prominent of the Nazi leaders, Dr. Lopomann, a member of the Prussian Diet. Quote, we call your attention to the fact that it is intolerable that Jewish teachers should still fill posts in Prussian educational institutions while German soldiers who fought at the front have to wander around as unpaid auxiliary teachers in their own fatherland. 
Furthermore, we consider it an impossible situation that any regard should be paid to the exaggerated claims of male and female Jewish scholars. On behalf of the National Socialist Parliamentary Fraction in Prussia, we expect you to take the following measures. 1. All Jewish teachers, that is, teachers of Jewish descent, must immediately be dismissed or sent on leave from all Prussian educational institutions. 2. In the case of male and female scholars who are Jews, the proportionate clause must be applied so that the percentage of pupils of Jewish origin in any institution must correspond with the proportion of Jews to the whole German population, that is to say, only 1% of the students at any institution may be Jews or of Jewish descent. End of quote. In accordance with this circular, almost all Jewish teachers employed in the public educational system were immediately granted leave. An instruction issued by the chief official of Brandenburg and Berlin extended these measures also to Jewish private teachers. A cabinet meeting on April 25th passed an act, quote, against the excessive number of students of foreign race in German schools and universities, end of quote. The same principles were applied to the staffs of universities. In an earlier chapter, some of the best-known Jewish lecturers who have been dismissed are mentioned. Removal of Jewish Editors and Journalists The Neue Free Press of April 13, 1933 reports, quote, In the extraordinary general meeting of the members of the Berlin District Organization of the National Union of the German Press, it was unanimously decided to nominate Dr. Dietrich at the general delegate meeting for the presidency of the Union. After the general meeting of the Berlin Organization, the new committee met and adopted unanimously a motion that in future no Jewish or Marxist editors were to be admitted to membership. A further motion for the general delegate meeting was also adopted unanimously, demanding that Jewish and Marxist editors not be permitted to enter or belong to the National Union of the German Press. End of quote. Almost all Jewish editors of German papers have been dismissed and contributions from independent journalists of Jewish faith or Jewish origin are not accepted. It must be noted that in this connection even Jewish newspaper proprietors have achieved inglorious distinction. For example, Gutermann, the Jewish proprietor of the Neue Badische Landeszeitung in Mannheim, dismissed all his Jewish editorial staff and employees as early as March 1st. Debarred from lists of assessors and juries the silent boycott of the Jews continues in every sphere. They are being banished from all public life. The Neue Free Press of April 12th reports the exclusion of Jews from the lists of assessors, jurymen, and arbitrators. Quote, the government has decided to shorten the current period of office of all assessors and jurymen to June 30th, at which date the period of office of commercial arbitrators will also be brought to a close. The new lists of assessors and jurymen will be differently constituted in the future. As in present circumstances, the municipal authorities will naturally send people of a different outlook to participate in the electoral colleges. There will no longer be any communist assessors and jurymen. The number of social democrats nominated will be considerably smaller than hitherto, and it is probable that no Jews will be elected. The appointment of the new commercial arbitrators will also be on the same lines. The decree just issued provides that until new elections of assessors and jurymen are held, judges need not adhere to the existing rules for bringing in lay assistance. For example, they may pass over certain names on the lists. End of quote. Jews as outcasts in sport. Even in sport, every Jew is an outcast. Although even in America colored boxers are allowed to take part in championship fights, German boxers of Jewish faith or origin are no longer allowed to appear in the boxing ring in Germany. The holder of the middleweight championship in Germany, Eric Selig, was prevented from defending his title in Germany. He was, however, able to show his form in France. Daniel Prenn, who is far and away the best tennis player in Germany, can no longer be selected to represent Germany in international matches. We await with interest the steps which are to be taken against Helena Meyer, the champion woman fencer. Although probably no one looks more pure-blooded and Nordic than she does, she is the daughter of a Jewish doctor in Offenbach. 
We quote the following as a good example of many similar announcements. It was printed in the Neue Free Presse of April 28, 1933. Quote, the German Swimming Association issues the following statement. The German Swimming Association has adopted the Aryan Clause. In what form the membership of Jews in all sports associations, and therefore in the Swimming Association, will be regulated, and whether the Aryan Clause will be incorporated in the statutes of the association, will be determined in accordance with instructions issued by the government. Meanwhile, I order that Jews shall be removed from all leading positions in the association and put into the background, and they must not appear as representatives in displays or take part in sports meetings. George Hawks. The German Swimming Association is at present affiliated to the International Swimming Association, and the Aryan Clause conflicts with the statutes of the latter body, which prescribe equality of rights for everyone. The president of the International Swimming Association is, however, Binner, who was removed from the executive of the German Association because of his international outlook. Pending the final decision of the Government Commissioner of Sport, the regulations relating to official posts will be applied to Jewish members of the DSB Union. This means that only those Jews, by race, not religion, who enjoy protection under the civil service law will be allowed to take part in sports meetings. End of quote. Malicious Rumors but when business questions come in, in this connection also loyalty to principle takes second place. The government controlled 12 or Mittagsblatt of April 19, 1933, under the heading Malicious Rumors, gives an assurance that the race question will not be raised at the 11th Olympiad, which is to take place in Berlin in 1936. Quote, the foreign boycott propaganda against Germany has even penetrated sport. Many foreign papers have repeatedly stated during the last few weeks that efforts are being made, especially in the United States, to transfer to another country the Olympic Games, which have been arranged for Berlin in 1936, on the alleged grounds that measures will be taken in Germany to prevent Jewish sportsmen from taking part in international competitions. In reply to an official inquiry, Avery Brundage, chairman of the American Olympic Committee, stated that the International Olympic Committee had the right to select where the Olympiad would be held. The committee, which is to meet in Vienna in June, would undoubtedly consider the question. His personal opinion was that the Olympic Games should not be held in a country where the fundamental Olympic principle of the equality of all races was being violated. In connection with the premature declaration made by this leading American sportsman, it must be stated that no measures have been or will be taken in Germany which make participation in international sporting events dependent on the question of race. The world can be confident that every individual who is sent to Berlin to represent his country in the Olympic Games will be received and treated as a guest, irrespective of his race or nationality. End of quote. Passports Special regulations are also in force for Jewish holders of passports. The Breslau chief of police has issued instructions, quote, that German citizens of Jewish faith, or formerly of Jewish faith, who are in possession of passports must present these in person at the police headquarters of the area in which they live, not later than April 3, 1933. The passports will be returned after they have been altered so as to make them valid only for internal traveling in Germany, end of quote. Special hours for the baths. There is hardly any possible regulation calculated to bring Jewish citizens into disrepute of which some person in authority or some administrative body has not thought. The town of Speyer in the Palatinate will live in the history of these times for its unique inventive powers. It has the glory of being the first German municipal authority to issue a regulation, quote, that in the interests of public order, Jews may only use the municipal baths at certain hours of the day. End of quote. Other German municipal authorities were quick to follow this example. The Frankfurter Zeitung of May 24, 1933 reports, quote, At the Tübingen Council meeting on May 15, it was moved by a National Socialist that Jews and persons of foreign race be excluded from the use of the free municipal baths. The motion was adopted with only three voting against it. End of quote. Shortly afterwards, the Upper Silesian newspapers published similar regulations. Dismissal of Jewish employees. It would be a mistake to think that German Jews were only thrown out of the professions. 
A good deal is said, and rightly so, about the outlawry of Jewish professors, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and artists, but unfortunately not so much attention is paid to the treatment of Jewish employees, small traders, and workers. But the main part of the Jewish population is covered by these categories, and the economic position of these Jews is just as difficult as that of the non-Jewish lower middle class and working class. The Nazi factory cell organizations have been most assiduous in depriving the Jewish clerks, small traders, and workers of their livelihood. A Berlin message of March 31st runs, quote, On the instructions of the National Socialist Party Executive, the factory cell organization instructs National Socialist factory cell committees, together with the workers' organizations, to visit the Jewish shops and demand two months' payment in advance for Christian workers and employees. The demand should also be made that all Jewish employees be dismissed. Anyone refusing to comply with these demands must be immediately reported to the party leadership, which will take the necessary steps. Punctually at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, all employees and workers in Jewish shops must leave work and take part in warning off customers. Newspapers and vital industries are accepted, but in any case, all Jewish employees must be dismissed. In the Olstein Publishing House, the whole of the responsible editorial staff of Jewish race has been granted leave of absence. End of quote. The Frankfurter Zeitung of May 28, 1933, states, quote, It is reported in the Postnecker Handlerblatt the official journal of the Association of German Merchants, Showmen, and Commercial Travelers, whose headquarters are at Dresden, that at a provincial conference of the Union of Traders, the question was raised whether Jewish merchants and traders would be allowed access to the markets in future. The president of the provincial organization put forth the view that the Jews must be completely rooted out. End of quote. Business is business, even for anti-Semites. The Volkischer Beobachter of April 2nd proclaims the spontaneous rise of prices on the stock exchange, now rid of Jews, as the most obvious result of the boycott movement. We know why such a point is made of this. It is to show that the fight is not against the existing system, not against capitalism, and not even against the excesses of capitalism, but that it is a competitive fight of the national profiteers against the Jewish profiteers. The members of the stock exchange can do business even on a stock exchange now rid of Jews. The fight is not against capitalism, not against private property, but against the small man, against the Aryan workers and middle class who are being hoaxed, against the Jewish employees and small traders who are being ruined, to the delight of the capitalists of Aryan and Jewish blood. The Aryan principles are regulated everywhere by the size of a man's purse. In a statement printed in the Berliner Tageblatt, of March 31, 1933, Herr Oskar Wasserman, a director of the Deutsche Bank und Discanto Gesellschaft, correctly stated that he had not suffered the least inconvenience, and that the change of things had not made any noticeable difference so far as he was concerned, even from a social standpoint. The other Jewish capitalists may equally congratulate themselves. The National Socialist Government is doing its utmost for their material well-being. It has issued reproofs to those in its lower organizations who thought that the basis of anti-Semitism was the National Socialist hostility to capitalism. It protects, if not the Jews, at least Jewish capital, business first. Capitalism, whether Aryan or represented by Jews, is not to fall a victim to the spiritual revival which the National Revolution has brought to boiling point. The Frankfurter Zeitung and the Volkischer Beobachter of March 27th published the following letter addressed by the Commissioner for Trade, Dr. Wagner, to the President of the National Socialist Party Office for Municipal Politics, Mayor Fehler of Munich. Quote, I have recently received from a number of business firms copies of circulars issued by various local authorities to a large number of manufacturers and other business concerns, with a view to ascertaining whether the concerns can be regarded as German undertakings. The questions put in the circulars are intended to discover to what extent the capital of the firm concerned is German, to what extent non-Aryan and non-German principles are connected with it, and so forth. While I am, of course, completely in agreement with the view that the municipalities particularly should only obtain their requirements from German firms, I nevertheless consider it necessary that a stop should be put to the measures which have been taken. The whole complex of questions raised in these circulars 
is not so simple that decisions can be made by a mere yes or no or on the basis of figures. It is rather the government's task to see that every undertaking in Germany, no matter where its capital comes from or who controls it, finds its place in the German economic system, and that the management of each undertaking is in future conducted exclusively from a German economic standpoint. In carrying through this necessary task, the government can, however, only be hindered if, through the action of certain authorities, a situation is created which reacts unfavorably on economic life. Our aim cannot be to ruin existing economic undertakings in Germany, even if they are worked with foreign capital and have hitherto been directed to some extent by foreign individuals, but rather to compel them to act in a German way and in conformity with the great principle laid down by our leader, the common good before private interests. I must therefore request you to use your influence as the leader of the Department of Municipal Politics to prevent further circulars of this type being issued in future, and to explain that such measures will cause a dislocation in the whole of the country's economic life, which, with the best will in the world, we do not want at the present time. End of quote. With the best will in the world, they do not want any capitalists to suffer loss in this national revolution. We knew this long ago. The people who still swear by the socialist Adolf Hitler and expect him to perform the miracle of securing for the peasants higher prices and at the same time lower prices for the consumer, higher wages for the workers, and at the same time greater profits for the employers, higher salaries for civil servants together with economies to the state. These misled and incited miracle believers will before long be roused from their hypnotized state by the undeniable and inexorable fact that in the Third Empire no one gains anything but the capitalists, whether they are of Jewish or non-Jewish faith. They will learn, from what they still have to experience in the Third Empire, that the whole campaign against the Jews has only served to distract them from the struggle against the people who are really responsible for their conditions. The Aryan Clause and Race Officials We have seen that the anti-Semitism of the New Germany has a biological basis, that it is racial anti-Semitism. This biological anti-Semitism dates back to the anti-Semitic campaign led by the court chaplain Stocker, which derived its ideology, that is, its pseudo-scientific justification, from Eugen Dürings, the Jewish question as a question of racial character. Race science, which used to be a hobby horse of freak writers and was never taken seriously, has now in the new Germany been declared as an official science, which means that it is now a lucrative profession. The Jews as a race. It is true that in spite of all its efforts, this science has not yet succeeded in proving that the Germans are a race. On the contrary, it is evident that the Germans are a mixed people and are very far from having any right to call themselves Nordic. But these curious research workers have not yet even succeeded in proving that the Jews are really a race. We will come to their aid. There is something in the talk of a Jewish race. But in this case, too, it is necessary to stand things on their head in order to examine the matter, which is extremely complex. That is to say, we must treat race not as an original factor, but as an artificial product, not as the beginning, but as the result of a process of evolution to attempt to trace back the Jews of the present day to the original Jews of the Bible would be a hazardous and absurd undertaking. In the course of Jewish history, there was a constant mingling of races, which it is not easy to disentangle. But from about A.D. 1000, at the end of the period of proselytism, that is, the entry of people of other faiths into the Jewish religious community, the religion and laws of the Jews themselves and the social relations in which they lived maintained an inbreeding which in duration and degree has no parallel in European history. The anthropological characteristics of race originated during this period, which in the course of more than 800 years produced a new type of human being, namely the Jew. But what is to be gained even by proving the existence of Jewish racial characteristics is quite another matter. The special characteristics of the Jews against which the anti-Semites pretend they are fighting are not in any way the product of race, but of the social conditions in which they live. The fact that they are a caste whose conditions of existence are prescribed by the world around them. When these imposed conditions no longer exist, then the characteristics disappear immediately. 
that is to say, at least in the second generation which has not had to live in these conditions. But such theoretical discussions take us a long way from the actual practice of National Socialism. In this sphere everything is much simpler and more straightforward. There is not a single question in which National Socialism has acted in accordance with its own arguments. On the contrary, it has always post factum found venal persons to justify its own barbarities as acts of culture. And if in Germany today racial research sets itself up as science, the real purpose is only to provide a new cloak for the bestialities of the existing regime. Race Officials The Frankfurter Zeitung of May 5, 1933 reports, quote, Dortmund, May 4th, to you. The government commissioner of Dortmund has issued instructions for the immediate organization of a race department in Dortmund. The assistant commissioner for health, Dr. Braus, who is to take charge of the department, has made an important statement to the press on the question of racial hygiene. He indicated that medical material relating to the 80,000 schoolchildren in Dortmund, which provided partial material for statistics of race hygiene, was already available. Thus, the department would first deal with the young persons who would constitute the next generation. At the same time, the investigations laid down under the recently published regulations would be undertaken, that is, in connection with the candidates for official positions and the students in the higher schools and universities. Investigation of the whole population would be a task for future years. The early publication of laws for the separation of the race and its division into types was to be anticipated. The essential feature of this legislation would be the prohibition of any intermingling of races in Germany. The population would also have to be divided into families whose offspring would be welcome to the state and those whose offspring would be regarded as a burden on the nation. The logical consequence would be the demand for the compulsory sterilization of criminals and other antisocial elements. The fact that all the medical associations of Prussia had recently declared in favor of the sterilization of criminals in the interests of the nation as a whole proved that this demand put forward by the National Socialists was already recognized as justified by wide circles of the nation. The fundamental aim of the organization of racial hygiene could only be reached after some generations, but a government which was conscious of its responsibility was obliged to think in terms of generations. End of quote. Dr. Achim Gerke, a pushing young man, got himself appointed ministerial advisor and expert for racial research at the Ministry of the Interior. Men and Submen All of this seems relatively harmless. It is primarily directed to bring about the economic destruction of the Jewish population, but not to threaten life and limb. The following leaflet is not so harmless. It was distributed in thousands in all restaurants and in particular was given to every German girl who was seen in company with a Jew. This document threatens every girl who is suspected of the terrible crime of being friendly with a Jew that her face will be branded with the initials J.H., Judenhor, Jewish prostitute. The assurance is given that this is no mere empty threat, but that in any circumstances it will be carried out if the girl is seen again in company with a Jew. In this we have a clearer example of the National Socialist distinction between men and submen, submen being everyone who does not think and feel as the National Socialists do. The National Socialists divide the men and the submen into different groups. In Group 1 are the pure representatives of the Nordic race. In Group 2, according to Ziel und Weg, the Journal of the National Socialist Doctors, are, along with, quote, inebriates, drug takers, habitual criminals, and prostitutes, all persons of foreign race, particularly Jews, end of quote. The National Socialist race theoretician, Professor Stamler, proposed on behalf of the National Socialist Doctors the following law for the division of the race. Quote, 1. Every person who is of foreign racial blood to the extent of one half, that is, one of whose parents or two of whose grandparents were of foreign race, irrespective of their religion, is regarded as of foreign race. Foreign race means all colored races, near Asiatic and Oriental races, including the Jew. 2. In conformity with this, every adult German citizen must declare on oath at the registration office for his area to what race he belongs. In the case of persons under age, the declaration must be made by their legal representatives. False declarations will be punished with imprisonment and confiscation of property. 3. 
persons ascertained to be a foreign race must in future describe themselves not as germans but as of foreign race jews from germany etc four persons born after the day of grace are to rank as germans only when both parents are german younger brothers or sisters however rank as of the same nationality as their elder brothers or sisters whose nationality has been established by declaration End of quote. breeding farms professor stammler whose name has already been mentioned writes that quote, the aim of breeding is a physically morally and mentally sound person of nordic race End of quote. to help towards the achievement of this aim breeding farms are to be provided the outpourings of a certain Professor Ernst Bergman indicate what kind of breeding farms they have in mind. Quote, there are quite enough willing and industrious men and youths to provide mates for the available women and girls, and fortunately, one lively lad suffices for ten to twenty girls who have not yet killed their desire for a child, were it not for the civilized nonsense, so contrary to nature, of monogamous and permanent marriage. End of quote. Professor Ernst Bergmann in Erkenntnisgeist und Muttergeist. We conclude these examples with yet another Bill for the Preservation of Race Purity, which contains the following, quote, 1. Marriages between Germans and persons of foreign races are prohibited. Those which have already been contracted remain valid, but new marriages must not be entered into and will not be recognized. 2 extra-matrimonial sexual intercourse between Germans and persons of foreign race will be punished with penal servitude for the person of foreign race and imprisonment for the German party. Prostitutes do not come under this law. 3. The entry into Germany of persons of foreign race is only allowed in special circumstances. The settlement in Germany of persons of foreign race is prohibited. 4. Changes of name which in most cases are for the sole purpose of concealing the race of the person concerned, are prohibited until further notice. Changes of name made since 1914 are cancelled. It may be objected that this kind of nonsense has no real connection with the mass movement, that these race hygienists are only on the edge of the movement, which cannot be regarded as responsible for them. This suggestion is not well founded. A man like Professor Stamler is the official adviser on these questions. The bills drafted by him were introduced by the National Socialist Fraction in the Reichstag. They are therefore typical and must be taken seriously as agitation material. Liquidation of the Jewish Question We have given a small number of examples out of the massive incidents in the war of extermination which is being waged against 600,000 German Jews. These documents and facts are typical of the artificially nurtured hatred of the Jews, who have once more in Europe's history been given the role of scapegoats. We have tried to show that in general this fanaticism is not directed against those who were first made the object of hatred, the big bankers, merchants, and speculators. The wrath of the people has once more been turned aside against the lesser fry, against the Jewish middle class and the Jewish working class. Forced Denials what action did the Jews in Germany take? They protested against the foreign atrocity propaganda. Under the pressure of the stormtroopers, they sent out into the world documents which were the product of mortal fear. Often their fear has made them go further than is necessary. No one can blame them. Not every man is a born hero. And eventually an enterprising man got the idea of publishing these denials which had been forced from the Jews in book form under the title The Atrocity Propaganda. The government-controlled Berliner Tageblatt devotes two columns to this extremely welcome book, but no one in the world will let himself be led to believe that it was not written by men in fear of their lives and their liberty, and that they were not compelled against their better knowledge to spread the lie that there is no persecution of Jews in Germany. Jews who support Hitler. There are even Jews who support Hitler. In the Jewish press, Wien, Bratislava of March 31st, the organ of the Orthodox Jews, a rabbi, Professor Dr. Weinberg, writes as follows, quote, In Jewish circles generally, and particularly in Orthodox circles, there is more sympathy and understanding for the national revival in Germany than the leaders of this movement realize. The religious Jews know how particularly grateful they must be to Hitler for his energetic and thoroughgoing fight against communism, end of quote. The central organ of German Zionists, the Judische Rundschau, adopts the same attitude. 
quote, Jewish history will understand even Hitler. It will cite him as evidence of the fact that history is made up of the imponderables of human endeavor towards an ideal, no matter what this may be, end of quote. We have already quoted the statement made by the third partner in the alliance with Jewish orthodoxy and Jewish nationalism, Jewish capitalism, the statement made by Oskar Wasserman, director of the Deutsche Bank und Diskante Gesellschaft, that he has not suffered the least inconvenience and that he has hardly been able to notice the change in things. Lenin on anti-Semitism. We have not hushed up these statements. On the contrary, they seem to us convincing proof that in the last analysis, the Jewish question, too, is not a question of race, but a class question. The similar experience in Russia under the Tsardom is summarized by Lenin as follows. Quote, the propagation of hostility against the Jews is described as anti-Semitism. When the accursed Tsarist monarchy was at its last gasp, it tried to incite the ignorant workers and peasants against the Jews. The Tsar's police, in league with the landlords and the capitalists, organized pogroms. They tried to deflect the hatred of the workers and peasants, crushed down by want, from the landlords and exploiters and turn it against the Jews. It has often been the same in other countries, too. The capitalists have roused up hostility against the Jews in order to throw dust in the eyes of the workers and distract them from the real enemy of the toiling peoples, capital. It is not the Jews who are the enemy of the toiling people. The enemies of the workers are the capitalists of every country. There are workers, toilers, among the Jews. These form the majority. They are our brothers, our comrades in the fight for socialism, because they are oppressed by capital. There are kulaks, exploiters, capitalists, among the Jews, as among all other peoples. The capitalists strive to arouse hostility between the workers of different religious beliefs, of different nations and races. The rich Jews, like the rich Russians and the rich people of all countries, all in league with each other, trample on, oppress, and contaminate the workers. Shame and contempt upon the accursed Tsarism which tortured and persecuted the Jews. Shame and contempt upon those who sow hostility against the Jews and hatred against other nations. End of quote. End of chapter 8. Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley. Chapter 9. The Concentration Camps. On the basis of statements published in the press, the total number of political prisoners in Hitler's Germany at the beginning of June 1933, must be put at about 60 to 70,000. Of this total, between 35 and 40,000 men and women have been taken to concentration camps. It goes without saying that there is no legal justification for the establishment of concentration camps. There are no laws or regulations determining the rights of prisoners in concentration camps, nor is there any law or regulation governing the length of their detention in the camps. Till our leader takes pity on them. The Neue Zürcher Zeitung, in an article on the concentration camps in Germany, published on May 8, 1933, states, that the prisoners will be divided into two groups, those whom it is easy and those whom it is difficult to train as citizens, and that the former will be kept in the camps one year, the latter three years. But this is merely the personal opinion of the reporter, not an official statement. Banishment to the concentration camps, and also the length of the period of detention are entirely determined by the arbitrary will of the fascist chiefs, central and local. Lieutenant Kaufmann, one of the Nazi controllers of the concentration camp at Heuberg in Baden, put the position very clearly in an interview which he gave at the end of April to a reporter of the Danish paper Politiken. In reply to the question, How long will you keep the prisoners here? The lieutenant replied, quote, Till our leader takes pity on them. End quote. The Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung of April 30th, 1933, confirms this statement by Lieutenant Kaufmann, 
insofar as it says quote, it will be a long while before many of the prisoners get their freedom for the will of the prisoners is not easy to break End quote. if i even knew why i am here the men and women who have been interned in the concentration camps are completely innocent even within the meaning of the principle of the fascist state all socialist and communist workers and leaders who in the government's view have done anything against the laws of the fascist regime are not put into the concentration camps but are locked up in prisons and penal settlements and brought before special courts and sentenced the people who are interned in the concentration camps are only men and women whose political views are regarded by the fascists as suspect though even the fascist prosecutors cannot find any pretext for a criminal prosecution against them most of them were arrested immediately after the burning of the reichstag and the elections on march fifth so that they could not conceivably have carried on any activity hostile to the fascist regime towards the end of april the politican published some letters from prisoners in concentration camps one young worker writes if i only knew why i am here a doctor writes only anonymous and personal revenge can be the reason for my imprisonment another man writes i have nothing to reproach myself with i have no idea why i was arrested the trivial things which suffice to bring people into the concentration camps are well illustrated by the case of the jewish religious teacher karl krebs who is a citizen of czechoslovakia and has been in germany since he was a year old the following order was issued for his arrest Quote, the jewish teacher of religion karl krebs of dinkelsbuhl a czechoslovakian subject is to be arrested on march twenty ninth nineteen thirty three krebs killed some hens creating great dissatisfaction among the population although this was not a criminal act in view of the great excitement among the population in connection with the atrocity campaign of the jews abroad krebs should not have carried out such an act the excitement among the population is so great that krebs must be put under arrest in order to protect him from attacks the order for his protective arrest is issued in agreement with the commissioner burgomaster itemeyer in wasser trudigen dinkelsbuhl march twenty ninth nineteen thirty three end quote krebs is still in prison what the concentration camps are for captain buck nazi chief of the hoiberg concentration camp told the reporter of the politiken that the purpose of the concentration camps was quote, to punish the prisoners end quote. in some of the camps as prisoners who have been released report the prisoners have to register as convict x in accordance with the regulations for penal settlements their heads have even been shaved the london daily telegraph of april twenty seventh nineteen thirty three confirms this in a cable from its vienna correspondent r g Gitte. the convicts have not seen a judge and will not see one the national socialist leaders have repeatedly stated that internment in the concentration camps is a purely administrative measure that it is a question of protective detention the nazis told the politiken correspondent quote, we have had to intern many of these individuals in order to protect them from the vengeance of the people they would have been lynched by the patriotic mob who regard these criminals as the instigators of the november revolution End quote. this statement is an outright lie the extraordinarily strict watch on the camps is not for the sake of protecting the interned socialists and communists the machine guns in front of the camps are to make any attempts at flight or rescue impossible 
wherever there have been so-called demonstrations against arrested persons the tumult and rioting has been organized by the fascists the transfer of the former social democratic minister Ramelli, to a concentration camp which was organized as a great popular entertainment shows this clearly the volkischer beobachter of may seventeenth nineteen thirty three published the following report headed in the pillory Quote, on tuesday the former state president and minister dr adam ramelli recently president of the german consumers purchasing cooperative society in hamburg who a few days ago was brought from there to karlsruhe at the request of the government was taken in an open police car from the prison at the western end of the town to the office of the chief of police with ramelle were also stens whom he had placed in the ministry of the interior the former baden councillor and member of the reichstag marum the editor of the karlsruhe social democratic paper volksfreund grunenbaum the former police commissioner Führer and the Baden leaders of the Reichsbanner and the Iron Front, as well as other members of the Social Democratic Party. From the police headquarters, they were then taken to a penal settlement at Kieslaw, now a concentration camp. A gigantic crowd had assembled outside the prison and greeted the prisoners with jeers and catcalls. A double row of Nazi protective corpsmen marched with linked arms in front of the first police car on which the prisoners were seated bareheaded to clear the street a second police car followed the first filled with storm troopers the procession was also flanked by storm troopers and others brought up the rear the police cars drove quite slowly through a double wall of onlookers often eight deep catcalls and abuse greeted the prisoners all the way along the streets the song of the miller was also sung everywhere by way of mocking ramelli who had once been a miller's laborer and had forbidden the singing of this song in baden the procession passed in front of the diet buildings and the government offices as well as the former trade union building at each of which a short halt was made along the way bands also played the song of the miller the concourse was so immense that the whole of the tramway and motor traffic was stopped a number of persons who shouted red front were arrested on the spot and taken along in the second police car End quote. the report shows clearly that this was an organized demonstration with carefully prepared shouting in short that it was one of those spectacles which the reich minister of propaganda goebbels uses to entertain the crowd and to make it for a while forget its hunger protective arrest protective detention in germany is strictly governed by the law of eighteen forty nine on the restriction of personal freedom by this law only persons who are themselves threatened may be taken into protective arrest this must not be continued longer than is necessary for the purpose and in no case longer than three months the law provides for the lodging of appeals and a decision by the courts but all those who are now imprisoned were arrested not in their own interest but to protect the new rulers they are being kept longer than three months and they have no right to appeal forty five concentration camps how many concentration camps are there and how many people are detained in them the german government probably with good reason avoids giving any exact information on the basis of a few reports in the german press occasional statements by nazi leaders and visits of foreign journalists it is possible to draw the conclusion that early in july nineteen thirty three there were forty five concentration camps with between thirty five thousand and forty thousand prisoners 
the following are some of the camps dachau near munich bavaria five thousand prisoners heuberg upper baden two thousand prisoners Kislau, near buchsal baden one hundred prisoners rostadt baden three hundred prisoners bad durheim baden five hundred prisoners Waltz, two thousand prisoners mulheim rhine two thousand prisoners hohenstein saxony eight hundred prisoners ortenstein zwickau saxony two hundred prisoners zittau saxony three hundred prisoners ordwuf thuringia twelve hundred prisoners oranienburg near berlin fifteen hundred prisoners Zonenburg, Prussia, four hundred and fourteen prisoners. Senelager, Potterbern, nine hundred men, thirty women. Esterwagen, Westphalia, five hundred prisoners. Vilsede, Lunenberger Heide, two thousand prisoners. Königstein, Saxony, two hundred prisoners. A concentration camp at Poppenburg emsland has been equipped for four thousand prisoners other camps are at ginsheim and rodelheim near frankfurt langen and osthofen in hessen kassel fulsbutel and wittmore near hamburg bremen braunschweig grundal near konigsberg and another in east prussia schleswig pomerania Breslau. There are six camps in Brandenburg province, five in the Ruhr area, and a number in central Germany. The number of prisoners in these camps is not known. In the middle of May, the government decided to open ten new concentration camps. The Frankfurter Zeitung of May 30, 1933, reports that a second concentration camp will be opened at Heuberg for such prisoners as are not to be released before the winter. Women and Intellectuals in the Camps There are hundreds of women among the prisoners in the concentration camps. The communist women members of the Reichstag and of the state diets, insofar as they were found, were first taken to the women's prison in the Barnumstrasse in Berlin before they were taken to the concentration camp this prison has been organized as a collecting and transit station for arrested women early in june a special concentration camp for women was organized in south germany an official announcement dated june eighth nineteen thirty three states quote, a detention camp for women has been organized at gotzel near gomund in Württemberg." End quote. A second concentration camp for women was opened in Saxony a few days later. All reports agree that the women in the prisons and concentration camps are being subjected to exceptionally bad treatment and persecution. All kinds of views and professions and ages are represented among the prisoners in the concentration camps. Communists, anarchists, social democrats adherents of the center party pacifists jews young and old people workers intellectuals artists students members of parliamentary bodies lawyers doctors writers tradesmen well-known names and unknown names martin buber the gray-haired zionist poet karl von osietzky the revolutionary pacifist editor of the Weltbühne, the anarchist Eric Musam, the Bavarian member of parliament, Auer, the democratic member of the Reichstag, Fischer, the social democrat members of the Reichstag, Rossmann and Pfluger, the barrister Hans Litten, the doctors Schminke and Bernheim, and many others of similar standing. The truth breaks through. The Hitler government has done its best to conceal the conditions in the concentration camps. 
the committee for the victims of fascism has nevertheless succeeded in obtaining from prisoners who have succeeded in getting away and from relatives of prisoners a considerable amount of material which throws light on the terrible condition of the prisoners in the concentration camps in spite of the nazi guards and barbed wire the truth has broken through to the outside world foreign journalists have been allowed to see some of the model camps such as those at heuberg dachau and oranienburg nazi stormtroopers accompanied the press representatives everywhere there was no opportunity of separate conversation with any of the prisoners the descriptions given by these correspondents are therefore general impressions of the arrangement of the camps rather than observations of actual conditions but where the journalists were able even though in a very restricted way to describe the objective conditions or where as in the case of edmund taylor of the chicago daily tribune they were able to put a few questions to prisoners in a foreign language the truth also comes to light in the newspaper reports anyone who wants to help get the truth about the german concentration camps must support the demand for an international commission of members of all the relief committees to have the right to visit every camp not under the control of the commandants of the camps and of nazi guards but to make their visits without warning with the right to investigate conditions in every detail and to talk to every prisoner without interference the convict prisons of sonnenburg and fusbutel were closed down some years ago because they were buildings belonging to the middle ages and were absolutely unhygienic from a modern standpoint even habitual criminals were no longer sent there in fulebutel there are no closets and no drains detention in this prison is acute torture particularly in the hot part of the year but these are the prisons which the hitler government has now established as concentration camps among the prisoners at Zonenburg are Litten, Kasper, Asietsky, and Mulsum. The concentration camp at Zittau was formerly a bookshop, so that the comforts of this camp can be imagined. The concentration camp at Dachau, according to a report in the Daily Telegraph of April 25, 1933, consists of old half decayed huts. Oranienburg is the model camp which has been shown to a number of foreign journalists and of which the Nazis have broadcast photographs. An abandoned factory, formerly a brewery. The works have fallen into ruin. The windows are simply broken glass. The yard is covered with grass and weeds. This is how the Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung of April 30th, 1933, describes oranienburg we are in possession of a confidential report from a german woman journalist who accompanied a foreign correspondent as interpreter when he visited the camp at oranienburg Quote, only one single pump in the courtyard the prisoners of whom there are between one hundred and two hundred have to wash in five old wash basins which stand in the courtyard the rooms where they sleep are old workshops which are in ruins a few inches of dirty straw cover the cement floor End quote. the deutsche allgemeine zeitung of april thirtieth nineteen thirty three confirms that the prisoners have to sleep on straw in dachau according to the description given by gide in the daily telegraph of april twenty fifth nineteen thirty three fifty four prisoners sleep in a small hut on rough wooden boards covered with straw the interpreter who has already been mentioned describes the appalling conditions in such a dormitory at oranienburg Quote, already by evening when the prisoners are locked in 
the place stinks as if a herd of wild animals had spent the night there but it is impossible to describe the air after it has been slept in by fifty or more men whose clothes are unwashed and whose sweating bodies fill the room with vapor End quote. the model camp at hoiberg the concentration camp at hoiberg is the show place among the camps it is exhibited to all foreign reporters who for the most part describe the external appearance of the camp and its environment but do not deal with the internal rooms and dormitories at the end of may the frankfurter zeitung published a detailed report on a visit to the heuberg camp which testifies to the extremely close guard kept on the prisoners and the military drill imposed on them the young nazis are forbidden to enter into conversation with prisoners owing to the fear that they might be influenced politically the report runs quote, the old parade ground is now used as a concentration camp going in through a lattice fence we could see the whole camp spread out before us first there are the offices a post office and the officials quarters with little gardens then left and right the former quarters of the reichswehr soldiers here at a height of twenty seven hundred feet where there is little green to be seen two thousand prisoners are herded together in small rooms the houses are shut in by iron railings tall barbed wire fences run round the buildings in a double line so that there is a space between them the concentration camp is divided into sections the storm troopers are on guard with rifles by the iron railings both sides of the barbed wire fences are guarded by auxiliary police the windows are empty it is forbidden to look out at night searchlights play on the sides of the building each building is divided into two sections a and b there is one latrine between them in the courtyard left and right of the staircase on each floor are large rooms and between them the former sergeant major's room now labeled control officers there are three of these one storm troop officer for each of the large rooms and a police sergeant who maintains contact with the police officer in charge at the entrance to the prisoners room there is a register containing the names of the thirty-six prisoners name place of birth address the storm troop officer pulls out his key we hear look out shouted inside and the voices in the room are silent chairs are pushed back the prisoners rise to their feet when the control officer enters the prisoners sit on little stools at long smooth tables playing chess they have made the pieces themselves there are practically no papers or books to be seen each room is provided with one newspaper which is usually read aloud by someone there are small square cupboards along the wall in which eating utensils are kept while the young nazi auxiliary police all of whom come from the countryside are forbidden to have any dealings with the prisoners the nazi officers are charged with the duty of bringing their political influence to bear on the prisoners in the room under their control correspondence is controlled by the officials each prisoner can write a letter or card once a fortnight the officer in charge has to determine from these letters the general conduct of the prisoners and official and private conversations with them which of the prisoners show any prospect of changing their political views End quote. we can supplement this report with information given us in a letter from the heuberg camp the writer's name cannot be disclosed for the reason that he is still in the camp quote, there are two thousand comrades in heuberg most of them communists they are kept in seven or eight two-story buildings each double block and single block are separated off by barbed wire fences two meters high in rooms twelve meters by eight thirty men are housed 
in the top rooms four to twelve men according to the size of the rooms the beds in two tiers consist of a straw sack and two blankets there are no baths the reporter of de telegraph the amsterdam paper says in a report of april fifth that the prisoners get a bath once a month evidently this does not apply to all prisoners the editors soap is not provided any one who wants it must buy it linen is not provided and there is no washing towels are in short supply one between two prisoners open razors are forbidden shaving is difficult so beards are becoming the latest achievement of the german awakening End quote. captain buck who is in control of the camp told the politiken reporter that hoiberg is not a sanatorium either in comfort or in hygiene he is right these camps are breeding grounds of disease and but few will leave them sound the guards round the camp the prisoners in the camps are kept under extraordinarily strict control nazi stormtroopers are patrolling everywhere armed with rubber truncheons rifles and revolvers many of the patrols are accompanied by police dogs the official photographs show this it is confirmed by the politiken the telegraph and the daily telegraph and by every prisoner's letters in the daily telegraph of april twenty seventh nineteen thirty three gede reports that the concentration camp at dachau is surrounded by a high wire fence which is charged with high voltage electricity machine guns are kept ready at the main posts the correspondents of the telegraph and politiken were struck by the mass of barbed wire and railings from which escape was impossible at night the camp is lighted up by gigantic searchlights the light prevents the prisoners from sleeping the telegraph of april fifth nineteen thirty three says quote, if anyone opens a window to get a breath of air he is shot at End quote. the camp at oranienburg has low factory walls on one side and on the other where the prisoners take exercise quite low shrubbery do none of the prisoners try to get away the journalist who visited the camp with a foreign correspondent put this question the reply quote, there is no danger of flight here the guards are armed and have strict instructions to shoot at once if any of the prisoners cross the boundary marked by the bushes besides why should they try to get away things are all right for them here even when they are allowed to go they don't want to End quote. the questioner quote, but that is impossible Unquote. the reply quote, the day before yesterday we received instructions to set one man free he would not go and had to be taken to the station by force ask the others whether this is so or not End quote. the journalist continues her report quote, it is a fact that there have been cases of prisoners not wanting their liberty but why the orders for release come as a rule at night or at a very early hour of the morning at that time it is easier to shoot a prisoner on the way and then the following day the papers report marxist shot when trying to escape End quote. in fact these low bushes are meant to tempt prisoners to flight but flight means death grouping of prisoners the arbitrary decisions which have brought the concentration camps into being have also divided the prisoners into three categories a easily reformable german nationals barbarian guards and political followers b not easily reformable c unreformable communist leaders and officials and intellectuals of left views are put in the last category and the worst treatment is meted out to them in the report on the hoiberg camp which has already been quoted this fact is confirmed quote, 
prisoners who on the basis of documents and reports are classified as unreformable are put into the old building numbers 19 and 23 there everything is much stricter the controlling officer does not have any conversation with them the time allowed for exercise is restricted to 10 minutes permission to smoke and talk is given less frequently and they are not allowed to work which with the other prisoners gives the opportunity for a few hours of physical activity and entitles them to extra food end quote. the commandants of the camps compete with each other in inventing more and more ingenious punishments prisoners have their free time shortened permission to write letters is granted less often or taken away altogether they are not permitted to have visitors for a long period they are forbidden to take part in the general conversation during their free time they are isolated and particularly sharply controlled they are forbidden to smoke they are given long periods of arrest with only ten minutes exercise or are confined in a dark room disciplinary punishments which are frequently used are additional exercise continued for several hours drilling longer work hours and particularly unaccustomed and irritating work in some of the concentration camps prisoners against whom the nazis have a particular grudge have even been kept in chains according to the daily telegraph report of april twenty seventh nineteen thirty three refractory prisoners for example at dachau are not allowed out of the tiny huts and may not go into the open air the report of the woman journalist already referred to describes a cell in the Oranienburg camp in which quote, not easily reformable unquote, prisoners are kept quote, a hole in the wall shut in by an iron door and without any other ventilation but the door we were shown one of these rooms empty but this was an hour after we had begun to inspect the camp so that evidently the prisoners had first been taken out then of the one hundred and twenty prisoners in the camp thirty were missing were they perhaps behind that iron door which we were not allowed to examine more closely End quote. at hoiberg an elderly lawyer complained of the bad food for making this complaint he was condemned to sleep fifteen nights on the roof of the barracks without any shelter captain buck however assured the telegraph reporter april fifth nineteen thirty three that there were no detention cells in the hoiberg camp manhandled and beaten all reports are unanimous on the fact that the unimprovable prisoners are being treated in such a way that their physical ruin is inevitable the aim is the physical extermination of the organizers of the german working class captain buck assured the representative of the politiken that no one was mishandled in the concentration camps quote, no blows no punishments end quote, he asserted but the government's press itself indicates that this is not true the angriff of april first writes quote, a reichsbanner man was interrogated he gave an insolent reply however a friendly but pointed look at his own rubber truncheon sufficed to bring home to him the seriousness of the position End quote. the maltreatment that must go on in this camp if a glance at a rubber truncheon is enough to bring home to a prisoner the seriousness of the position is confirmed by the deutsche allgemeine zeitung of april thirtieth nineteen thirty three quote, for it was only by laying hold of them and carrying through the interrogation with merciless severity that we have succeeded in discovering the underground terror almost to its full extent but the resistance of individual prisoners has still to be broken End quote. this report confirms that torture is used in the interrogations we have a report of the correspondent of the chicago daily tribune edmund taylor he managed to speak in english and french 
with some of the prisoners in the Hoiberg camp, so that the stormtroopers accompanying him did not know what was said. Many of the prisoners expressly stated that in that camp severe mishandling was a frequent occurrence. Similar reports come from the Schloss Ortenstein camp near Zwickau. Visitors to this camp have declared on oath that they saw bleeding wheels and green and blue patches on the arms and hands of prisoners. There can be no doubt whatever that these are the result of maltreatment. The mishandling was particularly severe when the stormtroopers were in charge of the prisoners. When they were replaced by police, the position became more bearable. But the stormtroopers have been put into the Ortenstein camp again since the beginning of May. The Hell of Zonenburg the concentration camp at Zonenburg must be dealt with separately. Letters and reports from prisoners, and even official statements, show beyond doubt that Zonenburg is a real torture chamber. Working class leaders and intellectuals are subjected to the most disgraceful maltreatment. Throughout Germany, the camp is known as the Sonnenburg Hell. A letter from a worker who escaped from Sonnenburg gives a terrible description of the conditions there. Quote, the first batches of prisoners were met at Sonnenburg Station by stormtroop detachments and police. They were compelled to sing and were literally beaten to the camp. The inhabitants of Sonnenburg can testify to this. When they arrived at the camp, the prisoners were compelled to stand in the courtyard in streaming rain. Then the first ones were taken to the rooms. Each had to fetch straw for himself from another floor. Stormtroopers were standing on the stairs, and they beat the prisoners mercilessly with their rubber truncheons. Some were made to empty the closet pails of the Nazis, in the course of which they were again brutally mishandled. One stormtrooper held a prisoner's head between his legs, while another stormtrooper beat him. The comrades were compelled to count the blows in a loud voice. Some of the prisoners received as many as 185 blows. In addition, they were kicked and otherwise manhandled. Those treated worst were comrades Litten, Wiener, Bernstein, Casper, Schneller, and the Jewish prisoners. Our old friend Musem suffered terribly. Now things are a little different, but instead we have extremely severe military drill, worse than when I was a recruit. Most of the time we have to be exercising outside, marching and singing. The first three weeks were the worst. In the single cells we were attacked in the night and terribly beaten. The backs of many comrades were quite black. I don't know whether Lytton will get through with his life. The wives of several of the Sonnenburg prisoners raised such sharp protests that Mittelbach, of the public prosecutor's department, was sent to Sonnenburg to investigate. Lytton begged him to have him shot, as he could no longer bear the brutal mishandling that was being inflicted on him. End quote. The Sonnenburger Anzeiger of April 7, 1933, reported, quote, The prisoners had to march from the station to the former convict prison, singing the national hymns. The rubber truncheons of the Berlin Auxiliary Police often helping them along. End quote. This account, by one of the Sonnenburg prisoners, is confirmed by letters from Frau Musam and Frau Kasper, who visited their husbands in Sonnenburg. Frau Musam writes, quote, They have beaten our husbands to the point of death. Eric, I saw him, and I did not recognize him, Teresa. I did not recognize him among the others. How they have been beaten! They have cut off his beard and knocked out his teeth. They made him carry his trunk. He fell down on the road. Then the beasts, 
beat him terribly as he lay on the road and could not get up when i reached sonnenburg there he was sitting completely broken and he was horrified that i had come his first words were how can you have come to this hell you won't get out alive they will kill you because you have seen us and how we have been mishandled when i saw caspar i had to keep control of myself not to faint it was all the more ghastly as i had seen him three days before he was standing leaning against the wall his face white and absolutely mutilated there was blood running down from one eye which was quite blue to his mouth his mouth was black and swollen as if someone had stamped on his face he could hardly speak or move with the pains he had all over his body End quote. the wives of the political prisoners bernstein and geisler succeeded in forcing the control authorities to grant them a permit to visit sonnenburg frau bernstein writes quote, i felt as if it was a stranger in front of me his eyes and the skin around them were blood red and badly swollen across his face there were broad wheels from blows with rubber truncheons i was not allowed to get close to him but his whole body must be battered during the whole time he stayed quite still in a strange position End quote. frau geisler writes quote, when i saw my husband he was so changed and his face was so terribly swollen that i had to keep myself in hand not to scream with horror End quote. a prisoner who succeeded in escaping from sonnenburg and getting over the german frontier reports quote, there are four hundred and fourteen political prisoners in sonnenburg among them karl von ossietzky who was arrested on february twenty eighth one of his fellow prisoners who was thirteen days in sonnenburg and now has been able to get across the frontier saw ossietzky in the hospital ward bent double sunken features his face yellow his hands moving nervously shambling gait that is his description of ossietzky the other sonnenburg prisoners dr wiener whose whole body had been beaten black and blue the communist bernstein whose kidneys have been injured by blows and who can now only walk with a crutch eric musom who with caspar were forced to dig a grave for themselves being told that they were to be shot the following morning one night they broke the window of caspar's cell and pushed a revolver through threatening to shoot him then they rushed into his cell and beat him with rubber truncheons the daily program in sonnenburg is five fifteen a m get up empty the closets there are no drains in sonnenburg clean the cells wash exercise etc eight thirty a m breakfast nine to ten military drill singing of hitler songs ten thirty until noon rest and dinner twelve thirty until five thirty p m military drill and gymnastics six p m supper six thirty until seven thirty exercise seven thirty until eight thirty free time prisoners all together the mishandling in the sonnenburg camp was so inhuman that the new police commander of the camp appointed on april eleventh felt compelled to make a report on it to his superior officer he received orders from above to destroy the copy of this letter most of the pieces of this torn up copy have come into our hands Sonnenburg, 18 May, 1933. Concerning certain occurrences since I took over the prison on 11, 4, 1933. Quote, on taking up my post on the 11, 4, 1933, I ascertained that no order was maintained in this prison, especially by the stormtroop men. Irregularities in the main concerned, one, 
treatment of prisoners by the storm troop men two attitude of storm troopers to the administration officials three conduct of storm troopers among themselves four conduct of storm troopers in public five the situation with regard to pay of the storm troopers in regard to point one a section of the prisoners especially the prominent ones were extremely severely mishandled by members of the storm troops to put a stop to this mishandling the injured prisoners have been kept under control of word missing officers i threatened the storm troop men that if missing were repeated i would have the storm troopers kept under strict control day and night to put a stop to the missing on prisoners in spite of this i have established two instances of prisoners being struck in view of the way the storm troopers support each other especially in connection with such incidents the investigations i set on foot proved fruitless i have therefore threatened the storm troopers that the slightest incident of this sort again will lead to my dismissing the guards on duty at the time that is the whole of the storm troop in regard to point two there is continuous conflict between the storm troop men and the administration officials on the question of pay in spite of reasonable advances against pay the storm troop men feel that they are being prejudiced and they hold police inspector pells to blame their attitude toward police inspector pells was carried so far that only my personal intervention brought them to reason when the storm troopers were withdrawn on the twenty fourth of april nineteen thirty three i had to place an armed police guard at pells's house to prevent any violence in regard to point three there were frequent conflicts among the storm troop men generally over trivialities End quote. here the report breaks off compulsory labor the national socialist minister frick stated that the prisoners in the concentration camps were to be trained to become useful citizens in fact the work that they are forced to do is absolutely useless a neutral visitor to the oranienborg camp describes what he saw as follows quote, the work if we can call it work is the most pointless labor both for prisoners and warders that it is possible to imagine three young workers were driving six of their fellow unemployed to pull grass out of the ground as quickly as possible behind the factory building water is being splashed about some dozens of men are busy trying to clean the old building it is even worse where the wood is being cleared the trees have already been removed the prisoners under heavy guard are trying to dig out the gigantic roots with their fingers storm troop men drive on workers who are old enough to be their grandfathers old sow red swine and so forth End quote. compulsory drill after the compulsory labor comes the compulsory drill according to official statements the time from one thirty to five thirty p m is allotted to drill this is severe military drill and military exercises of an extremely exhausting character which the prisoners are compelled to carry out for hours at a time and so for days weeks and months the same futile work the same futile and exhausting drill has to be carried out on food which is entirely inadequate ordinary prisoners can at least count the days to their release but the prisoners in concentration camps have no idea when they will be set free the barbarous treatment the prisoners receive the exhausting work and drill the low diet and the hopelessness of their position has driven many to suicide the politican correspondent who visited the heuberg camp early in april nineteen thirty three reported that quote, 
Captain Buck answered my question quite willingly. He admitted that attempts at suicide are not infrequent at this camp. End quote. But there are also repeated cases which are officially reported as shot while trying to escape. The falsity of such reports is obvious. The camps are most closely guarded with armed patrols, police dogs, and searchlights at night. The prisoner must realize the hopelessness of any attempt to escape. And for that reason, there are few real attempts to escape from the camps. The murders in the camp, however, are systematically reported as shot while trying to escape. Dachau, the murder camp. Fourteen cases of murder in the Dachau camp, near Munich, became known in the course of a few weeks. In the middle of April, the official Wolf Telegraph Bureau reported, quote, Munich, April 14, WTB. In the Dachau concentration camp, near Munich, communists made an attempt to escape. The stormtroop police found themselves compelled to use their guns. They brought down four communists, of whom three were killed on the spot, and one was mortally wounded. End quote. According to the Daily Telegraph of April 27, 1933, the commandant of the Dachau camp confirmed this report to the English journalist Gede. The names were not stated in the official announcement. The victims were described as communists, but it soon became known that they were not communists, but middle-class Jews. A prisoner who was in the Dachau camp describes the murder as follows. Quote, a few days ago we were going out as usual to work. All of a sudden the Jewish prisoners, Goldman, a merchant, Benario, a lawyer from Nuremberg, and the merchants, Artur and Erwin Kahn, were ordered to fall out of the ranks. Without even a word, some stormtroop men shot at them. They had not made any attempt to escape. All were killed on the spot. All had bullet wounds in their foreheads. They were buried secretly, no one being allowed to be present. Then a meeting was called and a stormtroop leader made a speech in which he told us that it was a good thing these four Jewish sows were dead. They had been hostile elements who had no right to live in Germany. They had received their due punishment. End quote. We have particulars of thirteen similar murders at Dachau. Two of the most brutal cases were the murder of the communist members of the Diet, Dressel and Goetz. The former was tortured to death, and the latter was shot after weeks of brutal maltreatment. Tens of thousands in prison. The thirty-five to forty thousand prisoners in the concentration camps are not the only political prisoners in Germany. In addition, there are the prisoners awaiting trial and those who have been sentenced to imprisonment and penal servitude. Their number is growing every day. Every day the press announces new mass arrests. In the second half of June, the number of new arrests was higher than in any previous period. Sometimes a thousand arrests are made in a day. Thus, for example, in Seftenberg, a small town in the Niederlotzitzer coalfield, 267 Social Democrats have been arrested. In Bremen, over 80, and several hundreds in Braunschweig, Hamburg, Saxony, Berlin, and Stuttgart, all on one day only. The total number of prisoners awaiting trial or already serving sentences can only be guessed at. It is certainly not less than twelve to fifteen thousand. The prisoners awaiting trial are herded together in overcrowded prisons sometimes four or five in a cell intended for a single prisoner. Many of the prisoners have no bedding of any kind. Among those awaiting trial are many well-known officials of the Communist and Social Democratic parties, 
as well as members of the democratic party the people's party the center party and even the german nationalist party ernst thalemann leader of the german communist party was arrested on march third in charlottenburg and put in prison in all the government papers and the press which have been brought into conformity it was reported that he had been arrested in connection with the reichstag fire the arrests it will be difficult for people in other countries to realize the arbitrary methods used by the police and storm troops in making arrests one day an illegal leaflet is seen in a street it is reported by a policeman or an adherent of the nazis police motors immediately rush up the whole district is cordoned off all houses are searched from attic to cellar books and typewriters are seized and often completely innocent citizens are carried off any obstruction is immediately met with violence and arrest every day the papers report such raids and mass arrests early in july the hitler government began to seize as hostages the relatives of workers who had escaped the best-known case is the arrest of five relatives of scheidemann but this is only one case among many the sentences the public prosecutors have been busy since february twenty seventh special courts have been instituted in practically every german town denunciations bring a continuous stream of prisoners and the charges are as arbitrary as the sentences often prisoners are kept for weeks in prison and then set free without even being tried but even after being set free they are continuously menaced with further arrest and in many cases have to report daily to the police the following are some examples of the nature of the charges and the heavy sentences passed Quote, the special court of moabit berlin sentenced the unemployed workers max ziegler and richard schrotter to fifteen months and eighteen months imprisonment respectively because ziegler a member of the communist party had distributed in east berlin illegally produced copies of the rotofauna which he had received from schroter the darmstadt special court sentenced a female member of the young communist league to eight months and a male member to five months imprisonment for producing and distributing a leaflet the prisoners are sixteen years of age End quote. there are innumerable sentences for spreading atrocity stories often the relatives of arrested persons are told that they cannot expect the case to be heard for several weeks owing to the number of cases awaiting trial the relatives can seldom find a lawyer prepared to undertake the defense the position of the prisoners is made worse by the fact that the hitler government has prohibited the red aid organization which used to help the families of political prisoners but it still carries on its work with the help of similar organizations in other countries and the committees for the relief of the victims of german fascism which have been set up on the initiative of the workers international relief organizations end of chapter nine brown book of the hitler terror by lord marley chapter ten murder murder stalks through germany mutilated corpses are carried out of nazi barracks the bodies of people disfigured beyond recognition are found in the woods corpses drift down the rivers unknown dead lie in the mortuaries during the world war lists were published of those who were killed the lists were even exchanged between enemy governments the hitler government is naturally not so liberal as to publish the list of all its victims only a small number of the murders ever appear in the press and then in the form of shot while trying to escape or in some similar lying form and if any one were to try to get at the truth he would suffer the same fate torture and death 
on march twenty second a general amnesty was proclaimed for all criminal acts committed in the fight for the national revolution this general amnesty is a license for all past and future murders hitler's comrades of potemper there is no complete list of the victims of nazi knives and bullets even in the months preceding hitler's entry into the government certainly there must have been many hundreds murdered social democrats communists and members of the catholic parties as well as non-party workers a wave of murderous attacks on social democrats communists and members of the democratic parties developed in the first half of august nineteen thirty two in many towns these occurred on the same day showing clearly that they were organized in january nineteen thirty three under the schleicher government the number of crimes of violence perpetrated by national socialists rose very rapidly and after hitler became chancellor they increased from day to day in the first half of february twenty seven working men and women were murdered by nazi stormtroops the most notorious case in the summer of nineteen thirty two was the murder of a worker in potempa a village in upper silesia a murder gang of nazis who had first drunk heavily in an inn forced their way into a house where a communist worker lived and literally trampled him to death in front of his aged mother when all the bestial details of the crime had been disclosed in court and the death sentence had been passed on some of the criminals hitler openly came to their defence and in a letter described them as my comrades they were pardoned by the papen government immediately after march fifth nineteen thirty three that is even before the general amnesty these murderers were amnestied by hitler and again let loose upon the working class the murders and how they are hushed up as in all other sections of this book we rely in this chapter only on material which has been carefully checked up the main sources are accounts of eyewitnesses and reports published by the press in germany which has been brought into conformity these press reports not only reveal the murders but also show the methods used to hush them up methods which unintentionally often provide proof of the crime in the month of march nineteen thirty three reports of political murders still appeared in the press as a result of the initiative of the reporters but in spite of the fact that the only surviving newspapers had been brought into conformity so many reports of murders began to appear that they became dangerous for the hitler government in the course of april the reporting of murders was taken out of the hands of the press itself and even of the local censors appointed by the hitler government the following announcement was issued by the wolf telegraph bureau berlin second of april wolf telegraph bureau the government has advised all news agencies that reports on incidents in germany particularly reports on conflicts arising out of the jewish boycott must not be published without express sanction from the press department of the reich government no alteration of the wording of the report as passed for publication is permitted as a result of this centralization of the censorship a concrete picture of incidents is seldom given and if any details appear they are almost certain to be contradictory there are many ways in which the incidents are dealt with so as to conceal the true facts in the first place bodies found are said to be of unknown persons in most cases the police can immediately identify such bodies as the dead persons have already been reported as missing or as having been taken away by force but the reports do not disclose their identity secondly a great number of murders are represented as suicides the following report of the murder of councillor kresser of magdeburg shows how clumsily the truth is concealed magdeburg fourteenth march t u an incident resulting in bloodshed occurred late on sunday evening at felgeleben near magdeburg at an inn which had been used as a voting station the social democratic councillor kresser who arrived at the inn from magdeburg was taken into custody by the police officers there at the request of a number of storm troop men in another room an argument developed between kresser and a number of storm troop men in the course of which kresser fired a shot at the national socialists severely wounding the storm troop leader gustav leermann everyone ran out of the inn into which several shots were then fired from outside Shortly afterwards, Kresser was found dead in the inn, with a bullet through his head. A post-mortem examination is now being carried out to establish whether Kresser, after his revolver attack, put an end to his own life, or whether he was killed by one of the shots fired into the inn from outside. 
the National Socialist Party press has a tendency to make such reports as sensational as possible. For example, the Volkischer Beobachter of April 25th presents one of the worst cases of lynching as suicide in the following terms. Terrible suicide, smeared with tar and burnt. A man living in a bungalow on the Hona Moor has committed suicide by a terrible method. He went into the tool house built onto his bungalow where there was a barrel of tar. After taking off some of his clothes, he smeared himself with tar and set fire to the barrel. He died in the fire which resulted. The motive of the suicide was melancholia. The bungalow was completely burnt down. The suicide was a married man with several children. The third method is to ascribe to natural causes deaths which take place in hospital as a result of Nazi brutalities. In a number of cases, for example that of Dr. Eckstein of Breslau, the report is used to slander the individuals after their death. References to venereal diseases are made to discredit the victims. The fourth method is to suggest that the motive of the crime was not political. In such cases, naturally, no details of persons or motives are given, as, for example, the following report published in Germania of May 15, 1933. A police report states that on Saturday evening, Hensler, a slater, was forced by several persons to accompany them to number 21 Lessingstrasse. Shortly afterwards, the neighbours heard a number of shots. Hensler was found in the loft, severely wounded, and taken to hospital, where he died within a short time. The criminals escaped without being recognised. The fifth method is the use of a formula which, since the murder of Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, has had a quite definite and unambiguous meaning. The formula, shot while trying to escape. Here is a typical case, told in the officially published reports. The Frankfurter Zeitung of April 5 publishes the following report from Dusseldorf, dated April 4, Wolf Telegraph Bureau. The communist leader Bassler, who has evaded arrest for a considerable time, was located this morning by auxiliary police officers. During the search, the arrested man made use of a moment when he was not under observation to attempt an escape. As he would not stop, in spite of repeated warnings, the officers made use of their weapons. Bassler was seriously wounded by a bullet and died after being taken to hospital. The Angriff of April 5 publishes the following message from Dusseldorf, dated April 5. The police state that on April 4, at about 4pm, the communist official Bassler was arrested in his flat by protective corpsmen. In the search of his flat, two packets of dynamite were discovered. Documents were also confiscated. On the way to the police station, Bassler made an attempt to escape. He did not stop, in spite of being summoned to do so several times, and continued to run after warning shots were fired. He was severely wounded by a shot in his back and died shortly after being taken to hospital. In actual fact, Bassler's home was surrounded during the night. He was brought out early in the morning and shot in the street. The contradictions in the official reports are clear. The dynamite was not found, but invented. Reduction in the number of political murders. The Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung of May 6, 1933, published the following under the heading Great Reduction in the Number of Political Murders Since the National Government Took Power. The following statement is official. The Prussian Premier and Minister of the Interior, Goering, announces through the Chief of the Secret Police Department that there has been a marked reduction since the National Government took power in acts of violence with fatal results arising from political motives. Almost simultaneously with the taking of power by the national government, the effective defence measures taken by the new government, together with the relaxing of political tension as a result of the victory of the national movement, brought about a rapid fall in the number of fatal cases which had previously been mounting steadily, and has now reached its lowest point for a long time, with only two fatal cases in April of this year. At about the same time as the Hitler government issued this transparent announcement, it was also officially announced that during the month of April, 46 bodies had been brought to the Berlin mortuary alone, with their features mutilated beyond recognition. During the month of April, the fascist press itself reported 50 political murders, the names being given in each case. We now give details of a number of cases, giving the sources of information in each case. Shot while trying to escape. 
we have already quoted the reports published in the frankfurter zeitung and the angriff in connection with the death of heinz bassler bassler had been a member of the national socialists and a storm troop leader in december nineteen thirty he began to understand the real policy of the nazis and left the national socialist party later joining the communist party this was the reason why he was murdered the following letter shows how he was done to death if only our dear heinz was still alive i can't realize it but god will revenge this crime this crime was no german deed in the morning that is tuesday morning about four we were roused by seven protective corpsmen and two detectives we were kept quiet with revolvers heinz had to dress and go with them we had to lock the doors and were not allowed to open the windows oh god how roughly they treated our hinds they closed off the street as early as three o'clock and at four they came up and then they took him with them and they shot him in the street martial law oh what he must have suffered the poor lad i wish i had gone with him he had three shots through his heart one in his arm one in his neck one in his pelvis and two others besides eight shots in all then they left him lying there and some peasants found him like a dog. I can't believe it. I went running to Herr M. in the morning, for Heinz told me, go at once to him and tell him, for Weitzel has pledged himself to help me. But what help did he give? Heinz trusted people too much. Frau Lena, if you could have seen Heinz now on the death bier, you would have called God to judge. They had treated him so brutally. I can't forget what he looked like. How can anyone treat a poor, harmless human being so brutally? and then the lies in the newspapers that heinz had been shot while trying to escape and that they had found two packets of dynamite such meanness and it's not possible to get any justice done not even a pistol or a piece of paper of any importance did they find and then the papers write such a provocation but i call god in heaven to judge for such a cruel and mean crime everyone is so overwhelmed by this crime they can't believe it that these people should shoot down a person by himself so mean and brutal the funeral is saturday afternoon at half past one at the south cemetery heinz will be buried by the clergyman and many many people will come with him on his last journey when i went to herr m how he treated me when i said to him how can anyone shoot a helpless man like that he answered if you say much more i'll have you arrested too i'll shoot you down about six p m on march sixth greta messing a working woman married and with two children left her home in the summer mullenweg in selb bavaria and went towards the town to do some shopping about forty yards from her home she met a national socialist of the name of lager who lived in the same street he got in front of her and provoked her by saying heil hitler frau messing rejoined rot front and tried to pass him lager stopped her and threatened her with his revolver saying i'll shoot you down she answered calmly shoot away lager put his browning to the woman's throat and pulled the trigger frau messing was mortally wounded her husband carried her back to her home and there she bled to death the murderer went to the nazi inn drank some liquor and then handed himself up to the auxiliary police he was put under arrest ten days later he was released a guard of honor met him at the station in selb lager was not expelled from the storm troops on the other hand the husband and nineteen-year-old son of the murdered woman are in a bayreuth penitentiary under protective arrest police and auxiliary police carried out repeated searches in working-class houses in selb they were not looking for a criminal nor for a murderer but for a photograph which was documentary proof of the murder this photograph is printed here three bodies in the Machnauer forest on march eleventh nineteen thirty three the whole press reported the finding in the Machnauer forest of three bodies of young persons who had been shot but whose identity was unknown in spite of the fact that the police had all particulars these were withheld from the public the three youths were fritz nitschmann upholsterer born at oldenburg march first nineteen o nine then living in berlin his parents did not belong to any party nor did he hans balschkukat a worker born august twenty eighth nineteen thirteen in berlin living in berlin member of the red aid organization praus twenty three years of age living in berlin we have received the following information with regards to fritz nitschmann 
At 9.30 p.m. on March 8th, Nietzschemann was walking with his fiancée towards his home. When they reached the corner of the Stubenrach Erdmannstrasse, a red car came over the Siegfried Bridge and crossed to the left side of the empty street. Two men in stormtroop uniform, the chauffeur was in civilian clothes, jumped out of the car and came towards Nietzschemann and his fiancée, calling out, Halt! Stand still! You must come and have your papers examined. Nitschmann said quietly, You must have made a mistake. To which the Nazis replied, Shut your mouth and get in. Nitschmann did as he was told, as he felt that he had nothing to worry about. His fiancée, who also belongs to no party, wanted to get into the car with him, but was pushed roughly away by the Nazis, who told her that Nitschmann was only being taken to be identified, and that nothing would happen to him. His fiance, who was crying after being pushed away, did not note either the number of the car or the number on the collar of the Nazis. The car drove through the Stubenrauchstrasse and turned into the Hauptstrasse. Immediately after his arrest, Nitschmann's fiance went to his mother and told her what had happened. From there, she went to the police station in the Kremhildestrasse and stated the facts. There she was told, Nothing will happen to him. He will be back soon. Come again tomorrow. At 8 a.m. on March 9th, his mother went to the same police station and was told the same thing. She was, however, told that during the night, inquiries had been made at all police stations and that Nitschmann had not been brought into any. She was to come again at noon. At noon, his father went to the police station and reported him as missing. Up to March 11th, Nitschmann's parents heard nothing from the police. At 9 a.m. on that date, police officers arrived with the information that the Berlin Morgenpost had reported that three bodies had been found in the Machnauer forest. From the description given, Nitschmann's father thought that one of these must be his son, and he went to the police station where, however, he could not yet get any further information. At noon, the father went to the police headquarters and spoke to the inspector who was dealing with the case. The inspector, who did not then know that Nitschmann had been carried off by stormtroop men, told the father that in all his experience he had never come across such a brutal murder. After the father had given all details, the inspector stated that he and his officers would do everything they could to discover the criminals. The father identified his son in the mortuary, in the presence of the inspector. The body showed ten bullet wounds, eight in the back, one in the neck, and one in the jaw. Permission to take a photograph of the body was refused. Cremation also was not allowed, in view of the possibility of expert examination being necessary. Up to March 15th, the criminal department had not yet authorised the handing over of the bodies to their families. Two persons independently approached Nitschmann's father and gave the number of the car in which Nitschmann had been carried off as IA78087. Both also stated that it was a red car. With regard to Hans Balschukat, the following information is in our possession. On March 8th, Bauschkukat was arrested at the entrance of Gottenstrasse 14 in Schonenberg by three National Socialists with drawn revolvers, who carried him off in a dark car. On March 10th, his father received a postcard with the following. I have today found a purse with contents. Please come for the purse on Saturday, March 11th at 6pm. Hans Schmidt, Bornstedt by Potsdam, Victoria Strasse 26. When the card arrived, Balschkukat's father was not at home, and his mother took it to the police, who told her that she should not in any circumstances go to Bornstedt. At the same time, they telephoned to Bornstedt and to the detectives who were then investigating the crime in the Machnauer Forest. The purse was taken charge of by the criminal department. That same day, the father also went to the police, who told him that he must not go to Bornstedt, that the man who alleged that he had found the purse had already been arrested, as he was suspected of the crime, in view of the fact that the purse showed no sign of having been lying about. On March 11th, the father saw his son's body. He could not identify him at first, as the body was terribly disfigured. The lips were swollen and blue, the chin battered in, and there were blue patches on the neck and larynx and chest, apparently caused by violent kicks. The arms and chest had a number of swollen patches, which were evidently the result of the lad having been tied up. From the father's superficial examination, he was not allowed to examine the body carefully, the murdered lad had had six or seven bullets through him, two at the back of his head, one through his temple, two or three in his right arm, and a shot through his chest. No details can be secured with regard to the murder of Prouse, as his father refuses to give any information. 
steel rods, and spirits of salt. Groto Henne, a telegraph fitter, was a member of the Reichsbanner, but held no political office of any kind. On Monday, March 27th, he was visited by storm troop men, who insisted on his coming with them to the storm troop quarters. When he did not come home after some considerable time, Frau Grotohenne went to the storm troop quarters, and just as she was asking one of the Nazis to release her husband, Grotohenne was brought out into the street, little more than a bleeding lump of flesh. Several men brought him home. He complained of internal pains as well as external injuries. Groto Hene was able to tell what had been done to him. His clothes had been taken off, and he had been beaten with steel rods for three hours, from time to time being made to wipe the blood from the floor with his own clothes. When he was lying almost unconscious, the Nazis tried to pour spirits of salt between his clenched teeth. As they did not succeed in doing this, they then forced his teeth apart, tearing away a part of his upper lip in doing this. Groto Hene died on April 29th, after terrible suffering. An official post-mortem was held, and the cause of his death was certified as apoplexy and internal burns. The case was referred to the criminal department, but up to the present none of the criminals have been followed up. Beaten, stabbed, and trampled on. On March 28th, the communist Edom of Robert Strasse VI, Königsberg, was carried away from his home at midnight. As it was known that he was a friend of the communist Reichstag deputy Schutz, he was beaten for two hours in such a brutal way that he lost control of himself and told the Nazis where Schutz was living. At 2.30 a.m., Schutz was brought to the same Nazi barracks and there beaten, stabbed and trampled on for 12 hours. On the evening of March 29th, Schutz died in hospital, the cause of death being given as heart failure. On April 3rd, Schutz's body was put into the ground like a dog's. His death was not reported in any German paper. The doctors and nurses who had attended him were forced by threats to say nothing. In the meanwhile, Frau Schutz had been arrested. After her husband had been buried, she was compelled to sign an undertaking to say nothing of what had happened. The Nazis took Schutz's twelve-year-old son to see his father's mutilated body, and one of them said to him, You will have the same fate if you follow in his footsteps. Lynched in Prison the three following official reports on the case of Schum are enough to expose the methods used by the fascist news agencies. 1. Kiel 1, April, T.U. At about eleven o'clock, a dispute arose in front of the Jewish furniture shop kept by Schum, in the course of which the son of the Jewish shopkeeper attacked a protective cause man. When one of his comrades came to the latter's help, a fight developed between the two protective cause men and the shopkeeper who rushed up, and his son, in the course of which a shot was fired, which seriously wounded in the chest the protective cause man Walter Asthalter, 22 years old, of Kiel. The facts were as follows. In the course of the boycott of Jewish shops, a stormtroop gang occupied the furniture shop kept by Schum. The shopkeeper was molested by the Nazis, and his son, a lawyer, tried to protect him. A dispute arose, and then a tussle, in the course of which a shot was fired by one of the Nazis, which seriously wounded another of the storm troop men. 2. Kiel, 1 April, WTB. The son of the proprietor of the Schum furniture shop, who in the morning had fired some shots at a storm troop man in front of his father's shop, and wounded him severely in the stomach, has been shot in the police cell to which he had been brought. It is reported that a number of persons went to police headquarters and demanded that the door of Schum's cell should be opened, and when this was not done, several shots were fired which killed him on the spot. The body was conveyed to the medical institute. This second report is already improved to make it appear that Schum, who was absolutely unarmed, had not only fired the shot, but some shots. The report gives the circumstances of the murder of Schum accurately enough, but without expressly stating that the Nazis concerned murdered him to get a witness of the morning's crime out of the way. But both of these reports were so transparent that that same afternoon the Central Press Bureau intervened and produced the following account, which is false in every particular. 3. Kiel, 1 April, WTB The Jewish lawyer and commissioner for oaths, Schum, at 11.30 this morning, shot a protective cause man of the name of Walter Asthalter in the stomach. According to information so far to hand, the shooting which took place in the Kiedenstrasse was without any plausible ground. The protective cause man died in the clinic. 
an enraged crowd of people assembled in front of the police jail, before the removal of Shum, which had been ordered by the authorities, could be effected. The enraged crowd forced its way into the prison, where Shum was killed by revolver bullets. The whole incident developed so quickly that the police could do nothing to stop it. The crowd also forced their way into the shop kept by Shum's father in the Kadenstrasse and destroyed the stock. How the Mine Workers Leader Albert Funk Was Murdered On April 16, the Mine Workers Leader Albert Funk was recognised by a National Socialist in Dortmund and denounced to the police. Albert Funk had for many years played a leading part in the struggles of the mine workers. He was formerly a communist member of the Reichstag and leader of the United Mine Workers Union. Funk was put into the Dortmund police prison. He succeeded in getting out a letter reporting the terrible brutalities inflicted on seven other prisoners. He himself was not brutally treated at first. The papers said not a word about his arrest. This was enough to arouse the gravest fears. On April 26th, after ten days in prison, Albert Funk was murdered. His wife came to the prison to ask to see him and was told that she could not because he had poisoned himself in his cell. This was on April 28th. On the next day, April 29th, the press of the Rohr district published sensational disclosures about alleged discoveries of arms, dynamite dumps, terrorist groups, etc., of the communists in the Recklinghausen area. And in this connection, it was reported that the communist Reichstag deputy Albert Funk, who had been arrested, had made an insane attempt to escape from the Recklinghausen prison by jumping from the third floor window into the courtyard, that he had broken his spine, arms and legs, that he had been taken fully conscious to hospital, where he died shortly afterwards. Nothing was said about Funk having been in prison for two weeks and naturally not a word of explanation was given as to how he was suddenly transported from Dortmund to Recklinghausen. Albert Funk had been driven almost out of his mind by horrible tortures, and his tormentors then forced him to throw himself out of the window. When some of the murdered man's imprisoned comrades who were in the courtyard at the time cried out in horror, the murderers shouted down to them, You Moscow swine can come and jump after him. Literally torn to pieces. A witness reports, early in March, Fritz Gumpert of Heidenau was arrested. He was accused of having buried munitions and arms. He was taken to the Königstein fortress and thence to the concentration camp at Hohenstein. There he was put in chains and tortured. He was so appallingly ill-used that he died. His wife was informed that he had died of internal hemorrhage. Workers in the Heidenau factories collected money to bring the body to Heidenau. This was permitted, but on the express condition that the coffin should not be opened. The workers did not observe this condition. None of the eyewitnesses will ever forget the sight. Gumpert's face had been completely torn to pieces. As far as they could tell, his tongue was missing. Traces of heavy chains were visible on his arms. The back of the body was a lump of flesh that had been cut in pieces and was full of holes. The spine was broken, the sexual organs were lacerated. The right thigh was torn open. The pit of the stomach had been kicked in, so that the intestines were protruding. The lips showed how the victim had bitten into them to endure the appalling tortures he had suffered. Horrified and enraged workers gathered round, and the stormtroop men used this as an excuse to confiscate the body again. A number of police and doctors came up, and a raid was conducted on the working-class houses in order to confiscate photographic apparatus and films. All witnesses were threatened with the severest penalties if they spoke of the case. Those who were known to have seen the body were warned to keep their mouths shut. On Friday, April 28th, the funeral took place. Some 3,000 working men and women went to take part, but all approaches were barred by storm troops armed with rifles. When the cemetery gates were reached, the Nazis attacked the procession, and only the relatives were allowed in the cemetery. A clergyman wearing the swastika spoke at the graveside. St. Bartholomew's Night in Köpenick. In many German towns, the Nazi stormtroops have carried out the Night of the Long Knife, foretold by Hitler before his advent to power. On the night of June 21st to 22nd, the Nazis began a series of murders, which lasted several days, in Köpenick, a suburb of Berlin. The victims were officials of the Social Democratic Party, of the Reichsbanner and of the Communist Party. On June 21st, the stormtroops twice searched the house of a trade union secretary, Schmaus, in Köpenick. They stated that they were looking for arms. 
During the night, the storm troop men came a third time, arrested Schmaus's son-in-law, who was a communist, and then stormed the house, firing a number of shots. Schmaus had a feeble-minded son, 22 years of age, who was wakened by the shooting, picked up a revolver, and went to oppose the Nazis. His mother shouted to him in alarm, "'Don't shoot!' But the son shot at and mortally wounded two of the Nazis who had forced their way in. Then the slaughter began. Schmaus's son-in-law, Rakowski, was immediately shot by the Nazis in front of the house. Schmaus's son was arrested and brutally done to death. Schmaus himself was hanged by the Nazis in his house. Frau Schmaus was accused of having told her son to shoot, and was so brutally ill-used that she died a few days later. That night Marxists were arrested throughout Köpenick and Friedrichshagen. Among them were the Reichsbanner leader and former premier of Mecklenburg, Johannes Stelling, the 55-year-old Paul von Essen, who was an official at the Reichsbanner, and Asmann, 57 years of age, who had been the Reichsbanner leader in Friedrichshagen. A social democratic eyewitness gives the following account of what happened to the prisoners in the Nazi barracks. We were taken by car to the Köpenick prison. The square in front was filled with stormtroop men who wanted to attack us as soon as they saw us. The stormtroop leader, however, shouted, Stop! Don't hit them in the street! But we were hardly inside the building when they began to attack us. We were driven up the stairs and along a long passage. In a long cell there were ten comrades standing with their faces to the wall. The floor and wall were already spattered with blood. An old woman with blood streaming from her mouth and nose and her clothes spattered with blood was forced to scrub the floor. One of the stormtroop men asked me, Do you know this whore? I looked at her more closely and saw with horror that she was my wife's mother. Then the Nazi told Comrade Kaiser to strike another comrade in the face. When Kaiser hesitated, he hit him such a blow with his fist that he went staggering to the wall. Then the comrades were forced with blows from sticks to hit each other until they were bleeding. After that, we had to run the gauntlet about ten times through lines of storm troopmen armed with sticks and truncheons. In the course of this, some of the older comrades collapsed. Meanwhile, the 55-year-old Paul von Essen was brought in, and the Nazis greeted him with howls of joy. He had been unemployed for a long time and had just come out of hospital. He was blind in one eye. He took part in the war, and he had four children. The first hit him in the face, then pulled down his trousers and beat him with really insane fury, with sticks and truncheons, until he lost consciousness. Comrade von Essen has since succumbed to the terrible injuries his torturers inflicted on him. Then we were each taken to a cell and beaten. The brutalities were repeated regularly every hour. Finally, I was taken to the leader for examination, and in my despair I denied that I was a Marxist. He then ordered that I should not be beaten meanwhile, but if it turned out that I had told a lie, I was to be shot. Shortly afterwards the door of my cell was flung open, and a stormtroop leader rushed in with other stormtroop men and beat me, shouting, You scoundrel, we'll finish you off today. I was then dragged along the passage to my mother-in-law's cell, and while two of the Nazis held me, the old woman, who was fifty-three years of age, was beaten with sticks until she lay quiet on the floor. She is now out of her mind and in an asylum. This eyewitness did not recognise either Stelling or Usman among the prisoners. Some days later, Stelling's body, covered with wounds and sewn up in a sack, was taken out of the Finnov Canal. At the same time, two other unknown bodies were recovered. Eleven other men were missing. On July 12th, people in Friedrichshagen heard that Asman's body had also been found. And so, also throughout Germany, at the time when Hitler was more and more openly acting on behalf of the rich capitalists of Germany, the number of murders was rising. End of chapter 10 Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley Chapter 11 the German Workers' Fight Against Fascism On April 21, 1933, the German Press Bureau of Stuttgart issued the following. Although the seizure and confiscation of all communist printed papers was ordered as far back as March 1st, communist sheets are still circulating. On April 28th, the British Press Bureau of Berlin stated, in the course of the search a considerable quantity of printed matter and numerous stencils for the production of leaflet material for may first were found at stiglitz in friedenau 
that the attempt to stop the organization of the anti-fascist fight had not succeeded is shown by the following announcement made by the police press bureau of castle on may fifth nineteen thirty three in continuation of the measures taken against the illegal district leadership of the german communist party in castle early on thursday morning the political police carried out searches in secret offices and in the houses of the leaders of the district committee on may twenty sixth nineteen thirty three the bremen police announced that in spite of the police warning issued a few days ago in connection with the distribution of illegal communist sheets and the reference to the severe penalties attached on thursday evening the illegal arbiter zeitung six pages in size was circulated by the communists hitler aimed at carrying out the destruction of all political parties but there is one party that he cannot destroy the german communist party which is carrying on the fight against fascism illegally the statements issued by the hitler government are every day proving that the party's active opposition cannot be broken reports are coming in from every part of germany showing that groups of workers belonging to the social democratic party and to the reichsbanner the league of socialist youth and the christian organizations are joining with the communists in the fight in the days following the burning of the reichstag anti-fascist sheets issued by the communists were already circulating among the workers workers homes and the cellars and roofs of blocks of flats were transformed into secret printing works although hundreds of active agitators were arrested thousands of newly trained and determined workers took their place in spite of the extension of torture and ill-treatment the fight for freedom against fascism continued even more vigorously and with increasing effect each line of the illegal papers issued by the communists is literally written in blood new horrible acts of torture were perpetuated wherever each issue of these papers appeared before the end of march an illegally printed pamphlet on the burning of the reichstag was produced and was distributed in every part of germany its external appearance is that of the advertisement of the film in the sign of the cross goring the organizer of the reichstag fire was compelled to pay a glowing tribute to the disintegrating work carried out by the communists when at the end of june nineteen thirty three he dissolved the organization of young german nationalists on the official ground that it had been completely permeated by communists early in july the threatening statements issued by hitler and frick against the second revolution showed that the work of unmasking the hitler government was achieving success even among large numbers of the storm troops and of the national socialist factory cells the following pages give only a brief and partial statement of the underground work which is being carried on in germany the illegal rotafana one of the most vital sections of the fight against fascism is the production and distribution of illegal newspapers the rote fahne the central organ of the german communist party has been appearing regularly since the burning of the reichstag police activities raids the allocation of thousands of spies nightly patrols of storm troop men through printing works have been unable to prevent the production of this paper it continues to appear as a two or four page paper and to find its way into the blocks of flats in wedding into the aeg and simon's factories and into the railway stations though the technical production of the paper may be worse than before it is certain that none of its former issues have ever been read by so many people as the present issues the christian socialist paper reichspost issued in vienna on may twenty seventh printed the following interesting story at first the rotafana appeared in an illegally printed edition of three hundred thousand copies and this was followed by a number of duplicated editions secret presses previously prepared for such purposes duplicating machines and typewriters began their work 
soon the greater part of the local cell and industrial papers though most of them only duplicated were again in circulation and hundreds of thousands of leaflets were being passed from hand to hand in the factories and at the labor exchanges in twenty different areas in greater berlin in addition to the printed rote fahne, duplicated papers produced from wax or metal sheets are regularly distributed weekly experienced long before the hitler dictatorship was and sometimes twice weekly they all bear the heading rote fahne. these papers are edited by workers red papers throughout germany early in may the hamburg police announced that in spite of the strongest countermeasures taken by the authorities again and again treasonable publications of the communist party of germany and particularly papers such as the prohibited hamburger volkszeitung and other marxist productions are being produced and sold on the streets in the ruhr district the ruhr echo has appeared several times in large editions the may first number was even printed in two colors in essen although whole districts of the town have been searched through by storm troops and police and although courageous distributors of the papers have been most horribly tortured duplicated editions of the ruhr echo continue to appear a letter received from a munich worker reports that every week a hectographed newspaper is issued in an edition of three thousand copies immediately after its production it is distributed to the separate anti-fascist groups and brought by them to the workers in a number of different ways six reichsbanner groups are helping in the distribution the bremen police refer to the illegal six-page paper the arbiter zeitung in stuttgart the south german arbiter zeitung appears in printed form and illegal papers were also distributed in leipzig and frankfurt am main during april and may several numbers of the dusseldorf journal freiheit were distributed in mannheim several issues of the rote fahne badens have been published in erfurt the thuringer volksblatt appears in duplicated form in the factories the only party which had made preparations for carrying on underground activities in the factories was the communist party its members were already established in the secret production and distribution of factory papers and because of this experience it had been possible for numbers of such papers to be distributed in the factories during the period of the hitler dictatorship for example a worker in the aeg works in berlin reports as follows in the anti fastici front of july second nineteen thirty three our last leaflet appeared in a format ten by twenty centimeters we produced it in the following way we first worked out the slogans and cut them in linoleum then we put the strips of linoleum over an inked bladder and printed off copies one by one during the night we posted a great number of these copies on various gates of the factory and we scattered the remainder in the streets round our fellow workers who are really starving for material of this kind picked up the leaflets as they came back to work in the morning and showed great enthusiasm each single leaflet passing through dozens of hands the illegal papers hofentel and grammy funk spruik and der storm are being published in the port of hamburg from one hamburg office it is reported that the rolls of paper in the closets contained small leaflets or cuttings from illegal papers in the siemens works of spandau berlin anti-fascist youth workers have up to now succeeded in producing their paper regularly in the bielfeld work the rote wacht is being produced and distributed by a joint group of communist social democrats and reichsbanner workers lightning demonstrations during the months of march april and may there were large and small anti-fascist demonstrations in hundreds of places most of them took the form of so-called lightning demonstrations 
in such demonstrations the workers assemble at an agreed point at a given signal carry out a demonstration lasting only a few minutes shouting slogans against the hitler dictatorship and singing anti-fascist songs these demonstrations as a rule succeed in dispersing again before the police or storm troops are able to intervene these mobile methods are adopted to prevent a large number of arrests during april such demonstrations were held in addition to very many others of which we have no reports in remscheid cleve krefeld siegen stetten worms osterode dusseldorf and linden near hanover a report from hamburg states that early in may the young communist league distributed ten thousand printed leaflets posted up eighty posters prepared by hand and painted anti-fascist slogans on walls and pillars in every part of the town four lightning demonstrations were held in each of which an average of three hundred workers took part a danish anti-fascist reports that during a visit to germany he saw a street choir of four workers who suddenly shouted who set fire to the reichstag the nazis and then separated and disappeared early in march a streamer was found across a working-class street in dortmund bearing the words nero set fire to rome and put the blame on the christians hitler set fire to the reichstag and blames the communists the same slogan printed from a linoleum cut was posted on walls all over dortmund at the end of april the vosichi zeitung of may third reports the wolf telegraph bureau reports from barnau that the night of april thirtieth may first a red banner bearing a hammer and sickle was fastened to the top of the steeple of the marienkirk early in the morning of may first it was taken down by storm troop men at the risk of their lives that morning which was the festival of national labor nazis who went to hoist the swastika banner at the town hall discovered that it had been stolen during the night the excitement in barnau arising from this double act of provocation was indescribable during the night of may first second about forty suspected persons were arrested by the storm troops and police and removed to the concentration camp at oranienburg in addition to torture and murder starvation is used by the hitler government as a method of fighting the anti-fascists the following quotation from the frankfurter zeitung of may tenth nineteen thirty three illustrates the methods used in the attempt to force the unemployed to denounce anti-fascist agitators kassel may eighth in schmuckelden which is in the administrative district of kassel intensified communist propaganda among the unemployed have been in evidence during the last few days several communist leaflets have been distributed and their producers and distributors have not yet been discovered the mayor of smalkelden has therefore ordered that relief is to be withheld from all recipients who are of the left tendencies until the criminals have been caught anti-fascists who are charged before the courts are not allowed witnesses or any other opportunities of defense before the charge is heard the penalty has already been decided on but in spite of everything many of the accused have made a heroic stand in court against the fascist dictatorship a report from altona dated june second nineteen thirty three for example states that during the trial of twenty anti-fascist workers the communist worker lutgens against whom the government attorney demanded the death penalty stated that he regarded this demand put forward by the prosecution as an honor as there could be no higher honor for a revolutionary worker than to be sentenced to the death penalty by a capitalist class court and prison clothes were robes of honor in the middle of may a typist Fräulein Jur was sentenced to imprisonment for eighteen months for having passed on leaflets the berlin journal der tag reported that 
the accused stated in court that she still remained loyal to communist ideas to which prosecuting counsel replied attention must be called to the audacity and shamelessness displayed by communists who dare to proclaim their views even here in front of the special tribunals similar cases are reported from all parts of germany only a very small percentage of the sentences passed on anti-fascist agitators is ever reported in the press but the increasing severity of the sentences has done nothing to stop the anti-fascist work which is being carried on unceasingly it has only been possible within the limits of this book to give a few examples of this work the organization of political and economic strikes the hundreds of separate movements within the factories and the results in the compulsory labor camps must be left to the second volume of the brown book the story of the heroic stand made by anti-fascists in the struggle for german freedom has still to be written the story of fighters who stood their ground in spite of the menace of murder the story of prisoners who met the death sentence with a proud declaration of their loyalty to socialism the story of tortured victims who sang the international in spite of steel rods and truncheons the story of heroes like the teacher wilhelm hamann in hessen who was ordered to raise the swastika banner and shout long live the leader of the german people adolf hitler but who hurled the banner to the ground and amid the blows of the storm troop men shouted long live the revolution and comrade thalman tens of thousands of nameless heroes are fighting to free germany and the world from the shameful barbarism of the brown shirts they are facing courts martial and the gallows torture and concentration camps their loyalty and courage cannot be broken and their ceaseless activity is fanning the spark which will burst forth into the flame of socialist freedom End of chapter 11 Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley Appendix List of Murders The following is an extract from our list of murdered workers and intellectuals. We have definite information relating to over 500 murders carried out by the Nazis since March 3rd, and below we give the detailed particulars of 250. Our sources of information are official German announcements, press reports which have not been denied, and authenticated reports of witnesses. It must be borne in mind that the list is only a small selection of the total number of murders, most of which are concealed by the rigorous censorship and the threats made by the Nazis to relatives and friends and witnesses. 1933 March 3rd, Gerdes, communist member of the Diet, Oldenburg, shot in the street, Wolf Telegraph Bureau. Unknown communist Hamburg, killed by a revolver shot, WTB, Wolf Telegraph Bureau. Unknown Reichsbanner man, Bremen, shot in the street, WTB. Unknown worker, Bernberg, shot by National Socialists, WTB. Gustav Segenbrecht, Berlin, shot in the Stephan Inn, Liebenswaldstrasse, 41, report from witness. Bernhard Wirsching, Berlin, Petrusstrasse, 8-9, shot by Nazis in his flat, report from witness. Ebeling, a Magdeburg worker, killed in the Breckenstrasse by a shot through his stomach, witness. Weiss, caretaker of the social democratic people's house verms shot witness unnamed girl verms killed in the raid on the people's house witness fabian a communist worker kellingshusen shot at and died in hospital wtb wolf telegraph bureau march four two unnamed workers cologne severely wounded by shots and subsequently died wtb 
unnamed member of the Iron Front, Thalischweiler, shot in the street, WTB. Friedrich Marquardt, Dusseldorf, Berenstrasse, 14, no party, killed by blows, witness. March 5th, Klassen and de Longville, Oberhausen, Rhine Province, killed in the school courtyard while attempting to escape. Both had bullet wounds in the front of their bodies. Witness, Warnicke, Quickborn near Penneberg, shot. WTB. Unnamed Reichsbanner man, Central Germany, stabbed to death. WTB. Two brothers, Bassi, Bankau, Upper Silesia, murdered by stormtroopers. Witness. Karl Tarnow, Berlin, beaten to death in Nessebeckstrasse. Neukolln. Witness. March 6th. Greta Messing. Working woman, Selb, shot in the street. WTB. Hans Bauer. Worker, no party, never returned from the Nazi barracks in the Hedemannstrasse, Berlin. Witness. Friedlander, a baker's apprentice, 19 years old, murdered in the Nazi barracks in the Hedemannstrasse, Berliner, Tageblatt. March 7th. Bernhard Krause, communist worker, Wiesenau, near Frankfurt on the Oder, shot by stormtroopers, WTB. Two unnamed workers, Hamburg, killed in Nazi raid, WTB. Unnamed worker, Dusseldorf, killed in the Levitzwaldstrasse, Telegrafen Union. March 8th. Unnamed communist worker, Bilstedt, near Hamburg, shot while trying to escape, WTB. Philip, caretaker at Trade Union House, Breslau, shot when Nazis occupied the building, WTB. Heinrich Sparlich, building worker, Breslau, killed by a bullet and a knife stab in the back. Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung. Balschukat, Nischmann, and Preuss, Schöneberg, Berlin. Bodies found in Machnauer Forest. Vossische Zeitung. Unnamed communist worker, Volkum, found shot in the street, T.U. Unnamed worker, Volkum, shot in his flat by six unknown men, T.U. Bless, member of the Reichsbanner, Offenbach, mortally wounded in a Nazi attack, since died. Witness. March 9th. Unnamed member of the Reichsbanner, Munich, mutilated corpse found in the Munich Trade Union House, which had been occupied by Nazis on March 1st. Witness. Landgraf, director of publishing house Chemnitz, shot when the Volkschema building was occupied. T.U. Helpuch, communist worker, Duisburg, found shot. March 10th. Frau Bix, 70 years of age, Berlin, mortally wounded by stormtroopers who fired through her door. W.T.B. Hermann, a watchmaker, Dresden, member of International Workers' Relief, beaten to death in his house. Witness. Hans Seile, circulation manager, shot when the Volksfreund offices in Braunschweig were occupied. Witness. Ulrich, leader of the Hessen Social Democrats, beaten to death. Berliner Tageblatt. Two unnamed workers, Schopau, shot by storm troopers, Berlin local Anzeiger. Alfred Petzloff, communist worker, Schoenberg, Berlin, taken by Nazis from his home, body found mutilated at Preisterweg station. Witness. Schoenflugel, a worker, Bernau, Chemnitz, killed by a chance bullet, Berlin local Anzeiger. March 11th. Eric Meyer, a young worker, Spandau, beaten to death, Frankfurter Zeitung. Robert Dittmar, a worker, Karlschorst, near Berlin, found shot, Berlin, local Anzweiger. Unnamed worker, Breslau, stabbed to death, T.U. Forster and Tandler, communist workers, Limbach, near Chemnitz, shot when trying to escape, witness. Paul Krantz. A young worker, Limbach, near Chemnitz, shot when trying to escape, WTB. Unnamed man, no party, 
Opeln, shot on the steps of the town hall. Berlin, local Anzeiger. March 12th. Councillor Kresse, Social Democrat, Magdeburg, shot at election station in Felgelaben, T.U. Eichholz and Rather, workers, Tolkemith. Shot while trying to escape, T.U. Spiegel, Social Democratic lawyer, Kiel, attacked at his home and killed, W.T.B. March 13th, unknown worker, Elbing, found shot, T.U. Heinz Vesha and Erna Knopf, communist councillors. Chemnitz, the first shot in the prison courtyard, the second beaten to death in his cell. Witness. March 14th. Krug. Schweinfurth. Shot in self-defense by a Nazi. T.U. Unnamed worker. Hamburg. Shot by detectives. W.T.B. March 16th. Dr. Asher. Berlin. Schweinmund der Strasse. Beaten to death. Witness. Leo Krell. Editor. Berlin. Beaten to death. Witness. March 17th. Two unknown persons, Elben, shot when trying to escape, Nachtausgabe. March 18th, Walter Schulz, communist worker, Wittstock, murdered in prison, witness. Hans Sachs, manufacturer, Chemnitz, shot, WTB. Siegbert Kindermann, Charlottenburg, Berlin, taken to the head of Monstrasse, beaten to death and thrown from the window. Berliner Tageblatt. Unnamed worker, wedding, Berlin, beaten to death at Nazi quarters, witness. March 19th, Krebs, communist worker, Moabit, Berlin, shot by stormtroopers in the street, witness. March 20th, Gunther Joachim, lawyer, Berlin, tortured, died in Moabit Hospital, Vossische Zeitung. Kurt Posener, Berlin, shot. Wiener Blatter. March 21st, Otto Seltz, Straubing, shot, witness. March 22nd, Walter Boga, Ebersbach, shot while trying to escape, Bosische Zeitung, Wilhelm Wenzel, communist worker Essen, shot in the street, WTB, Dresche, Dresden, found murdered, witness. Paul Reuter, Selschauerstrasse, Berlin, beaten to death by storm troopers. Witness. March 23rd. Erich Lange, ex-member of the Nazi Protective Corps. Gelsenkirchen. Shot by storm troopers. Witness. Frank, member of the Reichsbanner. Firms. Said to have committed suicide. Unsere Zeitung. Herbert Pengeritz, worker. Bergstrasse, 78. Berlin, brutally treated and died in hospital. Witness. March 24th. Frau Arbets, a working woman, Gladbach, shot while trying to escape. T.U. Eric Pearl, 17 years old, Leipzig, shot in the street after release from a Nazi barracks. Witness. House, retired Social Democratic counselor, found shot in Eichling Schofen. Frankfurter Zeitung. March 25th. Socialist, vetting. Berlin, maltreated and died in hospital. Witness. Frau Müller, Aue, Saxony, maltreated, said to have committed suicide. Witness. March 27th, Newman, shopkeeper, Königsberg, beaten and used as target. T.U. Grothehenna, telegraph fitter, Braunschweig, beaten to death. Witness. Dr. Max Plaut, lawyer, beaten to death in a Nazi barracks. Witness. Max Belecki, Schoenberg, tortured in Nazi barracks and died in hospital. Witness. March 30th, Fritz Rohl, worker, Siemenstadt, found stabbed, WTB. Liebel, Volschlager, Skalitzerstrasse, Berlin, murdered and thrown into the river. Witness. Unknown Jew, in Oberhessen, hanged by the feet and died. Manchester Guardian. April 1st, Wilhelm Potter, baker, and Karl Gorman, communist worker, Woldenberg, shot while trying to escape, Vossische Zeitung, Wilhelm Dengmann, steelworker, Duisburg, shot in the street, Vossische Zeitung, 
unnamed worker, Munich, shot while trying to escape. Munchner, Nuesta, Nachrichten. Fritz Schum, lawyer, Kiel, beaten to death in prison, T.U. Pressburger, cattle dealer, Munich, shot, described as suicide. Munchner, Nuesta, Nachrichten. April 2nd, H. Wertheimer, Kale, alleged stroke before arrest, W.T.B. April 3rd, Paul Jaros, Smith, Limbach, near Chemnitz, shot while trying to escape, unnamed worker, Augsburg, alleged stroke before arrest, T.U. Georg Bell, shot by stormtroop men in Austria, Conti, W.T.B. April 4th, Heinz Basler, Dusseldorf, shot while trying to escape, W.T.B. Wilhelm Drews, worker, Berlin, found shot, Wossischer Zeitung, Dr. Philippsthal, Biesdorf, Berlin, beaten to death, Berliner Tageblatt. April 5th, Renoir, communist counselor, Bonn, shot while trying to escape, T.U. Sauer, Zubakowicz, member of Social Democratic Party, beaten to death in concentration camp, Neue Welt. Wilhelm Drews, communist worker, Hamburg, shot in the street, T.U. April 6th, Max Niedermeyer, communist counselor, Johann Georgenstadt, Saxony, beaten to death in Zwickau prison, witness. Kurt Friedrich, communist worker, same town, shot, witness. April 7th, Hanussen, Berlin, T.U. See report. April 8th, unnamed worker, Neukölln, Berlin, beaten to death by stormtroops, witness. April 9th, Walter Kosch, Hamburg, shot. April 10th, Fritz Engler, hairdresser, no politics, Chemnitz, tortured and killed in the Zeisig forest, witness. April 11th, Max Ruff, Reichsbanner member, Chemnitz, found shot, T.U. Dr. Arthur Wiener, lawyer, Chemnitz, found shot, Frankfurter Zeitung. Alvin Hansbach, communist worker, Friedersdorf, Zittau, shot in prison, T.U. April 12th, Benario, a lawyer, Arthur Kahn and Erwin Kahn and Goldman, merchants from Nuremberg, shot while trying to escape, Dachau concentration camp. WTB, Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung. Fritz Kolische, Charlottenburg, tortured in Nazi barracks, died in hospital, witness. April 13th, Albert Janka, Communist member of the Reichstag, alleged suicide, WTB. Gustav Schönherr, worker, Hamburg, tortured to death, Saarbruck, Arbeiter Zeitung. April 15th, Spiro, a Jew, aged 17, Berlin, murdered in Nazi barracks in the Hedemannstrasse, witness. April 16th, Brett Schneider, Sigmar, Saxony, found, shot, WTB. April 18th, Bayer, Krefeld, found shot, Vossische Zeitung, Richard Tollett, communist worker, Konigsberg, shot while trying to escape, Frankfurter Zeitung, unknown communist worker, Konigsberg, shot while trying to escape, T.U. April 19th, unknown railwayman, Munich, stabbed in the back, described as suicide, Munchner Nuesta Nachrichten. Alfred Elker, a Christian beaten to death by stormtroopers because of his Jewish appearance. Witness. April 20th, Kaminsky, Dortmund, member of Anti-Fascist League, beaten to death in prison. Witness. April 21st, Fritz Dressel, chairman of Communist Fraction in the Diet, described as suicide. Munchner Nuesta Nachrichten, but reported by witness to have been murdered in Dachau camp. April 22nd, Max Kassel, dairyman, Wiesbaden, shot in his flat, Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung. Solomon Rosenstrauch, merchant, Wiesbaden, shot in his flat, Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung. Paul Pabst, worker, alleged suicide in Nazi barracks, Germania. April 23rd, Kurt Benke, a stormtrooper, Berlin, Angriff. Franz Schneider, anti-fascist worker, Goch, 
Rhineland, alleged suicide in prison. Vossische Zeitung. Konietzny, communist worker, Olsnitz, Erzgebirge, alleged suicide in prison. Vossische Zeitung. April 24th, unknown man, Honor Moore, tarred and burnt, alleged suicide. Volskischer Beobachter. Cordes and Son Merchants, Wittmund, near Bremen, shot in a pogrom. WTB. April 25th, Mendel Haber, merchant, Dortmund, shot and his body thrown into the river. Dortmunder General Anzeiger. Two unnamed workers, Heil Lippe, found dead. Volkischer Beobachter. Grenitza, worker, Königsberg, shot while trying to escape. Nachtaus Daba. April 26. Willy Plonska, Berlin, found dead. Angriff. April 27th. Erwin Volkmar, New Köln, Berlin, alleged unpolitical murder, shot in the street. Angriff. April 28th. Unnamed man, Wollenberg, Oberbarnum, shot and burnt. Frankfurter Zeitung. Funk. Communist member of the Reichstag, Dortmund, murdered in prison, alleged suicide, Angriff. Fritz Gumbert, communist worker, Heidenau, beaten to death after weeks of torture. April 29th, unknown man, found murdered near Wernerschen in the Mark, WTB. April 30th, Hackstein, communist worker, Gravenbrook, Shot while trying to escape, Konisha Zeitung, Andres von Flotow, German nationalist landowner, arrested by Nazis and shot while trying to escape, Conti. End April. Unnamed worker, Ebersdorf, Saxony and Heinz Goldberg, member of Red Sports Organization, shot in the cellar of Hermann Goering House, Lobau, witness. May 2nd, Rodenstock, Social Democratic Secretary of the Municipal Workers' Union and two unknown trade union officials tortured and beaten to death in Nazi barracks in Duisburg. Witness. Danziger, Jewish merchant, Duisburg, attacked by Nazis and so brutally treated that he died. Witness. May 3rd, Dr. Ernst Oberforen, chairman of German nationalist fraction in Reichstag, found dead in his Kiel house, described as suicide may fourth unnamed member of stahlhelm berlin shot in nazi quarters saarbruck barbeiter zeitung may fifth simon Katz, worker polish citizen beaten to death witness unnamed man potsdam tied up and thrown into the river Vossische zeitung spangenberg communist worker brederica templin Alleged suicide in prison. Vossische Zeitung. Unnamed dye worker. Sagan. Alleged suicide murdered in prison. WTB. May 6th. Unnamed girl. Grossen. Found dead. Angriff. May 8th. Dr. Eckstein. Leader of Socialist Labor Party. Breslau. Tortured to death. WTB. May 9th. Dr. Meyer. Jewish dentist. Fuppertal mutilated by Nazis and drowned. Witness. Galanowski, worker, Allenstein shot while trying to escape. WTB. May 10th, unnamed young worker, member of Red Sports Organization, Vetting, Berlin, murdered in Nazi barracks in the Hedda Manstrasse. Witness. May 11th, Biedermann, Social Democratic, member of the Reichstag, Hamburg, described as suicide. Frankfurter Zeitung. Gluckau, communist worker, Berlin, tortured, died in hospital. Witness. May 12th. Sepp Goetz, communist member of the Diet, maltreated and murdered in Dachau concentration camp. Witness. May 13th. Unnamed Nazi auxiliary policeman, Kiel, found shot. He had asked when the government was going to carry out its promises. Frankfurter Zeitung, Henseler, communist worker, Dusseldorf, shot, Germania. May 15th, Dr. Alfred Strauss, Munich, a lawyer, age 30, 
German Jew beaten to death. Witness. Unnamed member. Stahlheim, Berlin. Attacked by Nazis and stabbed to death. Witness. Paletti, Schoenberg. Berlin. Tortured to death. Witness. May 17th. Hermann Riedel. Gladbeck. Alleged suicide. Der Tag. Johannes and Wilhelm Barth. Duisburg. Beaten to death. Der Tag. May 18th. Unknown man. Berlin. Alleged suicide. Vossische Zeitung. Hongstein. Grevenbroek. Shot while trying to escape. WTB. May 19th. Leonard Hausmann. Communist official shot while trying to escape. In Dachau concentration camp. WTB. May 20th. Arthur Müller. A worker, member of Reichsbanner, beaten to death in Nazi barracks. General Papastrasse, Berlin. Witness. May 25th. Schloss, a merchant, Nuremberg, shot. Witness. May 26th. Groman, an artist, Duisburg, shot by protective corps men in Kalkumer Wood. Witness. May 27th. Franz Lehrberger, Nuremberg, shot while trying to escape in the Dachau concentration camp. Frankfurt Courier. May 29th. Wilhelm Aaron of Bamberg, member of Reichsbanner, shot in Dachau while trying to escape. Bamberger Zeitung. End of May. Two communist workers shot in Siegburg concentration camp. Witness. June 8th. Stormtrooper Dusseldorf shot for distributing opposition leaflets. Dortmund. General Anzeiger. June 10th. Karl Lottes, communist worker shot while trying to escape. WTB. Fritz Kokorenz, a stormtrooper in opposition, found shot in his home, Berlin. Witness. Walter Ernst, found half buried in Hennigsdorf Cemetery, Berlin. WTB. June 12th, unnamed worker, Essen, shot while trying to escape. TU. June 20th, Walter Kersing, worker, member of German Nationalist Youth Organization, Frankfurt on Oder, shot by Nazis in a dispute. WTB. June 21st. Paul Urban, worker, Brandenburg, alleged suicide in prison. Nachthausgabe. Three unknown men found dead in a pool with their arms and legs bound at Neustadtel near Zwickau. Twelve Uhr Mittagsblatt. June 22nd. Altenburg, Communist worker Arnswalde Neumark, shot while trying to escape. Deutsche Allgemeine Zeitung. Schmaus family, father, mother, and son, murdered by stormtroopers. Rakowski, worker, Kopenick, shot by stormtroopers. Johannes Stelling, former premier of Mecklenburg, murdered. Paul von Essen, member of Reichsbanner, Kopenick, beaten to death. June 24th, Arthur May, communist official, Aachen shot while trying to escape. Police report Aachen. June 26th, unknown communist worker, Braunschweig, murdered in prison, alleged suicide, WTB. June 29th, Dr. Rosenfelder, lawyer, Nuremberg, murdered in Dachau concentration camp. Witness. End of June. Glasper, local leader of Red Aid Organization Elberfeld, Gottschalk, town councillor Otto Datum, communist councillor Elberfeld, murdered shortly after release from concentration camp, body thrown into a river, Irwin Dollar, a young worker found dead, mutilated, Gorsmeyer, Elberfeld, shot by Nazis after arrest and thrown into a pool, unnamed worker, Elberfeld, found shot in the Bernerstrasse, Unnamed worker, Elberfeld, found shot. All of these Elberfeld murders are authenticated in reports from witnesses. Hunglinger, police officer, Munich. Sebastian Nefsger, Munich. Michael Sigmund, social democrat, murdered in Dachau concentration camp. Reports from witnesses. July 1st, Max Margoliner, merchant, Breslau, maltreated in the Brown House during April, died in hospital two months later. Witness. July 10th, Joseph Nies, journalist, member of Free Thinkers League, Erfurt, 
Alfred Knoll, Communist official Jenna, unnamed Communist worker Erfurt, all three shot by storm troopers when the illegal printing press for the Thuringer Volksblatt was discovered. Witness. July 12th. Osman, member of Reichsbanner, Kopenick, killed in the Kopenick St. Bartholomew's night. Van Tenda, communist worker, Essen, political prisoner, since October 31, shot while trying to escape. Conti, WTB. Schultz, communist member of Diet, Berlin, died in hospital after maltreatment. Tomps. Fritz Lange, communist worker, Konigsberg, lynched. Angriff. Joseph Messinger, communist worker, Bonn, murdered in prison, alleged suicide. Havis Agency. July 14th. Franz Braun, editor of Volksfacht. Stetten, murdered in his cell the day after he was arrested. Conti, WTB. Three unknown communists, Schwerin, shot while trying to escape on their way to Sonnenberg concentration camp. Vossische Zeitung, unknown communist worker, Stetten, shot. Conti, WTB. Unnamed communist official, Bochum, shot while trying to escape. Vossische Zeitung. July 15th, Speer, a tailor, Berlin, found with his throat cut. Witness. Clara Wagner, typist, Treptow, Berlin, shot. Witness. July 17th, Dr. Wilhelm Schaefer, Frankfurt, ex-Nazi, found shot. Frankfurter Zeitung. July 20th, unnamed worker, Berlin, found dead at Hirschgarten. Witness. Man, 50 years of age, found dead near Berlin. Witness. Hugo Federson, communist worker, Hamburg, murdered in prison, alleged suicide, WTB. Stormtrooper, Obermenzig, near Munich, found shot. He had adopted an opposition standpoint. Conti, WTB. July 24, Eric and Gustav Rudolf, Duringschuf, shot while trying to escape. Frankfurter Zeitung. Three stormtroopers of opposition tendency found shot. Grunwald, Berlin, witness. Jaskowiak, Nazi of opposition tendency. Leverkusen, shot by a protective corps man in self-defense. Dortmund, General Anzeiger. July 29th, Solecki, communist worker. Iserlohn, shot by auxiliary police in self-defense. WTB. Heinrich Fording, communist worker, Kosfeld, thrown from window of police station, Recklinghausen, alleged suicide, WTB. August 1st, four workers, Lutjens, Tesch, Wolf, and Müller, executed in Altona. End of Appendix List of Murders End of Brown Book of the Hitler Terror by Lord Marley